Chapter One of Agincourt, a Romance by G. P. R. James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. Chapter One, The Night Ride. The night was as black as ink. Not a solitary twinkling star looked out through that wide expanse of shadow which our great poet has called the blanket of the dark. Clouds covered the heaven. The moon had not risen to tinge them even with grey, and the sun had too long set to leave one faint streak of purple upon the edge of the western sky. Trees, houses, villages, fields and gardens all lay in one profound obscurity, and even the course of the high road itself required eyes well accustomed to night travelling to be able to distinguish it, as it wandered on through a rich part of Hampshire, amidst alternate woods and meadows. Yet at that murky hour a traveller on horseback rode forward upon his way, at an easy pace and with a light heart, if one might judge by the snatches of homely ballads that broke from his lips as he trotted on. These might indeed afford a fallacious indication of what was going on within the breast, and in this case they did so. The habit is more our master than we know, and often rules our external demeanour whenever the spirit is called to take counsel in the deep chambers within, showing upon the surface, without any effort on our part to hide our thoughts, a very different aspect from that of the mind's business at the moment. Thus, then, the traveller who there rode along, saluting the ear of night with scraps of old songs, sung in a low but melodious voice, was as thoughtful, if not as sad, as it was in his nature to be. But yet, as that nature was a cheerful one, and all his habits were gay, no sooner were the eyes of the spirit called to the consideration of deeper things, than custom exercised her sway over the animal part, and he gave voice, as we have said, to the old ballads which had cheered his boyhood and his youth. Whatever were his contemplations, they were interrupted, just as he came to a small stream which crossed the road, and then wandered along at its side, by first hearing the quick footfalls of a horse approaching, and then a loud but fine voice exclaiming, "'Who goes there?' "'A friend to all true men,' replied the traveller, "'a foe to all false knaves. Mary sings the throstle under the thorn. Which be you, friend of the highway?' "'Faith, I hardly know,' replied the stranger. "'Every man is a bit of both, I believe. "'But if you can tell me my way to Winchester, I will give you thanks.' "'I want nothing more,' answered the first traveller, drawing in his rein. "'But Winchester, good faith, that is a long way off. "'And you are going from it, master.' "'And he endeavoured, as far as the darkness would permit, "'to gain some knowledge of the stranger's appearance. "'It seemed that of a young man of good proportions, tall and slim,' but with broad shoulders and long arms. He wore no cloak, and his dress fitting tight to his body, as was then the fashion of the day, allowed his interlocutor to perceive the unencumbered outline of his figure. "'A long way off,' said the second traveller, as his new acquaintance gazed at him. "'That is very unlucky, but all my stars are under that black cloud. What is to be done now, I wonder?' "'What do you want to do?' inquired the first traveller. "'Winchester is distant five-and-twenty miles or more. "'Odds life, I want to find somewhere to lodge me and my horse for a night,' replied the other, "'at a less distance than twenty-five miles, and yet not quite upon this very spot.' "'Why not Andover?' asked his companion. "'Tis but six miles, and I am going thither.' "'Hm!' said the stranger, in a tone not quite satisfied. "'It must be so, if better cannot be found, "'and yet, my friend, I would fain find some other lodging.' Is there no inn hard by where carriers bake their beasts and fill their bellies, and country folks carouse on nights of merry-making, or some old hall or goodly castle where a chuckle-bed or one of straw and a nuncheon of bread and cheese and a draught of ale is not likely to be refused to a traveller with a good coat on his back and long-toed shoes? Oh, ay, rejoined the first. Of the latter there are many round, but on my life it will be difficult to direct you to them. The men of this part have a fondness for crooked ways, and unless you were the deedless who made them, or had some fair dame to guide you by the clue, you might wander about for as many hours as it would take you to get to Winchester. Then Andover it must be, I suppose, answered the other, though, to say sooth, 
I may there have to pay for a frolic, the score of which might be reckoned with other men than myself. A frolic, said his companion, nothing more, my friend? No, on my life, replied the other, a scurvy frolic, such as only a fool would commit, but when a man has nothing else to do, he is sure to fall into folly, and I am idle perforce. Well, I'll believe you, answered the first, after a moment's thought. I have, thank heaven, the gift of credulity, and believe all that men tell me. Come, I will turn back with you and guide you to a place of rest, though I shall be well laughed at for my pains. Not for an act of generous courtesy, surely, said the stranger, quitting the half-jesting tone in which he had hitherto spoken. If they laugh at you for that, I care not to lodge with them, and will not put your kindness to the test, for I should look for a cold reception. Nay, nay, it is not for that they will laugh, rejoined the other, and perhaps it may jump with my humour to go back too. If you have committed a folly in a frolic to-night, I have committed one in anger. Come with me, therefore, and as we go, give me some name by which to call you when we arrive, that I may not have to throw you into my uncle's hall as a keeper with a dead deer, and, moreover, before we go, give me your word that we have no frolics here, for I would not for much that any one I brought should move the old knight's heart with aught but pleasure. "'There is my hand, good youth,' replied the stranger, following as the other turned his horse, "'and I never break my word, whatever men say of me, though they tell strange tales. "'As for my name, people call me Hal of Hadnock. "'It will do as well as any other. "'For the nonce,' added his companion, understanding well that it was assumed, "'but it matters not. Let us ride on, and the gate shall soon be opened to you.' "'for I do not think they will be glad to see me back again, "'though I may not perchance stay long.' "'The porter rose a non sir ten as soon as he heard John call. "'You seem learned for a countryman,' said the traveller riding on by his side, "'but perchance I am speaking to a clerk.' "'Good faith, no,' replied the first wayfarer. "'More soldier than clerk, how of Hadnock. "'As old Robert of Langland says,' I cannot perfectly my paternoster, as the priest it singeth, but I can rhyme of Robin Hood and Randolph, Earl of Chester. I have cheered my boyhood with many a song and my mouth with many a ballad. When lying in the field upon the marches of Wales, I have whiled away many a cold night with the Queen's Mountford, Sir Dewar Moore, or Richard of Almain, while he was king. And then in the cold blasts of March I ever found comfort in Summer is ikumin in, lud sing cuckoo, groweth seed and bloweth mode, and springeth the word new. And good reason, too, said Hal of Hadnock. I do the same in faith, and when wintry winds are blowing, I think ever that a warmer day may come and all be bright again. Were it not for that, indeed, I might well be cold-hearted. Fie, never flinch, cried his gay companion. There is but one thing on earth should make a bold man cold-hearted. "'And what may that be?' asked the other. "'To lose his dinner?' "'No good life,' exclaimed the first. "'To lose his lady's love.' "'Ay, is it there, the saddle galls?' said Hal of Hadnock. "'Faith, not a whit,' answered his fellow-traveller. "'If it did, I should leave off singing. "'You are wrong in your guess, Master Hal. "'I may lose my lady, but not my lady's love, "'or I am much mistaken. "'And while that stays with me, I will both sing and hope.' "'Tis the best comfort,' replied Hal of Hadnock and generally brings success. But what am I to call you, fair sir, for it mars one's speech to have no name for a companion? Now, were it not my uncle's house within three miles, said the other, I would pay you in your own coin, and bid you call me Dick of Andover, for I am fond of secrets, and keep them faithfully, except when they are likely to be found out. But such being the case now, you must call me Richard of Woodville, if you would have my friends know you mean a poor squire." who has ever sought the places where hard blows are plenty, but who missed his spurs at Bramham Moor by being sent by his good friend Sir Thomas Ropeby to bear tidings of Northumberland's incursion to the king. I would fain have stayed and carried news of the victory, but, good sooth, Sir Thomas said he could trust me to tell the truth clearly as well as fight, and that, though he could trust the others to fight, he could not find one who would not make the matter either more or less to the king than it really was. "'See what bad luck it is to be a plain-spoken fellow?' "'Good luck as well as bad,' replied Hal of Hadnock, and in such conversation they pursued their way, riding not quite so fast as either had been doing when first they met, 
and slackening their pace to a walk when, about half a mile further forward, they quitted the high road and took to the narrow lanes of the country, which, as the reader may easily conceive, were not quite as good for travelling in those days, as even at present, when in truth they are often bad enough. They soon issued forth, however, upon a more open track, where the river again ran along by the roadside, sheltered here and there by copses, which occasionally rose from the very brink, and just as they regained it, the moon appearing over the low banks that fell crossing each other over its course, poured from beneath the fringe of heavy clouds that canopied the sky above, her full, pale light upon the whole extent of the stream. There was something fine but melancholy in the sight, grave and even grand, and though there were none of those large objects which seem generally necessary to produce the sublime, there was a feeling of vastness given by the broad expanse of shadow overhead, and the long line of glistening brightness below, broken by the thick black masses of brushwood that here and there bent over the flat surface of the water. "'This is fine,' said Hal of Hadnock. "'I love such night scenes with the solitary moon and the deep woods and the gleaming river, aye, even the dark clouds themselves. They are, to me, like a king's fate, where so many heavy things brood over him, so many black and impenetrable things surround him. And where, yet often, a clear yet cold effulgence pours upon his way, grander and calmer than the warmer and gayer beams that form upon the course of ordinary men. His companion turned and gazed at him for a moment by the moonlight, but made no observation, till the other continued, pointing with his hand, "'What is that drifting on the water? Surely it is man's head!' "'An otter with a trout in his mouth, speeding to his hole,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'He will not be long in sight. See, he is gone. All things fly from man. We have established our character for butchery with the brute creation, and they wisely avoid the slaughterhouse of our presence.' "'I thought it was something human, living or dead,' replied Hal of Hadnock. "'Methinks it were a likely spot for a man to rid himself of his enemy, "'and give the carrion to the waters, or for a love-lorn damsel to bury griefs and memories "'beneath the sleepy shining of the moonlight stream. "'The Lucadian promontory was an awful leap, "'and bold as well as sad must have been the heart to take it.' But here, timid despair might creep quietly into the soft closing wave, and find a more peaceful deathbed than the slow decay of a broken heart. "'Sad thoughts, sir, sad thoughts,' replied Richard of Woodville, "'and yet you seem merry enough just now.' "'Aye, the fit comes upon me as it will, comrade,' replied the other, "'and, good faith, I strive not to prevent it. I amuse myself with my own humours, standing, as it were, without myself, and looking inward like a spectator at a tawny. "'now laughing at all I see, now ready to weep, "'and yet for the world I would not stop the sea, "'were it in my power to cast down my warder "'at the keenest point of strife, and say, "'Pause, no more. "'Sometimes there lives not a merrier heart on this side the sea, "'and sometimes not a sadder within the waters. "'At one time I could laugh like a clown at a fair, "'and at others would make ballads to their little stars, "'full of sad homilies.' "'Not so I,' rejoined Richard of Woodville, I strive for an equal mind. I would fain be always light-hearted, and though, when I am crossed, I may be hot and hasty, ready to strive with others or myself, yet in good truth I soon learn to bear with all things, and to endure the ills that fall to my portion, as lightly as may be. Man's a beast of burden, and must carry his pack-saddle, so it is better to do it quietly than to kick under the load." out upon those who go seeking for sorrows a sort of commodity they may find at their own door. One winds over a man's ingratitude, another takes to heart the scorn of the great, another broods over his merit neglected, and his good deeds forgotten. But were they wise, and did good without thought of thanks? Were they high of heart, and knew themselves as great in their inmost soul as the greatest in the land? Were they bright in mind, and found pleasure in the mind's exercise, they would both merit more and repine less, aye, and be purer of their due in the end. "'By my life, you said you were no clerk, Richard of Woodville,' cried his companion, "'and here you have preached me a sermon fit to banish moonsick melancholy from the land. But say, good youth, is yonder light looking out of your uncle's hall window, there, far on the other side of the stream?' "'No, no,' answered Woodville. "'Ride after it, and see how far it would lead you.' You will soon find yourself neck deep in the swamp. 
"'Tis a will o' the wisp. My uncle's house lies on before, beyond the village of Abbot's Anne, just a quarter of a mile from the abbey. So, as the one brother owns the hall, and the other rules the monastery, they can aid and countenance each other, whether it be at a merry-making or a broil. Then, too, as the good abbot is as meek as a new in a May morning, and Sir Philip is as fiery as the sun in June, the one can tame the other's wrath, or work up his courage, as the case may be. But here we see the first houses, and lights in the window, too. Why, how now, Dame Julian has not gone to bed? But I forgot there is a glutton mass to-morrow, and as the reeve's wife, she must be cooking capons, truly. But hark, there is a sound of a sithen, and someone singing. Good faith, they are making merry by their fireside, though curfew has told long since. Well, heaven send all good men a cheerful evening and a happy hearth. Perhaps they have some poor minstrel within, and are keeping up his heart with kindness. For Julian is a bountiful dame, and the reeve, though somewhat hard upon the young knaves, is no way pinched when there is a sad face at his door. Well, fair sir, we shall soon be home. A pleasant place is home. Ay, it is a pleasant place, and when far away we think of it always. God help the man who has no home, and let all good Christians befriend him, for he has need. Although Hal of Hadnock made no farther observations upon his companion's mood and character, there was something therein that struck and pleased him greatly and he was no mean judge of his fellow-men, for he had mingled with many of every class and degree, quick and ready in discovering by small traits the secrets of that complicated mystery, the human heart. He saw, even in the love of music and poetry, in a man habituated to camps and fields of battle, a higher and finer mind than the common society of the day afforded. For it must not be thought that either in the night or the night sun of our old friend Chaucer the poet gave an accurate picture of the gentry of the age. That there were not such is not to be doubted, but they were few, and the generality of the nobles and gentlemen of those times was sadly illiterate and rude. The occasional words of Richard of Woodville let drop, too, regarding his own scheme of home philosophy, showed, his companion thought, a strength and rigour of character which might be serviceable to others as well as himself, in any good and honourable cause. And Hal of Hadnock, as they rode on, said to himself, I will see more of this man. After passing through the little village and issuing out again into the open country, they saw, by the light of the moon, now rising higher, and dispersing the clouds as she advanced, a high, isolated hill standing out, detached from all the woods and scattered hedgerows round. At a little distance from its base, upon the left, appeared the tall pinnacles and tower of an abbey, and a church cutting dark against the lustrous sky behind, and partly hidden by the trees on the right, partly rising above them, were seen the bold lines of another building in a sterner style of architecture. "'That is your uncle's dwelling, I suppose,' said Hal of Hadnock, pointing on with his hand. "'Shall we find any one up? It is hard upon ten o'clock.' "'Oh, no fear,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'Good Sir Philip Beecham sits late in the hall.' He will not take his white head to the pillow for an hour or two, and the ladies like well to keep him company. Here to the left is a shorter way through the wood, but look to your horse's footing, for the woodmen were busy this morning, and may have left branches about. In less than five minutes more they were before the embattled gates of one of those old English dwellings, half castle, half house, which denoted the owner to be a man of station and consideration. Just a step below, in fortune or rank, those mighty barons who sheltered themselves from the storms of the factious and lawless epoch, in fortresses filled with an army of retainers and dependents. As they approached, Richard of Woodville raised his voice and called aloud, "'Tim Morris! Tim Morris!' He waited a moment, singing to himself the two verses he had repeated before. The porter rose again, Sir Ten, as soon as he heard John call and then added, But it will be different now, I fancy, for honest Tim is as deaf as a miller, and his boy is sound asleep, I suspect. Tim Morris, I say, he will keep us here all night. Tim Morris, how now, old sluggard? He continued as the ancient porter rolled back the gate. Were you snoring in your wicker chair, that you make us dance attendance, as you do the country folk of a Monday morning? Tis fit they should learn to dance the Morris dance, as they call it, Master Dick. 
answered the porter, laughing and holding up his lantern. God yield ye, sir. I thought you were gone for the night, and I was stripping off my jerkin. Is Simeon of Royden gone, then? asked Woodville. Nay, sir, he stays all night, answered the porter. Here, boy, here, knave, turn thee out and run across the court to take the horses. A sleepy boy, with senses yet but half awake, crept out from the door and followed Richard of Woodville and his companion as they rode across the small space that separated the gate from the hall itself. There, at a flight of steps leading to a portal which might well have served a church, they dismounted, and advancing before his fellow traveller, Richard of Woodville raised the heavy bar of hammered iron, which served for a latch, and entered the hall, singing aloud, As I rode on a Monday between Wettenden and Wall, all along the Broadway, I met a little man with all. As he spoke, he pushed back the door for Hal of Hadnot to enter, and a scene was presented to his companion's sight which deserves rather to begin than to end a chapter. End of chapter 1「How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Chapter 2 of Agincourt A Romance by George Payne Rainsford James this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 The Hall and its Denizens The hall of the old house at Dunbury, long swept away by the two great destroyers of man's works, time and change, was a spacious vaulted chamber of about sixty feet in its entire length, by from thirty-five to forty in width, but at the end next the court, a part of the pavement of about nine feet broad, and some eighteen or twenty inches lower than the rest, was separated from the hall by two broad steps running all the way across. This inferior space presented three doors, the great one communicating at once with the court, and two others in the angles, at the right side and the left, leading to chambers in the rest of the building. At the further end of the hall, on the left, was another small door, opposite to which there appeared the first four steps of a staircase, which wound away with a turn to apartments above. There was a high window over the principal entrance from which the room received in the daytime its only light, and about halfway up the chamber on the left hand was the wide chimney and hearth, with seats on either side, and two vast bars of iron between them for burning wood. In the midst of the pavement stood a long table, with some benches, one or two stools, and a great chair, in which the master of the mansion seated himself at the time of meals. But the hall presented no other ornament whatever, except a number of lances, bows, crossbows, axes, maces, and other offensive arms, which were ranged with some taste against the walls. The armoury was in another part of the house, and these weapons seemed only admitted here to be ready in case of immediate need, for those were times in which men did not always know how soon the hand might be called upon to defend a head. When Richard of Woodville and his companion entered, some six or seven large logs, I might almost call them trees, were blazing in the hearth, and, in addition to the glare they afforded, a sconce of seven burners above the chimney shed a full light upon the party assembled round the fire. That party was very numerous, for several maids and retainers, of whom it may not be necessary to speak more particularly, were scattered round the principal personages, busy with such occupations for the evening as were common in a rude age, when intellectual pursuits were very little cultivated. The group in front, however, deserves more attention, consisting of seven persons, most of whom we shall have to speak of more than once in the course of these pages. In the seat within the chimney, just opposite the door, sat the master of the mansion, a tall, powerful old man, who had seen many a battlefield in his day, during that and the preceding reign, and had borne away the marks of hard blows upon his face. He was spare and large-boned in form, with his hair and beard very nearly white, but he was hale and florid withal, and his countenance, though strongly marked, had an expression of kindness and good humour, not at all incompatible with the indications of a quick and fiery temper, 
which were to be discovered in the sparkle of his undimmed blue eye, and the sudden contraction of his brow when anything surprised him. The seat on the left side of the fire was not visible from the door by which the two wayfarers entered, but beyond the angle of the chimney protruded into the light the arm, shoulder, and part of the head of another tall old man, apparently clothed in a grey gown of some monastic order. On the left of Sir Philip Beecham was seated a young lady, perhaps eighteen or nineteen years of age, with her arm resting on his knee, and her head and figure bent gracefully towards him. Her hair was as black as jet, her skin soft and clear, and her complexion somewhat pale, though a slight tinge of the rose might be seen upon her cheek. Her eyes, like her father's, were of a deep, clear blue, though the long black fringes that bordered her eyelids in a long, sweeping line made them, at a distance, look as dark as her hair. She seemed neither above nor below the ordinary height of woman, and her whole figure, though by no means thin, was slim and delicate. The small, exquisite foot and rounded ankle, inclining gracefully towards the fire, were displayed by the posture in which she had placed herself, and the hand that rested on her father's knee with long fingers tapering to the point showed in every line the high Norman blood of her race. Next to Isabel Beecham, the only daughter of the old knight, was another lady, perhaps a year younger. She was in several respects strikingly contrasted to her fair companion, though hardly less beautiful. Her hair was of a light glossy brown, "'catching a warm gleam wherever the light fell upon it. "'As fine as silk new spun from the cone, "'yet curling in large bunches wherever it could escape "'from the bands that confined it. "'Her complexion was fair and glowing, "'her cheek warm with health, "'and her skin as soft and smooth as that of a child. "'To look upon her at a little distance, "'one would have expected to find the merry grey or blue eye "'so often seen in the pretty village maid. "'But hers was dark brown, large and full and soft, yet with a laughing light therein that seemed to speak a buoyant and a happy heart. In form she was somewhat taller than the other, but though her waist looked as if it would have required no giant's hand to span it round, yet there was that sort of full and graceful sweep in all the lines which painters and statuaries, I believe, call contour. Naught but the tip of one foot was seen from beneath the long and flowing petticoat then in fashion, but even from that one might judge that nothing much more neat and small ever beat the turf, except amongst the elves of fairyland. Her hand rested upon a frame of embroidery at which she had been working, and her head was slightly bent forward as if to hear something said by the good abbot of the convent, who sat opposite to his brother in the seat within the chimney. But between her and him was another group, consisting of three persons, which somewhat detached itself from the rest. Two were seated, a lady and a gentleman, and the third was standing with his arms folded on his chest a little behind the others. The backs of these three were turned towards the door by which Woodville and his companions entered, and they were somewhat in the shade, being placed between the lower end of the hall and the light both of the fire and the sconce. But as we are now looking at the picture of the whole, we may as well examine the details before we proceed. The lady bore a striking resemblance in features, complexion, and form to Isabel Beecham, whom we have already described, and the Lady Catherine might well be taken, as was often the case, for her cousin's sister. She was taller, indeed, though not much, but the chief difference was in the expression of the two countenances. Catherine's wanted all the gentleness, the tenderness, the thoughtfulness of Isabel's. It could assume a look of playful coquetry, it could seem grave, it could seem joyous, but with each expression there mingled a touch of pride, perhaps, too, of vanity, and a scornful turn of the lip and well-chiselled nostril, as well as a quick flash of the eye, spoke the rash and haughty spirit which too certainly dwelt within her breast. We are the slaves of circumstances from our cradle, and the mother and the nurse form as much part of our fate as any of the other events which mould our character, guide our course, and lead us to high station, retain us in mediocrity, or plunge us into misfortune. Catherine Beecham, like her cousin, was an only child and an heiress, but her mother had brought large possessions to her father, and with those large possessions an inexhaustible store of pride. 
She had looked upon herself, indeed, as her husband's benefactor, for he was a younger brother, of small estate, and after his death she and a foolish servant had rivalled each other in instilling into her daughter's mind high notions of her own importance. In this, as in many another thing, the mother had proved herself weak, and the spoilt child had early shown her the result of her own folly. She did not live long enough to correct her error, even if she had possessed sense enough to make the effort, and when Catherine came to the house of her uncle as his ward, her character was too far fixed to render any lessons effectual, but the severe ones of the world. There, then, she sat, beautiful, rich, vain, and haughty, claiming all admiration as her due, and believing that even her faults ought to be admired for her loveliness and her wealth. Beside her was placed her mother's nearest relation, a distant cousin named Simeon of Royden. He was a tall, robust, well-proportioned man of two or three-and-thirty years of age, with a quantity of light hair close-cut in front, and left long upon the back of the head and over the temples. His features were in general good, and what with youth and health, a florid complexion, fair skin, bright keen eyes, an aquiline nose, somewhat too much depressed, and an air of calm self-importance and courtly ease, he was the sort of man so often called handsome by those who little consider or know in what beauty really consists. Nothing, indeed, that dress could do was left undone, according to the fashions of the day, to set off his person to the best of advantage. His long limbs were clothed in the light-coloured breeches and hose, without division from the waist to the foot, which were generally worn by men of the higher class, but so tightly did they fit that scarce a muscle of the leg might not be traced beneath, and his coat was also cut so close to his shape, that except on the chest, where perhaps some padding added to the appearance of breadth, the garment seemed to be but an outer skin. His shoes exhibited points of at least six inches in length beyond the toe, and the sleeves of his mantle, which he continued to wear even in the hall, hung down till they swept the floor. He wore a dagger in his girdle with a jewelled hilt, and a clasp upon his coat with a ruby set in gold, while on his thumb appeared a large signet ring, of a very peculiar fashion and device. Notwithstanding dress, however, and good features, and a countenance under perfect command, there were certain minute but very distinct signs to be perceived by an eye practised in the study of the human character, which betrayed the fact that his smooth exterior was but a shell containing a less pleasant core. There was a wandering of the eyes which did not always seem to move in the same orbits. There was an occasional quiver of the lower lip, as if words which might be dangerous were restrained with difficulty. There was a look of keen, eager, almost fierce inquiry, when anything was said, the meaning of which he did not at once comprehend, and then a sudden return to a bland and sweet expression, almost of insipidity, which spoke of something false and hollow. He was talking to Catherine Beecham when Richard of Woodville and Hal of Hadnock entered, in gay tones, often mingling a low laugh with his conversation, and eyeing his own foot and leg as it was stretched out towards the fire, with an air of great self-admiration and satisfaction. The figure of the third person, who stood close behind the lady, as if he had come round hither and left vacant a stool which appeared on the other side, to take part in her conversation with Sir Simeon of Royden, was as tall and finer in all its proportions than that of the knight who sat by her side. His chest was broader, his arms more muscular, the turn of his head and the fall of his shoulders more graceful and symmetrical, his dark hair curled short round his forehead and on his neck. His straight-cut features of a grave and somewhat stern cast wore their least pleasing look when in repose, for they wanted but the fire of expression to light them up in a moment and render them all bright and glowing. His eye, however, the feature which soonest receives that light, had in it a fixed melancholy which scarcely left it when he smiled, and now, though he had come round thither to interchange a few words with Catherine, his betrothed wife, and her gay kinsman, Sir Henry Dacre had fallen into thought again, and remained standing with his arms folded on his chest, and his look fixed upon Isabel Beecham, as she leaned upon her father's knee. His gaze was intense, thoughtful, I might call it inquiring, but yet it was not rude, for he knew not that his eyes were so firmly fixed upon her. 
He was buried in his own thoughts, and perhaps the peculiar investigating expression of that look might be accounted for by supposing that he was asking questions, difficult to solve, of his own heart. Isabel herself did not remark that he was gazing at her, for she was listening to some anecdote of other days which her father was telling. But the old knight did observe the glance of his young friend, and he observed it with pain, yet more in sorrow than in anger, for there were some things of which he bitterly grieved, but which could not be amended. He broke off his story for a moment to mutter to himself, "'Poor fellow!' and just at that instant his eye lighted upon Richard of Woodville, as the young traveller opened the great door of the hall. His brow contracted while perhaps one might count ten, but was speedily clear again, and he exclaimed, laughing aloud, "'Ha! Here is Dickon again! I thought he would not go far!' Everyone turned round suddenly, and all laughed gaily except one. But the fair girl with the rich brown hair, sitting next to Isabel Beecham, gazed down the hall, with a smile indeed, but with a kindly look gleaming forth through her half-closed merry eyes. "'Ah, run away!' cried Isabel Beecham, still laughing. "'So you have come back.' "'Yes, sweet cousin,' replied Richard of Woodville, advancing up the hall with his companion. "'But I have a cause.' "'I should have been half-way to Winchester else. "'Here is a gentleman, sir,' he continued, addressing his uncle, "'whom I have met seeking the right way and finding the wrong, "'and I failed not in promising him your hospitality for the night.' "'Right, Richard, you did right,' replied the old knight, "'raising his tall form from the seat by the fire. "'Sir, you are most welcome. "'Quick, you of Clapford, leave cutting that bow "'and speed to the battery and the kitchen.' "'Bring them wine and meat, I pray you, sir, take the seat by the fire.' "'Nay, not so, noble sir,' replied Hal of Hadnock, in a courteous tone. "'I am not one to take the place of venerable years and high renown. "'Thanks for your welcome and good fortune to your roof-tree. "'I beseech you, let me make no confusion. "'I will place me here.' "'And he drew a stool from the table somewhat nearer to the fire, "'and seated himself, while all eyes were fixed upon him.' Richard of Woodville, too, took a better view of his companion than he had hitherto obtained, and that view satisfied him that he had not introduced to his uncle Hall a guest who, in point of rank and station at least, was not well deserving of a place therein. The stranger was, as I have already said, a tall and somewhat slim young man, perhaps four or five and twenty years of age, with black hair and close-shaved beard, keen dark eyes, long and sinewy limbs, and a chest of great width and depth. His features were remarkably fine, his brow wide and expansive, his forehead high, and the whole expression of his countenance noble and commanding. His dress was rich and costly without being gaudy. His coat of deep brown, covering the hips like that of a crossbowman, was of the finest cloth and ornamented with small lines of gold in a quaint but not ungraceful pattern. Instead of the hood then commonly worn, his head was covered with a small cap of velvet, and one long penache, or feather, clasped with a large jewel. His dagger and the hilt of his sword were both studded with rubies, and though his riding boots of untanned leather were cut square off at the toe, instead of being encumbered with the long points still in fashion, over them were buckled with a broad strap and flap, a pair of gilt spurs, showing that he had seen service in arms, and had won knightly rank. His tight-fitting hose were of a light filimot, or brownish-yellow colour, and round the leg below the knee was a mark, as if the impression of a thong, seeming to prove that when not in riding attire he was accustomed to wear shoes so long that the horn's points were obliged to be fastened up by a gilt chain, as was then not unusual. His manner was highly courteous, but it was remarked that at first he committed what has in most ages been considered an act of rudeness, remaining with his head covered some minutes after he entered the hall. But at length, seeming suddenly to remember that such was the case, he took off his cap and laid it on the table. Sir Philip Beecham, without asking any question of his guest, proceeded at once to name to him the different persons assembled round the fire. But as we have already heard who they were, it is needless to give a recapitulation here. Richard of Woodville, however, marked, or fancied, that as the old knight pronounced the name of Sir Simeon of Royden, a brief glance of recognition passed between that personage and his companion of the road. 
but neither claimed the other as an acquaintance, and Woodville said nothing to call attention to what he had observed. "'It will seem scarcely courteous, sir,' said the guest as Sir Philip ended, "'not to give you my own name, though you in your hospitality will not ask it. But yet, for the present, I will beg you to call me simply Hal of Hadnock, and ere I go, Sir Philip, in your own ear I will tell more. And now pray let me not kill mirth, or break off a pleasant tale, or stop a sweet lay, for doubtless you passed the long eves of March, as did the knights and dames in our old friend Chaucer's dreams. Some to read old romances, them occupied for their pleasances, some to make verilays and lays, and some to the other diverse plays. Nay, sir, answered the old knight, who had glanced with a smile at his guest's gilded spurs, as he gave himself the name of Hal of Hadnock. We were but talking of some old deeds of arms, which doubtless you in your career have often heard of. As to lays, when my nephew Richard is away, we have but little poesy in the house, except when this sweet ward of mine, Mary Markham, will sing us a gay ditty. "'Not to-night, not to-night,' cried the lady on Isabel Beecham's left. "'I am not in tune to-night.' Isabel bent her head to her fair companion, and whispered a word which made the blood come warm into Mary Markham's cheek. But Catherine, with a gay toss of her head and a glance of her blue eye at the handsome stranger, exclaimed, "'I love neither lay nor ballad. They are but plain English twisted out of form, and set to duller tune.' "'Indeed, lady,' said the stranger, gazing upon her with an incredulous smile. I have ever thought that music and verse made sweet things sweeter, and methinks even now, were it some tender lay addressed to your bright looks, you would not find the sound so rude. A smile passed round the little circle, but did not visit the lip of Sir Henry Dacre, and though Catherine Beecham laughed with a scornful smile, it seemed as if she knew not well whether to look upon the stranger's words as kind or uncourteous. "'Ha, Katie, touch you there,' said the old knight. "'What think you, Abbot? Has not our guest judged our niece aright?' "'I believe it is so with all ladies,' answered the abbot gravely. "'They find the words of praise sweet and the words of blame bitter, whether it be in song or saying. "'You men of the world nurture them in such folly. "'You flatter them too much, so that, like the tongue of a wine-bibber, "'they can taste nothing but what is high-seasoned.' "'Faith, not a whit, reverend lord,' cried Hal of Hadnock gaily. "'Craving your forgiveness, we deal with them as heaven intended. "'Fair and delicate in mind and frame, "'we shelter their persons from all rough winds and storms, "'as far as may be, and their ears from all harsh sounds. "'They were not made to cope with the rough things of life, "'and if they find wholesome exercise for body and soul, good father, "'in the chase and in the confessional, it is as much as is needed.' The church has the staple trade for truth, especially with ladies, and for any layman to make it their merchandise would be against the laws of Cupid's realm. "'I fear you speak lightly, my son,' said the abbot with a good-humoured smile, "'but here comes your meal, and I will give it my blessing.' By such words as these the ice of new acquaintance was soon broken, and as the guest sat down at the side of the long table to partake of such viands as his entertainer's hospitality provided for him— the party round the fire separated into various groups. The good master of the mansion approached to do the honours of his board, and pressed the stranger to his food. Catherine seemed smitten with a sudden fit of affection for her uncle, and placed herself near him, where, with no small spice of coquetry, she sought to engage the attention of the visitor to herself. Sir Henry Dacre remained talking by the fire with Isabel Beecham, and whatever was the subject of their discourse, the faces of both remained grave, almost sad, while at a little distance Richard of Woodville conversed in low tones with fair Mary Markham, and their faces presented the aspect of an April sky, with its clouds and its sunshine being sometimes overshadowed by a look of care and anxiety, sometimes smiling gaily, as if the inextinguishable hopes of youth blazed suddenly up into a flame, after burning low and dimly for a while under some cold blast from the outward world. The abbot had resumed his seat by the fire, and Sir Simeon of Royden had not quitted his, but the latter, though the good monk spoke to him from time to time, seemed buried in his own thoughts, answered briefly and often vaguely, and then fell into a reverie again, turning occasionally his eyes upon his fair kinswoman and the stranger, 
with an expression of no great pleasure. With the old knight and Catherine Beecham in the meanwhile, Hal of Hadnock kept up the conversation gaily, seeming to find a pleasure in so mingling sweet and bitter things together, in his language to the lady, as sometimes to flatter, sometimes to pique her, and thus, without her knowing it, he contrived to put her through all her paces, like a managed horse, till every little weakness and fault in her character was displayed, one after another. At first Sir Philip Beecham was amused, and laughed at the stranger's merry jests, thinking, "'It will do Kate good to hear some wholesome truth from an impartial tongue.' But as he saw that, whether intentionally or not, the words of Hal of Hadnock had the effect of bringing out all the evil points in her disposition to the eyes of his guest, he grew uneasy for his brother's child, and felt all her faults more keenly from seeing her thus expose them in mere vanity to the acquaintance of an hour. He saw then, with satisfaction, his guest's meal draw towards a close, and, as soon as it was done, proposed that they should all retire to rest. There was some consideration required as to what chamber should be assigned to Hal of Hadnock, for small pieces of ceremony were, in those days, matters of importance, but Sir Philip Beecham decided the matter by telling Richard of Woodville to lead the visitor to the Rose Tapestry Room, and to place a good yeoman to sleep across his door. It was one of the principal guest-chambers of the house, and its selection showed that the good knight judged his nephew's fellow-traveller to be of higher rank than he assumed. Lighted by a page, Richard of Woodville led the way, and entered with his companion, when they reached the apartment to which they had been directed. Although it was now late, he remained there more than an hour, in conversation deeply interesting to himself, at least. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Agincourt, A Romance, by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The Foregone Events Come, Richard of Woodville, said his companion, as soon as they entered the chamber of the Rose Tapestry. Let us be friends. You have served me at my need, and I would fain serve you, but I must first know how. "'Faith, sir, that is not easy,' answered Woodville, "'for I do not know how myself.' "'Well, then, I must think for you, Richard,' rejoined Hal of Hadnock. "'What stays your marriage?' Woodville gazed at him with some surprise, and then smiled. "'My marriage? With whom?' he asked. "'Nay, nay,' answered his new friend. "'Waste not time with idle concealments. "'I am a man who uses his eyes, and I can tell you, methinks, "'all about every one in the hall we have just left.' "'Well, stay yet a moment till we can be alone,' replied Woodville. "'They will soon bring you a livery of wine and a manchet of bread.' "'In pity stop them,' cried Hal of Hadnock. "'I have supped so late that I can take no more.' But as he was speaking, a servant entered with a cup of hot wine and a small roll of fine bread upon a silver plate. As bound in courtesy, the guest broke off a piece of the manchet and put the cup to his lips. But it was a mere ceremony, for he did not drink— and the man, taking away the rest of the wine and bread, quitted the room. "'Now, Richard, you shall see if I be right,' continued Hal of Hadnock. "'There is one pretty maid called Mary Markham, or I heard not your uncle right, whose cheek sometimes changes from the soft hue of the rose's outer leaves to the deep crimson of its blushing breast, when a certain Richard of Woodville is near.' And there is one good youth, called Richard of Woodville, who can whisper sweet words in Mary Markham's ear, while his uncle holds converse with a new guest at a distance. Woodville laughed and made no answer, and his companion went on. Well, then, there is a fair Lady Catherine, beautiful and witty, but somewhat shrewish withal, and holding her own merits as most rare jewels, too good to be bestowed on ordinary men, who would have a lover like a bird in a cage, piping all day to her perfections, and would think him well paid if she gave him but one of the smiles or looks whereof she is bountiful to those who love her not. And moreover, there is one Sir Harry Dacre, a noble knight and true, for I have heard his name ere now, whom I should fancy to be her husband, were it not that— Why should you think them so nearly allied? asked Woodville. Because she gave him neither word nor look, replied Hal of Hadnock. Is not that proof enough with such a dame? You have read them but too rightly, rejoined Richard of Woodville with a sigh. He is not, indeed, her husband, but as near it as may be. 
betrothed in infancy, a curse upon such doings that bind together in the bud two flowers that but destroy each other's blossoms as they grow. They are to be wedded fully when she sees twenty years, and poor Dacre, as noble and as true a heart as e'er was known, looks sternly forward to that day, as a prisoner does to the hour of execution, for she has taught him too early and too well all those secrets of her bosom which a wiser woman would have hidden. "'He does not love her, that is clear,' answered his companion, in a graver tone than he had hitherto used. "'Did he never love her?' "'No, not with manly love,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'I remember well, when we were both boys together, and she as lovely a girl as ever was seen. He used to be proud then of her beauty, and call her his fair young wife. But even then she began the lessons of which she has given such a course, that never pale student at Oxford was better indoctrinated in Aristotle than he is in her heart. Even in those early days she would jeer and scoff at him, and if he showed her any little tenderness, would straightway strive to make him angry, would pretend great fondness for some other, for me, for any one who would happen to be near, would give his gifts away, admire whatever was not like him. Oh, then, fair hair was her delight, blue eyes were beautiful. She hated him, I do believe, because she was tied to him and that was the only bond upon her own capricious will, so that she resolved to use him as a boy does a poor bird tied to him by a string, pulling it hither and thither till its little heart beats, unto bursting with such cruel tyranny. Had she begun less early, indeed, her power of grieving him would have been greater, for he was well inclined to let affection take duty's hand, and love her if he could. But she herself soon ended that source of torture— she may now play the charmer with whom she will. She cannot wring his heart with jealousy. He does not love her, that is clear, repeated Hal of Hadnock in a still graver tone. But he may love another. Ha! exclaimed Woodville. Whom think you, sir? Nay, replied his companion after a pause. It is not for me, my good friend, to sow suspicious doubts or fears where I find them not. I do believe Sir Harry Dacre will do all that is right and noble and I did but mean to say that his poor heart may know greater tortures than you dream of, if, tied as he is by the act of others to a woman who will not suffer him to love her, he has met, or should hereafter meet, with one on whom all his best affections can be placed. I say not that he has. I only say such a thing may be. Richard of Woodville gazed down upon the rushes on the floor for several moments with a thoughtful look. "'I know of whom you would speak,' he said at length, "'but I think in this you have deceived yourself, "'sharp as your observation has been. "'Isabel has been the companion of both from youth, "'and to her, in early days, "'Dacre would go for consolation and kindness "'when worn out by his cold, vain lady's caprice and perverseness. "'She pitied him and soothed, "'and often have I heard her try to soften Catherine's conduct, "'making it seem youthful folly and high spirits.' and trying to take the venom from the wound. He looks upon Isabel as a sister, nothing more, I think. Hal of Hadnock shook his head, and then suddenly turned to another subject. Well, he said, you will not deny that I am right in some things, and therefore, as I am in your secret, whether you will or not, now answer me my question, what stays your marriage? Good sooth, I cannot tell, replied Richard of Woodville. The truth is, this dear, lovely girl came here some years gone. None knew from whence. But it was my uncle brought her, and ever since he has treated her as a daughter. All have loved her, and I more than all. But day after day went by in sports and pleasures, and in a full career of happiness I did not think till yesterday of risking the present by striving to brighten the future. Last evening, however, I said some plainer words than usual. What she replied matters not, but I saw that, afterwards, she was not so gay as usual, and to-day I took a moment when I thought good Sir Philip was in a yielding mood, and asked the hand of his dear ward or daughter, for I must not hide from you that men have suspicions. There is blood of the Beechams in the same lady's veins. He gave me a rough answer, however, told me not to think of her, and would assign no reason why. I will not say we quarrelled, for I love him too much— and reverence him too much for that. But I said in haste that if I were not to think of her, I would stay no longer where suing only bred regret. 
and that I would seek honour if I could not find a bride. He answered it was the best thing I could do, and so without more thought than to feed my horse and bid them all farewell, I put foot in stirrup for my own place hard by West Mion, with the intent of seeking service in some foreign land, as the wars here have come to an end. My good uncle only laughed at me and told them, as I mounted in the court, that Dickon was out of humour, but would soon find his good spirits again. I did not do so for a long way, however, but as I went well sure of my lady's grace, I began to take heart after a while, and resolved that she should hear of me from other shores, till I could claim her, and no one say me nay. It was a good resolve, answered his companion, for in such a case I know not what else could be done. But whither did you intend to bend your steps? To France? Nay, not to France, said Woodville. I love not the Frenchman. If our good king indeed were again to draw the sword for the recovery of all that sluggish men and evil times have lost, of our rightful lands since the black prince's death, right willingly would I follow thither to fight against the French, but not serve with them. But his royal thoughts are turned to other things, replied Hal of Hadnock. He still holds the mind, I hear, to take the cross and couch a lance for the sepulchre. That is gone by, I am told, answered Richard of Woodville. This frequent sickness that attacks him has made him think of other things, men say. But doubtless you know better than I do. Nay, I know naught of that, said his fellow traveller, but it is predicted that he shall die at Jerusalem. Heaven send it! exclaimed Woodville, for if he live till then, his will be a long reign, methinks. Amen, rejoined the other, but whither thought you then to go? Perchance to the court of Burgundy, replied Richard, or to some of those Italian states where there are ever hard blows to be found, and honour to be gained by doughty deeds. That famous land of Italy is somewhat far from our poor northern isle, answered Hal of Hadnock, especially for a lover. Methinks Burgundy were best, but doubtless, since you have come back again, your resolution has been left on the road behind us. No, not a whit, cried Woodville. What I judged best in haste some hours ago, I now judge best at leisure. I have told Mary that I go for her sweet sake, to make me a high name, and with heaven's blessing I will do it. Well, then, answered his new friend, if such be your determination, I know some noble gentleman in the court— of that same Duke of Burgundy, who may aid your advancement, for Hal of Hadnock's sake. Richard of Woodville smiled, replying, Doubtless you do, fair sir, but may I tell them you sent me to them? If you will but wait a day or two, said the other, I will write them a letter, which you shall take yourself, and you will find that I have bespoke you kind entertainment. Thanks, noble sir, many hearty thanks, rejoined the old knight's nephew, Wait for a time I must, for I will not go, solitary and unprepared. I must have horses and men and arms of the new fashion. I must also sell some acres of new cops, and some tons of old wine, to equip me for my journey. Well then, ere you go, you shall hear more from me, replied Hal of Hadnock. And now, good Richard, let us talk more of the folks in the hall. I would fain hear farther. This Sir Harry Dacre, his face pleases me. There is thought and a high heart therein or I read not nature's book aright. Methinks, if he were wise, he too would seek renown in arms, instead of dangling at a lady's side that loves him not. Perchance, if he were to seem to cast her by as worthless, and fix on honour for a mistress, her love, for who can tell all the wild whimsies of a capricious woman's heart, would follow him. He might think that worse than the other, said Woodville. I do not think he seeks her love. Then he is wrong answered his companion, for it is against all rule of philosophy, when we are bound by a chain we cannot break, to let it rust and canker in our flesh. It is well to polish it with any soft thing we can find, and, granted that she has lost his love, twere well he should have hers, if she is to be his wife. Perhaps he may long to break the chain, replied Richard dryly. Were both to seek it, such contracts have been annulled by law, and by the church ere now, and the Pope, or at least his cardinals, are not always stubborn against gold and reason. But I doubt she will consent, he added. She loves a captive, and if she sees he seeks his freedom, she will resist, of course. A most sweet temper, observed Hal of Hadnock, yet it is to be thought of, and if I can help him, I will. Tomorrow, early, indeed. I thought to speed me back to Westminster, 
but I will stay an hour or two, and see if I cannot play with a capricious lady, with art equal to her own. At all events, I shall learn more of what are her designs. Designs? She has none! exclaimed Richard of Woodville, but to reign and triumph for the hour. Here has been Simeon of Roydon doing her homage during these three days, as if she were the queen of love and she has smiled upon him, for she still fancied she can so give Dacre pain. But no sooner did you come than she turned all the archery of her eyes on you. Yet left a blank target, replied Hal of Hadnock. But of this, Sir Simeon of Roydon, I would have honest men beware, my good friend. I know something of him. And he of you, answered Woodville. I, answered his companion, what makes you fancy so? "'Why, I, too, am one of those who use their eyes, fair sir,' said Woodville. "'And not their tongues, good friend,' rejoined the other. "'Well, you are wise. But tell me, did not Sir Harry Dacre go with the Duke of Clarence into France?' "'Yes, it was there he gained his spurs last year,' answered Richard. "'He fought well, too, at Bramham Moor, and earlier still, when a mere boy against the Scots, when they last broke in, much hath Scotland for law, but at last what before?' and little prize won. "'I thought I had heard of him,' replied Hal of Hadnock. "'However, if you hold your mind to go to-morrow, we will ride together, and can talk further of these matters by the way. So, for the present, good night, and fair dreams attend you.' "'I must go and bid one of the men sleep across your door,' said Richard of Woodville, "'though this house is safe enough, yet it is as well always to be careful.' "'It matters not, it matters not,' answered his companion. I have never found a man against whom my own hand could not keep my head or my heart. As for your heart, sir, rejoined Woodville, laughing, you may yet find a woman who will teach you better. I know not, replied Hal of Hadnock, laughing. I am strong there, too, but no one can tell what is written in the stars. And thus they parted. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four The Glutton Mass. Breakfast was over, and yet between the lower edge of the sun and the gentle sweeping line of the hills above which he was rising, not more than two hand breadths of golden sky could be seen, for our ancestors were still, at that period, a matutinal people rising generally before the peep of day, and hearing the bird's first song. On a large smooth green at the back of the hall, yet within the limits of the park by which it was surrounded, with Dunbury Hill and the lines of the ancient invaders' camp at the top, rising still grey and cold before their eyes, the group which we have described in the second chapter, with the exception of the abbot, was assembled to practice or to witness some of the sports of the day. The ladies, having their heads now covered with the strange and somewhat cumbrous quaffs then worn, stood upon a stone-paved path watching the proceedings of their male companions, and with them appeared good Sir Philip Beecham, in a long furred gown, with Hal of Hadnock, talking gaily to Catherine on his right hand. "'Well pitched, Hugh of Clatford,' cried the old knight. "'Well pitched. A toy's beyond Sir Simeon.' "'I will beat him by two, answered Richard of Woodville, "'taking the heavy iron bar which they were engaged in casting. "'Here goes!' "'And after balancing it for a moment in his hand, "'he tossed it high in the air, "'sending it several yards beyond any one "'who had yet played their part. "'Will you not try your arm, noble sir?' "'asked Sir Philip, turning to Hal of Hadnock. "'Willingly, willingly,' replied their guest. "'But Sir Henry Dacre has not yet shown his skill.' "'He will not do much,' said Catherine Beecham, in a low tone. "'Fie, Kate!' cried Isabel, who overheard her. "'That is untrue, as well as unkind.' As she spoke, Dacre took the bar, which had been brought back by one of the pages, and, without pausing to poise it carefully, as the rest had done, cast it within a foot or two of the spot which it had reached, when sent from the hand of Woodville. Hal of Hadnock then advanced— "'looking round with a gay laugh to the ladies and saying, "'I am upon my mettle before such bright eyes. "'Here, boy, give me the bar.' "'The page placed it in his hand, "'and setting his right foot upon the mark where the others had stood, 
he swung himself gracefully backward and forward on one leg for a moment and then tossed the bar in air so light so easy was his whole movement that no one expected to see the iron to go half the distance it had done before but to the surprise of all it flew from his hand as if expelled from some of the military engines of the day and striking the ground full twenty paces farther than it had yet done bounded up off the sword and rolled on beyond well delivered well delivered exclaimed sir philip beecham and the men and boys around clapped their bands and cried hurrah i will send it farther or break my arm cried richard of woodville if you do i will beat you by a toys replied hal of hadnock laughing but they all strove in vain no one could toss the bar within several yards of the stranger's mark and now for a leaping bar cried hal of hadnock oh there stands one by the trees away woodville place it how high you will i will beat you at that noble sir said young hugh of clatford who was reported the best jumper and runner in the country and should you do so i will give you a quiver of arrows with peacock's feathers rejoined the gentleman now take it in turns i will leap last sir simeon of roydon declined the sport however and sir harry dacre stood back but clatford and others of the old knight's retainers took their stations as well as richard of woodville and the bar having been placed in the notches each took a run and leapt some touching it with their feet some clearing it clean hal of hadnock then gave a gay smile to his fair companions with whom he had for the time resumed his place and advancing at a walk as if to put the pole up higher he quickened his pace at the distance of three or four steps and cleared it by several inches you try him higher hugh cried richard of woodville laughing i have done my best good faith where will you put it asked the traveller turning to the young retainer of the house oh at the highest notch answered hugh of clatford lifting up the bar can you do that sir i will see replied hal of hadnock stand back a bit and taking a better start he ran and went over with an inch to spare poor hugh was less fortunate however for though he nearly accomplished the leap he tipped the bar with his heel cast it down and overthrowing his own balance fell upon his face amidst the laughter of his comrades he rose somewhat abashed with bloody marks of his contact with the ground but hal of hadnock laid his hand kindly on his arm saying thou art a nimble fellow on my life i did not know there was a man in england could go so near me as thou hast done here my friend thy sheaf of arrows is well won and he poured some pieces of gold into his hand the words were more gratifying to the good yeoman than the money and bowing low he answered i was sure you were no ordinary leaper sir for few can go higher than i can oh i am called deersfoot cried hal of hadnock laughing get in and wash your face for you have done well and need not be ashamed to show it some other sports succeeded but the stranger took no further part therein resuming his place by catherine's side apparently greatly smitten with her charms the weak vain girl flattered by his attention gave way to all the coquetry of her nature made her fine eyes use their whole artillery of glances whispered and smiled and spoke soft and sometimes sighed till the good old knight sir philip not the best pleased with his niece's demeanour broke off the amusements of the morning exclaiming to the mass to the mass sirs it's high time that we were on our way the sports then immediately ceased and passing through the great hall the courtyard and the gates the whole party arranged two and two walked on amidst the neighbouring woods towards the parish church hal of hadnock kept his place by catherine's side and sir harry dacre followed with isabel but somewhat to richard of woodville's annoyance sir philip beecham retained mary markham to himself while his nephew and sir simeon of roydon came after neither perhaps in the best of humours the noble party found the church crowded with the villagers every woman having her basket with her covered with a clean white napkin but apparently crammed as full as it well could be and hal of hadnock remembered that as his companion had said the night before this was one of the days appointed for those festivals which were then called glutton masses when the service was over old sir philip advanced to leave the building with his household not approving the disgraceful scene that was about to take place but hal of hadnock whispered to his companion of the road 
Let us stay and see. I have never witnessed one of these feats of gormandizing. Well, we shall save the credit of the family, replied Richard of Woodville in a low tone, for the good priest looks upon my uncle as half a lollard, because he will not stay in the church and eat till he bursts in honour of the Blessed Virgin. Hal of Hadnock and his new friend accordingly lingered behind, and hardly had the old knight passed through the doors when a scene of confusion took place quite indescribable. Everyone brought forward their basket. Some who had lost their store hunted for it among the rest. Some hurried forward to present what they considered very choice viands to the priest. Many a pannier was overturned, and chickens, capons, huge lumps of meat, and leathern bottles of wine, mead, and ale rolled upon the pavement. One or two of the latter got uncorked, and the contents streamed about amongst the napkins, which several of the women were spreading forth upon the ground. Knives were brandished, thumbs and fingers were cut, one man nearly poked out the eye of his better half by giving her assistance, and was heartily cuffed for his pains, and a fat chorister slipped in consequence of putting his foot upon a fine trout dressed in jelly, and fell prostrate on his back in the midst. The people roared, the priest himself chuckled, and was a long time ere he could get his flock or his countenance in due order. A song to the Virgin was then sung by way of grace, and every one fell to with an intention of outdoing his neighbour. To Richard of Woodville and his companion were assigned the places of honour near the clergy, and the priest, looking well pleased down the long aisle, literally encumbered with the preparations for excess, "'whispered to the old knight's nephew with an air of triumph. "'Well, I think we shall outdo well at this time, at least.' "'Undoubtedly,' replied Richard of Woodville gravely, "'but I fear you will think my friend and me no better than heathens, "'having brought nothing with us either to eat or drink.' "'Poh, there is plenty, there is plenty,' replied the good man, "'and to spare. Eat as hard as we can. "'We shall be scarcely able to get through it.' and it is fitting, too, that something be left for the poor. We will all do our best, however, and thank you for your help. The onslaught was tremendous. One would have thought that the congregation had fasted for a month, so eagerly, so rapidly did they devour the provisions before them. And then they took to their bottles and drinking horns, and when they had assuaged their thirst, recommenced the attack upon the meat with renewed vigour. Richard of Woodville and Hal of Hadnock had soon seen enough of the glutton mass, and, at a hint from his companion, the former took an opportunity of whispering to the priest, "'We must go, I fear, lest my uncle be angry at our absence.' "'Well, well,' said the worthy clerk, "'if it must be so, we cannot help it. But tis a sad pity, Master Richard, that so good a man as the Knight of Dunbury should be such a discourager of pious ordinances.' "'It is indeed,' answered Woodville, in a solemn tone. "'But all men have their prejudices, and you know, father, he loves the church.' "'Aye, that he does, that he does,' replied the other heartily. "'He sent me two fat bucks last summer.' "'Oh, yes, he loves the church, he loves the church,' rejoined Woodville, "'and gliding quietly down the side-aisle, "'so that he might not disturb any of the congregation in their devout exercise of the jaws.' He left the building, accompanied by Hal of Hadnock. Both laughed as soon as they were out of the church, but the guest of Sir Philip Beecham soon fell into deep thought, and after walking forward for a little distance, he observed, "'It is strange how men are inclined to make religion subservient to all their appetites. What are such things as these? What are many of our solemn customs but the self-same idolatrous rites practised by the ancient pagans?' who deified their passions and their follies, and then took the simplest means of worshipping them. What can be the cause of such perversity? "'The devil, the devil,' answered Richard of Woodville, "'he who leads every one from one wickedness to another, "'who first teaches man to infringe God's commandment "'in order to gratify some desire, "'and then, as that desire grows fat and strong upon indulgence, first persuades us that its gratification is pleasing to God,' and in the end makes us worship it as a god. "'But yet these same good folks fast and mortify themselves at certain times,' said Hal of Hadnock, "'and then carouse and revel as if they had won a right to excess.' "'To make up for lost time,' said Woodville. "'But the truth is, 
It is like a man playing at cross and pile, who, when he has lost one stake, tries to clear off the score against him by doubling the next. We have all sins enough to atone for, and we play the penance against the indulgence, and the indulgence against the penance. Give me the man who always mortifies himself in all that is wrong, who fasts from anger, malice, backbiting, lying, and uncharitableness, who denies himself at all times excess in anything, and holds a festival every day with gratitude to God for that which he, in his bounty, is pleased to give him. But, after all, it is very natural that these corruptions should take place, even in a faith like ours. Depend upon it, the purer a religion is, the more strong will be the efforts of Sathanus to pervert it, so that men may walk along his broad high road while they think they are taking the way to everlasting salvation. "'There is truth in that, good Richard,' replied his companion. "'But I fear me you have caught some of the doctrines of the Lollards of whom you were speaking.' "'Not a whit,' answered Woodville. "'I am a good Catholic Christian.' "'but I may see the evils which men have brought into the church "'without thinking ill of the church itself, "'just as when looking at the abbey down yonder "'I see that a foolish architect from France "'has changed two of the fine old round arches "'which were built in King Stephen's time "'to smart pointed windows all bedizened with I don't know what "'without thinking the abbey anything but a fine building notwithstanding. Although Richard of Woodville would not admit that any impression had been made upon him by the preaching of the Lollards, certain it is that the teaching of Wycliffe and his disciples had led men generally to look somewhat narrowly into the superstitious practices of the day, and that the minds of many were imbued with the spirit of the doctrines, who, either from prejudice, timidity, or conviction, would not adopt the doctrines themselves. Nor was the effect transitory, for it lasted till, and prepared the way for, the Reformation. In a thoughtful mood, both the young gentlemen proceeded on their way through the wood, and on their arrival at the hall found Sir Philip Beecham and the rest of his family and guests already seated at the early dinner of those days. The old knight received their excuses in good part, laughed at Hall of Hadnock's curiosity to see a glutton mass, and insisted he should sit down and finish his meal with him. "'Had you been at Andover yesterday,' he said, "'you might have seen another strange sight, "'the mare sit in the stocks, "'and a justice on either side of him.' "'Indeed,' cried Hallef Hadnock seriously, "'that were a strange sight to see. "'Pray, on whose authority was it done, "'and what was the crime these magistrates committed?' "'Good truth, I know not,' answered Sir Philip. "'A party of wild young men, they say, did it. "'And as for the crime, it is not specified.' "'But on my life it was justice, though a rash kind, "'for Master Havering, the mayor, has worked well for such a punishment, "'though, belike, the hands that put him in were not the best fitted for the office.' "'I should think not, certainly,' replied Hall of Hadnock, in the same grave tone, "'and with an immovable countenance, "'though Richard of Woodville, who had contrived to seat himself next to Mary Markham on the other side of the board, "'gave him a merry glance of the eye, as if he suspected more than he chose to say.' When the meal was over, which was not speedily, Hallef had not proposed to take his departure, but Sir Philip, with all courtesy, besought him at least to stay till the afternoon meal, or supper, then usually served at four o'clock, with the hospitable intent of urging him afterwards to spend another night under his roof, and in the meantime he promised to show him his armoury, his horses, and his library, though, to say the truth, the suits of rich armour were more numerous than the books, and the horses more in number than the people who frequented the library. Hal of Hadnock, for reasons of his own, accepted the invitation, and Richard of Woodville, though his approaching departure was already announced, agreed to stay in order to bear him company when he went. I will not lead the patient reader through all the rooms of the hall, or detain him with a description of the armoury and its contents, or carry him to the stable and show him all the horses of the good old knight, Sir Philip, from the battle-horse, which had borne him through many a stricken field in former days, to the ambling palfrey of his daughter Isabel. Hall of Hadnock, indeed, submitted to all this with a good grace, for he was a kind-hearted and considerate person, and little doubted that his friend Richard of Woodville was employing the precious moments to the best advantage with fair Mary Markham. To all these sights, with the discussion of sundry knotty points, regarding shields and pallets and unibers, 
and properties of horses and the form and extent of the manifair were given well nigh two hours and when hal of hadnock and his noble host returned to the great hall they found it tenanted alone by catherine beecham and sir simeon of roydon richard and dacre isabel and mary the lady said were gone to walk together in the park but she had waited she added with a coquettish air thinking it but courtesy to give her uncle's honoured guest a companion if he chose to join them so direct an invitation was of course not to be refused by hal of hadnock and he thanked her with highly coloured gallantry for her consideration do you go too sir simeon inquired sir philip beecham but the courtly knight replied that he had only waited to take his leave as he had business to transact in the neighbourhood and must be home ere night before Catherine and her companion set out, however, Sir Simeon drew her aside as the relationship in which she stood towards him seemed to justify, and spoke to her for a moment eagerly. A few of his words caught the quick ear of Hal of Hadnock as he stood talking to the old knight, who took care to impress him with the knowledge that his fair niece was fully betrothed to Sir Harry Dacre, and though those words were apparently of small import, Hal of Hadnock remembered them long after. "'I will tell you all, if you come,' replied Sir Simeon, to some question the lady had asked. "'But mind, I warn you. Will you come?' "'I do not know,' answered Catherine, with a toss of her head. "'It is your business to wait and see.' "'Wait, I cannot,' rejoined the knight. "'See, I will.' And the lady, turning to her uncle and his companion, accompanied the latter through a long passage at the back of the hall— to the door which led to the ground where the sports of the morning had taken place. The park of Dunbury was very like that described by old Chaucer. Quote, a park enclosed with a wall, la compass round, and by a gate small, who so that he would freely might and gone into this park, walled with green stone. The soil was plain and smooth, and wonders soft, all overspread with tappets that nature had made herself covered eke aloft with bowers green and flurries for to cure that in their beauty they may long endure End quote. the walks around were numerous and somewhat intricate and whether fair catherine beecham knew or not the direction that her friends had taken she certainly did not follow the path most likely to lead to where they really were but as she and Hal of Hadnock walked along, she employed the time to the best advantage in carrying on the siege of his heart. He, for his part, humoured her to the full. Having a firm conviction that it would be far better, both for Sir Harry Dacre and herself, that the imperfect marriage between them should be annulled at their mutual desire, than remain a chain upon them, only increasing in weight. It must not indeed be supposed that he took any very deep interest in the matter, but, as it fell in his way, he was willing enough to forward what he believed to be a noble-minded man's desire for emancipation from a very bitter sort of thraldom. And it is seldom an unpleasant or laborious task for a light-hearted man to sport with a capricious girl. Thus went he on, then, with that mixture of romantic gallantry and teasing jest, which is, of all things, the most exciting to the mind of a coquette with sufficient admiration to soothe her vanity, but with not sufficient devotion ever to allow her to imagine that her triumph is complete. Neither did he let her gain any advantage, for though it was evident that she clearly perceived the name he had assumed was not his own, he gave her no information, playing with her curiosity without gratifying it. "'But what makes you think,' he asked, "'that I am other than I seem? Why should I not be plain Hal of Hadnock?' "'a poor gentleman from the Welsh marshes. "'Oh, no, no, no,' she said. "'It is not so. "'A thousand things prove it. First, manners, appearance, dress. "'Why, are you not as fine as my good cousin "'a dozen times removed, Sir Simeon of Royden, "'the pink of court gallants?' "'And yet I have heard that he is not as rich as an abbot,' "'replied Hal of Hadnock. "'No, in truth,' answered Catherine, "'he is as poor as a verger.' and, like the curlew, carries all his fortune on his back, I believe. I suspect not his own fortune only, rejoined her companion, but a part of other men's. But then your knightly spurs, good sir, continued Kate, returning to the point. You must be Sir Hal of Hadnock at the least. 
Now I never heard of that name amongst our chivalry, and I am deep read in the rolls of knighthood. Oh, I am newly dubbed, replied the gentleman, laughing. But you shall know all some day, Lady Fair. I shall know very soon, answered Catherine, for Simeon of Roydon will tell me. More, perhaps, than he knows himself, said Hal of Hadnock. Oh, he knows well enough, exclaimed Catherine Beecham. He has already told me that you are a man of noble birth and high estate, and promised to speak the name, but I would rather owe it to your courtesy than his. Nay, what would I not do for the love of your bright eyes? asked Hal of Hadnock, in a tone half tender, half jesting. Methinks the light in them, even now, looks like the morning sun reflected from a dewdrop in a violet. But why should I tell you aught? I have been warned that you are another's. Out upon such cold contracts that bind unwilling hearts together. It is clear there is no great love in your heart for this Sir Harry Dacre. Not too much to lie comfortably in a hazelnut, answered Catherine. Then why do you not ask to have the marriage annulled? demanded her companion. There never yet was a bond in which the keen eyes of the court of Rome could not find a flaw. Why, it would grieve his proud heart sadly, replied the lady, yet I have often thought of it. If he be proud, and so he is, rejoined Hal of Hadnock, he would never refuse to consent, however much it might vex him. Well, well, set yourself free from him, and then you shall know who I am. As for this fellow Royden, he knows nothing, and will but lead you wrong. But were I you, I would be a free woman ere a year were over, and then this fair hand were a prize well worth the winning, to higher hearts than a Dacre or a Royden. With such conversation they wandered on for some time without overtaking the party they had come out to seek. They saw them once at some great distance, indeed, through the overhanging boughs of an opposite alley just fringed with early leaves, but they did not hurry their pace, and only met them at length at the door of the hall as they were all returning. Sir Henry Dacre was then walking by Isabel's side, with his arms crossed upon his chest and his brow sad and stern. As soon as he saw Catherine and her companion, he fixed his eyes inquiringly upon her, and seemed to mark her heightened colour and somewhat excited look, then fell into thought again, and then laid his hand upon her arm, saying, "'I will speak with you for a moment, Kate.' "'It must not be long,' she replied coldly, "'for I have dipped my feet in the dew and would fain dry them.' "'It shall not be long,' answered Sir Henry Dacre, and he remained with her behind, while the rest entered slowly. Ere they had passed the door, the anxious ear of Isabel heard high tones without, and in a few minutes, as they paused for a moment in the hall, where the servants were already spreading the board for supper, Sir Henry entered with a hasty step. "'My horse to the gate,' he said, addressing one of the attendants. "'At what hour, Sir Knight?' answered the servant. "'Directly,' answered Dacre. "'The men can follow. Farewell, dear Isabel,' he continued, turning to Catherine's cousin. "'I can stay no longer. Farewell, Mary.' He grasped Richard of Woodville's hand, but said nothing, and with a low and formal bow to Hal of Hadnock turned towards the door leading to the court. Isabel Beecham followed him quietly, laid her hand upon his arm and spoke eagerly, but in a low tone. "'I cannot, I cannot, Isabel,' he replied aloud. "'Dear girl, do not urge me. I shall forget myself. I shall go mad. Excuse me to your noble father. Farewell.' and opening the large door he issued forth and closed it behind him. Isabel Beecham turned with her eyes full of tears, but passing the rest silently, as if afraid to speak, she hurried to her own chamber, wept for a few minutes, and then sought her father. The supper that day was a grave and silent meal. There was a stern cloud on old Sir Philip Beecham's brow when he came down to the hall, and as he took his seat he asked, looking round, "'Where is Catherine?' "'I know not,' answered Mary Markham. "'But she went to her own chamber when she came in. "'Shall I seek the lady, sir?' asked one of the retainers of the house from the lower part of the table. "'No, let her be,' replied the old knight. And then he murmured, "'Perhaps she has still some shame, and if so, it is well.' To Hal of Hadnock his demeanour was courteous, though so grave, that his guests could not but feel that some share in the disagreeable event which had evidently taken place— was attributed to him, and though he knew that his intention was good, yet, like many another man, he had reason to feel sorry that he had meddled in other men's affairs at all. 
Supper was nearly over. The light was beginning to wane in the sky, and the stranger was thinking it was time to depart, when the porter's boy came into the hall, and approaching Richard of Woodville, whispered something in his ear. The young gentleman instantly rose and went out into the court, but returned a moment after and spoke a word to Hal of Hadnock, who started up and followed him. In the court they found a man booted and spurred and dusty from the road, holding by the bridle a horse, with one leg bent, and the head bowed down, as if exhausted by long exercise. The man instantly uncovered his head, when he saw the gentleman appear, and throwing down the bridle advanced a step, while Hadnock gave him a quick sign which he seemed to comprehend. "'Your presence is required immediately, sir,' he said, without adding any name. "'Your father is ill, very ill, and I have lost some hours in seeking you. "'I heard of you, however, at Andover, then at the Abbey, "'then at the priest's house in the village, "'and ventured on here, as tis matter of life and death.' "'You did right,' said Hal of Hadnock, briefly, "'but with deep anxiety on his face. "'Ill, say you? Very ill? And I go away. "'Why, I left him better.' "'One of those fits again, sir,' answered the man. "'For an hour he was thought dead, but had regained his speech when I set out. "'Yet the leeches much fear—' "'I come, I come,' answered Hal of Hadnock. "'Speed on before. I will be in London ere daybreak. "'Change your horse often, and lose no time. "'Buy a stout horse wherever you can find one, and have him ready for me on Murrell Green. "'Away, good fellow. Say that I am coming. "'Richard, I must go at once.' "'Well, I will with you, sir,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'You go to bid my uncle adieu. "'I will order out the horses.' "'So be it,' answered Hal of Hadnock. "'You shall be my guide, for I must not miss my way.' "'And after giving the messenger some money, "'he turned and re-entered the hall. "'End of chapter 4《Of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 The Assassination Clouds had again come over the heavens as day declined, and the light had nearly faded from the sky. But yet the horses of Hal of Hadnock and Richard of Woodville had not appeared in the courtyard, and the former showed great anxiety to proceed at once. His gaiety was gone, and he stood either playing in deep thought with the hilt of his dagger, the sheath of which hung from a ring in the centre of his belt, or listening for the horses, with his ear turned towards the door of the hall. "'I fear, sir, the news you have received are bad,' said old Sir Philip Beecham, who, with the rest of the party, had by this time risen from table. "'A father's perilous sickness, noble Sir Philip,' answered Hal of Hadnock, one who might have been kinder indeed, but still the tidings must ever be sad ones to a son's heart. I wonder that the horses be not ready. Go, Hugh, and see, replied Richard of Woodville, but a serving man, who had entered the moment before, stopped the messenger, saying, They will be here in a minute, sir. A shoe was found loose on the gentleman's steed, and John the Smith has had to fasten it. Well, Dick, thou goest in good earnest at last, said the old knight, turning to his nephew. "'and on my life I think it is the best thing thou canst do. "'Thou art a good soldier, and wilt raise thyself to renown. "'I need not tell thee what thy duties are, "'but thou must take a horse and arms of thine old uncle, "'whom thou mayst never see again, perchance. "'Choose them for thyself, boy. "'Thou wilt find wherewithal in that purse.' "'And he placed a full one in his nephew's hand. "'As my good brother, the abbot, is not here, "'thou must content thyself with my benison. Be it upon thee, Richard. Love thy king, thy country, and thine honour, but above all things love God, fear his anger, hope in his mercy, trust in his promises, and submit thine own reason in all things to his word. So shalt thou prosper in this world, so shalt thou be meet for another. The young man caught his uncle's hand and kissed it, and the old knight pressed him for a moment in his arms. Here, Richard, take this gift of me said Isabel. "'Tis but a jewel for your baldric. Mary Markham did not speak, but after he had pressed his lips on Isabel's cheek, she offered hers silently, placing a ring in his hand. "'I will bear it to honour and win you yet, Mary,' said Woodville, in a low voice, as he took his parting kiss, and he felt that her cheek was wet with tears. 
"'Hark, there are the horses, noble sir,' exclaimed Hal of Hadnock, turning to Sir Philip. "'Once more, farewell. Your nephew shall give you further news of me, and may one day clear me in your eyes for somewhat you have thought amiss.' Then, bidding the ladies adieu, he turned to the hall door and mounted with a princely largesse to the servants of the house. Richard of Woodville followed, sprang on his horse's back, and giving one look back, rode through the gates after his companion. The wood was dark and sombre as they proceeded amidst its thick coverts, but when they issued forth, a faint glimmer of twilight served to guide them on the way, and they quickened their pace. There were lights in the windows of the cottages, too, as they passed through the village, and when they reached the other side, they caught a pale line of yellow light, peeping out from beneath the dark clouds upon the edge of the western sky, and gilding the water of the stream. Riding on quickly, they had not left the last house behind them five minutes, when Hal of Hadnock pulled up his horse short, exclaiming, "'Hark! There is a scream!' "'Tis but a screech owl," answered Richard of Woodville. "'They come forth in spring.' But as he spoke, there was another shriek, apparently before them, and each struck his horse with the spur and dashed on. No other sound met their ear, however, except what seemed the distant galloping of a horse, which might be but the echo of their own beast's feet. When they reached the spot where, on the preceding night, they had seen the wild fire over the moor, Hal of Hadnock again drew in his rein, saying, "'It came from somewhere here.' "'It seemed to me near where we then were,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'Perchance t'was just some villagers got drunk at that glutton mass. See, there is the otter again.' "'It was a shriek of pain or terror,' answered his companion. "'Otter! That is no otter! Here, hold my horse!' And springing from the saddle in a moment, he dashed down the bank and plunged into the river. Though shallow in most places, it there formed a deep pool, but Hal of Hadnock, expert in all exercises alike, struck out at once and caught the object he had seen, just as it was sinking. A feeling of horror and alarm seized him, as his hand grasped the long hair of a woman, but raising her head above the water, he held it gently on his left arm, and with his right swam in towards the shore. "'Here, help, Richard,' he cried. "'Set the horses free and take her. "'Tis a woman.' Woodville was down the bank in a moment, exclaiming, "'Who is it? Who is it?' "'I know not,' answered Hal of Hadnock, raising her so far above the water that his companion could grasp her in his arms and lift her out. But as he himself followed, placing one knee on the shore— with a sad heart he heard his companion exclaim, in the accents of deep grief, "'Good heaven! It is Catherine!' "'Quick, bear her to the nearest house,' cried Hal of Hadnock. "'The spark of life may be still there. I will follow with the horses.' "'Up the short path to the right lies the chanters,' cried Richard, raising the unhappy girl in his stout arms, and running along the road. The horses were easily caught, and mounting one and leading the other, Hal of Hadnock followed, obtaining a glance of his companion, just as he turned from the highway, towards a spot where the thatch of a small house peeped up above some trees. He was at the door as soon as Woodville, and lifting the latch they both went in. An old man and woman were sitting before the fire, but the sudden entrance of two men roused them in fear, and when they saw who it was and what they bore, all was eager hurry and lamentation. The inanimate body of Catherine Beecham, however, was speedily laid in the old chanter's bed, in the neighbouring chamber, and such simple means as first suggested themselves were employed to ascertain if life was still within that fair and silent frame. But she lay calm and still as if in sleep, with her features full of a sweet placidity, such as they had seldom worn in life. "'It is past,' said Richard of Woodville. "'It is past. Poor girl! How has this happened?' "'Ha! There is the mark of a grasp upon her throat.' "'See there, too,' cried Hal of Hadnock, as he pointed with his hand to where, upon the fine lawn that covered her bosom, was a faint red stain, half washed out by the water of the stream, as if blood had been spilt. No wound, however, was to be discovered, and while the two gentlemen stood and gazed, the old chanter's sister continued, ineffectually, to employ every effort to reawaken the inanimate frame— and the old man himself ran off to the abbey to procure farther aid. "'Go into the other room, sirs, go into the other room,' said the good dame at length. "'I will take off her wet clothes. "'Tis that keeps her from coming too.' Hal of Hadnock shook his head, for he could not see that pale countenance, 
those immovable lips, those sightless eyes, without feeling sure, too sure, that life had departed for ever. He would not say anything, however, to discourage the zeal of the poor woman, and he accordingly accompanied Richard of Woodville into the chamber which they had first entered, and stood with him in silent thought before the fire. Neither spoke, for the mind of each was busy with sad and dark inquiries, regarding the event which had just taken place, yet neither could arrive at anything like a conclusion. Was it her own act? Was it accident? Was it the deed of another? And if so, of whom? Such were the questions which both asked themselves. Both, too, entertained suspicions, but yet they did not like even to admit those suspicions to their own hearts, for how often does the first conclusion of guilt do injustice to the innocent? But while they were still in thought, the voice of the chanter's sister was heard exclaiming, "'Come hither, Master Richard, come hither, see here!' And as they entered, she pointed to the poor girl's arm, which now lay uncovered on the bedclothes, adding, "'There is the grasp of a hand, clear enough. Look, all the fingers and the thumb.' "'Stay,' said Hal of Hadnock, "'that might be mine, Richard, or yours, in raising her out of the stream.' "'I took her by the other arm,' answered Richard of Woodville. "'And I do not remember having touched her arm at all,' said Hal of Hadnock, after thinking for a moment. "'Oh, no, sirs,' cried the old woman. "'That hand must have grasped her in life, else it would not have brought the blood to the skin. "'Hark, there are the people coming.' And in another minute the good old abbot and four or five of his monks ran in, breathless and scared. "'Alas, alas, Richard, what is this?' cried the abbot. "'A sad and dark affair, father,' replied Richard of Woodville, while one of the monks, famed for his skill in leechcraft, advanced to the bedside and put his hand upon the heart. "'I fear life is extinct.' The abbot gazed at the monk as he knelt, but the good brother slowly waved his head, with a melancholy look, saying, "'Yet leave me and the old woman alone with her.' "'I will stay and aid,' replied the abbot. "'I am her uncle.' All the rest withdrew, and many were the eager questions of the monks as to how the accident had happened. Richard of Woodville told the tale simply as it was, the two shrieks that they had heard, the discovery of the body in the water, and its recovery from the stream. Ay, she screamed when she fell in, and when she first rose, said one of the monks, drowning people always do. Woodville made no reply, for he would not give his own suspicions to others, but Hal of Hadnock asked him in a low voice, "'Did you not hear the galloping of a horse on the other side as we came near?' "'I did,' answered Richard, in the same tone. "'I did, too plainly.' In about a quarter of an hour the abbot came forth, and all made way for him. "'What hope?' asked Woodville, looking into his uncle's face for speedier information. "'None,' replied the abbot. "'How has this chance, my son? There are marks of violence.' The same tale was told over again, but this time Richard of Woodville added the fact of a horse's feet having been heard, and the abbot mused profoundly. "'I will have the body carried down to the abbey,' he said at length. "'You, Richard, speed to my brother and break the tidings there. Come down with him to the abbey, and we will consult. Bring Dacre, too.' "'Dacre has been gone more than two hours,' answered Richard of Woodville, "'but I will seek my uncle Philip.' And he turned towards the door. Hal of Hadnock stayed him for a moment, however, saying, "'I must ride on, Richard. You know that my call hence admits of no delay. But let every one remark and remember, for this matter must be inquired into, that I heard and saw all that this good friend of mine did. The shrieks, the galloping of a horse, the body in the water. You shall have means of finding me, too, should it be needful. And now, my lord abbot, a sad good night. Farewell, Richard. You shall hear from me soon.' Thus saying, he quitted the cottage, mounted his horse, and rode away at a quick pace. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Agincourt, A Romance, by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Suspicions Upon the borders of Hampshire and Sussex, but still within the former county, lies, as the reader probably knows, a large tract of land, but little cultivated even now, and which in the days whereof I speak was covered either with scattered trees and copses, or wild heath, having various paths and roads winding through it, which led now to a solitary village with a patch of cultivated land round about it, 
now to a church or chapel in the wild, now travelled on through the hills which are high and bare to Winchester or Basingstoke. Deep sand occupies a great portion of the ground through which it is well nigh impossible to construct a firm road, and the whole country is broken with wild and rapid undulations of no great height or depth, but every variety of form, the resort of all those rare birds which afforded so much interest and amusement to gentle white of Selborne. Through this rude and uncultivated track a little before the close of day, in the beginning of April 1413, two gentlemen clothed in deep mourning of the fashion of the day rode slowly on. Both were very grave and silent, and if the complexion of their thought was sad and solemn, the aspect of the scene at that hour was not calculated to lighten the heart, though it might arouse feelings of admiration. The sun hung upon the edge of the sky, broad masses of cloud floated over the wide expanse of azure, which stretched out above the wild heath, and their shadows, as they crossed the slanting rays, swept over the varied surface below, casting long lines of country into deep blue shade, while the rest shone in the cool, pale evening sunshine of the yet unconfirmed spring. Each dell and pit, too, at that hour, was filled with the same sort of purple shadow, the braes and banks looked wilder and more strongly marked from the position of the sun. The occasional clumps of fir trees cut sharp and black upon the western sky, and everything was stern and grand and solemn. Rising over one slope and descending another, by paths cut imperfectly through the heath and gorse, the travellers had ridden on for half an hour without speaking, when at length at the bottom of a deep valley where the sun could no longer be seen, and the shades of evening seemed already to have fallen, they stopped to let their horses drink in a large piece of water, sheltered by a thick copse, and gazed upon the reflection of the blue sky above and the clouds floating over it. As they moved on again, a large white bird started up from the reeds and flew heavily away, with its snowy plumage strangely contrasting with the dark background of the wood and hill. "'Tis like a spirit winging its way from earth said Sir Henry Dacre, following the bird with his eyes. Poor Catherine, would that aught else had set thee free from the chain that bound thee to me, but death. Luckless girl indeed, replied Richard of Woodville, from her infancy unfortunate, and yet men thought that the hand of heaven had showered upon her its choicest gifts, beauty, wealth, kind friends, and a noble heart to love her, if she would but have welcomed it. But alas, Harry, the crowning gift of all was wanting, a spirit that could use God's blessing aright. It was more the fault of others than her own, said Sir Harry Dacre. That, I do believe, her mother made her what she was. Tis sad, tis very sad, Richard, that, at the period when we have no power to form ourselves, each weak fool who approaches us can give us some bad gift which we never can cast off. Like the evil fairies at a child's birth, answered Richard of Woodville, and certainly her mother was a bad demon to her. But still, though I would not speak ill of those who are gone, yet poor Kate received the gifts willingly enough, destructive as they were. Would to heaven it had been otherwise. But others encouraged her in all that was wrong, as well as her mother. This man, Royden, was no good counsellor for a lady's ear. The brow of Sir Henry Dacre grew dark as night. He is a scoundrel, he cried. He is a scoundrel, and if he ever gives me the chance of having him at my lance's point, he or I shall go to that place where all men's actions are made clear. Oh, that I knew the truth, Richard! Oh, that I knew the truth! There is one who knows it, answered Richard of Woodville, who never suffers foul deeds to rest in darkness. Trust to him, and if this knave does but support his charge— Perhaps your lance may be the avenging instrument of heaven. May it be so, replied the knight, but I doubt it, Richard. True, he has not shown himself a coward in the field, and yet I cannot but think that he is craven at heart. Saw you not how carefully his letter to Sir Philip was worded? How he insinuated more than he dared say? And then, why did he not come? A sickness, forsooth, the excuse of an idle schoolboy. He would not face me. That is the truth. He fears me, Richard, and will not dare the test of battle. Well, that we shall soon see, answered his companion. Your messenger must be at my house by this time with his reply. 
"'I trust so,' said Dacre thoughtfully. "'Yet he will take time to write carefully, believe me. "'His will be no rash epistle, written in fiery anger at his cousin's death. "'No, no, it will be done as if a scrivener had dictated every word, and in a courtly hand. "'But whatever he does, mark me, he will leave the poison behind, "'and so calculate as to cast suspicion over me for life.' "'But who suspects you, Dacre?' asked Richard of Woodville, with a smile. "'Not one honest man on earth. "'You are too well known for doubts to light upon you. "'Does not Sir Philip, her own uncle, love you as a son? "'And can you let the idle words of a knave like this disturb your peace?' "'My peace, Richard,' said Sir Henry Dacre, sadly. "'Can a high and honest heart ever feel peace so long as one doubt, "'one unrefuted charge, casts a cloud upon it?' I would rather die a thousand deaths than have men point at me and say he was suspected of a foul crime against an innocent lady. And besides, even those that I love best, those who hold me dearest, may often ask themselves, could it be true? Not a whit, replied Woodville. No one will ever ask such a thing. Like a wounded man, you think that everyone will touch the spot and feel the pain in fancy. Cast off such imaginations, Dacre. Secure in your own honour, laugh suspicion to scorn, and trust to the noble and the true to do justice to those who are like themselves. Would I could do so, Richard, said the knight, and it would be easy, too, did we not know that the wide world is so full of arrant knaves, and that amongst the knaves there are such hypocrites that honesty has no touchstone whereby true metal can be really known from false, and men rightly doubt the value of each coin they take. "'so cunning are the counterfeits. "'Hypocrisy is a greater curse to mankind than wickedness, "'for it makes all virtue doubted, "'and fills the bosoms of the good with suspicion "'from a knowledge of the feigning of the bad. "'Besides, amongst those who hold a middle course, "'neither plunging deep in the stream of vice and wrong, "'nor staying firmly on the shore of honour, "'how gladly every one attributes acts to others "'that may outdo the darkness of his own.' No, no, suspicion never yet lighted on a name that ever was wholly pure again. All I ask is to give me that man before me, let me cram the falsehood down his throat at the sword's point, and wring the truth from his dying lips, or let me die myself. Well, we shall see what he replies, answered Richard of Woodville, finding it useless to argue farther with him. And if, as you suspect, he evades the question, what think you then to do? "'To go with you to Burgundy,' answered Dacre, "'for I shall be, then, one fitted well to take a part in civil broils, "'a right serviceable man, where danger is rifest, "'ever ready to lead the way in peril, "'having nor wife, nor relative, nor friend, nor hope, nor home, "'to make him feel the stroke that takes his life, "'more than the scratch of a sharp thorn that tears him as he passes through the wood.' "'But you will surely first return,' said Woodville, "'to say farewell to my good uncle and sweet Isabel.' "'I do not know,' replied Dacre. "'Dear Isabel, she tried to cheer me, "'and I know would not for worlds suffer doubts of me "'to rest for one hour in her heart, "'and yet they will come and go, Richard, "'whether she will or not. "'Each time I take her hand she'll think of Catherine, "'and though she'll answer boldly, it is false, "'as often as suspicions rise.' "'yet they will be remembered and rest for ever "'as a shadow over our friendship.' "'You do her wrong, Harry,' answered his companion. "'Your mind is sickly, and as a man in a sore disease "'you see all things through one pale mist. "'Isabel may often think of her who is no more, "'may grieve for her, and regret that she did not make life happier "'to herself and others, and that she met so early and so sad a death, "'but she will ever call her back to mind, as one who wronged you, "'not as one wronged by you, and you may be happy yet.' "'He spoke gravely, and Sir Henry Dacre turned and gazed at him "'as if for explanation of his words. "'But Richard said no more, and riding on in silence "'they soon after came to a point where the road began to rise, "'winding in slowly between two wooded hills, "'with a small streamlet following on by its side. "'The sun was sinking below the horizon as they passed through a village.' with the bright blacksmith's forge jutting out beyond the other buildings, and when at length they drew the rain before the gate of a tall house bosomed in trees, it was well nigh dark. Several servants came instantly into the court, and giving their horses to be taken to the stable, 
the two gentlemen entered the outer hall, and thence proceeded onwards to a room beyond, where they were immediately joined by a stout man. Habited as a courier who placed a letter in the hand of Sir Henry Dacre, without speaking. "'So thou art back, Martin,' said the knight, while Richard of Woodville called for lights. "'Yes, noble sir,' answered the servant, "'but I have had to ride hard, for he kept me a long time, but that I don't wonder at.' "'Indeed,' exclaimed Sir Henry, "'why should he keep you long?' "'Because he wrote a long letter, sir,' replied the man. "'He might have waited till doomsday if he had been in my place, and I in his.' "'Did he look ill?' inquired the knight. "'Not he, sir,' answered the servant. "'He was out goshawking after larks when I arrived.' "'The liar!' muttered Sir Henry Dacre. "'But at the same moment lights were brought in, "'and making the messenger a sign to retire, "'the knight opened the letter and read. "'Richard of Woodville stood by and watched him "'while his fine features, as he gazed intently upon the paper, "'assumed first a look of scorn and then of anger, "'and at length he exclaimed, "'As I thought, Richard, as I thought. "'On my life, I must be an astrologer and not know it, "'to have read this man's conduct to the letter beforehand. "'Mark what he says. "'Sir Simeon of Royden brings no charge against Sir Henry Dacre, "'and never has brought any, "'but holds him as good knight and true. "'He has, therefore, no cause to quarrel with the said knight, "'but far from it, wishes him all prosperity, "'the which Sir Henry would have clearly seen.' if he had read carefully the letter which Sir Simeon wrote to the good knight of Dunbury, and had not looked at it rashly. Therein Sir Simeon thought to do Sir Henry Dacre an act of love and courtesy, by pointing out, he himself naught doubting, what might breed doubts in the hearts of other men, regarding the manner of the death of the Lady Catherine Beecham, in order that the good knight might make such inquiries as would remove all suspicion. For this cause he remarked, that he had only learned by hearsay that Sir Henry Dacre had, as unhappily often happened, a fierce quarrel with the Lady Catherine, about a gentleman, it was seen, calling himself Hal of Hadnock. "'Curses upon him!' cried Dacre, breaking off. "'Nay, nay, you do him wrong,' answered Richard of Woodville. "'He sought but to serve you, as I will tell you anon, Harry. But read on. What says he more?' "'That Sir Harry quitted the hall in bitter anger,' continued Dacre, reading, and swearing he should go mad with the lady's conduct. Did I say so? Woodville nodded his head, and his friend proceeded. That the said Sir Henry, though his house is distant but seven miles, did not reach his own door till the hour of nine, and that the lady came to her death between seven and eight, or thereabout, that Sir Henry's hand was torn when he reached his house, and that there was a stain of blood upon the lady's throat, that there were marks of horses' feet on the opposite side of the river and across the moor towards Sir Henry's dwelling, and that he himself was seen of many persons wandering about near Abbot's Anne and Dunbury till dark that night, all of which points Sir Simeon of Royden doubted not in any way could be easily explained by Sir Henry Dacre, if true, but which perchance were untrue, he, Sir Simeon, having heard them merely from vague report and common fame. "'Some true, some false,' cried Dacre. "'I did tear my hand, opening the gate by Clatford Mill. "'I did wander about, with a heart on fire and a brain all whirling, "'at being made wretched by another's fault. "'But I was far from the village, far from the abbey and hall, "'before the sun went down, for I saw him set from Wayhill. "'Ah, poisonous snake! "'He stings and glides away from the heel that will crush him. "'Hear how he ends.' For his own part, Sir Simeon of Royden is right well convinced that Sir Henry Dacre is pure and free of all share in the lady's death. Otherwise that night might be full sure he would be the first to call him to the lists in vengeance of his cousin's death. The scoundrel coward! But how is this, Richard? We must have spies in our houses, at our hearths. How else did he gain such tidings? Who told him of the quarrel between that hapless girl and me? He was gone long before, I think." "'Aye, but his servant stayed,' replied Woodville. "'And there was one in the hall when you returned, "'that black-looking, silent man. "'He must have some other means of information, too, "'else how did he know your hand was torn?' "'I cannot say,' answered Dacre thoughtfully. "'But, heaven, he will plant suspicion in my heart, too, "'and make me doubt the long-tried, faithful fellows I have with me. 
and he cast himself gloomily on a seat and pondered in silence. The moment after there was a sound of horses' feet passing along before the house, and Richard of Woodville turned and listened, saying, "'There is some new messenger. Were it any of my own people, they will come to the other gate.' After some talking in the hall without, an attendant opened the door and informed his young master that there was a person without who desired to see him. "'He comes from Westminster,' added the man, "'and will give neither message nor letters to any but yourself, sir.' "'Let him come in,' answered Richard of Woodville, "'and a personage was called forward, habited somewhat differently from any of those whom we have already had occasion to describe. "'He was dressed in what is called a tabard, and it must not be supposed from that circumstance "'that he bore the office of either herald or pursuivant, "'for many other classes retained that part of the ancient dress, "'and it was officially worn by the squires "'and many of the inferior attendants of kings and sovereign princes, "'sometimes over armour, sometimes without. "'In particular cases the tabard was embroidered "'either with the arms of the lord whom the bearer served, "'or with his own as a sort of coat of arms, "'but was frequently, especially with persons of somewhat low degree, perfectly unornamented, and formed of a fine cloth of a uniform colour. Such was the case with the man who now approached, his loose short gown with wide sleeves, being of a bright pink hue. The linen collar of his shirt fell over it, and the part of his dress left exposed below the knee showed nothing but the riding boots of untanned leather, drawn up to their full extent. In person he was a short, thin young man, with a shrewd and merry countenance. His hair was cut short round the whole head, but left thick notwithstanding so as to resemble a fur cap, and his long arms reached his knees. Without uttering a word, he advanced towards Richard of Woodville, who had taken a step forward to receive him, and drawing a packet from the bosom of his tabard, he placed it in the gentleman's hand. "'From Hall of Hadnock, I suspect,' said Woodville, looking at him closely. "'Nay, I know not,' replied the messenger, from Hal, certainly, yet no more Hal of Hadnock than of Monmouth, or Westminster, or any other town of England or Wales. Read, and you will see. Richard of Woodville tore open the outer cover, and took forth several broad letters, tied and sealed. The first he opened, and drawing near the light, perused its contents attentively. Hal of Hadnock, so it ran, to Richard of Woodville, greeting. Good service requires good service, and honour, honour. Thus you shall find, my comrade of the way, that I have not forgotten you, though matters of much moment and some grief have delayed a promise, and put it out of mind. You too have doubtless had much cause for thought and sorrow, and may perchance have yet affairs to keep you in the realms of England, which, being the case, I do not require that you should lay aside things of weight to bear the enclosed to the noble Duke of Normandy, or his son, or to the faithful servant of this crown, Sir Philip Morgan, now at the court of Burgundy but the letter addressed to Sir John Grey at Ghent is of some importance to himself, and should find his hands as speedily as may be. If, therefore, by any chance you be minded to stay in England more than fourteen days from the receipt of these, return that packet by the bearer, one Edward Dyram. But, if you be ready to cross the seas, ere then, keep the messenger with you in your company, as I believe him to be faithful and true." and skilled in many things, and he knoweth my mind towards you, which is good. Neither be offended at speech or jest of his, for he hath a license not easily bridled, but so long as he useth his tongue for his own conceit, so long will he use his knowledge for a friend or master. I give him to you, treat him well, till you return him to me again, and if there be aught else that can serve you or do you grace, seek me at Westminster where you will find a friend in Henry. Richard of Woodville pondered, but testified no surprise, and after a moment's thought put the letter in the hand of Sir Henry Dacre, who read it through with more apparent wonder than his friend had expressed. And who is this? he asked when he had done. He signs himself Henry. Can it be the prince? The prince that was, the king that is, replied Woodville, giving him a sign to say no more before the messenger. And so, my friend, you are to be my companion over sea he added, turning to the latter. "'That is as you will, not as I will,' replied the man. "'If you are fool enough to quit England in a fortnight, when you can stay a month, I am to go with you. If you are wise enough to stay, I am wise enough to go alone.' 
Ten days, I hope, at farthest shall see my foot on other shores, answered Woodville, and pray, Master Edward Dyram, what may be your capacity, quality, or degree, for tis fit that I should know who it is goes with me. Ned Dyram, fair sir, by your leave, replied the messenger, tis so long since I lost the last half of my first name, that I know it not when I meet it, and I should as much expect my mother's ass to answer me if I called him Edward, as I should answer to it myself. Then, as to my capacity, it is large enough to hold any man's secrets without spilling them by the way, or to contain the knowledge of a knight, a baron, and squire, besides a clerk's and my own, without running over. My chief quality is to tell the truth when I like it, and other men do not, and my degree has never been taken yet, though I lived long enough with the doctor of Oxford to have caught that sickness, had it been infectious. "'I fear me, Ned Dyram,' said Richard of Woodville, smiling. "'I shall lose much time with you in getting crooked answers to plain questions. "'But if you have puzzled your own brains with logic, puzzle not mine.' "'Well, well, sir,' answered the other. "'I will be brief, for I am hungry, and you are tired. "'I am the son of a Franklin, who broke his heart to make me a clerk. "'I had, however, no gift for singing, and turned my wits to other things.' I can do what men can generally do, and sometimes better than they can. I have broken a man's head one day, and healed it the next, for I have handled a quarter-staff and served a leech. I can cast nativities and draw a horoscope. I can make a horseshoe and sharpen a sword. I can write court hands and speak more languages than I own. I can crook my own dinner when need be and bake or brew if the settler or the tapster should fail me. A goodly list of qualities indeed, said Richard of Woodville, and though my household is not the most princely, we will find you an office, Ned Dyram, which you must exercise with discretion. And now, as you are hungry, get you gone to my people, who will stop that evil. We have supped. The messenger withdrew, and Sir Henry Dacre returned the letter which he still held in his hand to Woodville, saying, So this was the prince? the more cruel in him to sport with the peace of his father's subject. Not so, Dacre, replied his friend. I told you I could explain his conduct, and it is but justice to him to do so, for he intended to be careful, not cruel. Dacre shook his head gloomily. Well, you shall hear, continued Woodville. When I first brought him to my uncle's gate, I knew not who he was, but he had scarcely entered the hall when I remembered him. I kept my own counsel, however, and said nothing, but when he sought his room I went with him, as you saw, and there, for a whole hour, we spoke of those we have left below. I told him nothing, Harry, for his quick eye had gleaned the truth wherever it turned, and I had only to set him right on some things regarding the past. He knew you by name, and took interest in your fate as well as mine. I would fain tell you all, but in the mood in which you are, I fear that I may pain you. "'Speak, Dick, speak,' answered the knight. "'Have we not been as brothers since our boyhood, "'that you may not give me all your thoughts freely? "'Say all you have to say. "'Keep naught behind, if you love me, "'for I have grown as suspicious as the rest, "'and shall doubt if I see you hesitate.' "'Well, at all risks,' said Richard of Woodville, "'it is better to give you some pain, perhaps, "'than to leave you with your present thoughts. "'We talked, then, first of myself and Mary Markham, "'and then of you and Catherine.' He saw you loved her not. "'Twas her own fault,' said Dacre. "'She crushed out love that might have once been deep and true.' "'I told him so,' replied Woodville. "'And he added, why, as you both clearly wished the bond that bound you to each other loosened, "'you did not apply to the church and the law to break it. "'I said what perhaps had better not been said, "'but yet what I believed, that if you proposed it, she would not consent.' for that she loved to keep you as captive, if not by love's chains, by any other. He fancied, Harry, that in that incomplete union were dissolved. You might be happy with another, I with Isabel. Ha! exclaimed Dacre. Ha! I have been so careless of my looks that a mere stranger should... And he bent down his brow upon his hands and remained for an instant silent. Then looking up, he added, Well, Richard, I have been a fool... But was it possible to stand between a desert and paradise and not regret that I could never pass the boundary? 
to look into a scene of joy and peace, and not long to rest the weary heart and call the aching brow in the calm groves and pleasure glades before me. Who would compare those two things and not choose between them in spite of fate? But what said he more? He thought you might be happy, answered Woodville, and that the only barrier was one that he might prompt Catherine to remove herself. For that object he humoured her caprice and played with her light vanity. He told me that he would, and I saw that he did so, for his was no heart to be suddenly made captive by one such as Catherine Beecham. Besides, it was clear his words, half sweet, half sour, were all aimed at that end. For ever and anon, when his tone was full of courteous gallantry, some sharp jest would break through, as if he could not keep down the somewhat scornful thoughts with which her idle vanity moved him. "'Then I did him wrong,' answered Dacre, "'for had he succeeded and led her to propose of her own will "'that our betrothing should be annulled, "'no boon on all the earth could have been equal to that blessing. "'It has turned out sadly, yet I will not blame him, "'for who can tell when he draws a bowstring in the dark "'where the shaft may fall? "'But say, Richard, was he aware you knew his station?' "'I never told him,' replied his friend, "'but I think that he divined. "'You see, in his letter that he gives no explanation. But listen, Harry, will it not be better, now that we have spoken freely on this theme, will it not better, I say, for you to return home, let the first memory of these dark days pass away, and seek for happiness with one who may well make up for all that you have suttered in the past? What? cried Dacre, with this stain upon my name? Oh, no, that dream of joy is gone. No, no, my only course is to forget that there is such a thing as love on earth, and to follow with your friend, Chaucer's lay, that love me is in young folk but rage, and in old folk a great dotage, who most in useth, he most shall impair, for thereof comes disease and heaviness, so sorrow and care, and many a great sickness, despite debate and anger and envy, depraving shame, untrust and jealousy, Pride, mischief, poverty, and woodness. "'Tis the song of the cuckoo, Harry,' replied Woodville. "'But this sad humour, built upon a baseless dream, "'will pass away when you find that the suspicions "'which you now fancy in every one's heart "'live but in your own imagination, "'and then you will answer with the nightingale "'that evermore love his servants amendeth, "'and from all evil takes them defendeth.' But time must do his own work, until then argument is of no avail. Yet I would fain not have you lose bright days with me in foreign lands. Happy were I if I could stay like you in hope, and lead the pleasant summer life beneath the lightsome looks of her whom I love best. Think of it, Harry, think of it, and do not rashly judge that you see clear, till you have wiped the dust out of your eyes. Dacre shook his head and answered, I will to rest, Richard, such as I can find, for now that I have got this craven's reply, I have no further business here till I join you again upon our pilgrimage. I will away to-morrow to prepare, and we shall meet before I go. I know my way. End of chapter 6《The Coronation》Five days after the events related in the last chapter, Richard of Woodville, leaving armourers and tailors busy in his house at Mion, rode away for London, accompanied by two yeomen, a page, and Ned Dyram, whose talents had not been long in displaying themselves in the service of his new master. He had instructed the tailors, he had assisted the armourers, he had aided to choose the horses, he had drawn figures for fresh pallets and pauldrons, and he had with his own hand manufactured a superb bridle and bit, ornamented with gilt steel plates, jesting, laughing, talking all the while, and overcoming the obstinacy and the vanity of the old artificers, who would fain have equipped the young gentlemen who employed them in the fashions of the early part of the last reign, all new inventions in those days travelling slowly from the capital to the country. Ned Dyram, however, had been in many lands, and had accumulated, in a head which possessed extraordinary powers, both of observation and memory, an enormous quantity of patterns and designs of everything new or strange, 
which he had seen, and sometimes with a laugh, sometimes with an argument, he drove those who were inclined to resist all innovation to adopt his proposed improvements greatly against their will. But though his tongue occasionally ran fast, and he seemed to take a pleasure occasionally in confounding his slower opponents with a torrent of words, yet on all subjects but those immediately before him he kept his own counsel, and not one of the servants of the house, when he set out with Woodville from London, was aware of who or what he was, whence he came, or where he had gained so much knowledge. The first day's journey was a long one, and Richard of Woodville and his train were not many miles from London, when they again set forth early on the following morning, so that it was not yet noon on the ninth of April, when they approached the city of Westminster along the banks of the Thames. Winding in and out through fields and hedgerows, where now are houses, manufactories, and prisons, with a soft air of spring breathing upon them and the scent of the early cowslips, for which that neighbourhood was once famous, rising up and filling the whole air, they came on, now catching, now losing, the view of the large, heavy abbey church of Westminster, and its yet unfinished towers of the same height as the main building, while rising tall above it appeared the belfry of St. Stephen's Chapel, with its peaked roof open at the sides, displaying part of the three enormous bells, one of which was said falsely to weigh thirty thousand pounds. The top of two other towers might also be seen from time to time over the trees, and also part of the buildings of the monastery adjoining the abbey. But these were soon lost, as the lane which the travellers were following wound round under the west side of Tote Hill, a gentle elevation covered with greensward and ornamented with clumps of oak and birch and fir, amidst which might be discovered here and there some large stone houses, richly ornamented with sculpture and surrounded with their own gardens. The lanes, the paths, the fields were filled with groups of people in their holiday costume, all flocking towards Westminster. And what with the warm sunshine, the greenness of the grass, the tender verdure of the young foliage, and the gay dresses of the people, the whole scene was as bright and lively as it is possible to conceive. At the same time, the loud bells of St. Stephen's began to ring with the merriest tones they could produce, and a distant hurrah came upon the wind. "'Now, Ned, which is the way?' asked Richard of Woodville, calling up his new attendant to his side, as they came to a spot where the lane divided into two branches, one taking the right-hand side of the hill, and one the left. "'This seems the nearest,' he continued, pointing down the former, "'but I know naught of the city.' "'The nearest may prove the farthest,' replied Ned Dyram, riding up, "'as it often does, my master. "'That is the shortest, good sooth, but they call the shortest often the fool's way.' and we might be made to look like fools if we took it. For though it leads round the end of St. Stephen's Lane, methinks that to-day none will be admitted to the palace court by that gate, as it is the king's coronation morning. Indeed, said Woodville, I knew not that it was so. Nor I either, answered Ned, but I know it now. And how, pray, asked his new master. "'By every sight and sound,' replied Ned Dyram, "'by that girl's pink coats, by that good man's blue cloak, "'by the bells ringing, by the people running, "'by the hurrah we heard just now. "'I ever put all that I hear and see together, "'for a man who only sees one thing at once "'will never know what time he is living in.' "'Then we had better turn to the left,' said Woodville, "'not caring to hear more of his homily. "'Of course, if this be the coronation day, "'I shall not get speech of the king till to-morrow.' "'but we may as well see what is going on.' "'To the left will lead you right,' replied his quibbling companion. "'That is to say, to the great gate before the palace court, "'and then we shall discover whether the king will speak with you or not. "'Each prince has his own manners, and ours has changed so boldly in one day "'that no one can judge from that which the lad did what the man will do.' "'Has he changed much, then?' asked Woodville, riding on. "'It must have been sudden, indeed, if you had time to see it ere you left him.' "'Aye, has he?' answered Dyram. "'The very day of his father's death he put on not the robes of royalty, but the heart, "'and those who were his comrades before gave place to other men. "'They who counted much upon his love found a cold face, "'and they who looked for hate met with naught but grace.' "'Then perhaps my reception may not be very warm,' said Woodville, thoughtfully. 
"'You may judge yourself better than I can, Master Mine,' replied Ned Dyram. "'Did you ever sit with him in the tavern drinking quarts of wine?' "'No,' answered Richard of Woodville, smiling. "'Then you shall be free of his table,' said Ned. "'Did you ever shoot deer with him by moonlight?' "'Never,' was his master's reply. "'Then you may chance to taste his venison.' rejoined the man. Did you ever brawl, swear, and break heads for him, or with him? No, truly, said the young gentleman. I fought under him, with the army in Wales, when he and I were both but boys, and I led him on his way one dark night, two days before his father died, but that is all I know of him. Then perchance you may enter into his council, answered Dyram, for now that he is royal, he thinks royally, and he judges man for himself, not with the eyes of others. As all kings should, said Richard of Woodville. And few kings do, rejoined Ned. I was not so lucky, but many a mad prank have I seen during the last year, and though he knows, and heaven knows, I never prompted what others did, yet I was one of the old garments he cast off as soon as he put on the new ones. I fared better than the rest, indeed, because I sometimes had told him a rough truth, and trust I shall fare better still, if I do his bidding. "'And what may be his bidding?' asked Richard of Woodville, for doubtless he gave you one, when he sent you to me. "'He bade me live well, and forget former days, as he had forgotten them,' replied Ned Dyram, "'and he bade me serve you well, master, if you took me with you. So you have no cause to think ill of the counsel that he gave me in your case.' "'But here we are, master mine, and a goodly sight it is to see.' "'As he spoke, they turned into the wide street, or rather road, "'which led from the village of Charing to the gates of the palace at Westminster, "'and a gay and beautiful scene it certainly presented, whichever side the eye turned. "'To the north was seen the old Gothic building, destroyed in the reign of Edward the Sixth, "'where the royal falcons were kept, and called from that circumstance the Mew.' while a little in advance upon a spot slightly elevated stood the beautiful stone cross, one of the monuments of undying regard erected in the village of Charing by King Edward I. To the left appeared the buttery and lodge, and other officers of the hospital and convent of St. James's, forming together a large pile of buildings, with gates and arches cut in each other in somewhat strange confusion, while the higher stories, supported by corbels, overhung the lower, the effect of the whole, however, massed together by the distance, was grand and striking, while the trees of the fields, then belonging to the nunnery, and afterwards formed into a park, broke the harsher lines, and marked the distances down the course of the wide road. A little nearer, but on the opposite side of the way, with gardens and stairs extending to the river, was the palace or lodging of the kings of Scotland. The edifice has been destroyed, but the grounds has still retained the name which it then bore, and many years had not elapsed at the time I speak of, since that mansion had been inhabited by the monarchs of the northern part of this island, when they came to take their seats in Parliament, in right of their English fiefs. Gardens succeeded, till appeared, somewhat projecting beyond the line of road, the old stern building which had once been the property of Hubert de Berg, Earl of Kent, more like a fortress than a dwelling, though its gloomy aspect was relieved by a light and beautiful chapel, lately built on the side nearest to Westminster by one of the archbishops of York. Several smaller edifices, sometimes constructed of brick, sometimes of grey stone, were seen on the right and left, all in that peculiar style of architecture so much better fitted to the climate of northern Europe, and the character of her people, than the light and graceful buildings of the Greeks, which we imitate in the present day, generally with such heavy impotence, and still between all appeared the green branches of oaks and beeches and fields and gardens blending the city and the country together. Up the long vista, thus presented, were visible thousands of groups on horseback and on foot, decked out in gay and glittering colours, and as brilliant a scene displayed itself to the south, in the wide court before the palace, surrounding which appeared the venerable abbey, the vast hall, the long line of the royal dwelling, the monastery, the chapel of St. Stephen, with its tall belfry, and many another tower and lofty archway, and the old church of St. Margaret, built about a century and a half before, together with the lofty yet heavy buildings of the wall staple, and the row of arches underneath. 
banners and pennons fluttering in the wind, long gowns of monks and secular clergymen, tabards and mantles of every hue under the sun, the robes and headdresses of the ladies and their women, and the gorgeous trappings of the horses, catching the light as they moved hither and thither, rendered the line from the Eleanor Cross to the palace one living rainbow while the river flowing gently on upon the east was covered with boats all tricked out with streamers and fluttering ribbons even the grave the old and those dedicated to seclusion and serious thought seemed to have come forth for this one day and amongst the crowd might be distinguished more than one of the long grey black or white grounds and the coif and veil which marked the nun all seemed gay however and nothing was heard but laughter merriment gay jests, the ringing of the bells, the sounding of clarions, and, every now and then, the deep tone of the organ through the open windows of the abbey, or a wild burst of martial music from the lesser court of the palace. Habited in black as mourning for his unhappy cousin, Richard of Woodville felt himself hardly fitted for so gay a scene. But his good mien and courteous carriage gained him many a civil word as he moved along or perchance some shrewd jest, as the frank simplicity of those days allowed. "'Where is the black man going?' cried a pert London apprentice. "'He must be chief mourner for the dead king.' "'Nay, he is fair enough to look upon, Tom,' replied a pretty girl by his side. "'You would give much to be as fair.' "'Take care of my toes, master,' exclaimed a stout citizen. "'Your horse is mettlesome.' "'He shall not hurt you, good sir,' replied Woodville. "'Let me hold by your leg, Sir Squire,' said a woman near, "'so I shall have a stout prop.' "'Blessings on this fair, good-natured face,' cried an old woman. "'He has lost his lady. I will wager my life.' "'You have not much there to lose, good mother,' answered a man behind her. "'Well, he will soon find another lady,' rejoined a buxom dame, "'who seemed of the same party, if he takes those eyes to court.' "'Out on it, master,' exclaimed a man who had been amusing the people round him by bad jokes. "'Is your horse a cut-purse? He had his nose in my pouch.' "'Where he found nothing, I dare say,' answered Woodville, and in the midst of the peal of laughter which followed from the easily moved multitude, he made his way forward to the gates, where he was stopped by a wooden barrier drawn across and guarded by a large posse of the royal attendants, habited in their coats of ceremony.' "'What now, what now?' asked one of the jacks of office, with a large mace in his hand, as Woodville rode up. "'You can have no entrance here, Sir Squire, if you be not of the King's house, or have not an order from one of his lords. The court is crowded already. The King will not have room to pass back.' Before his master could answer, however, Ned Dyron pushed forward his horse and addressed the porter, saying, in a tone of authority, "'Up with the barrister, Master Robert Nesenham.' "'Tis a friend of the King's, for whom he sent me, "'Master Richard of Woodville, you know the name.' "'That's another affair, Ned,' replied the other. "'But let me see, are you not on the list of those who must not come to court?' "'Not I,' replied Ned Dyram. "'Or if I be, you have put me on yourself, Robin. "'Tis but the other day I left his grace upon this errand.' "'Well, come in, if it be so, varlet,' replied the porter, lifting the barrier. "'But if you come forbidden—' "'The pillory and your ears will be acquainted. "'How many men of you are there? "'Stand back, fellows, or I will break your pates. "'Seat him. "'There is a fellow slipping through. "'Drive him back. "'Give him a throw. "'Cast him over. "'Break his neck. Five of you, that is all. "'Stand back, fellows, or you shall into limbo.' "'While the good man strove with the crowd without, "'who all struggled manfully to push through the barrier when it was open, "'Richard of Woodville and his followers made their way on into the court.' and, dismounting from his horse in the more open space which it afforded, he advanced towards the passage which was kept clear by the royal officers, between the door of the great hall and the abbey. At first he was placed near a stout man, dressed as a wealthy citizen, and he inquired of him how long the king had been in the church. Three parts of an hour,' replied the other. "'Did you not hear the shout and the bells begin to ring?' "'Oh, it was a grand sight. There was—' but the rest of what he said was drowned by the noise around, aided by a loud flourish of trumpets from the hall. The crowd, however, was constantly changing and swaying to and fro, and Woodville soon found himself separated from the man to whom he had spoken, 
by two or three of the secular clergy of the city, and a somewhat coquettish-looking nun who wore over her grey gown a blue ribbon and a silver cross. She turned round and looked at him with her veil up, showing a very pretty face and a pair of bright blue eyes. A fat monk was behind, and a man dressed as a scrivener, but all were intent upon watching the door of the abbey, as if they expected the royal procession soon to reappear, and Woodville turned his eyes thither also. The next moment he heard a voice pronounce his own name, and then add, "'Beware of Simeon of Royden, and let not Harry Dacre fight with him.' Richard turned sharply round and gazed at those behind him, but he saw no face that he knew but those of Ned Dyram and one of his own men. The rest of the group in his immediate neighbourhood was composed of two monks, another nun, a doctor of divinity in his cope, a tall man in a surcoat of arms, and two elderly ladies with portentous headdresses, a full half-yard broad and two feet high. It was a woman's voice, however, that he had heard, and he inquired at once of the nearest woman, "'Did you speak, lady?' "'To be sure I did,' answered the good dame in a sharp tone. "'I asked my brother what the hour is. "'No offence in that, sir, I suppose.' "'Oh, none, assuredly,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'But I thought you mentioned my name.' "'I do not know it, young sir,' replied the lady. "'Come away, brother, the squire is saucy.' And she and her party moved on, making a complete change in the disposition of the group. In vain Richard of Woodville looked beyond the little circle in which they stood— he could see no face that he knew, and at length, turning to Ned Dyram, he inquired if he had heard anyone mention his name. "'That good dame, or someone near her, certainly did,' replied the man, "'but I could not see exactly who it was. It might be the other woman.' "'Was she old, too?' demanded Woodville. "'Too old for your wife, and too young for your mother,' answered Ned, "'somewhat on the touch of forty years.' As he spoke, there was a loud hurrah from the ground adjacent to the abbey door, a true, hearty English shout, such as no other nation on the earth can give, and the royal procession was seen returning, all pressed as near as they could, and Richard of Woodville gained a place in front, where he waited calmly, uncovered, for the passing of the king. On came the train, bishops and abbots, priests and nobles, the pages, the knights, the bearers of the royal emblems, and all eyes were turned to one person, as, with a step not haughty but calm and firm, such as might well accord with a heart fixed and confident to keep the solemn vows so lately made, in scrupulous fidelity, with a brow elevated by high and noble purposes, more than by the splendour of the crown it bore, and with an eye lightening with genius and soul, Henry of Monmouth returned towards his palace, amidst the gratulating acclamations of his people. Richard of Woodville saw Hal of Hadnock in the whole bearing of the monarch, as he had seen the prince in the bearing of Hal of Hadnock, and he murmured to himself, "'He is the same, tis but the dress is altered, either in mind or body. Excluded from the tasks of royalty, he assumed a less noble guise, but still the man was the same. As he thus thought, the king passed before him, looking to right and left upon the long lines of people that bordered his way, though marching in his state he distinguished no one by word or gesture his eyes indeed fixed firmly for an instant upon richard of woodville and a slight smile passed over his lip but he went on without farther notice and the young gentleman turned as soon as he had gone by thinking i will seek some inn and come to the palace to-morrow to-day it is in vain the pressure of the multitude however prevented him from moving for some time and he was forced to remain till the whole of the procession had gone by. He then made his way out of the crowd, which gradually became less compact, though few retired altogether, the great number waiting either to discuss the events of the day, or to see if any other amusements would be afforded to the people. But it was some time before the young gentleman could find his horses, for the movements of the people had forced them from the place where they had been left. Just as he was at length putting his foot in the stirrup, Ned Dyron pulled his sleeve, saying, "'There is a king's page, my master, looking for someone in the crowd. Always give yourself a chance. It may be you he seeks.' "'I think not,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'But you can join him and inquire if you will.' The man instantly ran off at full speed, and though soon forced to slacken his pace amongst the people, 
he in the end reached the page and asked for whom he was looking. "'A gentleman in black,' replied the boy, named Richard of Woodville. "'Then there he is,' answered Ned, pointing with his hand to where his master stood, and, followed by the page, he walked quickly to the spot. "'If your name be Richard of Woodville, sir,' said the boy, "'the king will see you now, while he is putting off his heavy robes and taking some repose.' "'I follow, young sir,' replied Woodville, and accompanying the page, he turned towards the palace, while Ned Dyram, after a moment's hesitation, pursued the same course as his master, in order, as he said mentally, always to give himself a chance. End of chapter 7「Eight of Agincourt, a romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Day of Festival Crossing through the great hall of the Palace of Westminster, where so many a varied scene has been enacted in the course of English history, where joy and sorrow, mirth, merriment, pageantry, fear, despair, and the words of death have passed for well nigh a thousand years, and do pass still, Richard of Woodville followed the page amidst tables and benches, serving men, servers, guards, and ushers, till they reached a small door at the left angle, which, when opened, displayed the first steps of a small stone staircase. Up these they took their way, and then, through a door thronged with attendants, passed the open door of a large room on the right, in which mitres and robes, crosses and swords of state, met the young gentleman's eye to a door at the end which the page opened. Within was a small antechamber containing several squires and pages in their tabards, waiting either in silence or at most talking to each other in whispers. They made way for their comrade and the gentleman he brought with him to pass, and, approaching an opposite door, the boy knocked. No one answered, but the door was immediately opened, and Richard of Woodville was ushered into a bedchamber, where, seated in a large chair, he found the king, attended by two men dressed in their habits of state. One of these had just given the visitor admission, but the other was engaged in pulling off the boots in which the monarch had walked to and from the abbey, and in placing a pair of embroidered shoes upon his feet instead. "'Welcome, Richard of Woodville,' said Henry, as soon as he beheld him. "'So you have come to see Hal of Hadnock before you depart.' "'I have come to see my gracious sovereign, sire,' "'replied Woodville, advancing and bending the knee to kiss his hand, "'and to wish him health and long life to wear his crown, "'for his own honour and the happiness of his people. "'Nay, rise, Richard, rise,' said Henry, smiling kindly. "'No court ceremonies here, and I will tell you, my good friend, "'that I do really believe there is not one of all those "'who have shouted on my path to-day, or sworn to support my throne, "'who more sincerely wishes my prosperity than yourself.' "'But say, did you guess that Hal of Hadnock was the Prince of Wales?' "'I knew it, sire,' replied Woodville. "'From the first moment you entered my uncle's hall, "'I had served under your grace's command in Wales.' "'I suspected as much,' replied the monarch, "'from some words that you let fall.' "'I do beseech you, sire, to pardon me,' continued Richard, "'if I judged my duty wrongly. "'But I thought that so long as it was not your pleasure "'to give yourself your own state, "'it was my part to know you only... "'as you seemed.' "'And you did right, my friend,' replied the king. "'But you were not tempted to breathe a secret to any one, "'not even to Mary Markham?' "'To no one, sire,' answered Woodville boldly. "'Not for my right hand would I have said one word "'to the best friend I had.' "'You are wise and faithful, Richard of Woodville,' said Henry gravely. "'God send me many such.' "'Here is the other mantle, sire,' said the attendant who was dressing him. "'Will you permit me to unclasp that?' Henry rose, and the man disengaged the royal mantle from his shoulders, replacing it with one less heavy, while the king continued his conversation with Woodville, after a momentary interruption, repeating, "'God send me many such, for if I judge rightly, I shall have need of strong arms and wise heads and noble hearts about me, nor shall I fail to call for yours when I have need, my friend.' "'Ah, sire,' answered Woodville, with a smile, "'as far as a true heart and a strong arm may go, I can perhaps serve you. "'But for wise heads, I fear you must look elsewhere. "'I am but a singer of songs, you know, and a lover of old ballads.' 
"'Like myself, Richard,' replied Henry, "'but none the worse for that. "'I know not why, but I always doubt the man that is not fond of music. "'Tis perhaps that I love it so well myself "'that I cannot but think he who does not "'has some discordant principle in his heart "'that jars with sweet sounds. "'Tis to me a great refreshment also, "'and when I have been sad or tired with all this world's business, "'when my thoughts have grown misty or my brain turned giddy, I have sat me down to the organ and played for a few moments till all has become clear again, and I have risen as a man does from a calm sleep. As for poesy, indeed, I love it well enough, but I am no poet, and yet I think that a truly great poet is more powerful and has a wider empire than a king. We monarchs rule men's bodies while we live, but their minds are beyond that sceptre, and death ends all our power. The poet rules their hearts, "'moulds their minds to his will, "'and stretches his arm over the wide future. "'He arrays the thoughts of countless multitudes "'for battle in the grand field of the world, "'and extends his empire to the end of time. "'Look at Homer. "'Has not the song of the blind Greek its influence yet? "'And so shall the verse of Chaucer be heard in years to come, "'long after the brow they have this day crowned "'shall have mouldered in the grave.' The thoughts which he had himself called up seemed to take entire possession of the king, and he remained gazing in deep meditation for a few minutes upon the glittering emblems of royalty which lay upon the table before him, while Richard of Woodville stood silent by his side, not venturing to interrupt his reverie. "'Well, Richard,' continued the king, at length rousing himself, "'so you go to Burgundy, but hold yourself ready to join me when I have need.' "'I am always ready, now or henceforward, sire.' "'answered the young gentleman, "'to serve you with the best of my poor ability, "'and the day will be a happy one that calls me to you. "'I only go to seek honour in another land "'because I had so resolved before I met your highness, "'and because you for yourself pronounced it best for me.' "'And so I think it still,' replied Henry. "'I would myself advance you, Woodville, but for two reasons. First, I find every office near my person "'filled with old and faithful servants of the crown.' and as they fall vacant I will place in them men who have themselves won renown. Next, I think it better that your own arm and your own judgment should be your prop, rather than a king's favour. And as yet, there is here no opportunity. Besides, there are many other reasons why you will do well to go, in which I have not forgotten your own best interests. But keep yourself clear of long engagement to a foreign prince, lest your own should need you. "'That I most assuredly will, sire,' answered Richard of Woodville. "'I go but to take service as a volunteer, "'holding myself free to quit it when I see meat. "'I ask no pay from any one, "'and if I gain honour or reward it shall be for what I have done, "'not for what I am to do.' "'You are right, you are right,' said Henry. "'But have you anything to ask of me?' "'Nothing, sire,' replied the young gentleman. "'I did but wish to pay reverence to your state.' "'and thank you for the gracious letters you have given me before I went.' "'And he took a step back as if to retire, "'but Henry made a sign, saying, "'Stop, yet a moment. "'I have something to ask you. "'Lay the gloves down there, Certes. "'Tighten this point a little, and then retire with Baynard.' "'The attendants did as they were bid, and Henry then inquired, "'What of Sir Henry Dacre, and of that dark evening's work "'at which we were present?' "'Dacre goes with me, sire.' "'replied Richard of Woodville. "'Ha!' exclaimed the king. "'Then we were wrong in thinking he loved the other.' "'Not so,' answered Woodville. "'Tis a sad tale, sire. "'He does love Isabel, I am sure, "'has long loved her, "'though struggling hard against such thoughts. "'But as if to mar his whole happiness, "'that scoundrel Royden, whom you saw, "'when informed of poor Kate's death, "'wrote, though he did not come, "'raising doubts as to whether her fate "'had been accidental.' "'Doubts?' cried the king. "'Do you entertain no doubts, Richard?' "'Many, sire,' answered the young gentleman. "'But I never mention doubts that I cannot justify by proof, "'and will not support with my arm. "'But he did more. "'He pointed suspicion at one he knew too well to be innocent. "'He called up some accidental circumstances affecting Dacre, "'not as charges, indeed, but as matters of inquiry, "'made the wound and left the venom, but shrunk from the result.' "'And what did Dacre?' asked the king. "'Gave him the lie, sire,' replied Woodville. "'Called upon him to come boldly forward, "'make his accusation and support it in the lists. 
"'He avoided that, I'll warrant,' replied Henry. "'I know him, Richard.' "'He did so, sire,' answered the young gentleman. "'He declared he had no accusation to bring, "'held Dacre to be a good knight and true, "'but still kept his vague insinuations forward in view, "'as things that he mentioned solely because it would be satisfactory to the knight himself "'to clear up whatever is obscure. "'And does the Lady Isabel give any credence, then, to these cowardly charges?' "'inquired the king. "'Oh, no, sire,' replied Woodville warmly. "'She has known Harry Dacre from her infancy. "'And those who have are well aware that, though quick in temper, "'he is as kind as the May wind, as true and pure as light. "'But Dacre is miserable. "'He thinks that, henceforth, the finger of suspicion will be pointed at him for ever. "'He sees imaginary doubts and dreads in every one's heart towards him. He feels the mere insinuation as the first stain upon a high and noble name. It weighs upon him like a captive's chain. He cannot break it or get free. It binds his very heart and soul, and casting all hope and happiness behind him, he is resolved to go and peril life itself in any rash enterprise that fortune may present. "'Poor man!' exclaimed Henry. "'I can well understand his feelings, but God will bring all things to light.' "'Yet tell me, Richard of Woodville, do your own suspicions point in no particular direction? "'Have you no doubts of any one?' "'Perhaps I have, sire,' answered Woodville. "'But I will beseech your highness to grant me one of two things, "'either to appoint a day and hour where, in fit lifts, and with arms at outrance, "'I may sustain my words to the death, "'or do not ask me to make a charge which I can support with no other proof than my right hand.' "'I understand you, Richard,' said the king, "'and I will ask no farther. "'Your course is a just one, "'but I trust, and am sure, "'that heaven will not witness such deeds "'as have been done, without sending punishment. "'We both think of the same person, I know, "'and my eye is upon him. "'Tell me, however, one thing. "'Does not Sir Simeon of Royden "'inherit the estates of this poor Lady Catherine?' "'He does, sire, and is already in possession,' "'replied Woodville. "'He is here at the court.' rejoined the king, and I shall show him favour for her sake. Richard of Woodville gazed at the monarch in surprise, but a slight smile curled Henry's lip, and although he gave no explanation of the words which he had spoken in a grave tone, his young companion was satisfied. "'I always love to get at the heart of a mystery,' continued the king, seeing that Richard remained silent, "'and I should much like to know, if you can tell me, what was the cause of that furious quarrel which took place between Sir Henry Dacre and this unhappy lady, just before he went. I fear I had some share in it. "'You were but the drop, sire, that overflowed the cup,' replied Woodville. "'It had been near the brim for several days before, but what was said I know not. Remonstrance upon his heart, and cutting sneers on hers, as usual, I suppose. But he has never told me.' Henry mused for a moment at this reply, and then, changing the subject, he inquired— "'Is good Ned Dyeron with you here at Westminster?' "'He is in the hall below, sire,' answered Woodville, "'and a most useful gift has he been to me already.' "'Alone, Richard, alone!' cried the king. "'I shall claim him back one of these days, "'after he has served you in Burgundy. "'You'll find he has faults as well as virtues, "'so have an eye to correct them. "'But even now, as the country folks say, "'I have a mind to borrow my own horse. "'I want his services for three days, "'if you will lend him to me.' "'You are not ready to set out yet?' "'Not yet, sire,' replied Woodville. "'But in one week more I hope to be on the sea.' "'Well, then, send the man up to me, "'and he shall rejoin you in four days,' answered Henry. "'But let me see you to-morrow, my good friend, "'before you go home, "'for I would fain talk farther with you. "'It is seldom that a king can meet one "'with whom he can speak his thoughts plainly, "'and I find already a difference that makes me sad. "'Command and obedience, arguments of state and policy,' "'flattering acquiescence in my opinion, whether right or wrong, "'praise, broad and coarse, or neat and half-concealed, "'of these I can have plenty, and to surfeit. "'But a friend, into whose bosom one can pour forth one's ideas without restraint, "'whether they be sad or gay, is a rare thing in a court. "'So for the present, fare you well, Richard. "'You will stay here for the banquet in the hall, of course, "'and let me see you to-morrow morning towards the hour of eight. Richard of Woodville, as he well might, felt deeply gratified at the confidence which the king's words implied, and he answered, 
I will not fail, sire, to attend you at that hour, with more gratitude for your good opinion than any other favour. At the banquet I will try to find a place, and will send Ned Dyrum to you. Will you receive him now? Yes, at once, replied the king. For good faith, these lords and bishops who are waiting for me will think me long. I will order you a place below, but, mark me, Richard, if you meet Simeon of Roydon, seek no quarrel with him, and lay my commands upon Sir Henry Dacre, that he do not, on any pretense, again call him to the lists, without my knowledge and consent. As to Ned Dyram, he shall rejoin you soon. There is no way in which he may not be useful to you, for there is scarce an earthly chance for which his ready wit is not prepared. I met him first, studying alchemy with a poor wretch who, in pursuit of science, had blown all his wealth up the chimney of his furnace, and could no longer keep this boy. I found him next in an armourer's shop, hammering at hard iron, and thence I took him. He has a thousand qualities, some bad, some good. I think him honest, but his tongue is somewhat too free, and that which the wild prince might laugh at might not chime with the dignity of the crown. He will learn better in your train, but at the present I have an errand for him, so send him to me quickly. Richard of Woodville bowed and withdrew, and finding his way down to the hall, he called Ned Dyram, who was in full activity, aiding the royal officers to set out the tables, and told him to go directly to the king. The man laughed and ran off to fulfil the command, and about three-quarters of an hour elapsed before the monarch appeared in the hall, which by that time was nearly filled with guests invited to the banquet. He was followed by the train of high nobles and churchmen, whom Woodville had seen waiting in a chamber above, and the numerous tables, which were as many as that vast building could contain, were soon crowded. It will be dull to the reader were I to give any account of a mere ordinary event, such as a royal feast of those days, were I to tell the number of oxen and sheep that were consumed, the capons, ducks, geese, swans, and peacocks that appeared upon the board. Suffice it that one of the royal servants placed Richard of Woodville according to his rank, that the banquet, with all its ceremonies, was somewhat long in passing, but that the young gentleman's comfort was not disturbed by the sight of Simeon of Roydon, who, if he were in the hall, kept himself from Richard's eyes. The lower part of the chamber was filled with minstrels, musicians, and attendants, and music as usual accompanied the feast, but ever and anon, from the court below the palace and the neighbouring streets, were heard loud shouts and laughter and bursts of song, showing that the merriment and revelry of the multitude were still kept up, while the king and his nobles were feasting within. Thus, when the banquet was over, the monarch gone from the hall, and Richard of Woodville, with the rest of the guests, issued forth into the court, he was not surprised to find a gay and joyous scene without, the whole streets and roads filled with people, and every one giving himself up to joy and diversion. The gates of the court were thrown open, the populace admitted to the very doors of the palace, and a crowd of several hundred persons assembled round a spot in the centre, where a huge pile of dry wood had been lighted for the august ceremony of roasting an ox whole, which was duly superintended by half a dozen white-capped cooks, with a whole army of scullions and turnspits. Butts of strong beer stood in various corners, and a fountain of four streams flowed with wine at the side next to the abbey. In one spot people were jostling and pushing each other to get at the ale or wine, in another they were dancing gaily to the sound of a viol, and further on was a tumbler twisting himself into every sort of strange attitude for the amusement of the spectators. Loud shouts and exclamations, peals of laughter, the sounds of a thousand different musical instruments playing as many different tunes, with voices singing and others crying wares of several sorts, prepared for the celebration of the day, made a strange and not very melodious din. But there was an air of festivity and rejoicing, of fun and good humour, in the whole that compensated for the noise in the crowd. Richard of Woodville had given orders for his horses to be taken to an inn at Charing, while waiting in the hall before the banquet, and he now proceeded on foot through the crowd in the palace courts towards the gates. It was a matter of some difficulty to obtain egress, for twilight was now coming on, and the multitude were flocking from the sights which had been displayed in the more open road to Charing during the last two or three hours, 
to witness the roasting of the ox, and to obtain some of the slices which were to be distributed about the hour of nine. At length, however, he found himself in freer air, but still, every four or five yards, he came upon a gay group, either standing and talking to each other, or gathered round a show, or some singer, or musician. It was one constant succession of faces, some young, some old, some pretty, some ugly, but all of them strange to Richard of Woodville. Nevertheless, more than once he met the same merry salutations, which he had been treated to when on horseback, and as he paused here and there, gazing at this or that gay party, he was twice asked to join in the dance, and still more frequently required to contribute to the payment of a poor minstrel with his pipe or scythern. The minstrels were not, indeed, in those days at least, a very elevated race of beings. Their poetical powers, if they ever in this country possessed any, had entirely merged in the musical, and though they occasionally did sing to their own instruments, or to those of others, the verses were generally either old ballads, or pieces of poetry composed by persons of a higher education than themselves. Nearly opposite the old dwelling of the kings of Scotland, Woodville's ear caught the tones of a very sweet voice singing, and approaching the group of people that had gathered round, he saw an old man playing on an instrument somewhat like, but greatly inferior, to a modern guitar, while a girl by his side, with fine features and apparently, for the light was faint, a beautiful complexion, dressed in somewhat strange costume, was pouring forth her lay to the delighted ears of youths and maidens. She had nearly finished the song when the young gentleman approached, and in a moment or two after she went round with a cap in her hand, asking the donations of the listeners. Woodville had been pleased, and he threw in some small silver coin, more than equal to all that the rest had given, and resuming her place by the old man's side, she whispered a word in his ear, upon which he immediately struck his instrument again, and she began another ditty in honour, it would appear, of her generous auditor. Song the bark is at the shore, the wind is in the sail, fear not the tempest's roar, there's fortune in the gale, for the true heart and kind its recompense shall find, shall win praise and golden days, and live in many a tale. O ghost thou far or nigh, to Palestine or France, for these soft hearts shall sigh, and glory wreath thy lance, for the true heart and kind its recompense shall find, shall win praise and golden days, and live in many a tale. The courtly hall or field still luck shall thee afford, the heart shall be thy shield, and love shall edge thy sword, for the true heart and kind. Its recompense shall find, shall win praise in golden days, and live in many a tale. The lark shall sing on high, whatever shores thou rovest, the nightingale shall try to call up her thou lovest, for the true heart and kind its recompense shall find, shall win praise and golden days, and live in many a tale. In hours of pain and grief, if such thou must endure, thy breast shall know relief in honour tried and pure, for the true heart and kind its recompense shall find, shall win praise and golden days, and live in many a tale. And fortune soon or late, shall give the jewelled prize, for deeds in spite of fate, gain smiles from ladies' eyes, and the true heart and kind its recompense shall find, shall win praise and golden days, and live in many a tale. The song was full of hope and cheerfulness, and though the melody was simple, as all music was in those days, it went happily with the words. Richard of Woodville well understood that though certainly not an improvisation, the verse was intended for him, and feeling grateful to the girl for her promises of success, he drew forth his purse and held out to her another piece of money. She stepped gracefully forward to receive it, and this time extended a fair small hand, instead of the cap which she had before borne round the crowd. But just at that moment a party of horsemen came up at full gallop, and, as if for sport, probably under the influence of wine, rode fiercely through the little circle assembled to hear the song. The listeners, young and active, easily got out of the way, but not so the old minstrel, who stood still, as if bewildered, and was knocked down and trampled by one of the horsemen. The girl, his companion, with a shriek, 
and Richard of Woodville, with a cry of indignation, started forward together, and the latter, catching the horse which had done vile mischief by the bridle, with his powerful arm, forced it back upon its haunches, throwing the rider to the ground with a heavy fall. As the man went down, his hood was cast back, and Woodville beheld the face of Simeon of Royden, but he paused not to notice him farther, instantly turning to raise the old man, and endeavouring to support him. The poor minstrel's limbs had no strength, however, and fearing that he was much hurt, the young gentleman exclaimed, "'Good heaven! Why did you not get out of the way?' The old man made no answer, but the girl replied, wringing her hands, "'Alas! He is blind!' "'Let us bear him quick to some hospital,' said Richard. "'He is stunned. Who will aid to carry him?' "'I will, sir, I will,' answered half a dozen voices from the crowd, and the old minstrel was immediately raised in the arms of three or four stout young men, and carried towards the neighbouring nunnery and hospital of St. James's, accompanied by his fair companion. Woodville was about to follow, but Sir Simeon of Royden, who had by this time regained his saddle, thrust himself in the way, saying in a fierce and bitter tone, "'Richard of Woodville, I shall remember this!' "'And I shall not forget it, Simeon of Royden,' replied the other, hardly able to refrain from punishing him on the spot. "'Get thee hence, thou hast done mischief enough.' The knight was about to reply, but a shout of execration burst from the people, and at the same moment a stone, flung from an unseen hand, struck him on the face, cutting his cheek severely, and shaking him in the saddle. His companions, alarmed at what they had done, had already ridden on and seeing that he was likely to fare ill in the hands of the crowd, Royden put spurs to his horse, and galloped after them, muttering curses as he went. Richard of Woodville soon overtook the little party which was hurrying on with the injured man to the lodge of the monastery, and found the poor girl weeping bitterly. "'Alas, noble sir,' she said as soon as she saw him, "'he is dead. He does not speak. His head falls back.' "'I trust not, I trust not,' answered Woodville, he is but stunned, probably, by the blow, and will soon recover. She shook her head mournfully, and the next moment one of the young men, who had taken up the old man's sithen, stepped forward before the rest, and rang the bell at the gate of the nunnery. It was opened instantly, and Woodville briefly explained to the porter what was the matter. "'Bring him in here,' said the old man. "'We will get help. The good prioress is skilful at such things, and Brother Martin still more so.' and he is nearest, for the monk's lodging is only just below there. Let one of the men run down and ask for Brother Martin. In the meantime, the old minstrel was brought in, and laid upon the pallet in the porter's room, and news of the accident having spread, the lodge was speedily filled with nuns, having their veils down, all eagerly inquiring what had happened. The prioress and Brother Martin appeared at the same moment, and in answer to their questions, Woodville explained the facts of the case, for the poor girl, overwhelmed with grief, was kneeling by her old companion's side, and holding a small ebony cross which she wore round her neck to his motionless lips. "'Give us room, my child, give us room,' said Brother Martin, putting his hand kindly on her shoulder, and having obtained access to the pallet, he and the prioress proceeded to examine what injuries the poor old man had received. Their search was short, however, for after feeling the back of the head with his hand, and then putting his fingers on the pulse, the good monk turned round with a grave countenance, saying, God have mercy on his soul, for to him has it gone. The poor singer covered her eyes with her hands and sobbed bitterly. All the rest were silent for a moment, and then Richard of Woodville, turning to the prioress, said in a low turn, I will beseech you, lady, to see in all charity to this poor man's internment, and that masses be said in your chapel for his soul. Also, if you would, like a good Christian, take some heed of this poor girl, who is his daughter, I suppose. I should be glad, for it may better become you than me. But whatever expense the convent may be at, I will repay, though. Heaven knows I am not over-rich. My name is Richard of Woodville, and to-morrow, if you will send a messenger to me, I shall be found at the acorn just beyond the Bishop of Durham's lodging. You must send before eight, however, or after ten, for at eight I am to be with the king. The prioress bowed her head, saying simply, I will, and Woodville turned to depart, but the poor girl, who had heard his words, started up, and catching his hand, pressed her lips upon it, 
then knelt by the pallet again and seemed to pray. Without farther words, Woodville quitted the lodge, the porter hurried on to open the gates, and the young gentleman went out with the people who had borne or accompanied the poor old minstrel thither. Just as he had reached the road, however, he heard a voice say, "'Richard of Woodville, farewell, and remember!' He started and turned round, but though it was a female voice that spoke, there were none but men around him, and at that same moment the gate rolled heavily to. End of chapter 8Chapter Nine of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sick Mind. We must return, dear reader, for a short time to the scenes in which our tale first began, and to the old hall of the good knight of Dunbury. Richard of Woodville and Sir Henry Dacre had been absent for two days upon their journey to another part of Hampshire, where we have shown somewhat of their course and Sir Philip Beecham sat by the fire, meditating, while his daughter Isabel and fair Mary Markham were seated near, plying busily the needle through the embroidery frame, and not venturing to disturb his reverie, even by whispered conversation. From time to time the old man muttered a few sentences to himself, of which the two ladies could only catch detached fragments, such as, They must know by this time. Dacre could not but do so. I am sure tis for that and several similar expressions showing that his mind was running upon the expedition of his nephew and his friend, in regard to the object of which neither Isabel nor Mary had received any information. It must not be said, however, that they did not suspect anything, for the insinuations of Sir Simeon of Roydon had been told them, and though neither weak nor given to fear, a knight's daughter in a chivalrous age, Isabel could not help looking forward with feelings of awe, and an undefinable sinking of the heart to the events which were likely to follow. She fully believed that she experienced, and had ever experienced, towards Sir Henry Dacre, but one class of sensations, regard for his high character and noble heart, and pity for the incessant grief and anxiety which her cousin's conduct had brought upon him from his early youth. But such feelings are very treacherous guides, and lead us far beyond the point at which they tell us they will stop. With her, too, they had had every opportunity of so doing, for she trusted to them in full confidence. Hers had been a task also of soothing and consoling him under all he had suffered, a dangerous task indeed for one young, kind, gentle, and enthusiastic, to undertake towards a man whom she admired and respected. But then they had known each other from infancy, she thought. They had grown up together like brother and sister, and the tie between them had only been brought nearer by the betrothing of Dacre to her cousin. Had a doubt ever entered into Isabel's mind since Catherine's death, it may be asked in regard to her own feelings towards Dacre. Perhaps it might, but if so, it had been banished instantly, and she looked upon the very thought as a wrong to her own motives. She would never suffer such a thing, she fancied, to trouble her again. Dacre had loved Catherine, Surely he had loved her, and yet... But fresh doubts arose, and Isabel, willing to be blind, still turned to other meditations. Mary Markham, on the other hand, with less cause for anxiety, and no motive for shutting her eyes, saw more clearly, and judged more accurately. She knew that Isabel Beecham loved Harry Dacre, and believed she had loved him long, though she did her full justice and was confident that her fair companion was as ignorant of what was in her own bosom as of the treasures beneath the waves. But Mary felt certain that such was not the case with Dacre in regard to his own sensations. She had marked his eye when it turned upon Isabel, had seen the faint smile that came upon his lip when he spoke to her, and had observed the struggle which often took place when inclination led him to seek her society, and the thought of danger and of wrong held him back a struggle in which love had been too often victorious. She doubted not that he was gone to call upon Simeon of Roydon to come forward with proof of his charges, or to sustain them with the lance, and though she entertained little doubt of the issue of such a combat, if it took place, she felt grieved and anxious both for Isabel and Dacre. There are some men whose native character, notwithstanding every artifice to conceal it, 
will penetrate through all disguises and produce sensations which seem unreasonable, even to those who feel them without being able to trace them to their source. Such a one was Sir Simeon of Roydon. He had never been seen by any of Sir Philip Beecham's family to commit any base or dishonest act, and yet there was not one in all that household from the old knight to the horse-boy who did not internally believe him to be capable of every crafty knavery. His insinuations, therefore, in regard to Sir Henry Dacre, passed by as empty air, at least for the time, but all had, nevertheless, a strong conviction on their minds that the doubts he had attempted to raise would rankle deep in the heart of their unhappy object, and poison the whole course of his existence, unless some fortunate event were to bring to light the real circumstances of poor Catherine Beecham's death. The whole party, then, were in a sad and gloomy mood, and even the gay young spirit of Mary Markham was clouded, as they sat round the fire in the great hall, on one of those April evenings when, after a day of summer sunshine, chilly winter returns with his fit companion, night. As they were thus seated, however, each busy with his own thoughts, the sound of horses' feet in the court was heard, and in a moment after, Dacre himself entered. He mounted the steps at the end of the pavement with a slow pace, and every eye was turned to his countenance to gather some indication from his look of the state of mind in which he returned. The old knight rose and grasped his hand, asking in a low voice, "'What news, Harry? Nay, boy, you need not strive to conceal it from me. I know what you went for. Will the slandra do battle?' "'No, my noble friend,' replied Dacre. "'He is coward, too, as well as scoundrel. There is his craven answer. You may read it aloud. The matter is now over, and that hope is gone.' "'You should not have done this, Harry, without consulting me,' said Sir Philip. "'I have some experience in such things.' At the very last that was fought between any two gentlemen of rank and station, I was judge in the field, and know right well what appertains to knightly combat. Of that I was full sure, answered Dacre, pressing his hand, and to you I should have applied for counsel and aid as soon as I had brought him to the point, but I thought it best to be silent till that was done. I was vain, perhaps, Sir Philip, to think that these dear ladies might take some interest in such a matter, might feel anxious even for me, and though I knew that they would have seen me go forth with satisfaction in defence of my honour, and would have bade God speed me on my course, yet it was needless to speak of what was to come till it did come, and you will see that it is to be never. "'Read it, Hal, read it,' said the knight. "'My eyes are old.' Sir Henry Dacre read the letter, the contents of which we have already seen, and Sir Philip Beecham and Mary Markham commented freely thereon, "'marking well its baseness and its craft. "'But Isabel remained silent, "'and looking down at her embroidery, "'her bright eyes let fall a tear. "'Many emotions mingled to produce that drop. "'She felt to her heart's core "'how bitter it must be "'to live with such a doubt "'hanging over us for ever, "'like a dark cloud, "'and the repeated mention of Catherine's name "'called back to her mind, "'in all its freshness, "'the memory of her cousin's sad fate.' and she was led on to think, too, how happy the wayward girl might have been, if she had but known the advantages which heaven had granted her. Dacre saw the tear and marked the silence, and read neither quite aright, for, with a wounded spot in the heart, the lightest touch will give torture. He sat down with the rest, however. He strove to cast off some of his gloom. He told of his journey with Richard of Woodville, and informed the old knight that his late guest, Hal of Hadnock, was now King of England. But while Sir Philip laughed heartily and, and called his sovereign a mad-headed boy, his young friend relapsed into deep meditation, and the black thought that he must be for ever a doubted and suspected man again took possession of his mind. The next morning when he rose he was more cheerful. Sleep, which had visited his eyelids only by short glimpses for the last week, had this night stayed with him undisturbed, and what seemed to him more extraordinary still, sweet dreams had come with slumber, giving him back the happiness of former days. He had seemed a boy again, and had wandered with Isabel Beecham through the woods and fields around, had heard the birds sing on the spray, and watched the fish darting through the stream. Summer and sunshine had been round their path, and that misty splendour which only is seen in the visions of the night, as if poured forth with some secret source in the heart of man, when the pressure of all external things is taken away, 
a slight indication perhaps of the adaptation of his spirit to the enjoyments of a brighter world than this. He slept longer than usual, and when he rose, he found the old knight and his daughter in the hall. "'I am going down, Harry,' said Sir Philip, "'to settle a difference between some of the monks and Roger Daly, of Little Anne, about his field. I shall find you when I come back.' "'Nay, I will go with you, noble friend,' answered Dacre. "'I wish to see my good Lord Abbot.' "'That you cannot do unless you ride to London,' replied the old knight. "'He went yesterday morning early to attend the king's coronation. "'Stay with Isabel and Mary. I shall be back soon.' "'It was too tempting a proposal to be refused, "'and while Sir Philip, with a page carrying his heavy sword, "'walked down to the abbey, Dacre remained with Isabel alone in the hall. "'They watched her father from the door till he entered the wood, "'and then turning, "'walked up and down the rush-covered pavement for several minutes without speaking. "'Dacre's heart was full of anxious thoughts, "'and though he much wished to fathom the feelings of Isabel's heart "'and discover some ground for future hope, "'yet he dreaded to find all his fears verified, "'and the words trembled at the gate of speech without obtaining utterance. "'Isabel, however, was more confident in herself "'and less conscious of her own sensations.' She saw and grieved at the state of Dacre's mind, and longed to give him comfort and consolation, as in days of yore. Finding, then, that he did not begin upon the subject of his cares and sorrows, she resolved to do so herself, and after a pause, during which she felt agitated, and hesitated she knew not why, she said, "'I am glad to speak with you alone, Harry, for I see you are very, very sad, and I would fain persuade you to take comfort.' "'Oh, many things make me thus sad, dear Isabel,' replied the knight with a faint smile. "'But I will try to do better with time.' "'Nay, Harry,' she answered, "'you cannot conceal the cause of your sadness from me. "'I have known you from my childhood too well not to understand it all. "'You were ever jealous too much of your fame. "'And now I know, because this false bad man has insinuated things that never entered your thoughts, "'you fancy people will suspect you.' "'And will they not, Isabel?' "'asked Dacre. "'I should not say perhaps suspect me, "'for suspicion is a more fixed and tangible thing "'than that which I fear. "'But will there not be doubts "'coming in men's minds against their will "'and against their reason? "'Will they not from time to time "'when they think of Henry Dacre "'and this sad history "'and these dark scandals, "'will they not ask themselves, "'What if he were really so?' "'Oh, no, no, Harry,' "'replied his fair companion warmly. "'None will think so who know you.' "'None will think so at all but the base and bad "'who are capable of such acts themselves.' "'Indeed, Isabel,' said Dacre, "'and is such really your belief? "'You know not how suspicion clings, dear lady. "'If you stain a silken garment, "'can you ever make it clear and glossy as once it was? "'And the fame of man or woman "'is of a still finer and frailer texture. "'There one spot, one touch, lasts for ever.' With kind and tender words and every argument that her own small experience could afford, Isabel Beecham tried to reassure him, and she succeeded at least in one thing, in convincing him so far of her full confidence in his honour that he was on the eve of putting it to the strongest test. The acknowledgment of his love hung upon his lips, and, if then spoken, might perchance, in her eagerness to prove her conviction of his innocence, have been met with by that warm return— which would have brought the best balm to his heart, although the first effect upon her might have been agitation and alarm. But ere he could utter the words on which his fate depended, Mary Markham joined them, and he waited for another opportunity. Dacre returned to his own house at night, but every day he went over to the hall, his mood varying like a changeful morning, sometimes sunny with hope and temporary forgetfulness. "'sometimes all cloud and gloom, "'when memory recalled the suspicions "'that had been pointed at him. "'Those suspicions, too, "'were frequently recalled to his mind "'even by his own acts, "'for he eagerly strove to discover "'by whose instrumentality "'his whole course on the unfortunate night "'of poor Catherine Beecham's death "'had been conveyed to Sir Simeon of Royden. "'But by so doing he only fretted his own spirit "'and gained no information.' Whoever was the spy, he remained concealed. Three or four days were thus passed before he obtained any second opportunity of speaking with Isabel alone, but on his arrival at the dwelling of Sir Philip Beecham on the morning of the 9th of April, 
He was told by a servant whom he found in the hall that the family had gone forth into the park, and, following immediately, he found Isabel sitting under the trees without companions. She seemed to have been weeping, and it was a pleasant task for Dacre to strive to console her who had so often been his own comforter. "'There are tears in your eyes, dear Isabel,' he said, as she rose gracefully to meet him. "'What has grieved you?' "'Have you not seen my father?' asked the lady. "'Do you not know that our dear Mary is going to leave us? "'She goes to London today, and he goes with her so far.' "'Indeed!' exclaimed the knight. "'That is very sudden.' "'And very sad,' answered Isabel. "'The hall will be melancholy enough without her now. "'I cannot but weep, and shall never cease to regret her going.' "'Nay, nay, time will bring balm, dear Isabel,' answered Dacre. "'You have often told me so.' "'And have you believed me, Harry?' answered the lady, with a faint and almost reproachful smile. "'Even last night you were more sad and grave than ever.' "'Aye, but this is a different case,' replied Dacre. "'One can lose a friend, aye, even by death. "'One can lose anything more easily than honour and renown.' "'But the loss of yours is only in your own fancy, Dacre,' she answered. "'Who believes this charge that Simeon of Royden dares to hint, but not to avow? "'Whom has it affected? In whom do you see a change? "'Surely not in my father, surely not in me.' "'No, assuredly, Isabel,' he said, after thinking for a while. "'But as yet I have had no occasion to make the trial. "'Hearken, and I will put a case. "'Suppose, dear Isabel, that I were to love. "'Suppose the lady that I loved had heard this tale. "'Suppose that she had loved me well before, and at her knee— I were now to crave the blessing of her hand. Would not a doubt, would not a hesitation cross her mind? Would she not ask herself? Oh, no, cried Isabel. But Dacre went on, not suffering her to conclude. You put it not fully to your own heart, dear Isabel, he said. Suppose you were that lady. Suppose that all Harry Dacre's hopes and happiness for life were staked on your reply. Suppose that you, who have so often consoled him in affliction, calmed him in anger, soothed him in anxiety he were to say isabel will you be my comforter through life the star of my existence the recompense for all i have suffered would not one thought isabel trembled violently and her cheek turned ashy pale it is enough said dacre with a quivering lip i am answered that memory could never be banished from your heart it is enough oh no no cried isabel but as will almost always happen when a word may make all clear, an interruption came. Before she could go on, good old Sir Philip Beecham was seen upon the steps of the house, waving them to come back, with a loud, Hello! They both turned and walked towards the hall in silence. Isabel would fain have spoken, but agitation overpowered her. She wished that Dacre, by a single word, would give her an opportunity of reply. But his oversensitive heart was convinced of her feelings, reading them all wrong, and he would not force her to speak what he thought must be painful for her to utter, and for him to hear. Twice she made up her mind to explain, but twice her heart failed her at the moment of execution, and it was not till they were within a few steps of the place where her father stood, that she could say in a low voice, "'You are mistaken, Harry. Indeed, you are mistaken.' He shook his head with a bitter smile, and walked on in silence. End of chapter 9《Chapter 10 of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Minstrel's Girl. At the hour appointed by the king, Richard of Woodville arrived at the palace and was at once introduced to Henry's presence. The monarch was now quite alone and seemed in a more cheerful, a less meditative mood than the day before. "'Well, Richard,' he said, "'how sped you last night? "'You found a room in hall and a place at board, I trust.' "'I did, sire,' replied Woodville, "'and so long as I was here, t'was well. "'But as I returned homeward to my hostel, "'I saw that done which grieved me, "'and would grieve your highness too, were it told. "'Speak it, speak it,' said the king. I am now in that station where every day I must hear that which offends my ear, if I will perform the first duty of a king, and render justice to my people. What is this you saw? Briefly and accurately, Richard of Woodville, as he had previously determined, related to the monarch the facts attending the death of the old minstrel, 
by the brutal act of Sir Simeon of Roydon and his companions, and he could see Henry's brow gather into a heavy frown and his cheek flush. When he had done, the king rose from his chair before he spoke and walked twice across the small chamber in which the young gentleman had found him. "'This is bad,' he said at length. "'This is bad, but I must not interfere with the course of law. "'The matter will be inquired into, of course. "'If the law should not punish the offence, "'I might myself inflict some chastisement, "'and, by banishing this man from my court and presence, "'mark my indignation at his rash contempt of human life and suffering, "'to call it nothing worse. "'But I have other views, Richard, and if I must strike... "'I would have it effectually.' "'I do not understand you, sire,' replied Woodville, "'seeing that the king paused. "'No, perhaps not,' said Henry, "'and then falling into a fit of musing again, "'he remained for more than a minute "'with his eyes fixed upon the ground. "'Call me a page,' he continued at length. "'I will see this Sir Simeon of Roydon.' "'Richard of Woodville obeyed, "'and when the boy appeared, "'Henry directed him in the clear, brief words,' with which even trivial orders are given by men of powerful and accurate minds, to inquire of the sergeant of the gates where Sir Simeon of Royden was to be found, and then to summon him immediately to his presence. He shall make some compensation to the old man's daughter, or whoever she is, whatever the law may say, the king continued, turning to his companion, after having spoken to the page. But tell me, Richard, was this the only adventure you met with yesterday? "'Ned Dyram told me that someone had spoken to you by name in the crowd, "'bidding you not to let poor Dacre do battle with Simeon of Roydon. "'She anticipated my commands, it would seem.' "'She did so, truly, sire,' replied Woodville, "'but I could never discover who it was, "'though she again spoke to me at the gates of the convent as I came out.' "'It is very strange,' said the king. "'Did you not know the voice?' "'It seemed somewhat disguised,' answered the young gentleman, "'but still it was clearly a woman's voice, "'and there were tones in it not unfamiliar to my ear, "'yet not sufficiently strong on recollection "'to, to enable me in any way to judge who spoke. "'Have we got fairies amongst us, even in Westminster?' "'asked the monarch, laughing. "'Well, my good friend, you have nothing to do "'but obey your fair monitor.' "'In that I shall not fail, sire,' replied Richard, "'for I shall have no cause to prevent or encourage Dacre. "'Simeon of Roydon will take good heed to that, "'but I trust neither the lady nor your highness "'will forbid my chastising this man myself, if need should be, "'for, as I have told you, sire, "'I cast him from his horse last night before his comrades, "'and he will seek revenge in some shape, I am sure.' "'To defend himself is every man's right,' replied the king, "'but I must insist that no arranged encounter takes place "'between you and Sir Simeon of Royden without your sovereign's consent.' "'The king spoke sternly, almost harshly, "'but he added a moment after in a mild and familiar tone, "'The truth is, Richard, that I have resolved as much as possible "'to put a stop both to the trial by battle and combats "'as outrance between my subjects.' The blood of Englishmen is too precious to their king and their country to be shed so frequently as it has hitherto been in private quarrels. The evil is increasing, and if it not be stayed, a time will come when every idle jest will be the subject of a combat, and the man of mere brute courage will venture upon any wrong he chooses to do another, because he values his life less than his neighbour. Such a state shall never grow up under me. The day may not be far distance when, in defence of the rights of this crown, I shall give every English gentleman an opportunity of displaying his valour and his skill. But, till then, I will hold a strong hand over quarrelsome folks, as a last resort for honour really wounded, or, under the sanction of the law, for the judgment of God in dark cases which human wisdom cannot decide— I may consent that an appeal be made to the lance, but not till every other means has been tried. Such is my resolution. Let that suffice you. I know you will obey, and in the court of Burgundy, if I hear right, you will have plenty of occasions, should you be too full of blood, to shed it freely. I have wished to give you some gift, my friend, he continued, in a tone of kindly condescension, but for the present I can think of nothing better than this. 
he took a ring from his finger and held it out to the young gentleman who stood beside him, adding, "'Take it, Richard. Wear it always, and when you look upon it, think of Hall of Hadnock. But should you at any time seek aught of the King of England, seal your letter with that ring, and I will open and read the contents myself, and immediately. It shall go hard, but I will grant you a boon, if it be such as the Richard of Woodville, whom I know, is likely to request.' So farewell, and God speed you, and lead you to honour. Richard of Woodville knelt and kissed the gracious prince's hand, and then, retiring from his presence, sped back to his inn without adventure. All traces of the last day's festival had disappeared. The citizens had resumed their usual occupations. The artisan had gone to his work, the merchant to his warehouse, the tradesman to his stall, the monk to his cloister the priest to his chapel or his church. The streets, though there was many a passenger hurrying to and fro, seemed almost empty by comparison, and a scene that was in itself gay looked dull from the want of all the glitter and pageantry of the preceding afternoon. The inn, called the Acorn, at which Richard of Woodville had taken up his abode, was a low building, in what we still term the Strand, between the cross at Charing and a very small monastery, which was soon after attached to the Abbey of Roncevaux in Navarre, and acquired the name of Roncevaux. The entrance to the acorn was a tall, dark arch, and as soon as Richard of Woodville rode in, followed by his two attendants, for Ned Dyram he had not seen since the day before, the host presented himself, saying, with a low reverence and a smile, "'There has been a fair maid seeking you, noble sir,' There have been many tears in her eyes, too, full lately. I hope you are not a faithless squire to make the pretty maiden weep. Poor thing, she has good cause, answered Woodville gravely. She is the poor old man's daughter, I suppose, who was killed by the horses last night. When did she say she would return? She is here now, she is here now, cried the host's wife from within. How can you be such a fool, Jenkin? I took her in till the noble gentleman returned. I knew she was no light of love, but only came from foreign lands. "'I never said she was, good wife,' replied her husband. "'Shall I bring her up, sir, to your chamber?' "'No,' answered Richard. "'It wants an hour of dinner yet. Let her come with me to the hall, if it be vacant.' "'That it is, discreet sir,' replied the host. "'Now I warrant you,' he continued, murmuring to himself, as he walked away to call the poor girl to her kind benefactor. He has got some lady-love himself, and fears it should come to her ears, were he to entertain a pretty maiden in his own chamber. Perhaps some such thought might pass through Richard of Woodville's mind, but certainly it would never have entered therein, had it not been for the host's first suspicion, and he would have received the poor girl in his own room without hesitation, though the minstrels of that day and their followers were generally a somewhat dissolute and licentious race. It has happened strangely, indeed, in all ages, that those who follow as their profession the sweetest of arts, music, which would seem intended to elevate and purify the mind and heart, should so frequently obnoxious to the charge of immoral life. But so it has been, alas, though difficult to account for. Finding his way through one or two long ill-lighted passages, Richard of Woodville opened the door of the room appropriated to the daily meals of the guests and their host, and had not long to wait for the object of his compassion. She was not dressed in the same manner as the night before, but still her garb was singular. A bright red scarf, which had been twined through her black hair, was no longer there, and the rich, luxuriant tresses were bound plainly round her head, which was partially covered also by a hood of simple grey cloth. The rest of her apparel was white, except at the edge of the petticoat, which came not much below the knee, and was bordered by two bands of gold lace. Her small, delicate ankles, as fair as alabaster, were, nevertheless, without covering, and her feet were clothed in small slippers of untanned leather, trimmed and tied with gold. Bending down her beautiful head as she entered, she said, "'I have come to thank you, noble sir.' "'Nay, no thanks, my fair maiden,' answered Woodville, placing a stool for her to sit, as the host retired. "'I did but what any Christian and gentleman ought to do, 
so say not a word of that but i am glad you have come for i wish much to hear more of you and to know what will become of you now ah oh, what indeed said the girl casting down her eyes which had before been fixed upon the young gentleman's countenance have you no friends no home to which you can go asked woodville in this country no friends that would receive me no home that would be open to me replied the girl the tears rolling over the long black lashes and trickling down her cheek i am not given to yield to sorrow thus she added had i been it would have crushed me long ago but this last blow has been heavy and like a reed beaten down by the storm i shall not raise my head till the sun shines again but you are of english birth inquired richard of woodville if not you speak our tongue rarely oh yes i am english she cried eagerly english in heart in spirit and birth but yet my mother was from a distant land and was that poor old man your father demanded her companion come let me hear something of your former life that i may think what can be done for the future the girl evidently hesitated she coloured and then turned pale and richard of woodville began to fear that in the interest he had taken in her he had been made the fool of imagination she is probably like the rest he thought and yet her very shame to speak it shows that she has some good feelings left but while he was still pondering the girl exclaimed clasping her hands oh yes i am sure i may tell you you are not one who whatever might be his errors would deprive a poor old man of blessed ground to rest in or the prayers of good men for his soul not i indeed replied the young gentleman methinks we have no right to carry justice or punishment beyond the grave when the spirit is called to its creator let him be the judge not man but speak i do not understand you clearly i will make my tale short she answered the old man was my father's father a minstrel once in the house of the great earl of northumberland i can just remember the earl and a gay and happy household it was he was well paid and much loved by the good lord and wealthy by his bounty my father was stout and tall a brave man and skilful in arms and he was the percy's henchman once when the earl's kinsman went to the court of the emperor my father was sent with him i have heard and he returned with my mother a native of a town called innsbruck in the mountains i know not whether you have heard of it but it is a fair city in good truth you have seen it then asked richard of woodville not a year since answered the girl but to my tale when i was still young my father fought and fell with hotspur and not long after the duke's household was dispersed and he himself obliged to fly to wales or scotland i know not which my mother pined and died for the people there loved not a stranger amongst them and after my father's death called her naught but the foreigner they laughed too at her language for she could speak but poor english and what between their gibes and her own grief she withered away daily till her eyes closed she taught me her own language however and i have not forgot it she taught me her own faith too and i have not abandoned it and that was exclaimed richard the holy catholic faith replied the girl crossing herself and nothing has ever been able to turn me from it but still i could not let it break all bonds could i noble sir perhaps not replied richard of woodville but let me hear farther when the earl fled and my mother died continued the girl my grandfather took me with him to the town of york and as he was wealthy as i have said his kinsfolk who were many in the place were glad to see him he was very kind to me oh how kind and taught me to sing and play on many instruments but there came a disciple of wycliffe into the town where there were already many lollards in secret and the poor old man listened to them and became one of them i would not hear them for i ever thought of my mother and what she had taught me and this caused the first unkind words my grandfather ever gave me he mourned them afterwards when he found i was not undutiful as he had called me but in the meantime he went on with the lollards till one night as they were coming from a place where they had met a crowd of rabble and loose people set upon them with sticks and stones and beat them terribly 
and the poor old man was brought home with his face and eyes sadly cut. Some of the lollas were taken, and two were tried and burnt as heretics, but my grandfather escaped that fate, for by this time his eyes had become red and fiery, and he kept close to his own house. The redness at length went away, but light went too, and he was in daily fear of persecution. One night, when he was very sad, I asked him why he stayed in York, where there were so many perils, but he shook his head and answered, "'Because I am sightless, my child, and I have none to guide me.' Then I asked him again if he had not me, and if he thought I would not go with him to the world's end, and I found by what he said that he had long thought of going to foreign lands, but did not speak of it, because he thought that, as I would not hear his people, I would refuse to go. When he found I was ready, however, his mind was soon made up, and we first went to a town called Liege, where he had a brother, and there we lived happily enough for some time. For that brother and all his family thought on many matters with him, but he heard of a man named Huss, who is a great leader of that sect in a country called Bohemia, and he resolved to go thither, as he was threatened with persecution in Liege. We then wandered far and wide, through strange lands, but why should I make my tale long? We suffered many things, were plundered, wronged, persecuted, beaten, and the money that he had began to melt away with no resource behind, for we had heard that our own relations and friends in York had pillaged his house, and one had taken possession of it as his own. I then proposed to him that I should sing at festivals and tournaments, that we might keep the little he still had against an evil day. Thus we came through Germany and Burgundy, and part of France and Brabant, and at length he determined that he would come back to his own country, which he did, only to be murdered last night, for we have not been a month in England. Alas, my poor girl, said Richard of Woodville, yours is indeed a sad history, and in truth I know not what counsel to give you for the future. Alone as you are in the world, you need someone much to protect you. I do indeed, replied the girl, but I have none. And yet, she added after a moment, these are foolish thoughts brought upon me but by grief. I can protect myself. Many have a worse fate than I have, for how often are those who have been softly nurtured cast suddenly into misfortune and distress? I have been inured to it by degrees, taught step by step to struggle and resist. Mine is not a heart to yield to evil chances. The little that I want in life, I trust, I can honestly obtain. If not honestly, why, I can die. There is still a home for the wanderer. There is still a place of repose for the weary. But as she spoke, the tears that rolled over her cheeks belied the fortitude which she assumed. Richard of Woodville paused and meditated ere he replied. Stay, he said at length, as the girl rose and covered her head again with her hood, which she had cast back as if you were about to depart. Stay, a thought has struck me. Perchance I can call the king's bounty to you. I myself am now about to depart for distant lands. I am going to the court of Burgundy in a few days, and shall not see our sovereign again before I set out. But I have a servant who was once the king's, and he will have the means of telling your sad tale. To the court of Burgundy? exclaimed the girl eagerly. Oh, that I were going thither with you. "'That may hardly be,' replied Woodville with a smile, as she gazed with her large brown eyes upon his face. "'I know it,' she answered, sighing, and cast her eyes down to the ground again, with the blood mounting into her cheek. "'Yet why not in the same ship? I have kinsfolk both in Liege and in Peron. You would not see wrong done to me?' "'Assuredly not.' said the young gentleman, but if the king can be engaged to show you kindness, it will be better. What little I can spare, my poor girl, shall be yours, and I will send this man of whom I spoke to see you and tell you more. First, however, you must let me know where you are lodged, and for whom he must ask, as it may be three or four days before he returns from the errand he is now gone to perform. My name is Ella Brune, replied the girl, and she went on to describe to Richard of Woodville the situation of the house in which she and her grandfather had taken up their abode on their arrival in London a few days before. 
He found from her account that it was a small hostel just within the walls of the city, which the old man had known and frequented in former years, that the host and his good dame were kind and homely people, and that, though the poor girl had remained out watching the corpse at the lodge of the convent, she had returned that morning to explain the cause of her absence, and had been received with sympathy and consolation. Knowing well, however, that there is a limit to the tenderness of most innkeepers, and that that limit is seldom, if ever, extended beyond the length of their guest's purse, the young gentleman took three half-nobles, which, to say truth, was as much as he could spare, and offered them to his fair companion, saying, "'Trouble yourself not in regard to expenses of the funeral, Ella, or of the masses. The porter of the convent has been here this morning, before I went out, and I have arranged all that with him.' The girl looked at the money in his hand with a tearful eye and a burning cheek, but after gazing for a moment she put his hand gently away, saying, "'No, no, I cannot take it. From you I cannot take it.' "'And why not from me?' asked Richard of Woodville in some surprise. She hesitated for an instant, and then replied, "'Because you have been so good and kind already. Were it from a stranger, I might, but you have already given me much, paid much, and you shall not hurt yourself for me. I have enough.' "'Nay, nay, Ella,' said Richard, with a smile. "'If I have been kind, that is a reason why you must not grieve me by refusing the little I can give. As to what I have paid, I will say to you, with little John, whom you have heard of, I have done thee a good turn for an quit me when thou may. And what did Robin answer, said the girl, a light coming into her eyes as she forgot, for an instant, her loss and her desolate situation in the struggle of generosity which she kept up against her young benefactor? Nay, by my troth, said Robin, so shall it never be. It must be, if you would not pain me, replied Richard of Woodville. You must not be left in this wide place, my poor girl, without friend or money. Nay, but I have enough, she answered. If I were tempted to take it, would only be with the thought of crossing the sea, which costs much money, I know. Then take it for that chance, my poor Ella, replied Woodville, forcing the money into her hand, and tell me what store you have got, in order that... If I have aught more to spare, when I have received what my copsewood brings, I may send it to you by the servant I spoke of. Indeed, I know not, said Ella Brune. There is a small leathern bag at the inn, in which we used to put all that we gathered, but I thought not to look what it contained. My heart was too heavy when I went back to reckon money. But there is enough to pay all that we owe, I know. And as for the time to come, she added with a melancholy smile, I eat little and drink less, so that my diet is soon paid. Her words and manner had that harmony in them, which can rarely be attained when both do not spring from the heart. And Richard of Woodville became more and more interested in the fair object of his kindness every moment. He detained her some time longer to ask farther questions, but at length, the host opened the door and told him there was a young man without who sought to speak with him. This interruption terminated his conversation with Ella Brune, for, drawing her hood farther still over her face, she again rose, took his hand, and pressed her lips upon it. "'The blessing of the Queen of Heaven be upon you, noble sir,' she said, and then passed through the door, at which the landlord still stood, wondering a little at the deep gratitude which she seemed to feel towards his young guest. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Agincourt, a romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Deceiver The King of England remained seated for many minutes exactly where Richard of Woodville had left him. His right hand rested on the arm of his chair, his left upon the hilt of his dagger, and his eyes remained fixed apparently upon the heavy building of the abbey, such as it then appeared, before a far successor of his, added to its structure, rich and perhaps beautiful in itself, but sadly out of keeping with the rest of the pile. But Henry saw not the long straight lines of the solemn mass of masonry, he heard not the bells chiming from the belfry hard by. His mind was absent from the scene in which his body dwelt, 
and his thoughts busy with things very different from those that surrounded him. On what did they rest? Over what did the spirit of the great English monarch ponder the very day after he had solemnly assumed the crown and scepter? Who can say? He might, perhaps, remember other days with some regret, for we can never lose aught that we have possessed without some mournful feelings of deprivation returning upon us from time to time, however great and empowering be the compensation that we obtain. We can never change from one state and station in our mortal course to another without sometimes thinking of former joys and gone by happiness, even though we have acquired grander blessings and a more expansive sphere. And, oh, how great is the change, even from the position of a prince to that of a monarch! So great, indeed, that none who have not known it can even divine. He might already, perhaps, feel what a burden a crown may sometimes become, how heavy are occasionally the gorgeous robes of state. He might look back to the free buoyancy of his early life, and long to roam the wide plains and fields of his kingdom alone, and at his ease. Or he might think of friendship, and there was none more capable of knowing and valuing it aright, and might wonder whether a monarch could indeed have a friend, one into whose bosom he could pour his secret thoughts, or with whose wit he could try his own, in free but not undignified encounter, one in whom he could trust, and with whom he might relax, certain that the condescension of the sovereign would not be mistaken, nor the confidence of the friend betrayed. Again he might ponder upon all the difficulties and pains of a royal station. He might think, each of my subjects is burdened with his own cares and anxieties, but I with the care and anxiety of the whole. Or his mind might turn to the especial troubles and discomforts of a monarch, and remember how many he must have to disappoint, how often he must have to punish, how much he must have to refuse how seldom he might be permitted to forgive, what great works he must necessarily leave undone, what good deeds he might be obliged to neglect, what faults he must be called upon to overlook, what pain and grief, even to the good and wise, a stern necessity might compel him to inflict. He might perhaps think of any or all of these things, for they were all within the grasp of his character as Henry was peculiarly a thoughtful monarch. We are indeed only accustomed to look upon him either as a wild youth, suddenly and somewhat strangely reformed, or as a great conqueror and skilful general, a prudent and ambitious prince. But those who will inquire into his private life, who will mark the recorded words that occasionally broke from his lips, trace the causes and course of his actions, examine his conduct to his friends, and even to his enemies, who will, in short, strip off the monarch's robes and look upon the man, will find a meditative spirit, though a quick one, a warm heart, though a firm one, a rich and lively imagination, though a clear and vigorous judgment. He was not one to take upon him the cares of government without feeling all their weight, to regard a throne as a seat of ease and pleasure, or to assume the grand responsibilities of sovereign power without examining them steadfastly and sternly, seeing all that is bright and all that is dark therein, and feeling keenly every sacrifice for which they call. To love and to be loved by a whole nation, to give and to receive happiness by a wise government of a great people, is assuredly a mighty recompense for all the pains of royal station but yet those pains will be felt hourly while the reward is afar, and the monarch's conversation with Richard of Woodville had awakened him to some of those evils which the wisest rule cannot entirely remedy. Almost under the window of his palace on the very day of his coronation, in the midst of rejoicing and festivity, one of his subjects, an innocent, inoffensive old man, had been brutally deprived of life by a party of those who had been feasting at his own table, and when he remembered all the scenes with which the course of his early life had made him acquainted throughout this wide land, he saw what a task it would be to restrain the wild license of a host of turbulent nobles, and to bind them to submission to the laws, and to reverence for the rights 
and happiness of others. The monarch was still deep in thought when the page whom he had sent for Sir Simeon of Roydon returned, announcing that he was in waiting without, and Henry at once ordered him to be admitted. The knight advanced with courtly bows and more than due reverence, for he was one of those who, overbearing and haughty to their inferiors, are always cringing and fawning towards those above them, at least until they are detected. But Henry came to the point at once, saying with a stern brow, I hear matters regarding you, Sir Simeon of Roydon, that please me not, and I would fain hear from your own lips what explanation you can give. Know, sir, that the subjects of this crown are not to be murdered with impunity, and that sooner or later blood will find a tongue to accuse those that spill it. The knight turned somewhat pale under the keen eye of the king, but he answered at once in smooth and fluent tones. I was not aware, sire, that I had done aught that should bring upon me the greatest punishment that I could receive, that of falling under the displeasure of your highness. For any other infliction which might follow that severe misfortune would seem nothing in comparison, or light indeed, if by any bodily suffering I could remove the heavy weight of your anger. May I humbly inquire what is my fault? It must be great, I am sure, though I know it not, to make so clement a king regard his servant so harshly. It is great, sir, replied Henry, who could not be deluded with fair words. Did you not, last night, after quitting the hall below, cause the death of an old man by a most brutal outrage? Nay, heaven forbid, cried Roydon, with well-feigned surprise and grief. Your Highness does not, I trust, mean to say that the poor old man is dead. He was killed upon the spot, sir, answered Henry, and I am told you did not even stop to inquire what had been the result of your own act. I will go home and have him slaughtered without delay, exclaimed Royden, as if speaking to himself in a paroxysm of regret. Have whom slaughtered? asked the king, gazing upon him coldly, for he began to divine the course his defence was to take. The brute that did it, sire, replied the knight, three times has that horse nearly deprived me of life, which I heeded not much, for it is a fine, though unruly, animal. But now that he has taken the life of another, his own shall be forfeit. Scarcely had I mounted when, with a bit between his teeth, he set off at full speed. Some of my companions galloped after to stop him, if possible, but were unable, till a gentleman on foot, I know not who, caught the bridle in the crowd, and I, not seeing what had befallen, rode on, keeping him in with difficulty. A slight smile curled the lip of the king, showing to Sir Simeon Royden that he was not fully believed, and a dark feeling of anger, the rage of detective meanness, gathered itself in the inmost recesses of his heart, with only the more bitter intensity, because he dared not suffer it to peep forth. There is nothing that we hate so much as one whom, however much he may offend us, we cannot injure. Vengeance is the drink by which the dire thirst of hate is often assuaged, but if that cannot by any possibility be obtained, the burning of the heart goes on increasing till it becomes the unquenchable drought of fever. The monarch answered calmly, however, and without further reproach, your tale, Sir Simeon, he said, is somewhat different from that which previously reached my ears. I trust it can be substantiated in all its parts, for this matter must be investigated fully. The Crown Officer will, of course, do his duty by inquest upon the body. It will be well for you to be present, and the law will then take its due effect. Retire for a time, sir, to another chamber, and I will cause inquiry to be made as to when a jury will be ready to investigate the case. Sir Simeon of Royden bowed with a sad and respectful countenance, and turned towards the door, but when he reached it, the expression of his face, now averted from the king, was very different from that which it had been a moment before. A mocking smile sat upon his lip, the sneering, bitter expression of a bad spirit, which has gained some advantage over a nobler one, but it was gone again the moment he opened the door and stood in presence of two or three attendants, who were waiting in the ante-room. At the same instant the voice of Henry called the page, and Sir Simeon, pausing and seating himself, could hear the king give orders for making the inquiries which he had mentioned. 
In less than twenty minutes the page returned and entered the monarch's closet, after which the knight was recalled. "'I find, sir,' said Henry, when he appeared again before him, "'that uncommonly quick proceedings have been taken in this case. "'The inquest has sat already, and the good men have pronounced the death accidental. "'So far the finding is satisfactory, but as it is clear that the accident occurred "'by your furious riding of a horse, which you yourself acknowledge to be vicious and dangerous, "'I have to require that you make the only compensation that can be made to the person "'who I am told is this old man's grandchild.' You will, therefore, go at once to the hospital of St. James, and there, or elsewhere, when you have found her, will pay to this poor girl the sum of fifty half-nobles, expressing your sorrow, which doubtless you feel sincerely, for the evil you have occasioned. Sir Simeon of Royden bowed, with every appearance of respect, but there was a scowl upon his brow, and he could not refrain from asking, "'May I inquire, sire, whether this fine is imposed by the inquest?' or whether it be the award of your highness, for if... Henry's cheek flushed, and the impetuous spirit which had made him in early years strike the judge upon the bench, roused itself for a moment in his heart. It was conquered speedily, however, and he murmured to himself, No, I will not act the tyrant. Sir Simeon, he continued aloud, waving his hand, the award is mine, as you say. It is my desire that this should be done. You will do it or not, as you think fit, for I will not strain the laws. But if it be not done, never present yourself before me again. That, at the least, I may require, sir, though the verdict of the jury can but affect the horse you rode. Your Highness did not hear me out, replied Royden, who had now recovered the mastery of himself. I did but presume to ask, because if such a fine had been imposed by the jury, I should have resisted it, as contrary to law. But at the command of your highness I pay it, not only with submission, but with pleasure, as the only means I have of showing both my regret at what has taken place, and my eager desire to conform myself in all things to your will. Not an hour shall pass before you are certified that I have not only obeyed, but gone beyond your orders, and so I humbly take my leave. The words were well and gracefully spoken, and Henry found no occasion to complain of the knight's demeanour but still he was not satisfied that his obedience was the submission of the heart, for he knew right well that fair words, ay, and fair actions too, are often but the cloaks of sly and subtle knavery, and the character of Sir Simeon of Royden was not new to him. He replied merely, So you shall do well, sir, and bowed his head as a signal that he might depart. The knight quitted his presence in no happy mood, perceiving right well that the monarch's favour, on which he had counted much, had been lost and not regained. He hated him for the clear-sighted penetration which had seen through his heart, and he only doubted whether there was or was not a chance of still deceiving his sovereign, and recovering his good graces by an appearance of zeal and devotion in obeying his commands. "'It is worth the trial,' he thought, "'and it shall be tried, "'but I shall soon find whether he continues to nourish such ill-will towards me, "'and if he do, my course must be shaped accordingly. "'Curses upon those beggarly vagrants! "'Who ever heard of King before, "'who troubled his nobility about minstrels and tombosteers? "'This smacks of the early tastes of a magnanimous monarch "'whose sole delight within these two months "'was in pot-house tipplers and loose gamers.' He may assume a royal port and solemn manner if he will, but the habit of years is not so easily conquered, and if he trip now, he is lost. Men were tired enough of his usurping father. A new prince carries the ever-changing multitude at his heels, but time will bring weariness, and weariness is soon changed into disgust. We shall see, we shall see, and the day of vengeance may come. In the meantime, of one at least I have had retribution, and this other shall not long escape, a rude ballad-singing peasant only fit for the brute sport of the bull-baiting or the fair, a very franklin in spirit and a yeoman in heart. With thoughts which, as the reader may have perceived, have deviated from the king to Richard of Woodville, with thoughts wavering with a strong inclination to bold evil, but chained down to mere knavery for the time, by some remaining chances of success, for, strange as it may seem, as many men are rendered cowards 
by hope as by fear, Sir Simeon of Royden pursued his way to the hospital of St. James on foot, having hastened to the presence of the king without waiting for his horses. As, still in deep and angry thought, he approached the gate and the old lodge, he raised his eyes somewhat suddenly at an advancing step, and beheld the form of a young girl with her long, dark eyelashes bent down till they rested on her cheek. He caught but a momentary glance as she hurried by, but Simeon of Royden was quick and eager in, in his examination of all that is beautiful in mere form, and that glance was sufficient to rouse no very holy feelings. The rounded limbs, the small and delicate foot and ankle, the fine chiselled features, the graceful easy movements, the exquisite neck and bosom half hidden by the folds of the grey hood, were all marked in an instant and as she seemed alone, without defence or protection, he hesitated for a moment whether to stop and speak to her, but while he paused she was gone with a quick step. The gate of the convent was near, and resisting the passing temptation, he walked on and rang the bell. The porter slowly opened the gate, and, with the tone of careless and haughty indifference, which has always marked the inferior personages of a court, I mean the inferior in mind, more than inferior in rank or station, the knight said, There was an old man killed near this spot last night, I think. There was, noble sir, answered the porter, with a low reverence to his air of superiority. The body has been removed to the chapel. I care naught about the body, rejoined Royden. He had a daughter or granddaughter or something with him. Where is she? She has gone forth, noble sir replied the porter. You must have passed her at the gate. Ha! What? A girl with a grey hood and a white coat, with some gold at the edge? asked the knight. The same, noble sir, said the old man. Poor thing, she is sadly afflicted. Send her to me when she comes back, and I will comfort her, answered the visitor in a light tone. Nay, sir, she is none of those, I'll warrant, replied the porter, very little edified, and I give no such messages here. "'Thou art a fool, old man,' said Sir Simeon of Royden. "'Will she come back hither?' "'Doubtless she will,' answered the other, "'for better comfort than you can give.' "'Pshaw, oh, art thou a preacher?' demanded the knight with a sneer. "'The comfort that I have to give is gold, by the king's command. "'So tell her to come to Burwash House, close by the temple gate, "'up the lane to the left, and ask for Simeon of Royden. "'If I be not within, I will leave the money with a servant.' "'But bid her come quickly, for I must tell the king as soon as his bounty is bestowed. "'When will she be here?' "'That I know not,' answered the old man. "'The prioress bade me give her admission to the parlour whenever she came, "'for the ladies and sisters have taken her case much to heart. "'But the young woman did not say when she would return. "'Perhaps it would be better for you to leave the money with the lady prioress herself, "'who would render it to her when she sees her.' "'Give advice to those who ask it, my friend,' replied Royden. "'I know best what are the king's commands and my duty, "'so tell her what I say on the part of his highness, "'and tell her come as speedily as may be.' "'The knight then turned, and, with a haughty step, "'took his way back to Burwash House, "'the London mansion of a distant kinsman, "'who, in reverence of his newly acquired wealth, "'permitted the heir of poor Catherine Beecham, to inhabit it during his own absence from the capital. Sir Simeon of Royden was now enjoying to the full that which he had long earnestly desired, the prosperity of riches which he had never before known, for his own estate had originally been small, and had soon been encumbered under the influence of expensive tastes and vain ostentation. Unchastened by adversity, unreclaimed by experience, he was now living as much beyond his present as he had previously lived beyond his former fortune. The grooms and attendants of all kinds waited him at his dwelling, chosen from the scum of a great city, which always affords a multitude of serviceable knaves, ready to aid an heir to spend his inheritance, and by obsequious compliance with all rash or vicious desires, to secure themselves in participation in the plunder during the term of its existence. To some of these worthies, whom he found in the court, he gave orders for the immediate admission of poor Ella Brune as soon as she appeared, 
and then, betaking himself to a chamber on the first floor, he occupied himself for somewhat more than an hour in thinking over future plans, no inconsiderable portion of which referred to the gratification of many of the pleasant little passions that, like strong drink, by turns stimulate and delay the thirst of a depraved mind. Revenge, or rather the gratification of hate, for revenge presupposes injury, was predominant, though ambition had a goodly share also. To become that for which he thought himself well fitted, but towards which he had never hitherto been able to take one step, a great and prominent man, was one principal object, to take a share in the mightier deeds of life, to rule and influence others, to command, to be looked up to, to receive authority and wield it at all. Oh, how often does that desire to become a great man render one a little man? How often is it the source of littleness in those who might otherwise be great indeed? When the greatest philosopher that modern ages has produced declared that, to rise to dignities we must submit to indignities, how powerful to debase the mightiest mind did that longing to become a great man show itself? How constantly, through his whole career, do we see it producing all that made him other than great? It was, and is ever, the result of the one grand fundamental error, the misappreciation of real greatness, and thus we desire to become great in the eyes of other men, not in our own, to win the applause of worms, not merit the approbation of God. Such pitiful elevation was the only greatness coveted by him of whom we speak, but that was not the only desire which moved him. He longed for indulgence of every kind, from which straitened circumstances had long debarred him. He thought of pleasures with the eagerness of a Tantalus, who had for years beheld them close to his lip without the power of bringing them within his taste. And like a famished beast, he was ready to fall upon the food of appetite wherever it could be found. But still cunning, both natural and that acquired from the ready teacher of all evil to inferior minds, poverty, was at hand to bring certain restraints which wisdom and virtue were not there to enforce. There was a consciousness in his breast that too great eagerness often disappoints its own desires, and that he was too eager, and therefore he resolved that he would be cautious too. But such resolutions usually fail somewhere, for cautiousness is the guardian who does not always watch when she is without the companionship of rectitude. Such reflections were still busily occupying his mind, and he had arrived at sincere regret for the rash and brutal act which he had committed the night before, not because it was evil, but because it was imprudent, when a page opened the door and ushered Ella Brune into the room. The poor girl knew not whom she was coming to see. She had taken no note of the face or form of him whose cruel carelessness had deprived her of the only support she had. She had not listened to the words that passed between him and Richard of Woodville. She stood before him, unconscious that he was the slayer of her old companion. Let the reader mark that fact well. Nevertheless, as soon as she saw him, she turned deadly pale, and her limbs trembled. But Sir Simeon of Royden took a smooth and pleasant tone, and as soon as the page was gone and had closed the door, he asked, "'They gave you my message, then, pretty maid?' At the same time, he placed a stool for her and motioned her to be seated. "'They told me, sir,' she answered in a low tone, "'that you had commands for me from the king.' "'And so I have, fair maiden,' replied Simeon of Royden. "'But I pray you, sit. This has been a sad event. I grieve for it much. I was not aware till this morning that my runaway charger had done such damage.' "'And you were the man?' demanded Ella Brune, suddenly raising her eyes to his face. As she did so, she found him gazing at her from head to foot, taking in all the beauties of her face and form, as an experienced judge remarks the points of a fine horse, and she drew her hood farther over her brow, not well satisfied with the eager and passionate look of admiration which his countenance displayed. "'I was unfortunate enough to be so,' answered Royden, perceiving her gesture, and thinking it as well to put some little restraint upon himself— though he never dreamed that a poor minstrel's girl could seriously resist the solicitation of a man of wealth and station. I regret it deeply, he continued, 
but the brute overpowered me. By the king's commands, I bear you fifty half-nobles. Here they are. And, for my own satisfaction, I will give you the same. As he spoke, he held out a purse to her, but Ella Brune drew back. The king's bounty, she said, I will receive with gratitude. But from you, I will take nothing. And pray why not, sweet girl, asked Simeon of Royden. The king cannot grieve for what has happened half as much as I do, or be half as eager to comfort and console you. Nay, sit down and speak to me. And taking her hand, he led her back to the stool, much against her will. I would fain hear what can be done for you, he added. I fear you may be friendless and unprotected, and I long to make up to you as far as possible for the loss you have sustained. I am indeed alone in the world, replied the fair girl, but not friendless and unprotected while I trust in God. Yes, but God uses human means, answered Royden, who was every moment growing more eager in the pursuit, which at first had been but as the chase of a butterfly. And you must let me be his instrument, as I have caused, unwillingly, this evil to befall you. I have a beautiful small cottage on my lands, where the trees fall round and shade it in the winter from the wind, in the summer from the sun. The woodbine and rose gather round the door, and a sparkling stream dances within sight. There, if you will accept such a refuge, you can live in peace and tranquillity, protected from all the harm and wrong that might happen to you in great cities for you are too young and too lovely to escape wiles, and perhaps violence, if you are left without good ward in such resorts of men as these. A smile came upon the lip of Ella Broom, but it was of a very mingled and shameful expression. Perhaps the awakening of some old remembered dream of happy days might render it at first soft and gentle, and the next instant the recollection of how that dream had faded might sadden and then again the transparency of his baseness mixed a touch of scorn with it, and she answered, "'That can never be, sir. I seek no protection, but that I have, and cannot accept yours. I am able, as I am accustomed, to guard myself, and will do so still. I think you have mistaken me, but it matters not. I seek neither gold nor favour from you, and if you would make atonement for bad deeds, it must be to God, not me.' As she spoke, she rose and turned to quit the room, and Simeon of Royden hesitated for a moment whether he should not detain her by force, for those were days of violence, and her very coldness had rendered the passion he began to feel towards her but the more impetuous. He remembered, however, that there might be those who expected her return, that the place whither she had gone was known at the monastery, and that the king's eye might be upon his conduct towards her. These calculations passed like lightning through his mind, and he chose his course in an instant. Stay, he cried, stay one minute more, sweet girl. I have not mistaken you at all. I would not even force my protection on you. But at least receive this, for I must tell the king that it is paid. His bounty, replied Ella, I will not refuse, as I said before, and offer him my deepest thanks, but from you I will receive nothing. "'Well, then, take these fifty pieces,' said her companion. "'They are given by the king's command. "'We shall meet again, fair maid, "'and then perhaps you will know me better.' "'I seek to know no more,' she answered, "'taking the gold he gave. "'I have known enough.' "'And turning to the door, she left him, "'murmuring to herself, "'Would that the king had sent it by other hands.' "'Simeon of Royden followed her to the gates, "'beckoning up two of his servants as he went. "'Quick,' he whispered, you see that girl? Follow her wherever she goes. Find out her name, her dwelling, every particular you can gather, and bring me your tidings with all speed. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Agincourt, A Romance by George Payne Rainsford James This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hours of Joy Probably there is a period in the life of every one, if it be not cut short in very early years, when the blossom is still upon the trees of existence, in which the heart is so depressed by a reiteration of those misfortunes which generally come in groups, that the unexpected announcement of an unnamed visitor causes us to look up with feeling of dread, as if some new sorrow were about to be added to the list of those endured. 
but such was not yet the case with Richard of Woodville, for though many of the events which had lately passed had tended to make him somewhat more grave and thoughtful than in younger days, yet neither griefs nor anxieties nor disappointments had been heavy enough to weigh down a spirit naturally buoyant. His heart might be called light and free, for though burdened with some cares and tied by the silver chain of love, yet hope, bright, vigorous, rarely tiring hope, helped him to carry his load, and the bond between him and sweet Mary Markham was not one to fetter the energies of his mind, or to dim the brightness of expectation. But above all things his bosom was perfectly free from guile, and in a house so cleanly kept there is always light, unless every window be closed by the hands of death or of despair. He looked, therefore, to see who the stranger could be that asked for him, with some curiosity, perhaps, but no alarm, and was surprised but well pleased when the figure of honest Hugh of Clapford darkened the door. "'Ah, Hugh!' he exclaimed. "'Is that you? What has brought you to Westminster? Are you also going to seek service in foreign lands?' "'Faith, sir, I know not what I am going to do,' replied the good yeoman. "'I came up here with my lord, and wait his pleasure.' "'With your lord?' exclaimed Woodville in astonishment. "'And what, in the name of fortune and all her freaks, has brought my uncle to Westminster? Was he summoned to the coronation?' "'Good truth, noble sir, I know not.' "'answered Hugh of Clatford. "'He has not told me why he came, "'but I chanced to meet your man, Hob, "'and asked him where you might be found, "'but to come and see you and how you fared.' "'Thanks, you, thanks,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'True friend findeth true friend wherever they follow, "'and summer's no summer that wanteth the swallow. "'But whom has my uncle with him?' "'He would have fain asked if Mary Markham was near,' but the question would not be spoken, and Hugh of Clatford saved him the trouble of farther inquiry. "'He has brought no one but myself,' he said, "'and Roger Vale, and Martin the henchman, "'and one or two lads with the horses, and a page, and the Lady Mary.' "'Ah! And is that sweet lady here?' asked Woodville, "'in as calm and grave a tone as a very joyous heart could use. "'But he has not brought my cousin Isabel?' "'No, good sooth,' rejoined the yeoman. "'He and the Lady Mary came off in haste "'on the arrival of a messenger from London.' "'That is strange,' said Richard of Woodville. "'But then he thought that, perchance, "'his friend Harry Dacre had sped well in his suit to Isabel, "'and that the old knight might have left her to cheer him at the hall. "'Nor was such a course unlikely in that age, "'for there were then fewer observances "'and stiff considerations of propriety than in later days.' since rules and regulations were more powerful, though but of air, than the locks and eunuchs of an eastern harem, have tied down the most innocent intercourse of those who love, and every lady in the land is watched with the dragon's eyes of parental prudence. Love was then looked upon with reverence and regarded as a safeguard rather than a peril. There was more confidence in virtue, more trust in honour. After a short pause, Richard of Woodville inquired where his uncle was lodged, and to the great disappointment of his host, who, while he was still speaking with Hugh of Clatford, entered to set out the tables for the approaching meal. The young gentleman accompanied the good yeoman, fasting as he was, to visit good Sir Philip Beecham, as he said, but, in truth, to sun himself in Mary's eyes. Fortune, though she be a spiteful jade, would occasionally favour true lovers, and she certainly showed herself particularly benign to Richard of Woodville in the present instance. Hurrying on with Hugh of Clatford, he made his way through the crowded streets of Westminster, till, at the outskirts of the town near where now stands George Street, he reached the gates of a large house in a garden where Sir Philip Beecham had taken up his abode. With all due reverence he asked for his uncle, but he must not be looked upon as a very undutiful nephew, if we admit that he was not a little rejoiced to find that the good old knight had gone forth, leaving fair Mary Markham behind. Guided by Hugh of Clapford, who very well understood all that was passing in the young gentleman's heart, Richard was soon in his fair lady's bower, and certainly Mary's bright face expressed quite as much pleasure to see him as he could have desired. It expressed surprise also, however, and after chiding him, not very harshly, for a sweet liberty he took with her arched lips, she exclaimed, 
"'But how are you here, Richard? "'I thought you were firm at Mion, "'polishing armour and trying horses.' Now Richard of Woodville, as soon as he heard that Mary was in the same city with himself, had formed his own conclusions in regard to various matters that had puzzled him the day before, and he answered gaily, "'What, deceiver? Do you think I do not know your arts? You would have me believe you were ignorant that I was here, and must tease your poor lover twice in the course of yesterday, by letting him hear your voice, yet hiding the face that he loves best from his sight?' "'Nay, dear Richard,' replied Mary, with a look of still greater surprise than before, "'you are speaking riddles to me. "'You could not hear my voice yesterday, at least in Westminster, "'unless, indeed, it were late at night, "'and then it must have been in sad, dolorous tones, "'for I was very tired. "'We did not reach this place till three hours after dark. "'But what is it you mean by daring to call Mary a deceiver, "'when you know right well I could not cheat you "'into thinking that I did not love you?' though I tried hard to look as demure as a cat in the sunshine. "'Are you sincere now, Mary? Are you telling me the truth?' asked Richard, still half inclined to doubt. But the moment after he added, "'Yet I know you are, my Mary, without guile. Truth gives you half your beauty, Mary. It lights your eyes, it smiles upon your lips. Yet this is very strange, and I thought that I had discovered the key to a mystery which must puzzle me still.' "'but hear what has happened, and you shall judge.' "'And he proceeded to relate the injunctions "'which had been twice laid upon him the day before "'by some unseen acquaintance in the crowd. "'Mary Markham was not less surprised and puzzled than himself, "'especially as he persisted "'in asserting the words had been spoken by a female voice. "'But they soon abandoned that topic "'to turn to others of deeper interest to their own two hearts.' the cause of Sir Philip Beecham's journey to the capital, and the future fate of his fair companion. "'In truth, Richard,' said Mary, in answer to some of his questions, "'I am well nigh as ignorant as yourself of what is about to happen. All I know is that Sir Philip told me I should probably soon see my father again.' "'And who is your father, my sweet Mary?' asked Woodville with a smile. Mary gazed at him for an instant with a look of touched and gratified affection, and then asked, "'And did Richard of Woodville really seek poor Mary Markham's hand, then, without knowing aught of her state and station? Was he willing to take her dowerless, friendless, stationless, almost nameless?' "'Good faith, dear Mary,' answered Woodville, "'I should be right glad to take you any way I could get you. And if dower or station or friends or aught else stand in the way,' Even down to this pretty robe, whose hem I kiss, I pray you, Mary, cast it off. I shall be right glad to have you in kirtle, if it be but of hodden grey. Mary Markham smiled and blushed, and her bright, merry eyes acquired a softer and more glistening light from the dew of happy emotion that spangled her long eyelashes. Well, Richard, she said, I do not love you the less for that. Tis a bold speech, perhaps, and one that I should not make. "'but once having owned what I feel, why should I hide it now?' "'File knows who will blame you, dearest lady,' answered Woodville. "'Who should feel shame for love? "'The brightest and the best of human feelings, surely, is no cause of shame. "'But we may all say, with the great poet, "'O son is life, O Jove's daughter dear, pleasance of love, "'O godly debonair, in gentle hearts I ready to repair, O oh, very cause of health and of gladness, Eheri be thy might and goodness. I cannot answer why, Richard, replied Mary, but I know it is so, that all women feel some shame to own they love, and many affect more shame than they really feel. But I will not do so, dear Richard, for I think it is dishonesty to feign aught. I know I did feel shame, when one day, as we sat beside the river under the green trees, you won me to say more than I ever thought I could, and all that night, when I thought upon it, my cheek burned. And yet in the moment of trial I felt bold, and when your uncle asked me, I told him all. Nor do I see why I should conceal it now, even if I could, when you were about to go far, and that may be your only consolation in danger and in difficulty. It will be my strength and my support, dear Mary, answered Woodville, and I do think that if I could but win a promise from you to be mine, it would so nerve my heart and arm in the hour of strife, 
that all men should own I had won you well. Say, will you promise, my sweet lady? I will promise that I will, if I may, replied Mary. But, alas, Richard, the entire fulfilment of that promise must depend upon another. We poor women have but little power even over our own fate and persons. But I will love none but you, Richard, wherever I go, and you will not doubt that love, though it be spoken so freely. Nay, heaven forbid, said Richard of Woodville, and were it not that you are my uncle's ward, I would have put that love, dear Mary, to the proof by asking you to fly with me and seek out some friendly priest who would bind our fate so fast together that it would take greater power than any one in the gland can boast to sever it again. But I would not be ungrateful to one who has been a father to me. Nor must I be ungrateful either to him or to my own father, Richard, replied Mary Markham. You would not love me long if I could be so. I know you cannot, Mary, answered her lover, but tell me who he is, Mary, that I may try to win him to hear my suit. I knew not that your father was alive, unless, indeed, the idle gossip. But no more of that. Whoever he be, I will trust to merit his esteem, and surely his daughter's love will be no bad commendation to him. I have hopes, too, of advancement, if ambition be his passion, such, indeed, as I have never had before. The king, he who was with us not a month ago, is Hal of Hadnock. Ay, Dacre told us who he was, cried Mary Markham. The king, he shows me great favour, continued Woodville, and has given me letters to many at the court of Burgundy, promising to send for me, too, as soon as he has service for me here. With a true heart and no unpractised hand, I do not fear that I shall fail of winning honour, and though I be but a poor gentleman yet— as I do know that riches or poverty would make no difference in Mary Markham to me, so I cannot believe that it will change me in her eyes. Oh, no, she answered, but then added with a sigh, but my father, Richard, it is long since I have seen him, yet he was kind and noble, just and true, if I remember right. I recollect him well, with his grey hair, changed more by sorrow than time. I thought you knew the whole, for Isabel does but I promise faithfully not to speak of my fate or his to any one, for reasons that he judged sufficient when he gave me into good Sir Philip's charge, and I must not break my word even for you, Richard. Well, it matters not, answered Woodville. Certainly I would fain know who he is, for then I might court him as a lover does his bride, for Mary's sake. But yet you must keep your promise to him, and to me too, and whenever you are free to speak, you must give me tidings, dear girl, for in all the thousand chances of this world I might mar my own hopes, even while seeking to fulfil them. I will, I will, replied Mary Markham, but hark, I hear your uncle's step, Richard. I will but add one word to cheer you. Perhaps, if I judge right, we may not be so long ere we meet again, as you suppose. And now, God prosper you, my own true squire. As she spoke, the good old knight, Sir Philip Beecham, entered the room, with a grave and somewhat perplexed air. It soon became evident, however, that whatever annoyed or embarrassed him, it was not the presence of his nephew, for he greeted him kindly, holding out his hand to him, saying, "'Ah, you here, foolish boy, still the moth and the candle, but if you needs must love, why, let it lead you to honour and renown. What brought you to London, to buy arms?' "'No, sir, to see the king,' replied the nephew. "'He sent me a messenger, bearing letters for me to the court of Burgundy, "'and gave me to understand that I might come to visit him if I would.' "'The old knight, in his meditative mood, "'seemed to catch some of Woodville's words and miss the others. "'Letters to the court of Burgundy,' he said. "'Well, from Harry of England, they should smooth thy path, boy. "'Would to heaven you two were not lovers.' Not that I would speak ill of love, tis the duty of every gentleman to vow his service to some fair lady, at least, as it was so in my young day, but we have sorely declined since then, sorely, sorely, nephew of mine, and love was then quite a different affair from now, when it must needs end in marriage or worse. It was a high and ennobling passion in those times, leading knights and gentlemen to seek praise and do high deeds, not for their own sakes, but for the honour of the ladies whom they served, nor requiring reward even from them, 
but for pure and high affection, and the pleasure of exalting them. Thus many a man loved a lady, either placed far above him, or removed from his reach by being wedded to another, without sin or shame or presumption. For love, as I have said, was a high and ennobling feeling in those days, which taught men to do what is right, not what is wrong. "'Well, my noble uncle,' replied Richard of Woodville, "'and so it may be now, and it will have the same effect with me. "'But one thing I do know, that I would rather do high deeds "'to exalt my own wife than another man's. "'I would rather serve a lady that I may win "'than a lady I have no right to seek. "'Methinks it is both more honest and more safe, "'and by God's blessing I will win her too, "'if I live long enough and have fair play.' The old knight smiled. "'Thou art a jesting coistrel, Dickon,' he said, "'and yet not a bad man at arms either. "'But times are changed, I tell thee, and not for the better. "'Thou thinkest according to the day, and cannot understand the past. "'When goest thou overseas, boy?' "'In a few days, sir,' answered Richard of Woodville. "'I think before a week be out.' Mary Markham's cheek turned a little pale, and the old knight meditated for a moment or two, after which he asked his nephew when he intended to quit London. Richard replied that he went on the following morning, and Sir Philip, who had found a sad vacancy in the hall since Richard had left them for a time, and poor Catherine for ever, required that he should stay and keep them company for the rest of the day. "'Heaven knows, my poor Mary,' he said, "'how long we may have to remain in this place, and we shall soon find it dull enough.' The people whom I expected to meet have not yet appeared, and no tidings of them have come, so we may as well keep this idle boy to make us merry, and if he must go by arms or lace jerkins for the court of Burgundy, why, we will go with him to Guthrin's Lane and the jury, and you shall ride your white palfrey for once along cheap, with your gay side-saddle quilted with gold, though in my young days, before King Richard married Anne of Bohemia, Never a lady in the land saw so foolish a contrivance. It may well be supposed that neither Mary Markham nor Richard of Woodville was very much averse to such a proposal, and the rest of the day passed in that April morn happiness which all must have felt ere parting with those we love, when the cloudy thought of the dreary morrow comes hourly sweeping over the sunshine of the present, yet making the light seem more bright for the passing shadow. More than once, too, the lovers were left for a while alone, and every moment added to their sweet store of vows and promises. Much was also told that they had not time to tell before, though it was still spoken in rambling and unconnected form, the one predominant feeling always intruding, and calling their thoughts and words back to what was passing in their own hearts. How many bitter moments pay for our sweet ones in this life, and yet how willing are we all, to make the purchase, whatever the price. The ambitious spirit of enjoyment is upon us, and we must still enlarge the sphere of, of our delight, though, as when a conqueror stretches the bounds of his empire, and thereby only exposes a wider frontier to attack, each new hope, each new pleasure, each new possession, but lays us open to loss, regret, and disappointment. It is a sad view of human life, but Richard of Woodville and Mary Markham found its truth when they came to feel how much more bitter was their parting for the few sweet hours of happiness they had enjoyed. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The wrong. The sun, scarce a hand's breadth above the sky, was nevertheless shining with beams as bright as in the summer, when Richard of Woodville mounted his horse in the courtyard of the inn at Charing, and, followed by his two yeomen and his page, rode out after receiving the valedictory speeches of the host and hostess, who, with a little crowd, composed of drawers and maidens, and some of their other guests, watched his departure and commented upon his strong yet graceful limbs and his easy management of his charger, prognosticating that he would prove stout in battlefield and fortunate in hall and bower. 
near the fine chased cross at Charing, which stood hard by the spot where the grand libel upon British taste called Trafalgar Square now stands, Woodville paused for a moment, and letting his eye run past its grave fretwork, gazed down in the direction of the palace and the abbey. Hesitating whether he should take the shorter road by the convent of St. James, or, once more passing through Westminster, ride under the windows of fair Mary Markham, for the chance of one parting glance. I need not tell the reader how the question was decided, but as he turned his horse's head towards the palace, he saw a female figure standing upon the lower step of the cross, with the hood, then usually worn by women when out, drawn far over the face. The beautiful form, however, the small foot and ankle appearing from beneath the short kirtle, and the wild, peculiar grace of the attitude, taken together, showed him at once that it was poor Ella Brune, and he was riding forward to speak with her, when she herself advanced and laid her hand upon his horse's neck. "'I have been watching for you, noble sir,' she said, "'to bid you adieu before you part, and to give you thanks from a poor but true heart.' "'Nay, you should not have waited here, Ella,' he replied. "'Why did you not come to the inn?' "'I did, yesterday, at Vespers,' answered the girl. "'But you were abroad, and the people laughed as if I had done a folly. "'Your men told me, however, you were going this morning at daybreak, "'and so I waited here, for I would fain ask you one boon.' "'And what is that, Ella?' inquired Woodville. "'If it be possible to grant, it shall not be refused.' "'for I have so little to give "'that I must be no niggard of what I have.' "'You can grant it,' replied the girl with a bright smile, "'and you will be a niggard indeed if you do not, "'for it is what can do you no harm "'and may stead me much in case of need. "'But it is to tell me whither you go and when and how.' "'That is easily said, my fair maiden,' answered Woodville. "'I go first to my own place at Mion, "'then to the court of Burgundy.' at the end of six days, and as I would not cross through France, I go by sea from Dover to a town called Nearport, on the coast of Flanders. But say, is there aught I can do for you before I send the man I told you of, to give you what little assistance I can? Send him not, send him not, cried the girl. I am now rich, almost too rich, thanks to your generous interference with our good king. He sent me a large sum by the hands of the bad knight who killed the poor old man. Aye, said Richard of Woodville, and did you see this Sir Simeon of Roydon, my poor Ella? Beware of him, for he is not one to understand you rightly, I fear. I am aware of him, answered the minstrel's girl, and I abhor him. He is a dark, fearful man, but no more of that. I shall never see him more, I trust, for his eyes chill my blood. He looked at me as I love not men should look, not as you do, kindly and pitifully, but I know not how. It can be felt, not told. I understand you, Ella, replied Richard of Woodville, and his acts are like his looks. He has made more than one unhappy heart in many a cottage that once was blithe. I grieve the king sent him to you. Oh, it will do no harm, cried the girl. I shall not long be here and I know him well, would that I were not a woman. What, would you avenge the wrong he did on that sad evening? asked Woodville with a smile, to think how feeble that small hand would prove in strife. No, not for that, she replied, for I will try to forgive. But if I were not what I am, you would take me with you in your train, and then I should be safe and happy. I trust you may be so still, even as a woman, poor girl answered Richard of Woodville, and, after a few more words of kindness and comfort, he bade her adieu. Ella Brune's bright eyes glistened, and perhaps she found it difficult to speak the parting words, for she said no more, but, catching her young protector's hand, she pressed her lips upon it, and drew back to let him pass. It was impossible for Richard of Woodville not to feel touched and interested, but he was not one to mistake her. He knew, not indeed by the hard teaching of experience, but by the intuitive perception of a feeling heart, how the unfortunate cling to those who show them kindness, and could distinguish between the love of gratitude and that of passion. 
He had purposely spoken gently and tenderly to her, and, in proportion as he could do little to afford her substantial aid, had tried to make his words and manner consoling and strengthening. And he thought, if one had acted so to me, I should feel towards him as this poor girl now feels in my case. Heaven guard her, poor thing, for hers is a sad fate. In such meditations he rode on, but we will not at present follow him on his way, turning rather to poor Ella Broom, who stood by the cross gazing after him, till his horse taking a road to the right, about two hundred yards before it reached the palace gate, was soon hidden by the trees, just at the entrance of the town of Westminster. With a deep sigh she then bent her steps along the road leading by the bank of the river towards the gate of the temple, which was still in a somewhat ruinous state from the attack made upon it in 1381. As she went, she looked not at the houses and gardens on either side. She marked not the procession which came forth, with cross and banner, from the convent on the right, nor the gay train that issued out of the gates of a large embattled house on the left. But separating herself from the people, who turned to gaze or hastened to follow, she made her way on, seeking the little inn where she dwelt. There were two other persons, however, who followed the same course— men with swords by their side, and bucklers on their shoulder, and a snake embroidered on the mourning habits that they wore. But Ella saw them not. She was too deeply occupied with her own dark thoughts. She seemed alone in the wide world, more alone than ever since Richard of Woodville had left the capital, and to be so is both sad and perilous. How strange, how lamentable it is, that society— that great, wonderful, confused institution, springing from man's necessity for mutual aid and support, provides no prop, no stay, for those who are left alone in the midst of it, none to counsel, none to help, none to defend against the worst of all evils, temptation to vice. Of the body it takes some care. We must not cut, we must not strike the flesh, we must not enthrall it, we must not kill. But we may wound, injure, destroy the spirit, if we can, even at our pleasure. For substantial things we multiply regulations, safeguards, penalties. For the mind on which all the rest so much depends, we provide none. The philosophy of legislation has yet a great step to advance, a step perhaps that may never, perhaps that can never, be taken. Though of one thing we may be sure— that till the great utopian dream is realised, and either by education or some other means, a safeguard is provided for the minds of men, as well as their bodies and their property, all the iron laws that can be enacted will prove insufficient for the protection of those more tangible things which we think most easily defended. To regulate and guard the mind, especially in youth, is to turn the river near its source, and to ensure that it shall flow on in peace and bounty to the end. But to leave it unguided, and yet by law to strive to restrain man's actions, is to put weak floodgates against a torrent that we have suffered to accumulate. But no more of this. Perhaps what has been already said is too much and out of place. Yet to return, it is strange and sad that society does afford no stay, no support to those who are left alone in the wide world. Nay, more, that to be so left seems in a great degree to sever the bond between us and society. He must have some friends. Let him apply to them, we are apt to say, whenever one of these solitary ones comes before us, and whether it is advice, assistance, or defence that is needed. He must have some friends. It is a phrase in constant use, and in our own hearts we go on to say, if he have not, he must have lost them by his own fault. And yet how many events may deprive man, and much more frequently woman, of the only friends possessed. Poor Ella Broom felt that she was indeed alone, and there was no one to whom she could apply for anything that the heart and spirit of the bereaved and desolate might need. She knew that had she been a leper, or halt, or blind, or fevered, she could have found those who would have tended, 
cured, supported her, but there was no comfort, no aid for her loneliness, and scorn or coldness or selfish passion or greedy knavery would have met her had she asked anyone in the wide crowd through which she passed. Which way shall I turn my footsteps? How shall I bend my course through life? She felt it deeply, bitterly, and, as I have said, walked on full of her own sad thoughts, while the numbers round her grew less and less. At length, in the sort of irregular street that, even then, began to stretch out from the edge of Farringdon, without the walls, into the country towards Charing, she was left with none near her but the two men of whom we have spoken, and an old woman walking slowly on before. The men seemed to notice no one, and conversed with each other in an undertone, till, in the midst of the highway, a little beyond St. Clement's well, one or two small wooden houses appeared built in the middle of the high road, with the end of a narrow lane leading up to the old temple in Oldbourne, and the house of the Bishop of Lincoln. There, however, one of them advanced a step, and spoke a word to Ella Brune over her shoulder. "'Whither away, pretty maiden,' he said. "'Are you not going to see the batch of country nobles who have come up to do homage?' "'I'm going home,' answered Ella Brune gravely, "'and want no company.' And she hurried her pace to get rid of him. The next instant the other man was by her side, and taking her arm roughly, he said, "'You must come with us first. Our Lord wishes to speak with you.' Ella Brune struggled to disengage herself, saying, "'Let me go, sir. If your Lord wishes to speak with me, it must be at some other time. I have people expecting me hard by. Let me go, I say.' "'Ay, we know all about it,' rejoined the man, still keeping his hold, and drawing her towards the mouth of the lane. "'You live at the Falcon, pretty mistress, but you must go with us first. The sounds behind her had caused the old woman to turn round the moment before, and seeing Ella struggling to free herself from the man who held her, she turned to remonstrate, exclaiming, "'What are you about, sirs? Let the young woman go.' "'Get you gone, old Beldane!' cried the other man, thrusting her back. "'What is it to you?' And at the same time he seized Ella by the other arm, and hurried her on, in spite of her resistance. "'Beldame, indeed!' exclaimed the old woman, gazing after them. "'Marry, thou art not civil. If thou callest me so, I will call thee Davy. I will see whither they go, however.' And thus saying, at the utmost speed she could master, she followed the men who were dragging poor Ella Brune along calling in vain for help, for the houses in that part of the suburb were few, and principally consisted either of the large Gothic mansions of the nobility, shut in within their own gates and surrounded by gardens, or the inns of prelates, isolated in the same manner. Whither they were dragging her the old woman could not divine, for she thought it unlikely that any of the persons who dwelt in that neighbourhood would sanction such a violent act. Ella herself, however, knew right well, for she had taken the same road the day before on her brief visit to Sir Simeon of Royden. Peril and wandering, and sad chances of various kinds, such as seldom are the lot of one so young, had taught her to remark every particular that passed before her eyes with a precision which fixed things in her memory, that might have escaped the sight of others, and she had seen the snake embroidered on the breast and back of the night's servants, and recognised the badge instantly on those who held her. As she expected, the men stopped at the gates of the house, which were open, and dragged her into the court, but her cries and her resistance ceased the moment she had reached that place, for she knew that they were both in vain, and made up her mind from that moment to the course which she had to pursue. Ha, <laughs> ha, pretty maiden, said the man who had first spoken to her. You are now willing to go, are you? Our Lord is not likely to be refused a visit from any fair dame. Come, come, I can manage her now, Pilcher. You stay at the foot of the stairs. Will you come willingly, girl, or must we carry you? I will come, answered Della Brune, not willingly, but because I must. And, with the man still holding her by the arm, she mounted one of the flights of stairs which led straight from the courtyard to the rooms above, following a long corridor or gallery, lighted by a large window at the end. The man led her from the top of the stairs towards the back part of the house, and opening a door on the right, bade her go in. 
after one hasty glance around which showed her that it was vacant, she entered the small cabinet which was before her, and the door was immediately shut and locked. She now found herself in a dark and gloomy chamber, which probably had been originally intended either for secret conferences or for a place of meditation and prayer, where the eye could not distract the mind by catching any of the objects without, for the only window which it possessed was so high up in the wall that the sill was above the eyes of any person of ordinary height. There was but one door, too, that by which she had entered, and the whole of the walls of the room was covered with black oak, of which also the beams overhead were formed. A few chairs and a small table composed the only furniture which it contained, and Ella paused in the midst, leaning upon the table in deep thought. Her mind, indeed, was bent only on one point. What were the purposes of Sir Simeon of Royden? She did not even ask herself, for she knew right well that they were evil. Nor did she consider what she should answer or how she should act, for a strong and resolute mind judges and decides with rapidity, marvellous in the eyes of the slow and hesitating, and her determination was already formed. Her only inquiry was, what were the means of escape from the chamber in which she had been placed? What was its position in regard to the apartments which she had visited on the previous day, and which had appeared to be those usually occupied by Royden himself? After thinking for some moments and retracing with the aid of memory every step she had taken in the house, both on that morning and the day before, she judged, and judged rightly, that the chamber in which she had seen the night must join that in which she now stood, though she had reached it by another entrance. The sound of voices, which she soon after heard speaking in a different direction from the gallery, confirmed her in that belief, for though she could not distinguish any of the words, she felt convinced that the tones were those of Sir Simeon of Royden, and of the man who had brought her thither. At length the speakers ceased, a door opened and shut, and then the key was turned in the lock of that which gave entrance to the room where she was confined. As she expected, the next moment Simeon of Royden stood before her, bearing a sort of laughing triumph in his face, which only increased her abhorrence. He was advancing quickly, as if to take her hand, but she drew back, with her eyes fixed upon him, saying, "'Come not too near, sir. I am somewhat dangerous at times when I am offended.' "'Why, what folly is this, my sweet Ella?' said the knight. "'My people tell me that you have resisted like a young wolf.' "'You may find me more of a wolf than you suppose,' replied Ella Brune coldly. "'Nay,' answered Sir Simeon, "'we have ways of taming wolves, but I seek nothing but your good and happiness, foolish girl. "'Is it not much better for you to live in comfort and luxury, "'with rich garments and dainty food, and glowing wine to lie soft?' and have no task but to sing and play and please yourself than to wander about over the wide world and sport of prentices or the companion of ruffians. There are ruffians in all stations, rejoined Ella Brune, else had I not been here. The cheek of the knight glowed with an angry spot, but then again he laughed the moment after, in a tone more of mockery than of merriment, saying, We will tame thee, pretty wolf, we will tame thee. Thou showest thy white teeth, but thou wilt not bite. Be not sure of that, answered Ella Brune. I know well how to defend myself, should need be, and have done so before now. Well, we will see, replied Sir Simeon. It takes some time to break a horse or hound, or train a hawk, and you shall have space allowed you. All soft and kindly entertainment shall you have. With me you shall eat and drink and talk and sing, if you will. You shall have courtship like a lady of the land, to try whether gentle means will do. But mark me, pretty Ella, if they will not, we must try others. I am resolved that you shall be mine by force, if not by kindness. You dare not use it, answered Ella Brune. And why not? demanded the knight with a haughty smile. I have done more daring things than vanquish a coy maiden. I know you have, said Ella Brune, in a grave and fearless tone. But I will tell you why not. First, because whatever be your care, it will come to the king's ears, and you will pay for it with your head. Next, because I carry about me wherewithal to defend myself. 
and, putting her hand into her bosom, she drew forth a small, short, broad-bladed knife in a silver case. "'This is my only friend left me here,' she continued, "'and you may think, perchance, most gallant knight and warrior upon women, "'that this, in so weak a hand as mine, is no very frightful weapon. "'But let me tell you that it was tempered in distant lands, I and anointed too, "'and you had better far give your heart to the bite of the most poisonous snake "'that crawls the valley of Egypt, than receive the lightest scratch from this.' The hilt is always at hand, so beware. Oh, we have antidotes, replied the knight. Antidotes for everything but love, sweet maid. And I swear by your own bright eyes that you shall be mine, so tis vain to resist. You shall have three days of tenderness, and then I may take a different tone. As he spoke, someone knocked for the second time. The first had been unheeded. The knight turned to the door and opened it, demanding impatiently, "'What is it?' "'The Lord Coombe and Sir Harry Olsover are in the court, desiring to speak with you,' replied the servant who appeared. "'Well, take them up to the other chamber,' answered the knight, and without saying more to his fair captive, he quitted the room, and once more locked the door. The moment he was in the corridor, however, he stopped, saying in a meditative tone, "'Stay, Easton.' He hesitated for an instant, asking himself whether it were worth his while to pursue this course any farther, for a low minstrel girl, against such unexpected resistance. The hand of heaven, almost always, in its great mercy, casts obstacles in the way of the gratification of our baser passions, which give us time for thought and for repentance, so that, in almost every case, if we commit sin or crime, it is with the perverse determination of conquering both impediments and conviction. Conscience is seldom, if ever, left unaided by circumstances, but the wicked find in those very circumstances which oppose their course motives for pursuing it more fiercely. No, said Sir Simeon of Royden to himself, by blank, she shall not conquer me. Tell the king she shall never have the means, for I will either tame her till she be but my bird, to sing what note I please, or I will silence her tongue effectually. To be conquered by a woman, no, no, she is very lovely, and her very lion look is worth all the soft simpering smiles on earth. Hark ye, Easton, there is a druggist down by the Vintry, with whom I have had some dealings in days of yore. This girl has a poisoned dagger about her which must be got from her, "'Tis a marvel she used it not on you, as you brought her along, "'for she drew it forth on me but now. "'The man's name is Tyler, and he would sell his soul for gold. "'Tell him that I have need for some cunning drug to make men sleep. "'To sleep, I say, understand me, not to die. "'To sleep so sound, however, that a light touch or a low tone would not awaken them. "'It must have as little taste as may be, "'that we may put it in her drink or in her food.' and then, while she sleeps, will draw the lion's teeth. He will give you anything for a noble, and, after these innocent directions, the knight betook himself to the chamber, whither he had directed his friends to be brought, and was soon in full tide of laughter and merriment at all the idle stories of the court. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Remedy. Nearly opposite to the old half ruined gate of the temple, there commenced in the days I speak of a very narrow lane, which wound up northwards till it joined the place now called Hoburn, passing in its course under the walls of the inn or house of the Bishop of Lincoln round his garden wall, and through the grounds of the old temple house, inhabited by the Knights Templars, before they built a dwelling for themselves by the banks of the Thames. This temple house, still called the Old Temple in the reign of Henry V, had been abandoned by the Brethren in the year 1184, or thereabout. For some time it was used to lodge any of the fraternity who might visit England from foreign countries, when the new building was too full to afford them accommodation. But gradually the custom ceased, even before the suppression of the order, 
and at its dissolution the old temple fell into sore decay. When the lands of the Templars were afterwards granted to the Knights of St. John, certain portions of the building, and several of the outbuildings, were granted by them to various artisans, who found it more convenient to carry on their several pursuits beyond the actual precincts of the City of London. One large antique gate of heavy architecture, with immense walls, and with rooms in neither of the two towers which flanked the lane I have mentioned, was tenanted by an armourer, who had erected his stithy behind, and who stored his various completed arms in the chamber on the right of the gate, where the porter had formerly lodged. Over the window of this room was suspended, under a rude penthouse of straw, to keep it from the rain, a huge cask indicative of the tenant's profession, and at about eight o'clock of the same morning on which Richard of Woodville quitted London, a little cavalcade, consisting of a tall, gaunt old man on a strong black horse, a young lady on a white jennet, and three stout yeomen, rode slowly up to the gatehouse and drew their bridles there, pausing to gaze for a moment or two through the deep arch at the forge beyond, where the flame glowed and the anvil rang, throwing a red glare into the shadowy doorway and drowning the sound of the horse's feet. "'Hallo, Lancelot Plas!' cried old Sir Philip Beecham, in as loud a tone as he thought needful to call the attention of the person he wanted. "Hallo!" But the cyclops within went on with their hammering, and, after another ineffectual effort to make them hear, the good knight called up his men to hold the horses, and lifting Mary Markham as lightly to the ground as if she had been the weight of a feather, he said, "'We must go in.' and bellow in this deaf man's ear, till we outdo his own noise. Stay here, Mary, I will rouse him. And advancing through the open gate, he seized the bare arm of the armourer, exclaiming, What, Launcelot, would thou brain me? Why, how now, man? Has the roaring of thine own forge deafened thee? The elderly white-headed man to whom he spoke turned round and gazed at him, leaning his strong muscular arm upon his hammer and wiping the drops from his brow. "'By St. Jude!' he cried after a moment's consideration. "'I think it is Sir Philip Beecham. Yet your head is as white as the ashes, and when I knew him it was a grizzled black, like pauldrons traced with silver lines. And you are mighty thin and bony for stout Sir Philip, whose right hand would have knocked down an ox.' Fifteen years, Launcelot, fifteen years,' answered the knight. They bend a stout frame, as thou beatest out a bit of iron, and if my head be white, thy black hairs are more easy to be counted than found. Yet both our arms might do some service in their own way yet. Well, I am glad to see you again, noble knight, replied the armourer, though I thought that it would be no more, before you and I went our ways to dust. But what lack you? There must be some wars toward, to bring an old knight to the city. "'for well I wot you are not going to buy a tilting suit "'or do battle for a fair lady. "'God send us some good wholesome wars right soon. "'We have had nothing lately but the emprise of the Duke of Clarence. "'King Harry the Fourth got tired of his armour. "'Pray heaven, his son will love the weight better, "'or I must let the forge cool, and that were a shame.' "'Nay, it is not for myself,' replied Sir Philip. I have more arms, Launcelot, than ever I shall don in life again. My next suit, unless the king make haste, will be in the chancel of the church of Abbot's Anne. What I want is for my nephew, Dickon of Woodville. He is going to foreign lands in search of renown, and I would fain choose him a suit myself, for you know I am somewhat of a judge in steel. You are always accounted so, noble sir, replied the armourer, with a grave and important face, and, if you had not been a knight, might have taken my trade out of my hands. But whither does child Richard go? You must know that, for every land has its own arms, and it would not do to give him for Italy what is good for France, nor for Palestine what would suit Italy. The old knight informed him that his nephew was first to visit Burgundy, and the armourer exclaimed, with a well-satisfied air, then I can provide him to a point, for I have Burgundian arms already, even to flaming swords, if he must have them, 
but tis a foolish and fanciful weapon, far less serviceable than the good straight edge and point. But come, Sir Philip, let us go into the armoury. Tis well nigh crammed full for gentlemen by little, and yet I go on hammering with my men till I have put all the money that I got in the wars into arms. Thus saying, he covered himself with the leathern jerkin, which he had cast off while at work, and returned with his old acquaintance to the room in which the various pieces of armour that he kept ready were preserved. Sir Philip called Mary Markham to assist in the choice, but it soon became evident to both that no selection could be made in good Lancelot Place's armoury, for not only was the room, to their eyes, as dark as the pit of Acheron, but the armour was piled up in such confused heaps that it was hardly possible to take a step therein without stumbling over breastplate or bassinet, pauldrons or brassieres. "'Fie, Lancelot, fie!' cried Sir Philip. "'This is a sad, deranged show. Why, a stout man-at-arms always keeps his armour in array?' "'Then he has room and time, Sir Philip,' answered the man. "'But here I have neither. However, you and the fair lady go forth under the arch, and I will bring you out what is wanted.' "'Here, knave Martin,' he continued, calling one of his men from the forge, "'bring out the great bench and set it under the gate, quick. "'What is your nephew's height, Sir Philip?' "'What my own used to be,' replied the old knight. Six feet and half an inch, and there is his measure round the waist.' "'The bench was soon brought forward, "'being nothing else than a large solid table of some six inches thick, "'and by it Sir Philip Beecham and fair Mary Markham took their station.' while Lancelot Place, with the aid of one of his men, dug out from the piles within various pieces of armour which he thought might suit the taste of his old customer, laying them down at the door to be brought forward as required. The first article, however, that he carried to the bench was a cuirass of one piece, evidently old, for not only was it somewhat rusty about the angles, but in the centre there was a large, rough-edged hole. "'Why, what is this?' exclaimed Sir Philip. "'This will never do.' "'Nay, it has done, and left undone enough,' replied the armourer. "'I brought it but to show you. "'In that placate was killed Harry Hotspur. "'I do not say that it was the hole that let death in, "'for men ever that it was a stab in the throat with a castle, "'when he was down, that slew him. "'But the blow that made that bore him to the ground, "'otherwise... "'Shrewsbury Field might have gone differently. "'Now I will fetch the rest. "'You see, fairest lady, what gentlemen undergo for the love of praise, "'and your bright eyes.' "'Thus saying, he took back the breastplate and brought forwards, "'supported on his arm, one of the bassinets or casks worn in the field, "'which were lighter and considerably smaller than the jousting helmets. "'It was of a round or globulous shape, with a small elevation at the top, in which to fix the feathers that usually displayed, and on the forehead was a plate or band of white enamel inscribed with the words Ave Maria. Sir Philip Beecham made some objections to the form, but Mary Markham, after she had read the inscription, pronounced in favour of the bassinet, and the armourer himself had so much to say of its defensive qualities, of the excellent invention of making the ventile rise, by plates from below, and of the temper of the steel, that Sir Philip, after having examined it minutely, waived his objections. The price being fixed, the body armour to match was brought forward piece by piece, and laid upon the bench. It was of complete plate, as was now the custom of the day, but yet many pieces of the old chain hauberk were retained to cover the joinings of the different parts. Thus beneath the gorget, or camar, which covered the throat, was a sort of tippet formed of interlaced rings of steel, to hang down over the cuirass and afford additional protection, while at the same time from the tassets which terminated the cuirass hung a broad edge of the same, to complete their junction with the cuissards or thigh pieces. This arrangement pleased the old knight very much, for it was a remnant of the customs of ancient times, when he himself was young, and which totally disappeared before many years were over. But with the cuirass he quarrelled very much, exclaiming, "'What, will men never have done with their idle fancies? "'Tis bad enough to divide the breastplate into two, "'and hang the lower part to the upper by that red strap and buckle. 
But what is the use of sticking out the breast like that of a fat-cropped pigeon? It gives greater use to the arms, noble sir, replied Launcelot Plas, and turns a lance much easier from being quite round. Besides, it is the fashion of the court of Burgundy, and no noble gentleman could appear there well without. The palettes, too, you see, are shaped like a fan, and gilt with quaint figures at the corners. It cost me nine days to make these palettes alone, and the genilieres, which have the same work upon them. Then the pauldrons, see how they are artfully turned over at the top of the shoulder with a gilt bordure? And pray, what may that be for? demanded the old knight. We had no such tricks in my days to make a land look like a crayfish. That is to give the arm full of sweep and sway, neither with axe or sword, answered the armourer. You can thus raise your hand quite up to your very crest, which you could never do before, since pauldrons were invented. We used to give good stout strokes in the year eighty, rejoined Sir Philip Beecham, as you well know, Master Launcelot. But boys must have boys' things, so let it pass. But what between one piece and another, it will take a man an hour to get into this harness, with all these buckles and straps. But I will tell you what, Master Launcelot, I will have no twills over the cuissards. They were a barbarous and unnatural custom, and very inconvenient, too. I was once nearly thrown to the ground in Gascony, by the point catching the saddle as I mounted. Oh, they are quite gone out of use, replied the armourer, and we now either make the tassets long, or add a guipon of mail, coming down to the thighs. The jambes, or steel boots, the sollerets, or coverings for the feet, the brassards, gauntlets, and vembrances, were then discussed and purchased, not without some chaffering on the part of the old knight, who was a connoisseur in the price as well as in the fashion of armour. But Launcelot Plas had so much to say in favour of his commodities that he obtained very nearly the sum he demanded. He then proceeded to prove to Sir Philip Beecham that the suit would not be complete without the testiere, the chanfron, and the manifère, and poitrel of the horse to correspond, and though his customer was not inclined to spend any more money, yet a soft word or two from Mary Markham won the day for the armourer, and he was directed to bring forth the horse armour for inspection. While he and his men were busy fulfilling this command, the old knight turned, hearing someone speaking eagerly, and apparently imploringly, to his attendants, and seeing an old woman poorly dressed con conversing with them, he inquired, "'What does the woman want, Hugh?' "'Ah, noble sir,' replied the old dame, "'if you would but interfere, it might save sin and wrong. "'I have just seen a poor girl dragged away by two men "'up to a house in the lane called Burwash House, "'where they have taken her against her will.' "'Ha!' cried Sir Philip Beecham. "'Why, he is an old and reverend man, my good lord of Burwash, "'and will not suffer such things in his mansion. "'I will send up one of the men to tell him.' "'The noble lord is not there, fair sir,' replied the woman, "'but he has lent his house to some gay knight, "'whose men do what they please with the poor people. "'Tis but yesterday my own child was struck by one of them. "'If there be wrong done, you must go to the offices of the duchy, good woman,' "'answered the knight, whose blood was cold with age, "'and who could be prudent till he was chafed. "'I will send one of the yeomen with you to get you a hearing. "'These things should be amended.' "'But when king's sons will beat the citizens and brawl in cheap, there is no great hope.' "'Good faith, Sir Philip,' cried the armourer, who had just come forth, bearing the manfare upon his arm. "'If it be the Duke of Clarence you speak of, and his brother John, "'twas they got beaten, and did not beat. "'We Londoners are sturdy knaves, and take not drubbings patiently, whether from lord or prince.' "'And you are right, too,' replied the old knight. "'Men are not made to be the sport of other men. "'But what's to be done about this girl, Lancelot? "'You know the customs here better than I do. "'The good woman says they have carried a girl off against her will "'to Burwash House here hard by. "'Why, that's the back of it,' cried Lancelot Plas. "'The old lord is not there, but in his stead one Sir Simeon of Royden, "'who, if I may state not, will never win much renown by stroke of lance.' "'Wait a minute, my good woman, till I have sold my goods, "'and then I and my men will go up with you, "'and set the girl free, or it shall go hard, 
if you are certain she was taken against her will. She shrieked loud enough to make you all hear, replied the old woman. I thought there was a noise when we were hammering at the back piece, observed one of the men. I heard nothing, said Launcelot Plass. Oh, go at once, go at once, cried Mary Markham. You know not how she may be treated. We can wait till you return. Send the men with them, dear Sir Philip. "'I will go myself, Mary,' replied the knight. "'Come along, my men. Leave one of the horses, and the rest follow.' "'I am with you, Sir Philip,' cried the armourer. "'Bring your hammers, lads. We will make short work of oaken doors.' But ere Sir Philip Beecham had taken two steps up the lane, the casement of a large window in the house, which had been pointed out, was thrown suddenly open, and a woman's head appeared. The sill of the window was some twelve or fourteen feet from the ground, but, to the surprise of all, without seeming to pause for a moment, the girl whom they beheld set her foot upon it, caught the iron bow which ran down the middle of the casement, seemed to twist something round it, and then suffered herself to drop, hanging by her hands, first from the bar and then from a scarf. She was still some five or six feet from the ground, however, and Mary Markham, who had been watching eagerly, clasped her hands and turned away her head. Sir Philip Beecham and the men who accompanied him paused, and they could hear a voice from within exclaim, "'Follow her like light by the back door. She will to the king, and that will ruin. What fear, you fool! She has broken the dagger in the lock. Do you not see?' As he spoke, the girl, after a momentary hesitation, during which she hung suspended by the hands, wavering with the motion which she had given herself in dropping from above, let go her hold and sank to the ground. Fortunately, the lane was soft and sandy, and she fell light, coming down indeed upon one knee, but instantly starting up again unhurt. Then she gazed wildly round her for an instant, and put her hand to her head, as if asking herself whither she should fly. But the sight of the old knight and his companions, and the sound of an opening door on the other side, brought her indecision quickly to an end and running rapidly forward, she cast herself at Sir Philip Beecham's feet, embracing his knee and crying, "'Save me! Save me, noble sir!' At the moment she reached the good old man, two stout fellows, who had rushed from a door in the wall, and followed her at full speed, were within two paces of her, and one of them caught her by the arm, even at the knight's feet, as he was in the act of commanding them to keep aloof. "'Stand back, fellow!' thundered Sir Philip Beecham with the blood coming up into his withered cheek, and the next moment, in the midst of an insolent reply, he struck the knave in the face with his clenched fist, knocking him backwards, all bloody, to the ground. The other man, who had more than once accompanied Sir Simeon of Royden to Dunbury, and recognised its lord, slunk back to the house, stopped some others who were following, and then hastened in to tell his master in whom Ella Brune had found a protector. The man who had been knocked down rose, gazed fiercely at the knight, and then looked behind him for support. But seeing his companions retreated, he too retrod his steps, not without muttering some threats of vengeance, while the old armourer cried after him, "'Never show your faces again in the lane, knaves, or we will hide you back like hounds, or pound you like strayed swine.' In the meantime, Sir Philip had raised up the poor girl, and Mary Markham was soothing her tenderly, as Ella, finding herself safe, gave way to the tears which her strong resolution had repressed in the actual moment of difficulty and danger. "'Come, come, do not weep, poor thing,' said the knight, laying his large bony hand upon her shoulder. "'We will take care of you. Who is it that has done this?' "'A bad man, called Simeon of Royden,' replied Ella Brune, wiping away the tears." "'We know him,' said Mary Markham, in a kindly tone, "'and do not love him, my poor girl.' "'And I have cause to love him less, noble lady,' replied Ella Brune, "'waving her head mournfully. "'Tis but two nights ago he killed the last friend I had, "'and now he would have wronged me shamefully.' "'Killed him?' exclaimed Mary. "'What, murdered him?' "'Twas the same as murder,' replied the girl. "'He rode him down in a mad frolic.' A poor blind man, he is not yet in his grave. Come, come, be comforted, says Sir Philip. Let us hear how all this chanced. We will be your friends, poor girl, added Mary Markham, 
and then, turning to the old knight, she asked in a low tone, "'Can we not take her home with us?' Sir Philip gazed at the minstrel's girl from head to foot, and then shrugged his shoulders slightly with a significant look, as he remarked her somewhat singular dress. "'Nay, nay,' said Mary Markham in the same low tone, "'do not let that stop you, noble friend. There may be some good amongst even them.' "'Well, be it as you will, Mary,' answered the old knight. "'She must be better than she looked to do as she has done. "'Come, poor thing, you shall go home with us, and there tell us more. "'Wait till I have finished the purchase of this harness, "'and we will go back along to Westminster, "'though how to take you through the streets in that guise I do not well know.' "'Get a boat, sir, at a landing by the temple,' said Launcelot Plas, "'and send the horses by land.' "'A good thought,' replied the knight, and thus it was arranged, the whole party returning to the armourer's shop, and thence, after the bargain was made, and all directions were given, proceeding to the water-side, where a boat was soon procured, which bore them speedily to the landing-place at Westminster. End of chapter 14《ハッタフィフティーン・オフ・アジンコー・アロマンス》by George Payne Rainsford James This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim One morning, while the events which I have lately detailed were passing in the city of London, a man in a long brown gown, with a staff in his hand, a cross upon his shoulder, and a cockle shell in his hat, walked slowly and apparently wearily into the little village of Abbot's Anne and sat himself down on a stone bench before the reeve's door. Recognising the pilgrim from some far distant land as she looked out of her casement window, the good dame, with the charitable spirit of the age, took him forth some broken victuals and a cup of ale, and inquired what news he brought from oversea. The wanderer, however, seemed more inclined to ask than answer questions, and was apparently full of wonder and amazement at the tragic story, which he had just heard, he said, of the death of the Lady Catherine Beecham. He prayed the good woman, for love and for charity's sake, to tell him all about it, and she, very willing to gratify him, for every country gossip gains dignity while telling a horrible tale, began at the beginning of the affair, as far as she knew it, and related how, just on the night after the last glutton mass, as child Richard of Woodville, their lord's nephew, was riding down the road with a friend, he heard a shriek, and on hurrying to the water found the body of the poor young lady floating down the stream. How the two gentlemen bore her to the chanter's cottage, and how marks were found upon her person, which seemed to prove that she had come to her death by unfair means. "'And has the murderer been discovered, sister?' inquired the old pilgrim. "'Alas, no,' replied the reeve's wife. "'There have been whispers about, but nothing certain.' "'Aye, murder will out sooner or later,' answered the pilgrim. "'And whom did the whispers point at?' "'Nay,' replied Dame Julian. "'I know not that I ought to say. "'But to a reverend man like you, "'who have visited the shrine of St. James, "'there can be no harm in speaking of these things.' "'especially as we all know that the whispers are false. "'Well, then, but you must tell nobody what I say. "'The lady's own lover, husband indeed I might call him, "'for they were betrothed by Holy Church, "'has been accused of having done the deed. "'But every one who knows Sir Harry Dacre is right sure "'that he would have sooner cut off both his hands. "'And besides, the miller of Clapford Mill told me, "'it was but yesterday morning,' "'that half an hour before sunset on that very day when all this happened, "'he saw Sir Harry at his own place and opened the gate for him to go through. "'He remembered it,' he said, "'because the knight had torn his hand with a nail in the gate "'by trying to open it without dismounting, "'and as soon as he was through he rode on towards Way Hill, "'which is quite away from here.' "'Might he not have come back again by another road?' asked the pilgrim. No, answered Dame Julian, not without going four miles round. And besides, the miller told me that his man Job saw the knight half an hour later at the top of Way Hill, halting his horse and gazing at the sun setting. Now that's a good way off, and this deed was done just after close of day. 
"'Then that clears him,' replied the pilgrim. "'But is there no one else suspected?' The good woman shook her head, and he added, "'Was nobody seen about here who might have cause to wish the lady ill?' "'None,' said Dame Julian, with a low laugh, "'but one who might perhaps wish her dead, "'for he got all her wealth, which was prodigious, they say.' "'Aye, was he seen about then?' demanded the pilgrim. "'There might be suspicion there.' "'Why,' said the Reeves' wife, "'he was staying up at the hall and passed homeward about three. It might be a little later, but not much. What became of him afterwards, I do not know. And yet, now I think of it, he must have remained in the place some time, for he was seen an hour after or more by a girl who asked me who he was. "'Tis a wonder she did not know him,' said the pilgrim, "'if she lives in this place.' "'But that she does not,' answered Dame Julian. "'She dwells a good way off, and was here by chance.' Ah, it is a sad tale indeed, rejoined her companion, but I must go, good dame, gramercy for your bounty, but tell me, I saw an abbey as I came along, have they any famous relics there? Ay, that they have, rejoined the reeve's wife with a look of pride, our abbey is as rich in relics as any other in England, and she began an enumeration of all the valuable things that it contained, amongst which the objects that she seemed to set the greatest store by was a finger of St. Luke the Evangelist, the veil of the Blessed Virgin, and one of the ribs of St. Ursula. The pilgrim declared that he must positively go and visit them, as he never passed any holy relics without sanctifying himself by their touch. He accordingly took his way towards the abbey direct, and visited and prayed at the several shrines which the church contained, having secured the company and guidance of one of the monks, who were always extremely civil and kind to pilgrims and palmers, when they did not come exactly in the guise of beggars. The present pilgrim was of a far different quality, and he completely won the good graces and admiration of, of the attendant monk, not so much, indeed, by the devotion with which he told his beads and repeated his prayers, as by his generosity in laying down a large piece of silver before the rib of St. Ursula, another at the shrine of St. Luke, and a small piece of gold opposite to the veil of the Blessed Virgin. Having thus prepared the way, the stranger proceeded to open a conversation with the monk, somewhat similar to that which he had held with Dame Julian, the reeve's wife, and now a torrent of information flowed in upon him, for his companion had been one of the brethren who accompanied the abbot to the cottage whither the body of Catherine Beecham had been carried. The tale, however, though told with much loquacity, furnished but few particulars beyond those which the pilgrim had already gained, for the monk appeared a meek, good man, who took everything as he found it, and deduced but little from anything that he heard. All that he knew, indeed, he was ready to tell, but he had neither readiness nor penetration sufficient to gather much information, or to sift the corn from the chaff. The pilgrim seemed somewhat disappointed, for he was certainly anxious to hear more, and he was on the eve of leaving the church unsatisfied, when he beheld another monk pacing the opposite aisle, with a grave and even dull air. He was an old man, with a short, thin, white beard, and heavy features, which, till one examined closely, gave an expression of stupidity to his whole countenance, only relieved by the small, elephant-like eye, which sparkled brightly under its shaggy eyebrow. "'What brother is that?' demanded the pilgrim, looking across the church. "'Oh, that is Brother Martin,' replied the monk, "'a dull and silent man, from whom you will get nothing. "'He is skilled in drugs and medicines, it is true. "'His cell is like an alchemist's shop, "'but we all think he must have committed some great sin in days of old, "'for half his time is spent in prayers and penances, "'and the other half in distilling liquors, "'or roasting lumps of clay and other stuffs,' "'in crucibles and furnaces. "'Tis rather hard the Lord Abbot favours him so much, "'and has granted him two cells, "'the best in the whole monastery, "'to follow these vain studies, "'which, in my mind, come near to magic and sorcery. "'I saw him once, with my own eyes, "'make a piece of paper cut in the shape of a man, "'dance upright as if it had life.' "'I will speak to him,' said the pilgrim, "'and will soon let you know if there be anything forbidden in his studies, "'for I have been in lands full of witches and sorcerers, "'and have learned to discover them in an instant. 
"'Tis a marvel if he answers you at all,' replied the monk, "'for he's as silent as a frog. "'But, I pray you, let me hear what you think of him.' "'Aye, that I will,' rejoined the stranger. "'But you must keep away while we talk together, "'lest the presence of another might close his lips. "'I will seek you out afterwards, brother. "'I think your name is Clement, so the porter told me.' The same, the same, replied the monk. I will go to the refectory. But before he went, he paused for a minute or two and watched the pilgrim crossing the nave and addressing Brother Martin. At first he seemed to receive no answer but a monosyllable. The next instant, however, much to his surprise, Clement saw the silent brother turn round, gaze intently upon the pilgrim's face, and then enter into an eager conversation with him. What was the subject of which they spoke he could not divine, or rather, what was the secret by which the pilgrim had contrived to break the charmed taciturnity of silent brother Martin, and his curiosity was so much excited that he thought fit to cross over also, though with a slow and solemn step, in order to benefit by this rare accident. The small, clear, grey eye of brother Martin, however, caught Clement's movements in a moment, and laying his hand upon the sleeve of the pilgrim's gown, he led him, with a quick step, through a small side door that opened into the cloister, and thence to his own cell, leaving the inquisitive monk, who did not choose to discompose his dignity, or shake his fat sides by rapid motion, behind them in the church. What turn their communications took, and whether the pilgrim discovered or not that Brother Martin was addicted to the black art, Clement never learned, for the faithless visitor of the abbey totally forgot to fulfil his promise, and when, at the end of about two hours, he took his departure, it was by the back door leading from the cloister over the fields. The high road was at no great distance, and along it he trudged with a much more light and active step than that which had borne him into the village on his first appearance, so that, had good Dame Julian, the reeve's wife, seen him as he went back, she might have been inclined to think that Brother Martin had employed upon him some magical device to change age into youth. About half a mile from Andover, the pilgrim turned a little from the road, and sitting down in a neighbouring field, took out of his wallet a large kerchief and an ordinary hood, then stripped off his brown gown and hat, laying them directly in the kerchief, and next divested himself of a quantity of white hair which left him with a shock head, of a lightish brown hue, a short tabard of blue cloth, a stout pair of riding boots, and a dagger in his girdle. So ends my pilgrimage, said Ned Dyram, as he packed up his disguise in the napkin, and by my faith I have brought home my wallet well stored. Out upon it! Am I to labour thus always for others? No, by my faith! I will at least keep some of the crusts I have got for myself, and if others want them, they must pay for them. Let me see. We will divide them fairly. Dame Julian and Brother Clement in one lot, Brother Martin in the other. That will do. And if aught be said about it hereafter, I will speak the truth and avow that had I been paid, I would have spoken. Alchemy is a great thing. Without its aid, I could never have transmuted Brother Martin's leaden silence into such golden loquacity. Why, I have taught the old man more in an hour than he has learned in his life before, and he has given wheat for rye, so that we are even. With these sage reflections, Ned Dyram put his packet under his arm and walked on to Andover, where, at a little hostelry by the side of the river, he paused and called for his horse, which was soon brought. A cup of ale sufficed him for refreshment, and after he had drained it to the dregs, he trotted off upon the road to London, still meditating over all that he had learned at Abbot's Anne and Dunbury Abbey, and somewhat hesitating as to the course which he had to pursue. It would afford little either of instruction or amusement were I to trace all the reflections of a cunning but wayward mind, for such was that of Edward Dyram. Naturally possessed of considerable abilities, quick in acquirements, retentive in memory, keen, observing, dexterous, he might have risen to wealth, and perhaps distinction, for his were not talents of that kind which led some of the best scholars of that day to beg from door to door, with a certificate of their profound science from the chancellors of their universities, but of a much more serviceable and worthy kind. 
a certain degree of waywardness of mind and inconstancy of disposition, often approaching that touch of insanity, which affected, or was affected by, those wise men the court fools of almost all epochs, and an unscrupulousness in matters of principle, which left his conduct often in very doubtful balance between honesty and knavery, had barred his advancement in all the many walks he had tried. He had strong and even ungovernable animal impulses also, which had more than once led him into situations of difficulty, and between which and his natural ambition there was the same struggle that frequently took place between his good sense and his folly. He laboured hard, not perhaps to govern his passions, but rather to keep their gratification within safe limits. And he felt a sort of ill-will towards himself when they overcame him, which generated a cynical bitterness towards others. That bitterness was also increased by a consciousness of not having succeeded in any cause as much as the talents he knew himself to possess might have ensured. But it must not be supposed that for one moment that Ned Dyrum ever attributed the failure of his efforts for advancement to himself. The injustice or folly of others, he thought, or the concurrence of untoward circumstances, had alone kept him in an inferior situation. Though the king, on his accession to the throne, had extended to him greater favour than to any other of those who had participated in the wild exploits of his youth, simply because Ned Dyrum had never prompted or led in any unjustifiable act, and had not withheld the bitterness of his tongue even from the youthful follies of the prince, yet he felt a rankling disappointment at not having been promoted and honoured, without ever suspecting that Henry might have seen in him faults or failings that would have rendered him a more dangerous servant to a sovereign than to a private individual. Yet such was the case, for that great prince's eyes were clear-sighted and keen, and though he had not troubled himself to study all the intricacies of the man's character, he had perceived many qualities which he believed might be amended by mingling with the world in an inferior station, which unfitted the possessor at the time for close attendance upon the monarch. Ned Dyrum, however, though affecting that bluntness which is so often mistaken for sincerity, was not without sufficient pliancy to conceal his mortification, and to perform eagerly whatever task the king imposed upon him. I do not say, indeed, that he proposed to perform it well, unless it suited his own views and wishes. He did the monarch's bidding with alacrity, because on that he thought his future fortune might depend." but he did not make up his mind to ensure success by diligence, activity, and zeal, satisfying himself by saying that the result must ever depend upon circumstances, and one of those circumstances was always, in this case, Ned Dyrum's own good will. He had some hesitation, however, and some fear, for there was but one man in England whose displeasure he dreaded, and that man was the king. But yet I would not imply that it was his power he feared alone. He feared offending the man, rather than the monarch, for Henry had acquired over him that influence, which can be obtained only by a great and superior mind, over one less large and comprehensive. It was the majesty of that great prince's intellect, of which he stood in awe, not the splendour of his throne, and perhaps he might have yielded to the impression, in the present instance, and done all that he ought to have done, had he not perceived too clearly the feelings which prompted him to do so. For as soon as he was conscious that dread of the king was operating to drive him in a certain direction, the dogged perversity of his nature rose up and dragged him to the contrary side. He called himself a cowed hound, and, with all the obstinate vanity of a wrong-headed man, he resolved to prove to himself that he had no fear, by acting in direct opposition to the dread of which he was conscious. As the best way of conquering all scruples, he treated them lightly from that moment, quickened his horse's pace, stopped to sup and sleep about fifteen miles from London, and presented himself at the gates of the palace at an early hour next morning. There he was kept waiting for some time, as the king was at council, but at length he was admitted to the monarch's presence, and in answer to questions which evidently showed that he had been sent into Hampshire to collect information of a more definite character than had previously reached Henry's ears, in regard to the death of Catherine Beecham, he gave his sovereign at full 
all the tidings he had gained from Dame Julian, the Reeve's wife, from Brother Clement, and from two or three other persons whom he had seen before he met with those I have mentioned. Of Brother Martin, however, he said not a word, and Henry mused for several minutes without observation. "'Well,' he said at length, "'refresh yourself and your horse, Ned, and then go back and join your new lord. Here is largesse for your service.' though I am sorry you have been able to gain no more clear intelligence. And at the same moment he poured the contents of a small leathern purse, which had been lying on the table, into his hand. The amount was far larger than Ned Dyram had expected, for Henry was one of the most open-handed men on earth, and he paused, looked from the gold to the monarch, and seemed about to speak. At that moment, however, the door of the room opened, and a young gentleman entered in haste. By the stern and somewhat contracted but high forehead, by the quick keen eye, and by the compressed lips, Ned Dyram instantly recognised Prince John of Lancaster, and, at a sign from the king, he bowed low and quitted the presence. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The New Friends Ella Brune sat on a stool at the feet of Mary Markham on the day after Richard of Woodville's departure from London, and certainly a more beautiful contrast was seldom seen than between the fair lady and the minstrel girl, as the one told and the other listened to the tale of the old man's death and all that had since occurred. The eyes of both were full of tears, which did not run over, indeed, but hung trembling on the eyelid, like drops of summer dew in the cup of a flower. And Mary Markham, with the kind, familiar impulse of sympathy, stretched forth her fair hand twice, and pressed that of her less fortunate companion, as she told the tale of her sorrows and her sufferings. The poor girl's heart yearned towards her gentle friend, as she remarked her sympathy for all she felt, her grief at the death of the poor old man, her pleasure at the conduct of Ella's generous protector, her indignation at the persecution she had suffered from a man whom she herself scorned and despised. But one thing is to be remarked. The name of Sir Simeon of Roydon, Ella spoke plainly, and repeated often during her narrative, but that of Richard of Woodville, from some latent feeling in her own heart, she shrunk from pronouncing. It might be that the meaning looks and smiles of the people of the inn where she had visited him made her believe that others would entertain the suspicions or fancies which she imagined that those looks implied. It might be that she doubted her own heart, or that she knew there really were therein sensations which she dreaded to acknowledge to herself, and still more to expose to the eyes of others. Thus she gave him any other designation than his own name. She called him the noble gentleman who had befriended her, her protector, her benefactor, everything, in short, but Richard of Woodville. Mary Markham observed this reserve, and, as woman's heart, even in the most simple and single-minded, is always learned in women's secrets, Mary judged, and judged rightly, that gratitude was growing up in Ella's bosom into love. She could very well understand that it should be so. She thought it natural, so natural, that it could scarce be otherwise, and what she felt within herself would have made her very lenient to passion in others, even had she been more harsh and severe than she was. She took a deep interest in the poor girl and her whole history, and not less in her grateful love than in any other part thereof, so that she was anxious to learn who and what this unnamed benefactor was, in order that she might judge whether there was the least hope or chance of Ella's tenderness meeting due return. He was a generous and noble-hearted knight indeed, she said, more like the ancient chivalry, my poor girl, than the heartless nobility of the present day. He is not a knight, answered Ella timidly, but I am sure he soon will be, for he well deserves his spurs. And he is young and handsome, of course, Ella, said Mary Markham with a smile. The minstrel girl coloured, but answered nothing, and Mary went on, saying, but you must tell me his name, Ella. I would fain know who is this noble gentleman. Thus plainly asked, Ella Brune could not refuse to answer, and bending down her bright eyes upon the ground, she said, His name is Richard of Woodville, lady. 
she spoke in a tone so low that the words might have been inaudible to any other ear than that of Mary Markham. The well-known sound, however, was instantly caught by her, producing emotions in her heart such as she had never felt before. Her very breath seemed stopped, her bosom fluttered, as if there had been a caged bird within. Her cheek turned very pale, and then flushed warm again, with the blood spreading in a brighter glow over her fair forehead and her blue-veined temples. Hers was not indeed a jealous disposition. Her nature was too generous and frank to be suspicious or distrustful, but it is difficult for any woman's ear to hear that he to whom her whole affections are given is loved by another, and her heart not beat with emotions far from pleasurable. Yet Mary schooled herself for what she felt, for the slight touch of doubt towards Woodville and of anger towards Ella, which crossed her bosom for a moment. It is not his fault, she thought, if the girl loves him, nor hers either to love him for acts of generous kindness. She is no more to blame for such feelings than myself. The same high qualities that won my regard might well gain hers. He is too noble, too, too true and faithful to trifle with her or to forget me. Yet would this have not happened. It is strange, too, that he did not mention all this to me. But then she remembered how every hour he had spent with her had passed, how little time they had found to say all that two warm and tender hearts could prompt, how often they had been interrupted in the half-finished tale of love, how constantly it had been renewed whenever they were alone, and then she thought it not extraordinary at all that he had spoken of nothing else. Such thoughts, however, kept her mute, with her eyes gazing on the tapestry at the other side of the room, and she saw not that Ella, surprised at her silence, had now raised her look and was reading in the countenance, with the skill which peril and misfortune soon acquire in this hard world, all that was passing in the heart beneath. The poor girl's face was very pale, for she had her emotions too but yet she was calmer than Mary Markham, for one of the chief sources of agitation was wanting in her bosom. She was without hope. She might love, but it was love with no expectation. The future, which to Mary's eyes was like the garden of the Hesperides, all hanging with golden fruit, was a desert to poor Ella Brune. She had no fear because she had no hope. She had no doubts because she had no trust. She was extremely calm, for though there were painful sensations, there was no internal contention. She, therefore, it was, who spoke first. You know him, lady, in a sweet, gentle, humble tone, and if you know him, you love him. I do know him, answered Mary Markham, with a trembling voice and glowing cheek. I have known him well for years. She paused there, but the moment after, she thought, with that generous confidence so often misplaced, but which was not so in this instance, it were better to tell her all for her sake and for mine. If she be good and virtuous, as I think, it cannot but lead to good to let her know the whole truth. Ay, Ella, she continued aloud, and you are right, I do love him, and he loves me. We have plighted our faith to each other, and wait but the consent of others to be more happy than we are. A tear trembled in the eye of Ella Brune, and what were the thoughts that flashed like lightning through her mind? The lady loves him, and she sees I love him too. Jealousy is a strange thing, and a sad pang. She may doubt him, even with such a friendless being as I am. I will sweep that doubt away. And with a resigned but gentle smile, looking in Mary's face, she said, I was sure of it. Of what, Ella? asked Mary Markham with some surprise. "'That he loved someone, and was beloved again,' replied the poor girl, and she repeated, "'I was sure of it.' "'What could make you sure?' asked the lady, gazing at her with a less embarrassed look. "'He did not tell you, did he?' "'Oh, no,' answered Ella Brune. "'All he told me was that he was going afar to Burgundy, and that as he could not give me any further protection himself, he would send one of his men to inquire after me, that he might hear I was safe and as happy as fate would let me be.' But, and she paused, as if she doubted whether to proceed or not. But what, Ella? demanded Mary. Why, I was foolish, lady, said the girl, and perhaps you may think me wrong, too, and bold. But when I heard that he was going to Burgundy, I cried, Oh, that I were going with you! And I told him that I had kinsfolk, both in Liege and in Peron. And then I knew by his look, and what he said, 
that there was some lady whom he loved and who loved him. "'How did that enlighten you?' inquired Mary Markham. "'Did he refuse you? That were not courteous, I think.' "'No, he did not actually refuse,' answered Ella Broom. "'But he said that it might hardly be, and I saw he thought that his lady might be jealous, might suspect.' Mary Markham put her hand on Ella's with a warm smile, and said, "'I will neither suspect him nor be jealous of you, Ella, though perhaps I might have been,' she added. "'Yes, perhaps I might, if I had heard you were with him, and I had not known why. Yet I should have been very wrong. Out upon such doubts, I say, if they can prevent a true-hearted gentleman from doing an act of kindness to a poor girl in her need, lest a jealous heart should suspect him. But I will write to him, Ella.' "'and yet it is now in vain, for he has left Westminster.' "'Ella gazed at her, smiling. "'We know not our own heart,' she said, "'and perhaps, dear lady, you might be jealous yet.' "'No, no,' cried Mary, with one of her own joyous laughs again. "'Never, now. I am of a confiding nature, my poor girl, "'and I soon conquer those bitter enemies of peace called doubts.' "'Ella Broom gazed round the room.' "'If I had some instrument, I could sing to you on that theme,' she said. "'Nay, you can sing without, Ella,' replied the lady. "'I have none here, alas.' "'Well, I will sing it, then,' answered Ella Broom. "'Tis an old ditty, and a simple one.' And leaning her hand on Mary Markham's knee, she sang, "'Trust, trust, sweet lady, trust. "'Tis a shield of sevenfold steel. "'Cares and sorrows come they must, "'but sharper far is doubt to feel.' "'Trust, trust, sweet lady, trust. "'If deceit must vex the heart, "'who can pass through life without? "'Better far to bear the smart "'than to grind the soul with doubt. "'Trust, trust, sweet lady, trust. "'Trust the lover, trust the friend. "'Heed not what old rhymers tell. "'Trust to God, and in the end "'doubt not all will still be well. "'Trust, trust, sweet lady, trust.' Love's best guide and friendship stay, trust to innocence was given. Tis doubt that paves the downward way, but trust unlocks the gates of heaven. Trust, trust, sweet lady, trust. And so I will, Ella, cried the lady, so I have ever done, and will do still, but methinks you have made the song to suit my ear. Nay, in truth, dear lady, it is an ancient one, replied Ella Broom, but ere she could add more, old Sir Philip Beecham strode into the room with an air hurried, yet not dissatisfied. I have seen the king, Mary, he said, and on my life he is a noble youth, right kingly in his port and in his words. His brother John, who won his spurs under my pennon, when but a boy, soon got me speech of him, and you are to go with me at once to his presence, pretty maid. "'Nay, do not look downcast. "'He is no frightful tyrant, "'but a man that lady's eyes may look upon well pleased, "'and tis needful for your safety you should go.' "'Must she go alone, dear knight?' asked Mary Markham, "'with kind consideration for the girl's fears. "'Alone? No, I am to go with her, to be sure,' answered Sir Philip. "'How, my fair Mary, you would fain go visit Henry too. "'What would Richard of Woodville say?' "'He would trust,' answered Mary Markham, giving a gay look to Ella. "'However, I seek not to go, noble sir, "'but it would be better for this poor girl to have my maid moored with her, "'for decency's sake,' she continued in a laughing tone. "'You old knights are sometimes too light and gallant, "'and I must protect her from your courteous speeches, by the way. "'Come with me, Ella. "'I have a cloak in my chamber that will suit well with your hood, "'and cover you all so that nothing will be seen but the edge of your wimple.' "'Then will you and Sir Philip escape scandal "'if you both walk softly and look demure "'while Maud trips along beside you?' "'Though Mary Markham said no word of the minstrel girl's attire "'and did not even glance her eye to the gold fringe upon her gown, "'yet Ella understood and was thankful for her kind care "'and mentally promised herself that before that day was out "'she would provide herself with plainer weeds. "'In less than five minutes she and the maid were ready to depart,' and accompanied by Sir Philip, they soon crossed the open ground before the abbey and the sanctuary, and entered the gates of the palace yard. At the private door of the royal residence they received immediate emission, for a page was waiting Sir Philip's return, and he led them, not to the small chamber where Henry had received Ned Dyram in the morning, and Sir Philip shortly after, 
Following, on the contrary, the larger staircase, the boy conducted the little party to a hall, then used as an audience chamber, and when they entered they at once perceived the king at the farther end, surrounded by a gay and glittering throng, and listening apparently with deep attention to an old man, dressed as a prelate of the church, who, with slow and measured accents, was delivering what seemed a somewhat long oration. Whatever was the subject on which he spoke, it seemed to be one of much interest, for ever and anon the king bowed his head with a grave approving motion, and a murmur of satisfaction rose from those around. Slowly and quietly the old knight and his companions drew near, and then found that the good bishop was arguing the king's title, not alone to the duchies of Normandy, Aquitaine, and Anjou, which undoubtedly belonged of right to the English crown, but also to the whole of France, which has certainly belonged to another. Sir Philip Beecher marked well the monarch's countenance, as he listened, and perceived that, when the subject was the recovery of those territories which had descended to the race of Plantagenet from William the Conqueror, Fulke of Anjou, and Eleanor of Aquitaine, one of those grave inclinations of the head which marked his approbation followed but that when the claim of all France was considered, Henry paused, and seemed to meditate more on thoughts suggested by his own mind than on the mere words that struck his ear. The surrounding nobles, however, applauded all, and bright and beaming eyes were turned upon the prelate when he concluded his oration with the words, strange ones indeed, in the mouth of a Christian bishop, Wherefore, O oh my lord, the king, advance your banner, fight for your right, conquer your inheritance, Spare not sword, blood, or fire, for your war is just, your cause is good, your claim is true. Many thanks, my good lord, replied the king. We will with our counsel consider duly what you have advanced, and we beseech you to pray God on our behalf that we be advised wisely. Pity it were indeed to shed Christian blood without due cause, and therefore we shall first fairly and courteously require of our cousin the restitution of those territories undeniably appertaining to our crown, with the which we may content ourselves, if granted frankly, but if they be refused, a greater claim may perchance grow out of the denial of the smaller one, and at all events we shall know how, with the sword, to do ourselves right when driven to draw it. We will then beseech farther communion with you on these weighty matters, and for the present thank you much. The bishop retired from the spot immediately facing the king, and Henry's eye lighting on Sir Philip Beecham, he bowed his head to him, saying, Advance, my noble friend. Ha! You have brought the girl with you, as I said. And his look fixed upon the countenance of poor Ella Broom, with a calm and scrutinizing gaze, not altogether free from wonder and admiration, to see such delicate beauty in one of her degree, but without a touch of that coarse and gloating expression which had offended her in the stare of Sir Simeon of Royden. "'Is the knight I sent for here?' demanded the king, turning towards the page. "'Not yet, sire,' answered the boy. "'Well, then,' said Henry, "'though it is but fair that a man accused should hear the charge against him, we must proceed, and you lords will witness what this young woman says, that it may be repeated to him hereafter. Now, maiden,' What is this which the worthy knight, Sir Philip Beecham, has reported concerning you and Sir Simeon of Royden? To say that Ella Brune was not somewhat abashed would be false, for she did feel that she was in the presence of the most powerful king and the most chivalrous court in Europe. She did feel that all eyes were turned upon her, every ear bent to catch her words, but there were truth and innocence at her heart the strongest of all supports. There was the sense of having been wronged also, and perhaps some feeling of scorn rather than shame was roused by the light smiles and busy whisper that ran round the lordly circle before which she stood, for there is nothing so contemptible in the eyes even of the humble, if they be wise and firm of heart, as the light and causeless but oppressive sneer of pride, whether that pride be based in station, fortune, courtliness, or aught else on earth, for the true nobility of mind, which sometimes impresses even pride with a faint mark of its own dignity, never treads upon the humble. Henry, however, heard the buzz, and felt offended at the light looks he saw. "'My lords,' he said, in a tone of surprise and displeasure, "'I beseech you, my good uncle of Exeter, warn those gentlemen of that which the king would not speak harshly. This is no jesting matter. Wrong has been done.' 
I may say almost in our presence, so near has it been to our palace gates, and by the Queen of Heaven such things shall not escape punishment, while I wear the crown or bear the sword. When I am powerless to defend the meanest of my subject, may death give my sceptre to more mighty hands. When I am unwilling to do justice to any in the land, may my enemies take from me the power I have borne unworthily. Go on with your tale, maiden. Ella Brune obeyed the king's order, with a voice that faltered at first, but the rich sweet tone of which soon called the attention of all to what she said. And taking up her story from the beginning, she related the death of her old companion, the interview which she had first had with Sir Simeon of Royden, and the violent manner in which she had been carried off, as she was returning to the hostelry where she lodged. As she spoke she gained confidence, and though, ere she had proceeded far, the base knight himself entered the presence, and placed himself exactly opposite to her, glaring at her with fierce and menacing eyes, her tongue faltered no more, and she went on to speak of her second interview with him, telling how she had forced back the lock of the door with her dagger, how the servants of the knight had not ventured to seize her, under the belief that the weapon was poisoned, and how she had dropped from the great window at the end of the corridor into the lane below. As soon as she had done, Royden stepped forward as if to reply, but old Sir Philip Beecham, who stood by Ella's side to give her support, waved his hand, saying, "'Silence, boy, till all be said against you, then speak if you must.' As far as the carrying off as this poor little maiden is concerned, a good woman of the neighbourhood saw the deed done, and can bear witness respecting it, if farther testimony is required. I saw the manner of her escape as she has told it, and knocked down one of this knight's knaves just as he clutched her. So far his story is confirmed. What passed between him and her in private they only know, but I would take her word against his in any town, for I know him to be a wondrous liar. A laugh ran round the royal circle, and Sir Simeon of Royden put his hand to his dagger, but the king turned towards him, saying, "'Now, sir, have you aught to answer? Is this story true or false?' "'Somewhat mixed, sire,' answered Simeon of Royden, with a sneer upon his lip. "'The young woman is rather fanciful. I will own that because she has a pretty face, as you may see, and bright eyes and a small foot and rounded ankle, she pleased my fancy.' and although of somewhat low degree for such an honour, I thought to make her my paramour for a time, as many another man might do. Minstrel girls and tumble steers are not generally famed for chastity, and by my faith I thought I showed her favour when I told my servants to find her out and bring her to my lodging. If they used any violence, twas not my fault, for I bade them treat her gently, and as to her confinement at my house, that is pure fancy— she might have gone whenever she chose. "'Tis strange, then,' said the king, with a scornful smile, "'that she should take such means of going. "'People do not usually leap out of a window "'when they can walk through a door.' "'What made you bellow after her like a wild bull?' "'demanded Sir Philip Beecham, turning to the culprit. "'I heard you with my ears, and so did many more. "'Shout to your knaves to follow her, lest she should to the king. "'I know your voice right well, Sir Knight, "'and will vouch for its sweet sounds.' "'Doting fool!' murmured Simeon of Royden. "'Doting!' cried the old knight. "'Take care you don't feel my gauntlet in your face, "'lest I send you home as toothless as I sent your serviceable man. "'You will find that there is strength enough left to crush such a worm as you.' "'Silence, Sir Philip,' said the king. "'Sir Simeon of Royden, according to your own account, "'you have committed an offence for which, "'if it had been done within the gates of our good city of London,' The sober citizens would, methinks, have set you on a horse's back, with your face to the tail, and marched you in no pleasant procession. But I must add, I do not believe your account. It seems to me to bear no character of truth about it. Yet, that you may not stand upon my judgment alone, if there be one of these good lords here present, who will say they do, upon my honour, believe that this poor maiden speaks falsely, and you tell the simple truth, you shall go free. "'What say you, lords? Is the girl true, or he?' "'The girl! The girl!' cried all the voices round. "'However men may love leaping,' said John of Lancaster, "'they seek not to break their necks by springing from a window when they can help it.' "'Well, then,' continued Henry, "'you must carry your amorous violence to other lands, Sir Simeon of Royden. "'You have committed a discourteous and unknightly act, 
and must give us time to forget it. We will not touch you in person or in purse, in goods or lands, but we banish you for two years from the realm of England. Bestow yourself where you will, but be not found within these shores after one month from this day, which space we give you to prepare. Is this a just award, my lords? The gentlemen round bowed their heads, and Henry, turning to the good old knight, added, with a gracious smile, I thank you much, Sir Philip Beecham, for bringing this matter to my knowledge. These are deeds that I am resolved to check, with all the power that God entrusts to me. Heaven bless your grace, and ever send us such a king, replied the old knight, and taking Ella by the hand, with a low reverence to the monarch, he led her from the hall. Henry, it would seem, dismissed his court at once, but before the minstrel girl and her companion had reached the bottom of the stairs, they were surrounded by several of the younger nobles, who were all somewhat eager to say soft and flattering things to the fair object of the day's interest, notwithstanding some rough reproof from good Sir Philip Beecham. But as he and his young charge were passing out with Mary Markham's maiden, a low, deep voice whispered in Ella's ear, "'I swear by Christ's sepulchre, I will have revenge. And the next moment Sir Simeon of Royden passed them, mounted his horse in the palace yard, and rode furiously away. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Agincourt, A Romance, by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Preparation it was late in the evening of the same day of which we have just been speaking, when Ella Brune returned to her hostelry. She had gone back to thank fair Mary Markham for her kindness, intending only to stay for a few moments. But her new friend detained her till the sun was near his setting, and then only let her depart under the escort of Hugh of Clatford and another yeoman, after extracting a promise from her that she would return on the following morning, after the sad ceremony of her grandsire's funeral was over. And now Ella sat in her lonely little chamber, with the tears filling her bright eyes, which seemed fixed upon a spot of sunshine on the opposite wall of the court, but, in reality, saw nothing, or at least conveyed no impression to the mind. Why was it Ella wept? To say truth, Ella herself could not, or would not, tell. It was perhaps the crowding upon her of many sad sensations, the torrent swelled by many smaller rills, which caused those tears. And yet there was one predominant feeling, one that she wished not to acknowledge even to her own heart. What can I call it? How shall I explain it? It was not disappointment, for, as I have said before, she did not, she had never hoped. No, the best term for it is love without hope, and oh, what a bitter thing that is. During the whole of that morning she had had no time to dwell upon it. She had been occupied, while she remained with Mary Markham, in struggling against her own sensations, not examining them, but now she paused and pondered, in solitude and in silence. She gave way to bitter thought, but it was not with the weak and wavering irresolution of a feeble mind. On the contrary, though the anguish would have its tear, she regarded her present fate and future conduct with the firm and energetic purposes of a heart inured to suffer and to decide. Her mind rested upon Richard of Woodville, upon his kindness, his generosity, his chivalrous protection of her who had never met with such protection before, and the first strong determination of her mind expressed itself in the words she murmured to herself. I will repay it. Then again she asked herself, Why should I feel shame or fear or hesitation now at the thought of following him through the world, of watching for the hour, for the moment, when God may grant me the grace to serve him? He loves another, and is loved by another. He can never be anything to me, but the friend who stood forward to help me in the hour of need. What has sex or station to do with it? Why should I care more than if I were a man? And how often do the meanest, by watchful love, find an opportunity to deliver or to support the highest and the mightiest? Why should I think of what men may say or believe? True in my own heart and conscious of my truth, 
I may well laugh at suspicion, which follows such as I am, whatever course they take. How often have I been thought a ribald and loser, when I have guarded my words and looks and actions most carefully, and now I will dare to do boldly what my heart tells me, knowing that it is right. Yet, poor thing, she added after a moment, thou art beggar enough, I fear. Thou must husband thy little store well. Let me see. I will count my treasure. There are the fifty half-nobles sent me by the king, and those my dear protector gave me. Now for the little store of the poor old man. And drawing a key from her bosom, she crossed the room to where, upon a window-seat, there stood a small oaken coffer, containing her apparel and that of the poor old minstrel. After opening the box and taking out one or two instruments of music, which lay at the top, she thrust her hand further down and brought forth a small leathern pouch, fastened by a thong bound round it several times. It cost her some trouble to unloose it, but at length she spread out the mouth and poured the contents upon the top of the clothes in the coffer. She had expected to see nothing but silver and copper, but amongst the rest were several pieces of gold, and besides these was a piece of parchment tied up with some writing upon it, and a gold ring set with a large precious stone. The former she examined closely and read the words with some difficulty, for they were written by no very practised hand in rough and scattered characters. She made it out at length, however, to be merely My Ella's Dowry, and a tear fell upon it as she read. She thought that the handwriting was her father's. She then looked at the ring and saw by its lustre that it must be of some value, but a strip of leather which was sewn round the gold caught her eye, and she found it, too, traced with some rude characters. They expressed a date, however, which was 21st of July, 1403, and what it meant she knew not. Opening the parchment packet, she then proceeded to examine of what her little dowry consisted, and, to her surprise and joy, she found forty broad pieces of gold. Nay, she exclaimed, this is indeed wealth. Why, I am endowed like a knight's daughter. And well might she say so, for when we remember the difference between the value of gold in that day and at present, the amount she now possessed, what the sum she had just found and the penalty imposed by the king on Simeon of Royden, was equal to some six or seven hundred pounds. "'I shall have enough to follow him for ten years,' said Ella Brune, gazing on the gold, "'without being a charge to any one, "'and then there may still remain sufficient to gain me admission to a nunnery. "'But I will lay it by carefully, "'and placing all the gold she had, except the few pieces that had been loose in the pouch, "'into the parchment which had contained her dowry, "'she tied it up again carefully and restored it to its place. "'Yet I will be avaricious,' she said, I will disencumber myself of everything I do not want, and change it into coin. Shall I sell this ring? No, it may mean something I do not know. It is easily carried, and might create suspicion if I disposed of it here. Perhaps my cousin at Peron can tell me more about it. How shall I sell the other things? Nay, I will ask the hostess to do it for me. She will think of her own payment, and will do it well. After carefully putting back the ring and the money, she opened the door of the room and called down the stairs. "'Hostess! Hostess! Mistress Trenchard!' "'Come in, come in, little maid,' said the good dame from below. "'Do not be in haste. I am with you in a minute.' And after keeping Ella waiting for a short time, more to make herself of importance than because she had anything else to do, she came panting up the stairs, closed the door, and seated herself on the side of the low bed. "'Well, my poor Ella,' she said, what want you with me? Yours is a sad case indeed, poor thing. My husband and I both said, when you and poor old Murdoch Brune went away to foreign lands, leaving your own good country behind you, that harm would come of it. And yet he died in England, replied Ella with a sigh. But what you say is very true, hostess. No good has come of it, and we returned poorer than we went. I have wherewithal to pay my score she added, seeing a slight cloud come over the good mistress Trenchard's face. But yet I shall want more for my necessity, and I would fain ask you a great favour. What is that? asked the hostess, somewhat dryly. 
"'It is simply that you would sell for me a good many of these things that I do not want,' answered Ella. "'Here are several instruments of music, which I know cost much, and must produce something.' "'Oh, that I will, right willingly,' replied the hostess, "'and tis but right and fitting that you should trust such matters to one who is accustomed to buy and sell, "'than to do it yourself, who know nothing of trade, God wot. "'I will have them to Westcheap, where there are plenty of fripperies, "'or carry them to the Lombards, who, perhaps, know more about such matters.' "'I should think that the Lombards would purchase them best,' answered Ella, "'for one of these instruments, the viol, was purchased out of Italy, "'when my grandfather was chief minstrel to the great Earl of Northumberland.' "'Aye, I remember the time well,' said Mistress Chenthard. "'Murdoch Brune was a great man in those days, "'and rode upon a grey horse, fit for a knight. "'He used to pinch my cheek and call me pretty Dolly Trenchard, "'till my husband was somewhat crusty.' "'And so the viol is valuable, you think?' "'And the ribable, too,' answered Ella Brune, "'for they were cut by a great maker in Italy, "'and such are not to be found in England.' "'I will take care, I will take care,' rejoined the hostess. "'Gather them all together, and I will send up Tom, the drawer, for them presently. "'Tomorrow I will take them to the Lombards, for it is somewhat late this evening.' "'Nay, but I have other favours to ask of you, Dame,' said Ella Brune. "'Tomorrow they bury the poor old man, and I must have a black gown of serge and a white wimple, and I would fain that you went with me to the burial, if you could steal away for an hour, for it will be a sad day for me.' "'That will I do, poor maiden,' replied the hostess readily, not alone because she took a sincere interest in her fair guest, but because in those days, as in almost all others, people of inferior minds found a strange pleasure in bearing part of any impressive ceremony— however melancholy as so much of her spare time was likely to be occupied on the morrow she agreed to run up to cheap that very night before the watch was set and to purchase for ella brune the mourning garments which she required the latter commission she performed fully to the girl's satisfaction returning with a loose gown of fine black serge ready made and a wimple and hood of clear lawn little differing from that of a nun Ella gazed on the dress with some emotion, murmuring to herself, "'Ay, the cloister, it must end there at last. Well, prayer and peace, tis the calmest fate after all.' But the sale of the instruments of music and several other small articles was not executed quite as well. Men were rogues in those times, as at present, though perhaps in the improvement of all things roguery has not been neglected— and the good Lombards took care not to give more than half the value of the goods they purchased. Neither Ella nor good Mistress Trenchard herself knew any better, however, so that the latter thought she had made a very good bargain, and the former was content. Her store was by this means considerably increased, and a short time before the appointed hour, Ella, with the hostess, set out towards the hospital of St. James, for the sad task that was to be performed that day. I will not pause upon the hours that followed. Dark and sorrowful such hours must ever be, for the dim eyes of mortality see the lamp of faith but faintly, and there is naught else to light our gaze through the obscure vault of death to the bright world of reunion. Put the holy promises to our heart as eagerly, as fondly as we will, how difficult it is to obtain a warm and living image of life beyond this life. How the clay clings to the clay. How the spirit cleaveth to the dust with which it hath borne companionship so long. Strange, too, to say that we can better realise in our own case the idea of renewed existence than in the case of those we love. It is comparatively easy to fancy that we who have lived today shall live tomorrow, that we who lie down to rest ourselves in sleep and to rise refreshed shall sleep in death and wake again renewed. There is in every man's own heart a sentiment of his immortality, which nothing can blot out, but the vain pride of human intellect, the bitterest ashes of the forbidden fruit. But when we see the dearly loved, the bright, the beautiful, the wise, the good, fall like a withered leaf into the dark corruption of the tomb, the light go out like an extinguished lamp, and all that is left, all that has been familiar to our living senses, drop into dust and mingle with its earth again. The Sadducean demon seizes on us, 
and it requires a mighty struggle of the spirit, prayer, patience, resignation, hope, and faith, to win our belief from the dark actuality before us, and fix it on the distant splendour of a promised world to come. There were sad hours for poor Ella Brune, and when they were over, the chambers of the heart felt too dark and lonely for her to admit any thoughts but those of the dead. She sent, therefore, to Mary Markham to tell her that she was too woebegone to come that day, and returning to her little chamber at the inn, she sat down to weep and pass the evening with her memories. On the following morning, early, she once more set out for Westminster, and passed quietly along the road till she reached Charing. But near the hermitage and chapel of St. Catherine, just opposite the cross, she perceived a man standing gazing up the strand, with the serpent embroidered on the black ground, which distinguished the followers of Sir Simeon of Royden. Her fears might have betrayed her, for she forgot for a moment the complete change of her dress, and fancied that she must be instantly recognised. But the instant after, recovering her presence of mind, she drew the hood far over her face, and passed the man boldly, without his even turning to look at her. She then made her way on towards Tote Hill, and soon came to the gates of the house in which Sir Philip Beecham had taken up his temporary abode. Few but the higher nobility, or persons immediately attached to the court, indulged in those days in the luxury of a dwelling in London, or the neighbouring city, and when business or pleasure called inferior personages to the capital, they either took up their dwelling at a hostel, or found lodging in the mansions of some of the great families, to whom they were attached by friendship or relationship. Nor was such hospitality ever refused, so long as the house could contain more guests, for each man's consequence, and sometimes his safety, depended upon the number of those whom he entertained, and even when the Lord was absent from his own dwelling, the doors were always open to those who were known to be connected with him. Thus Sir Philip Beecham had found ready lodging in the house of one of the numerous family of that name, the head of which was then the Earl of Warwick. Though, ere many years had passed, an only daughter bore that glorious title into the house of Neville. When Ella reached the mansion, the porter, distinguished by the cognizance of the bear, was standing before the gates, talking with a young man, who seemed to have just dismounted from a tired horse, and held the bridle rein cast over his arm. In answer to Ella's inquiry for the Lady Mary Markham, the old servant laughed, saying, Here is another. If it goes on thus all day, there will be nothing else but the opening of gates for a pretty lady who is not here. She departed last night with Sir Philip, fair maid. They went in great haste, good sooth I know not why, for twas but two hours before the sturdy old knight told me he should stay three days. But they had letters by a messenger from the country, so perchance his daughter is ill. The Blessed Virgin give her deliverance, said Ella, turning away with a disappointed look, and bending her steps back towards the city of London, she walked slowly on along the dusty road, absorbed in no very cheerful thoughts, and marking little of what passed around her. The few people were yet abroad between the two towns. The strand was almost solitary, and she had nearly reached the wall of the garden of Durham House, which ran along to the temple, when she heard a voice behind her exclaiming, in a sharp tone. Why do you follow her, Master Knave? What is that to you, Blue Tabard? replied another tongue. I will let you know right soon if you do not desist, answered the first. Whom do you serve? asked the second. The king, was the reply. So away with you. Ella looked round and beheld the man whom she had found speaking with the porter a moment before, bending his brows sternly upon the servant of Sir Simeon of Royden, whom she had seen watching near the hermitage of St. Catherine as she passed up the strand. The latter, however, seemed to be animated by no very pugnacious spirit, for he merely replied, Methinks one man has a right to walk the high road to London as well as another. But he did not proceed to enforce this right by following the course he had been pursuing, and crossing over from the south to the north side of the way, he was soon lost among the low shops, and small houses which there occupied the middle of the road. "'I will ride along beside you, fair maiden,' said Ned Dyram, for he it was who had come up, though I should not wonder from what the porter told me just now if you were the person I am looking for. 
He spoke civilly and gravely, and Ella replied with a bright smile, Ha, perhaps it is so, for he said he would send. Whom do you come from? I come from Richard of Woodville, answered the man, and I am sent to a maiden named Ella Broom, living not far up the new street somewhat beyond the old temple, in a hostelry called the Falcon. Tis I, tis I, cried Ella. Oh, I am glad to see you. Her bright eyes lighted up, and her fair face glowed with an expression of joy and satisfaction, which added in no small degree to its loveliness. For though we hear much of beauty and distress being heightened by tears, yet there is an inherent harmony between man's heart and joy, which makes the expression thereof always more pleasant to the eye than that of any other emotion. Ned Dyrum gazed at her with admiration, but withdrew his eyes the moment after, and resumed a more sober look. "'I will give you all his messages by and by,' he said, "'for I shall lodge at the Falcon to-night, and have much to say. "'But yet I may as well tell you a part as we go along,' he continued, "'dismounting from his horse and taking the bridle on his arm. First, fair maiden, I was to ask how you fared, and what you intended to do.' "'I have fared ill and well,' answered Ella Broom, "'but that is a long story, and I will relate it to you afterwards.' "'for that I can talk of, though the people of the house should be present. "'And what I am to do is a deeper question, and I know not how to answer it. "'I have friends at the court of Burgundy.' "'What, then, are you of noble race, lady?' asked Ned Dyram in an altered tone. "'Oh, no,' replied Ella Broom, with a faint smile. "'The cousin of whom I speak is but a goldsmith to the Count of Charolois.' "'But tis a long journey for a woman to take alone, "'through foreign lands and amongst the people somewhat unruly.' "'Why not come with us?' inquired Ned Dyrum. "'We sail from Dover in three days, and our company will be your protection. "'Did not Child Richard tell you he was going?' "'Yes,' answered Ella Broom, casting down her eyes. "'But he did not seem to like the thought of having a woman in his company.' "'Faith, that is courteous of the good youth,' said Ned Dyram, with a low, sharp laugh. "'He may win his spurs, but will not merit them if he refuses protection to a lady.' "'That, I am sure, he would not do,' replied Ella gravely. "'He has given me the noblest protection at my need, but he may not think it right.' "'No, no, you have mistaken him,' said Ned Dyram. "'He is courteous and kind, without a doubt. "'He might think it better for yourself.' "'to go to York, as he bade me tell you, "'and to see your friends there, and to claim your rights. "'But if you judge fit to turn your steps to Burgundy instead, "'depend upon it, he will freely give you aid and comfort on the way. "'If he did doubt,' added the man, "'twas but that he thought his lady-love might be jealous, "'if she heard that he had so fair a maiden in his company, "'for you know he is a lover.' "'And he fixed his eyes inquiringly on Ella's face.' "'I know he is,' she answered calmly and without a change of feature. "'I know the lady, too, but she is not unwilling that I should go, "'and I dread much to show myself in York.' "'Why so?' demanded Ned Dyram. "'But Ella Broom was not sufficiently won by his countenance or manner "'to grant him the same confidence that she had reposed in Richard of Woodville, "'and she replied, "'For many reasons, but the first and strongest is "'that there are persons there who have seized on that which should be mine.' They are powerful, I am weak, and tis likely, as in such case often happens, that they will be willing to add wrong to wrong. Not only often, but always, replied Ned Dyram. Therefore I say, fair maiden, you had better come with us. Here's one arm will strike a stroke for you, should need be, and there are plenty more amongst us who will do the like. Ella answered him with a bright smile, but at that moment they were turning up the lane opposite the gate of the temple, and she paused in her reply, willing to think farther and see more of her companion before she decided. "'Stay, fair maiden,' continued Ned Dyram, who well knew where the hostelry of the Falcon was situate. "'It may be as well to keep our counsel, whatever it be, from host and hostess. Gossip is a part of their trade, and it is wise to avoid giving them occasion. I will give you, when we are within, a letter from my young lord, and read it to you, too, as perchance you cannot do that yourself. But it will let the people see that I am not without authority to hold converse with you, which may be needful. Nay, answered Ella, I can read it myself, for I have not been without such training. Ah, I forgot. 
rejoined Ned Darren with one of his light sneers. Had you been a princess, you would not have been able to read. Such clerk craft is only fit for citizens and monks. I wonder how Child Richard learned to read and write. I fear it will spoil him for a soldier. The satire was not altogether just, for though it did not unfrequently happen that high nobles and celebrated warriors and statesmen were as illiterate as the merest boors, in some instances, especially after the Wars of the Roses, had deluged the land with blood, and interrupted all the peaceful arts of life, the barons affected to treat with sovereign contempt the cultivation of the mind. Yet such was not by any means so generally the case, as the pride of modern civilization had been eager to show. We have proofs incontestable that, in the reigns of Richard the Second, Henry the Fourth, and Henry the Fifth, men were by no means so generally ignorant as has been supposed. The House of Lancaster was proud of its patronage of literature, and though more than one valiant noble could not sign his own name, or could do so with difficulty, there is much reason to believe that the exceptions have been pointed out as the rule, for we know that many a citizen of London could not only maintain, without the aid of another hand, long and intricate correspondence with foreign merchants, but also took delight in the reading, during winter's nights, of Chaucer and Gower, if not in studying secretly the writings of Wycliffe and his disciples. Ella Broom replied not, but walked on into the house, calling the good hostess, who, in that day as in others, often supplied the place of both master and mistress in a house of public entertainment. Ned Darren followed her with his eyes into the house, scrutinising with keen and wondering glance the beauties of form which even the long loose robe of serge could not fully conceal. He marvelled at the grace he beheld, even more rare at that day amongst the sons and daughters of toil than at present. And although the pride of rank and station could not, in his case, suggest the bold disregard of all law and decency in seeking the gratification of passion, his feelings towards Ella Brune were not very far different from those of Sir Simeon of Royden. He might have more respect for the opinion of the world by which he hoped to rise. He might even have more respect for and more belief in virtue, for he was a wiser man. He might seek to obtain his ends by other means. He was even not incapable of love, strong, passionate, overpowering love, but the moving power was the same. It was all animal, for, strange to say, though his intellect was far superior to that of most men of his day, though he had far more mind than was needful, or even advantageous, in his commerce with the world of that age, his impulses were all animal towards others. That which he cared for little in himself he admired, he almost worshipped, in woman. It was beauty of form and feature only that attracted him. Mind he cared not for, he thought not of, Nay, up to that moment, he perhaps either doubted whether it existed in the other sex, or thought it a disadvantage if it did. Even more, the heart itself he valued little, or rather, that strange and complex tissue of emotions, springing from what source we know not, entwined with our mortal nature. By what delicate threads, who can say, which we are accustomed to ascribe to the heart, he regarded but as an almost worthless adjunct. His was the eager love, forgive me if I profane what should be a holy name, rather than use a coarser term, of the wild beast, the appetite of the tiger, only tempered by the shrewdness of the fox. I mean not to say it always remains so, for under the power of passion and circumstances the human heart is tutored as a child. Neither would I say that aught like love had yet touched his bosom for Ella Brune but I speak of his ordinary feelings towards woman, but feelings of that sort are sooner roused than those of a higher nature. He saw that she was very beautiful, more beautiful, he thought, than any woman of his own station, that ever he had beheld, and that was enough to make him determine upon counteracting his master's wishes and counsel, and persuading Ella to turn her steps in the same course in which his own were directed. He knew not how willing she was to be persuaded, he knew not that she was at heart already resolved, but he managed skilfully, he watched shrewdly, through the whole of his after-communications with her during the day. He discovered much, he discovered all, indeed, but one deep secret, which might have been penetrated by a woman's eyes, 
but which was hid from his with all their keenness, the motive, the feeling, that led her so strongly in the very path he wished. He saw indeed that she was so inclined. He saw that there was a voice always seconding him in her heart, and he took especial care to furnish that voice with arguments which seemed irresistible. He contrived, too, to win upon her much, for there was in his conversation that mingling of frankness and flattering courtesy, of apparent carelessness of pleasing, with all the arts of giving pleasure, and that range of desultory knowledge, and tone of superior mind, with apparent simplicity of manner, and contempt for assumption, which of all things are the most calculated to dazzle and impress for a time. Tis the lighter qualities that catch, the deeper ones that bind, and though, had there been a comparison drawn between him, who was her companion for a great part of that evening, and Richard of Woodville, Ella Broom would have laughed in scorn, yet she listened, well pleased, to the varied conversation with which he whiled away the hours, when she could wean her thoughts from dearer, though more painful, themes, yielded to his arguments when they seconded the purposes of her own heart, and readily accepted his offered service to aid her in executing the plan she adopted. End of chapter 17《Chapter 18 of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Journey and the Voyage The sun rose behind some light grey clouds, and the blue sky was veiled, but the birds made their welkin ring from amongst the young leaves in the April trees, and told of the coming brightness of the day. Why or wherefore let man of science say, but one thing is certain, the seasons at that time were different from those at present. They were earlier, they were more distinct. Spring was spring, and summer was summer. And winter, content with holding his own rights stiffly, did not attempt to invade the rights of his brethren. Far in the north of England we had vines growing and bearing fruit in the open air. At Hexham there was a vineyard, and wine was made in more than one English county. Not very good, it is to be supposed, but still good enough to be drunk, and to prove the longer and more genial reign of summer in our island. Thus, though the morning was grey, as I have said, and April had not yet come to an end, the air was as warm as it is often now in June, and every bank was already covered with flowers. There were horses before the gate of Richard of Woodville's house, and men busily preparing them for a journey. There was the heavy charger, or battle-horse, with tall and bony limbs, well fitted to bear up under the weight of a steel-covered rider, and the lighter but still powerful palfrey, somewhat of the size and make of a hunter of the present day, to carry the master along the road. Besides these appeared many another beast, horses for the yeomen and servants, and horses and mules for the baggage. The load of armour for himself and for his men, which the young adventurer carried with him, requiring not a few of those serviceable brutes who bow their heads to man's will, in order to carry it to the seashore. At length all was prepared, the packs were put upon the beasts, the drivers were at their heads, the yeomen by their saddles, and with ten stout men and two boys, fourteen horses, three mules, a plentiful store of arms, and all the money he could raise, in his wallet— Richard of Woodville issued forth, gave his last commands to the old man and woman whom he left behind in the hall, and springing into the saddle began his journey towards Dover. It was not without a sigh that he set out, for he was leaving the land in which Mary Markham dwelt, but yet he thought he was going to win honour for her sake, perchance to win her herself, and all the bright hopes and expectations of youth soon gathered on his way, more vivid and more glowing in his case, than they could be in that of any youth of the present day, taking his departure for foreign lands. If at present each country knows but very little in reality of its neighbour, if England entertains false views and wild imagination regarding France and her people, and France has not the slightest particle of knowledge in regard to the feelings, characters and habits of thought of the English, how much more must such have been the case in an age where communication was rare, and then only, or chiefly, by word of mouth. 
It is true that the state of geographical knowledge was not so low as has been generally supposed, for we are apt to look upon ourselves as wonderful people, and to imagine that nobody knew anything before ourselves, and the difference between former ages and the present is more in the general diffusion of knowledge than in its amount. In the very age of which we speak, the famous Henry of Vasco was pursuing his great project for reaching India by passing round Africa, attempting to establish Portuguese stations on the coast of that continent, and to communicate with the natives. Et pour avoir connaissé l'oro commercio per l'onere e utilta del regno. The highways of Europe were well known, for mercantile transactions between country and country were carried on upon a system so totally different from that existing at present, that multitudes of the citizens of every commercial state were constantly wandering over the face of Europe, and bringing home anecdotes, if not much more solid information, regarding the distant lands they had visited. The merchant frequently accompanied his goods, and the smaller traders, especially from the cities of Italy, travelled every season from fair to fair and mart to mart throughout the whole of the civilised world. Besides the communications which thus took place, and the information thus diffused, intelligence of a different sort was carried by another class, who may have been said to have represented in that day the tourists of the present. Chivalry, indeed, had greatly declined since the days of Richard I, and even since the time of the Black Prince. But still it was a constant practice for young knights and nobles of every country to visit the courts of foreign princes, in order either to acquire the warlike arts then practised, or to gain distinction by feats of arms. Few books of travels were written, it is true, and fewer read, for the art of printing had not yet, by the easy multiplication of copies, placed the stores of learning within the reach of the many, and one of the sources from which the vast information might have been derived was cut off by the general abhorrence with which the ever-wandering tribes of Israel were regarded, and the habitual taciturnity which had thus been produced in a people naturally loquacious. Still a great deal of desultory and vague information concerning distant lands was floating about society. Strange tales were told, it is true, and truth deformed by fiction. But imagination had plenty of materials out of which to form splendid structures, and bright pictures of the far and the future certainly did present themselves to the glowing fancy of Richard of Woodville as he rode on upon his way. Knowing his own courage, his own skill, and his own strength, energetic in character, resolute and persevering, animated by love and encouraged by hope, he might well look forward to the world as a harvest field of glory into which he was about to put the sickle. Then came all the vague and misty representations that imagination could call up of distant courts and foreign princes, tilt and tournament, and high emprise. And the adventurous spirit of the times of old made his bosom thrill with dim visions of strange scenes and unknown places, accidents, difficulties, dangers, enterprises, the hard rough ore from which the gold of praise and renown was still to be extracted. Movement and exertion are the lifeblood of youth, and as he rode on, the spirits of Richard of Woodville rose higher and higher, expectation expanded, the regrets were left behind, and onward, onward was the cry of his heart, as the grey cloud broke into mottled flakes upon the sky, and gradually disappeared, as if absorbed by the blue heaven which it had previously covered. Through the rich wooded land of England he took his way for four days, contriving generally to make his resting place for the night at some town which possessed the advantage of an inn, or at the house of some old friend of his family, where he was sure of kind reception. In the daytime, however, many of his meals were eaten in the open field, or under the broad shade of the trees, and as he sat, after partaking lightly of the food which had been brought with him, while the horses were finishing their provender, the birds singing in the trees above often brought back to his mind the words of the minstrel girl's lay. The lark shall sing on high, whatever shore thou rovest, the nightingale shall try to call up her thou lovest, for the true heart and kind its recompense shall find, shall win praise and golden days, and live in many a tale. 
It seemed like the song of hope, and rang in his ear, mingling with the notes of the blackbird, the thrush, and the woodlark, and promising success and happiness. The words, too, called up the image of Mary Markham, as she herself would have wished, the end and object of all his hopes and wishes, the crowning reward of every deed he thought to do. It is true that, with her, still appeared to the eye of memory the form of poor Ella Brune, but it was with very different sensations. He felt grateful to her for that cheering song, and indeed how often is it in life that a few words of hope and encouragement are more valuable to us, are of more real and solid benefit than a gift of gold and gems. For moral support to the heart of man in the hour of difficulty is worth all that the careless hand of wealth and power can bestow. But he felt no love. He might admire her, he might think her beautiful, but it was with the cold admiration of taste, not with passion. Her loveliness to him was as that of a picture or statue, and the only warmer sensations that he felt when he thought of her were pity for her misfortunes and interest in her fate. Nor did this arise either in coldness of nature or the haughty pride of noble birth, but love was with him, as it was with many in days somewhat previous to his own, very different from the transitory immutable passion which so generally bears that name. It was the absorbing principle of his whole nature, the ruling power of his heart, concentrated all in one, indivisible, unchangeable, a spirit in his spirit, a devotion, almost a worship. I say not that in former times, before he had felt that passion, he might not have lived as others lived, that he might not have trifled with the fair and bright wherever he found them, that the fiery eagerness of youthful blood might not have carried him to folly and to wrong. But from the moment he had learned to love Mary Markham, his heart had been for her alone, and the gate of his affections was closed against all others. Thus could she have seen his inmost thoughts, she would have found how fully justified was her confidence, and might perhaps have blushed to recollect that one doubt had ever crossed her bosom. It was about three o'clock on the evening of the fourth day that Richard of Woodville, passing along by the priory and leaving the church of St. Mary to the left, with the towers of the old castle frowning from the steep above, on one side, and the round chapel of the ancient temple house peeping over the hill upon the other, entered the small town of Dover, and approached the seashore, which, in those days, unencumbered by the immense masses of shingle that have since been rolled along the coast, extended but a short distance from the base of the primeval cliffs. Thus the town was then thrust into the narrow valley at the foot of two hills, and the moment that the houses were passed, the wide scene of the sea, with a number of small vessels lying almost close to the shore, broke upon the eye. The associations of the people naturally gave to the principal hostelry of the place a similar name to that which it has ever since borne. The very differently situated and maintained, the chief place of public reception in the town of Dover, was then called the Bark, as it is now called the Ship. And although that port was not the principal place through which the communication between England and France took place, yet, ever since Calais had been an English possession, a great traffic had been carried on by Dover, so that the hostelry of the bark was one of the most comfortable and best appointed in the kingdom. As every man of wealth and consequence who landed at or embarked from that port brought his horses with him, numerous ostlers and stable boys were always ready to take charge of the guests' steeds, and as soon as a gentleman's train was seen coming down the street, loud shouts from the host called forth a crowd of expectant faces— and ready hands to give assistance to the arriving guests. The first amongst those who appeared was Ned Dyram, in his blue tabard, and although he did not condescend to hold his master's stirrup, but left that task to others, yet he advanced to the young gentleman's side with some pride in the numbers and gallant appearance of the train, and informed him, as he dismounted, that he had performed his errand in London, and also the charge which he had received for Dover, having engaged a large bark, named the Lucy Neville, to carry his master with horses and attendants to the small town of Newport on the Flemish coast. "'The tide will serve at five o'clock, sir,' he said. "'There is time to embark the horses and baggage, if you will, while you and the men sup. We have plenty of hands here to help, and I will see it done safely. 
If not, we must stop till tomorrow. The host put in his word, however, observing that the young lord might be tired with a long journey, that it were better to wait and part with the morning tide, and that it was Friday, an inauspicious day to put to sea. But the surface of the water was calm, the sky was bright and clear, and it was the last day of the period which Woodville had fixed in his communication with the king for his stay in England. He therefore determined to follow the opinion of Ned Dyram instead of that of the host, which there was no absolute impossibility to prevent him from supposing interested, and ordering his horses and luggage to be embarked, with manifold charges to his skilful attendant, to look well to the safety of the chargers, he sat down to the ample supper which was soon after on the board, proposing to be down on the beach before his orders regarding the horses were put in execution. The master and the man, in those more simple days, sat at the same board in the inn, and often at the castle, and as he knew that his own rising would be a signal for the rest to cease their meal, Richard of Woodville remained for several minutes to allow the more slow and deliberate to accomplish the great function of the mindless. At length, however, he rose, discharged his score, added largesse to payment, and then, with the fair voyage, noble sir, of the host, and the good wishes of the drawers and ostlers, proceeded to the shore, where he fully expected to find Ned Dyram busily engaged in shipping his baggage. No one was there, however, but two or three of the horse-boys of the hotel, who saluted him with the tidings that all was on board. As he cast his eyes seaward, he saw a large boat returning from a ship at some small distance from the shore, with Ned Dyram in the stern, and in a few minutes after, the active superintendent of the embarkation jumped ashore, with a laugh, saying, "'Ah, sir, so you could not trust me. But all is safe. No hide rubbed off, no knees broken, no shoulder shaken. And if they do not kick themselves to pieces before we reach Newport,' You will have as stout charges to ride as any in Burgundy. But you are not going to embark yet. The tide will not serve for half an hour, and I have left my saddle-bags at the hostel. Well, run quick and get them, replied his master. I would fain see how all is stowed before we sail. And know little about it when you do see, answered Ned Dyron with his usual rude bluntness, or that which appeared to be such. Richard of Woodville might feel a little angry at his saucy tone, but it was only a passing emotion, easily extinguished. "'I certainly know little of stowing ships, my good friend,' he answered, seeing that I never was in one in my life. "'But common sense is a great thing, Master Dyram, and I am not likely to be mistaken as to whether the horses are so placed as to run the least chance of hurting themselves or each other. "'Back to the hostel, then, as I ordered, with all speed, and do not let me have to wait for you.' The last words were spoken in a tone of command which did not much please the hearer, but there were certain feelings in his breast that rendered him unwilling to offend a master on whom he had no tie of old services, and he therefore hurried his pace away as long as he was within sight. He contrived to keep Woodville waiting, however, for at least twenty minutes, and as the young gentleman gazed towards the ship, he saw the large and cumbersome sails slowly unfurled, and preparations of various kinds made for putting to sea. His patience was well-nigh exhausted, and he had already taken his place in the boat, intending to bid the men pull away, when Ned Dyram appeared coming down from the inn, and carrying his saddle-bags over his arm, while a man followed bearing a heavy coffer. Richard of Woodville smiled, saying to his yeoman of the stirrup, "'I knew not our friend Ned had such mass of baggage, or I would have given him further time.' "'He has got his tools there, I doubt,' observed the old armourer, "'for he is a famous workman, both in steel and gilding, "'though somewhat new-fangled in his notions.' "'The minute after Ned Dyram was seated in the boat, "'the men gave way, and over the calm waters of a sea "'just rippled by a soft but favourable breeze, "'she flew towards the ship. "'All on board were in the bustle of departure, "'and before Richard of Woodville had examined the horses, and satisfied himself that everything had been carefully and thoughtfully arranged for their safety, the bark was under way. He looked round for Ned Dyram, willing to make up by some praise of his attention and judgment for any sharpness of speech on the shore, but the yeoman told him that their comrade had gone below, saying that he was always sick at sea, 
and the young gentleman, escaping from the crowd of confusion which existed amongst the horses and men in the forepart of the vessel, retired to the stern and took up his position near the steersman, while the cliffs of England and the tall towers of the castle, with the churches and houses below, slowly diminished, as moving heavily through the water the bark laid her course for the town of Newport. The bustle soon ceased upon the deck. Some of the yeomen laid themselves down to sleep, if sleep they might. The rest were down below. The mariners who remained on deck proceeded with their ordinary tasks in silence. The wind wafted them gently along with a soft and easy motion, and the sun, declining in the sky, shone along the bosom of the sea as if laying down a golden path, midway between France and England. The feeling of parting from home was renewed in the bosom of Richard of Woodville, as he gazed back at the slowly waning shores of his native land, leaning his arms, folded on his chest, upon the bulwark of the stern. He felt no inclination to converse, and the man at the huge tiller seemed little disposed to speak. All was silent, except an occasional snatch of a rude song, with which one of the seamen cheered his idleness from time to time, till at length a sweeter voice was heard, singing in low and almost plaintive tones, and turning suddenly round, Woodville beheld a female figure, clothed in black, leaning upon the opposite side of the vessel, and gazing, like himself, upon the receding cliffs of England. He listened as she sang, but the first stanza of her lay was done before he could catch the words. Song O oh, leave longing, dream no more, of sunny hours to come, dreams that fade like that loved shore where once we made our home. Farewell and sing lullaby to all the joys that pass us by. They go to sleep, though we may weep, and never come again, Nenny. O oh, leave sighing, thought is vain, of all the treasures past. Hope and fear, delight and pain, are clay and cannot last. Farewell, and sing lullaby to all the things that pass us by. They go to sleep, though we may weep, and never come again, Nenny. O oh, leave looking on the wave that dances in the ray. See how it curls its crest so brave, and how it melts away. Farewell, and sing lullaby to all the things that pass us by. They go to sleep, though we may weep, and never come again, Nenny. The voice was so sweet, the music was so plaintive, that without knowing it, and though she sang in a low and subdued tone, the singer had every ear turned to listen. Richard of Woodville did not require to see her face to recognise Ella Broom, though the change in her dress might have proved an effectual means of concealment, had she been disposed to hide herself from him. The peculiarly mellow and musical tone of her voice was enough and as soon as the lay ceased, Woodville crossed over and spoke to her. But she showed no surprise at seeing him, greeting him with a smile and answering gaily to his inquiry, if she knew that he was on the same ship. Certainly, that was the reason that I came. I am going to be headstrong, noble sir, for the rest of my life. I would not go to York, as you see, for I fancied that when people have got hold of that which does not belong to them— they may strike at any hand which strives to take it away, especially if it be that of a woman. "'You are right, Ella,' answered Richard of Woodville. "'I had not thought of that.' "'Then I am going to Peron, or it might be to Dijon,' answered Ella, in a tone still light, notwithstanding the somewhat melancholy character of her song, "'because I think I can be of service, perhaps, to some who have been kind to me. And then, too, I intend to amass a great store of money and marry a scrivener. You are gay, Ella, replied Woodville, somewhat gravely, sitting down beside her, as she still leaned over the side of the vessel. Do you see those waves, she said, and how they dance and sparkle? Yes, replied her companion. What then? There are depths beneath, answered Ella. Henceforth I will be gay, on the surface at least, like the sunny sea. "'but it is because I have more profound thoughts within me "'than when I seemed most sad. "'Keep my secret, noble sir.' "'That I will, Ella,' replied Woodville. "'But tell me, did my servant find you out?' "'Yes, and did me good service,' answered the girl, "'for he brought me here.' "'And the poor fool was afraid I should be offended,' said Woodville, "'for he has avoided mentioning your name.' "'Perhaps so,' rejoined Ella, "'for he knew, I believe, that you did not wish to have me in your company.' "'Tis a charge, noble sir, 
and a poor minstrel girl is not fit for a high gentleman's train. "'Nay, you do me wrong, Ella,' answered Richard of Woodville. "'Right willingly, my poor girl, now as heretofore, in this as in other things, will I give you protection. I thought, indeed, that it might be better for yourself to remain, and there were reasons, moreover, that you do not know.' "'Nay, but I do know, sir,' replied Ella, interrupting him. "'I know it all. I have made acquaintance with your lady-love, and sat at her knee and sung to her and she has befriended the poor lonely girl as you did before her, and she told me she would neither doubt you nor me, though you took me on your journey and protected me by the way. "'Dear Frank Mary!' exclaimed Richard of Woodville. "'There spoke her own true heart. But tell me more about this, Ella. How did you see her? When? Where?' Ella Brune did as he bade her, and related to him all that had occurred to her since he had left London. As she spoke, her eye was generally averted, but sometimes it glanced to his countenance, especially when she referred either to Sir Simeon of Royden or to Mary Markham, and she saw with pleasure the flush upon her young protector's cheek, the knitted brow and flashing eye, when she told the outrage she had endured, and the look of generous satisfaction which lighted up each feature, when she spoke of the protection she had received from good Sir Philip Beecham and the King. "'Ah, my noble uncle,' he said, "'he is indeed somewhat harsh and rash "'when the warm blood stirs within him, "'as all these old knights are, Ella. "'But there never was a man more ready to draw the sword "'or open the purse for those who are in need of either than himself. "'And so the king befriended you, too? "'He is well worthy of his royal name "'and has done but justice on this arch knave. "'Not half justice,' replied Ella Brune with a sudden change of tone, but no matter for that. The hand of vengeance will reach him one of these days. He cannot hide his deeds from God. But you speak not of your sweet lady. Was she not kind to the poor minstrel girl? She is always kind, answered Richard of Woodville. God's blessing on her blithe heart. She would fain give the same sunshine that is within her own soft bosom to every one around her. "'That cannot be,' answered Ella Brune. "'There are some made to be happy, some unhappy, in this world. "'Fortune has but a certain store, and she parts it unequally, "'though perhaps not blindly, as men say. "'But there's a place where all is made equal.' "'And resuming quickly her lighter tone, she went on, "'dwelling long upon every word that Mary Markham had said to her, "'seeming to take a pleasure in that, "'which had in reality no small portion of pain mingled with it.' Such is not infrequently the case, indeed, with almost all men, for it is wonderful how the bee of the human heart will contrive to extract sweets from the bitter things of life, but perhaps there might be a little art in it, innocent art indeed, most innocent, for its only object was to hide from the eyes of Richard of Woodville that there was any feeling in her bosom towards him, but deep gratitude and perfect confidence. She dwelt then upon her he loved, as if the subject were as pleasing to her as to himself, and though she spoke gaily, sometimes almost in a jesting tone, yet there were touches of deep feeling mingled every now and then with all she said, which made him perceive that, as she herself had told him, the likeness was in manner alone and not in the mind. At all events, her conduct had one effect which she could have desired. It removed all doubt and hesitation from the mind of Richard of Woodville, if any such remained, in regard to his behaviour towards her. It did away all scruple as to guarding and protecting her on the way, as far as their roads lay together. One point, indeed, in her account puzzled him and excited his curiosity, which was the sudden departure of his uncle and Mary from Westminster. Well, he thought, I never loved the task of discovering mysteries, and have ever been willing to leave time to solve them, else I should have troubled my brain somewhat more about my sweet Mary's fate and history than I have done. And after pondering for a few moments more, he turned again to the other subjects with Ella Brune. Pleased and entertained by her conversation, he scarcely turned his eyes back towards the coast of England, till the cliffs had become faint and grey, like a cloud upon the edge of the sky, while the sun setting over the waters seemed to change them into liquid fire. In the meantime, wafted on by the light breeze, the ship continued her slow way, and as the orb of day sank below the horizon, the moon, 
which had been up for some little time, poured her silver light upon the water. No longer outshone by the brighter beams, the sky remained pure and blue. The stars appeared faint amidst the luster shed by the Queen of Night, and the water, dashing from the stern, looked like waves of molten silver as they flowed away. Nothing could be more calm, more grand, more beautiful than the scene, with the wide expanse of heaven and the wide expanse of sea, and the pure lights above and the glistening ripple below, and the curtain of darkness hanging round the verge of all things, like the deep veil of a past and future eternity. Neither Ella Brune nor Richard of Woodville could help feeling the influence of the hour, for the grand things of nature raise and elevate the human heart, whether man will or not. They lived in a rude age, it is true, but the spirit of each was high and fine, and their conversation gradually took its tone from the scene that met their eyes on all sides. They might not know that those stars were unnumbered suns, or wandering planets like their own. They might not know that the bright, broad orb that spread her light upon the waves was an attendant world, wheeling through space around that in which they lived. They had no skill to people the immensity with miracles of creative power, but they knew that all they beheld was the handiwork of God, and they felt that it was beautiful and very good. Their souls were naturally led up to the contemplation of things above the earth, and while Richard of Woodville learned hope and confidence in him who had spread the heaven with stars and clothed the earth in loveliness, Ella Brune took to her heart from the same source the lesson of firmness and resignation. They gazed, they wondered, they adored, and each spoke to the other some of the feelings which were in their hearts, but some only, for there were many that they could not speak. "'I remember,' said Ella at length in a low voice, "'when I was at a town called Innsbruck, in the midst of beautiful mountains, hearing the nuns chant a hymn which I caught up by ear.' and the poor old man and I turned it as best we might into English, and used often in our wanderings to console ourselves with singing it, when little else had we to console it. It comes to my mind to-night more than ever. Let me hear it then, Ella, said Richard of Woodville. I love all music. I will sing it, replied Ella, but you must not hear it only. You must join in heart, if not in voice. O glorious, O mighty, Lord God of salvation, thy name let us praise from the depth of the heart. Let tongue sing to tongue, and nation to nation, and in the glad hymn all thy works bear a part. The tops of the mountains with praises are ringing, the depths of the valleys re-echo the cry. The waves of the ocean thy glories are singing, the clouds and the winds find a voice as they fly. The weakest, the strongest, the lowly, the glorious, the living on earth and the dead in the grave. For the arm of thy son over death is victorious, with power to redeem and with mercy to save. O glorious, O mighty, Lord God of salvation, to thee let us sing from the depth of the heart. Let tongue tell to tongue and nation to nation how bountiful, gracious and holy thou art. End of chapter 18《Chapter 19 of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Foreign Land. The night had fallen nearly an hour ere Richard of Woodville, Hella Brune, and the young Englishman's attendants were seated for the first time round the table of a small Flemish inn on the day after they had left the shores of their native land. Strange as it may seem, that with a wind not unfavourable, somewhat more than twenty-four hours should be occupied by a voyage of less than sixty miles. Yet such had been the case between Dover and Newport, for it was more than five hours past noon on the evening following that on which they set sail, when the bark that bore Richard of Woodville entered the mouth of the little river on which that port is situated. But the art of navigation was little known in those times, and the wind, which, though directly fair at first, was never strong enough to give the ship much way through the water, veered round soon after midnight, not to a point exactly contrary, but to one which favoured the course of the voyagers very little, so that if it had not again changed before night, 
another twelve hours might have been passed upon the sea. At length, however, the land, which had been for some time in sight, grew clear and more strongly marked. The towers of village churches were seen, distinct, and, anchoring as near the town as possible, the disembarkation was commenced without delay, in order to accomplish the task before nightfall. Nevertheless, ere horses and baggage were all safely on the shore, the day had well nigh come to an end, so that, as I have said, it was dark before the young Englishman, Ella Brune, and his attendants were seated round the table of the poor hostel, which was the only place of entertainment that the town afforded. Here, first, the services of the poor minstrel girl became really valuable to her protector, for notwithstanding the proximity of the English coast, not a soul in the hostel could speak aught else but the Flemish tongue. There were evidently numerous other guests, all requiring entertainment, though with a strange exclusiveness hardly known in those days, they kept themselves closely shut up in the rooms, which had been retained for their own accommodation. And as neither Woodville nor any of his train, not even excepted the learned Ned Dyram, knew one word of the language, the whole party would have fared ill, had not Ella, in tones which rendered even that harsh jargon sweet, given, in the quality of interpreter, the necessary orders for all that was required. The greatest difficulty seemed to be in obtaining chambers in which the somewhat numerous party of the young cavalier could find repose. The stable and the adjoining barn were full already of horses and mules, even to overflowing, otherwise they might have afforded accommodation to men who were accustomed in their own country to lie hard and yet sleep lightly, and only one room of any size was vacant, with a small closet hard by containing a low pallet. The latter, Richard of Woodville at once assigned to Ella Broom, the former he reserved for himself and three of his men, of whom Ned Dyram was one, and it was finally arranged that the rest should be provided with dry hay mown from the neighbouring sandy ground in the hall where they supped. As soon as the meal was over, the board was cleared, the hay brought in, Ella retired to her pallet, Richard of Woodville to his, straw was laid down across his door for the three men, and the whole party were soon in the arms of slumber. Richard of Woodville dreamed, however, with visions coming thick and fast, and changing as they came, like the figures of a phantasmagoria. Now he was in the king's court, defying Simeon of Royden to battle. Now at the old hall at Dundry, with Isabel, and Dacre, and Mary, and poor Catherine Beecham herself. Then suddenly the scene changed, and he was by the moonlight stream near Abbot's Anne, with Hal of Hadnock. He heard a voice called to him from the water— "'Richard! Richard!' it seemed to cry. "'Save me! Revenge me! Richard! Richard of Woodville!' He started suddenly up, but the voice still rang in his ears. "'Richard of Woodville!' it said, or seemed to say. "'I hear!' he exclaimed. "'Who calls?' "'What maiden is this thou hast with thee?' asked the voice. "'Beware! Beware! Love will not be light lied. "'Who is that speaks?' demanded Richard of Woodville, rubbing his eyes in surprise and bewilderment. But no one answered, and all was silence. "'Surely someone spoke,' said the young gentleman. "'If so, let them speak again.' There was no reply, and Woodville was inclined to believe that his dream had been prolonged after he had fancied himself awake. But, as he sat up and listened, he heard the movement of someone amongst the straw at the end of the room, and, well aware that— if any of the men were watchful, it must be he who had the most mind. He exclaimed, Ned Dyram, are you asleep? No, sir, replied the man. I have been awake these ten minutes. Did you hear any one speak just now? demanded Woodville. To be sure I did, answered Dyram. Someone called you by your name. It was that which roused me. They asked about the maiden, Ella, and bade you beware. Foul for them. We have witches near. Richard of Woodville instantly sprang from his bed and advanced towards the casement. The moon was still shining, but when the young gentleman gazed forth, all without was in the still quiet of midnight. He could see the court of the hostel and the angle of the building, formed by a sort of wing which projected from the rest, close to where he stood. But all was calm, and not a creature seemed stirring. He looked up to the windows in the wing, 
but there was no light in any. "'Whence did the sound seem to come, Ned?' he asked. "'It seemed in the room,' replied the man. "'Shall I strike a light? I have always wherewithal about me.' Richard of Woodville bade him do so, and a lamp was soon lighted. But Ned Dyram and his master searched the room in vain, and the other two inhabitants of the chamber slept soundly through all. At length, puzzled and disappointed, Woodville retired to bed again, and the light was extinguished. But the young gentleman did not sleep for some hours, listening eagerly for any sound. None made itself heard through the rest of the night, but the hard breathing of the sleeping yeoman, and, after watching till near morning, slumber once more fell upon Woodville's eyes, and he did not wake till the sun had been up an hour. The yeoman had already quitted the room without his having perceived it, and dressing himself in haste, he proceeded to inquire of the host what strangers had lodged in his house during the preceding night, besides himself and his own attendants. "'None but a party of monks and nuns,' the man replied, through the interpretation of Ella Brune, whom Woodville had called to his aid. "'Ask him, Ella, of what country they were,' said Richard of Woodville, but the man replied to Ella's question that they were all Hainalters, except two who came first from Friesland, and that they were going on a pilgrimage to Rome. Richard of Woodville was more puzzled than ever. For a moment he suspected that Ned Dyra might have played some trick upon him, for notwithstanding the bluntness of that worthy personage, a doubt of his being really as honest and straightforward as the king believed him had entered into Woodville's mind. He knew not well why. Reflecting, however, on the fact of Ned Dyram having encouraged Ella Brune to accompany them to the continent, notwithstanding the opposite advice given by his master, the young gentleman soon rejected that suspicion, and remained as much troubled to account for what had occurred as before. No farther information was to be obtained, and as soon as his men and horses were prepared, Richard of Woodville commenced his journey towards Ghent, directing his steps, in the first instance, to Gistel, through a country which presented at that period nothing but wide, uncultivated plains and salt marshes, and here and there a village raised on any little eminence, or a feudal castle near the shore, from which, even in those days, and still more in the times preceding, numerous bands of pirates were sent forth, sweeping the sea, and occasionally entering the mouths of the English rivers. The inhabitants of the whole tract from Ostend to the Ah were notorious for their savage and bloodthirsty character, so much so, indeed, as to have obtained the name of the Scythians of the North. And Ella Brune, as she rode beside Richard of Woodville, on one of the mules which he had brought with him, and which had been freed from its share of the baggage to bear her lighter weight, warned her companion to be upon his guard, as the passage through that part of the country was still considered unsafe, notwithstanding some improvement in the manners of the people. At first Woodville only smiled, replying that he thought a party of eleven stout Englishmen were sufficient to deal with any troop of rude Flemings, who might come against them. But she went on to give him many anecdotes of brutal outrages that had been committed within a very few years, which somewhat changed his opinion and the appearance of a body of five or six horsemen, seemingly watching the advance of his little force, induced him to take some precautions. Halting within sight of the church of Lombard's Hade, he caused his archers to put on the cuirasses and salades with which they were provided for active service, and ordered them to have their bows ready for action at a moment's notice. He also partly armed himself, and directed the two pages to follow him close by with his casque, shield, and lance and thus keeping a firm array, the party moved forward towards Gistel, watched all the way along the road by the party they had at first observed, but without any attack being made. The military display, indeed, proved in some degree detrimental to them, for that small town had been surrounded by ramparts some sixty or seventy years before, and the party of strangers was refused admission at the gates. On the offer of payment, however, some of the inhabitants readily enough brought forth corn and water for the horses, and food and hydromel for the men. One or two of them could speak French also, and from them Richard of Woodville obtained clear directions for pursuing his way towards Ghent. 
He now found that he had already somewhat deviated from the right track in coming to Gistel at all. But as he was there, the men said that the best course for him to follow was to cross the country direct by Ernigham, and thence march through the forest of Winnendale, along the high raised causeway which commenced at the gates of Gistel. As no likelihood of obtaining any nearer place of repose presented itself, the young Englishman proceeded to follow these directions, and towards three o'clock of the same day reached the village of Ernigham. Much to his disappointment, however, he found no place of entertainment there. The inhabitants were mostly in the fields, and but little food was to be obtained for man or horse. On his own account Richard of Woodville cared little, nor did he much heed his men being broken in to privations, which he well knew must often befall them. But for Ella Brun he was more anxious, and expressed to her kindly his fears lest she should suffer from hunger and fatigue. But Ella laughed lightly, replying, I am more accustomed to it than any of you. Onward from that place the march of the travellers was through the deep green wood, which at that time extended from a few miles to the south of Thoru, almost to the gates of Bruges. The soil was marshy, the road heavy and full of sand, but the weather was still beautifully clear, the sun shone bright and warm, a thousand wild flowers grew up under the shade, and the leafy branches of the forest offered no unpleasant canopy, even at that early period of the year. Neither village, nor house, nor woodman's hut, nor castle tower presented itself for several miles, and as they approached a spot where the road divided into two, with no friendly indication to the weary traveller of the place to which either tended, Richard of Woodville turned towards Ella, asking, "'Which, think you, I ought to follow my fair maid? Or had I better, like the knight-errant of old, give the choice up to my horse, and see what his sagacity will do?' "'where my own entirely fails me.' "'What little I have,' replied Ella, "'would be of no good here, "'but I think the best road to choose "'would be the most beaten one.' "'Often the safest, Ella,' replied Richard with a smile. "'Yet not always the most pleasant,' answered Ella Broom. "'But as she spoke a human figure came in sight, "'the first that they had seen since they had left Ernigan. "'It was that of a stout monk in a grey gown, "'with a large straw hat upon his head,' "'tied with a ribbon under his beard. "'He was mounted upon a tall, powerful ass, "'which was ambling along with him at a good pace, and "'though he pulled up when he saw the large party of strangers "'pausing at the separation of the two roads, "'he came forward at a slower pace the next moment, "'and, after a careful inspection of the young leader's person, "'saluted him courteously in the French tongue. "'Give you good day, and benedicite, my son,' he said, bowing his head. You seem embarrassed about your way. Can I help you? Infinitely, good father, replied Richard of Woodville. If you can direct me on the road, I am going to Ghent. Why, you can never reach Ghent to-night, my son, exclaimed the monk, and you will find but poor lodging till you get to Thielt, which you will not reach till midnight, unless you ride hard. We shall want both food and lodging long ere that, good father, said Richard of Woodville, "'Whither does this road you have just come up lead?' "'To Ertic, replied the monk. "'But you will get neither food nor beds there, my son, for so large a troop. "'Tis a poor place, and the priest is a poor man, "'who would lodge a single traveller willingly enough, "'but has no room for more, nor bread to give them. "'But your best plan will be to come with me to Toru. "'Tis a little out of your way to Ghent, "'but yet you can reach that city to-morrow, if you will.' "'though it is a long day's journey, well nigh ten leagues.' "'Is there a hostel in Toru, good father?' asked Richard of Woodville. "'One of the most miserable in Flanders, Hainault or Brabant,' answered the monk, laughing. "'But we have a priory there, where we are always willing to lodge strangers, and let them taste of our refectory. "'We are a poor order,' he continued, with a sly smile, "'but yet we live in a rich country, and the people are benevolent to us.' "'so that our board is not ill-supplied, "'and strangers who visit us always remember our poverty. "'That we will do most willingly,' said Richard of Woodville, "'to the best of our ability, good father. "'But, you see, we have a lady with us. "'Now I have heard that in some orders—' "'Ay, ay,' replied the monk, laughing, "'where the brotherhood are in sad doubt of their own virtue. "'But we are all grave and sober men, "'and fear not to see a fair sister amongst us. 
as a visitor, of course. It would be a want of Christian charity to send a fair lady from the gate, when she was in need of food and lodging. But come on, sir, if you will come, for we have still near a league to go, and it is well nigh the hour of supper, which this pious beast of mine knows right well. I had to drub him all the way to Ertick, because he thought I had ought to be at Vespers in the convent. And now he ambles me well nigh three leagues to the hour, because he knows that I ought to be back again. Oh, he has as much care for my conscience as a lady's father director has of hers. Come, my son, if you be coming. And therewith he put his ass once more into a quick pace, and took the road to the right. In a little more than half an hour the whole party stood before the gates of a large, heavy building, enclosed within high walls, situated at a short distance from the town of Cheru. And the good monk, leaving his new friends without, went in to speak with the prior in regard to their reception. No great difficulty seemed to be made, and the prior himself, a white-bearded, fresh-complexioned old man, with a watery blue eye, well set in fat, came out to the door to welcome them. His air was benevolent, and his look, though somewhat more joyous than was perhaps quite in harmony with his vows, was by no means so unusual in his class as to call for any particular observation on the part of the young Englishman. Far from displaying any scruples in regard to receiving Ella within those holy walls, he was the first to show himself busy, perhaps somewhat more than needful, in assisting her to dismount. It was evident that he was a great admirer of beauty in the other sex, but there were other objects for which he had an extreme regard, and one of those, in the form of the supper of the monastery, was already being placed upon the table of the refectory, so that there was no other course for him to pursue than to hasten the whole party in, to partake of the meal, only pausing to ask Richard of Woodville, with a glance at the black robe of Serge and the white wimple of Ella Broom, whether she was a sister of some English order. Woodville simply replied that she was not, but merely a young maiden who was placed under his charge to escort safely to Peronne, or perhaps Dijon, if she did not find her relations who were attached to the court of Burgundy at the former place. The good prior was satisfied for the time, and led the way on to the refectory, where about twenty brethren were assembled, waiting with as eager looks for the commencement of the meal as if they had been fasting for at least four and twenty hours. To judge, however, from the viands, to which they soon sat down, no such abstinence was usually practised, and capons and roe-deer and wild boar pork were in as great plenty on the table of the refectory as in the hall of a high English baron. Some distinction of rank, too, was here observed, and the attendants of Richard of Woodville were left to sup with the servants of the convent, somewhat to their surprise and displeasure. The monks in general seemed a cheerful and well-contented race, fond of good cheer and rich wine, and all but one or two seemed to vie with each other in showing very courteous attention to poor Ella Broon, in which course the prior himself and the brother Quester, who had been Woodville's guide thither, particularly distinguished themselves. There was one saturnine man, indeed, seated somewhat far down the table, with his head bent over his platter, who seemed to take little share in the hilarity of the others. From time to time he gave a sidelong look towards Ella, but it was evidently not one of love or admiration, and Richard of Woodville was easily led to imagine that the good brother was somewhat scandalised at the presence of a woman in the convent. He asked the quester, who sat next to him, however, in a low voice, who that silent brother was, and it needed no farther explanation to make the monk understand whom he meant. "'He is a killjoy,' replied the quester, with a significant look. "'But he is none of our own people, though one of the order, from the abbey at Liège. He departs soon, God be praised, for he has done nothing but censure us since he came hither. His abbot sent him away upon a visitation.' to get rid of him, I believe, for he was unruly there, too, and declared that widgeons could not be eaten on even an ordinary fast day without sin, though we all know to the contrary. "'He is not orthodox in that, at least,' answered Richard of Woodville, with a smile. "'Doubtless he thinks it highly improper for a lady to have shelter here.' 
"'For that very reason,' said the quester in the same low tone in which their conversation had been hitherto carried on, "'the prior will have to lodge you in the visitor's lodging, which you saw just by the gate, for he fears the reports of Brother Paul. Otherwise he would have put you in the sub-prior's rooms, he being absent. But see, now he has done himself, how Brother Paul watches every mouthful that goes down the throats of others.' The quester sank his voice to a whisper, adding in a solemn tone, "'He drinks no wine. Nothing but water wets his lips. Is not that a sin, a disparaging of the gifts of God?' "'It is, certainly, not using them discreetly,' answered Richard of Woodville. "'And methinks, in these low lands, a cup of generous wine such as this is, must be even more necessary to a reverend monk, who spends half his time in prayer.' than to a busy creature of the world who has plenty of exercise to keep his blood flowing. "'To be sure it is,' replied the quester, who approved the doctrine highly, and thereupon he filled Woodville's can again, with a benedicite, noble sir. When the meal was over, the young Englishman remarked that this grim brother Paul, of whom they had been speaking, took advantage of the little interval which usually succeeds the pleasant occupation of eating, to draw the prior aside and whisper to him for several minutes. The face of the latter betrayed impatience and displeasure, and he turned from him with a somewhat mocking air, saying aloud, "'You are mistaken, my brother, and not charitable, as you will soon see. Hark, there is the bell for the complains. Do you attend the service, sir?' The last words were addressed to Richard of Woodville, who bowed his head and answered, "'Gladly I will.' "'Oh, yes!' cried Ella, with a joyful look. "'I shall be so pleased if I may find a place in the chapel.' I have not had the opportunity of hearing any service since I left London. Assuredly, my daughter, said the prior with a gracious look, the chapel is open to all. We have our own place, but every day we have the villagers and townsfolk to hear our chanting, which we are somewhat vain of. You shall be shown how to reach it with your friends. The monks took their way to the chapel by a private door from the refectory, and Richard of Woodville, with Ella, was led by a lay brother of the monastery through the court. Two or three women and one old man were in the chapel, and the short evening service began and ended, the sweet voice of Ella Broom mingling sounds with the choir, which, well I wot, the place had not often heard before. At the close Richard of Woodville moved towards the door, but Ella besought him to stay one moment, and advancing to the shrine of Our Lady, knelt down and prayed devoutly, with her beads in her hand. Perhaps she might ask for a prosperous journey, and for deliverance from danger, or she might entreat support and guidance in an undertaking that occupied the dearest thoughts of an enthusiastic heart. Nor will there be many found to blame her, even if the higher aspirations, the holier and purer impulses that separate the spirit from the earth and lead the soul to heaven, were mingled with the mortal affections that cling around us to the end, so long as we are bondsmen of the clay. While she yet prayed, and while the monks were wending away through their own particular entrance, the old prior advanced to Woodville, who was standing near the door, and remarked, "'Our fair sister seems of a devout and Catholic spirit. These are bad days, and there are many that swerve from the true faith.' At these words of conviction, very near the truth, broke upon Woodville's mind, as he recollected what Ella had told him of the opinions of old Murdoch Broon, and of his relations in Liège, and combined her account with the whispering of Brother Paul, a monk from that very city. It was a sudden flash of perception, rather than a light of cold consideration, and he replied without a moment's pause, "'She is, indeed, a sincere and pious child of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and she has been much tried, as you would soon perceive, Reverend Sir, if you knew all.' for she has relations who have long since abandoned the faith of their fathers, and would fain have persuaded her to adopt their own vain and heretical opinions. But she has been firm and constant, even to her own injury in their esteem. Poor maiden! Ay, I thought so, I thought so, replied the fat prior, rubbing his fat white hands. See how she prays to the Blessed Virgin, and the Queen of Heaven will hear her prayers. She always has a special grace for those who kneel at that altar. "'Good night, brother, good night. "'The quester and the refectioner will show you your lodging "'and give you the sleeping cup. "'Tomorrow I will see you ere you depart. "'God's blessing upon you, daughter,' he added, as Ella approached. "'I must away, for that Father Paul has us all up to matins.' "'The 
Thus saying, the old monk retired, and in the court Woodville found his friend the quester and another brother, who led him and his attendant to what was called the visitor's lodging, where, with a more comfortable bed than the night before, he slept soundly, only waking for a few moments as the matin bell rang, and then dropping asleep again, to waken shortly after daylight and prepare for his journey onward. When he came to depart, however, there was one drawback to the remembrance of the pleasant evening he had passed in the monastery. A stout mule was saddled in the court, and the prior besought him, in courteous terms, to give the advantage of his escort to Father Paul, who was about to set out likewise for Ghent. Richard of Woodville could not well refuse, though not particularly pleased, and placing a liberal return for his entertainment in the box of the convent, he began his journey, resolved to make the best of a companionship which he could not avoid. End of chapter 19Chapter Twenty of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The New Acquaintances. All was bustle in the good old town of Ghent as Richard of Woodville and his train rode in. It was at all times a gay and busy place, and even now, when much of its commerce has passed away from it, what a cheerful and lively scene does its market place present on a summer's day, with the tall houses rising round and breaking the line of the sunshine into fantastic forms, and the innumerable groups of men and women standing to gossip or to traffic, or moving about in many-coloured raiment. On that day, however, military display was added to the usual gaiety of the scene, and to the ordinary municipal pageants of the time. Horsemen in arms were riding through the streets, lances were seen here and there, and pennons fluttered on the wind, while every now and then attendants in gay dresses with the arms of burgundy embroidered upon breast and back, passed along with busy looks and an important air. The young Englishman took his way under the direction of Brother Paul, who had shown himself upon the journey more courteous and conversable than had been expected, towards the principal hostelry of the place, and Ghent at that time possessed many, but he was twice forced to stop in his advance by the crowds, who seemed to take little notice of him and his train, so fully occupied were they with some other event of the day. The first interruption was caused by a long train of priests and monks going to some church, with all the splendid array of the Roman Catholic clergy, followed by an immense multitude of idle gazers, and hardly had they passed when the procession of the trays, walking on foot, with banners displayed and guards in armour, and ensigns of the different companies, crossed the path of the travellers, causing them to halt, for a full quarter of an hour, while the long line moved slowly on. "'Is this any day of peculiar festival, Brother Paul?' demanded Richard of Woodville. "'The good citizens of Ghent seem in holiday.' "'None that I know of,' replied the monk, "'but I will ask.' And pushing on his mule to the side of one of the more respectable artisans, he inquired the cause of the procession of the trades. "'They are going to compliment the Count of Charolois.' answered the man, and to ask his recognition of their charters and privileges. He arrived only this morning. "'That is fortunate, Ella,' said Woodville, as soon as he was informed of this reply. "'Both for you and for me. Your father's cousin will most likely be with him, and I seek the Count myself.' Brother Paul seemed to listen attentively to what his companion said, but he made no remark, and as soon as the procession had passed they rode on, and were soon housed comfortably for the night. The monk left them at the inn door, thanking the young English gentleman for his escort, and retired to the abbey of saint Bavon. The hour of the day was somewhat late for Richard of Woodville to present himself before the Count de Charolois, and he also judged that it might be more prudent to visit in the first place the agent of the King of England, the well-known diplomatist of that day, Sir Philip Morgan, or de Morgan, if it should chance that he had accompanied the Count to Ghent. That he had done so, indeed, seemed by no means improbable, as Woodville had learned since his arrival in Flanders that the Duke of Burgundy himself was absent in the French capital, and that the chief rule of, of his Flemish territory was entrusted to his son. The host of the inn, however, could tell him nothing about the matter. All he knew was that the Count had arrived that morning unexpectedly, accompanied by a large train, 
and that instead of taking up his abode in the Cour des Princes, which had of late years become the residence of the Counts of Flanders, he had gone to what was called the Vieux-Bourg, or Old Castle, of the Flemish princes. He offered to send a man to inquire if a person bearing the hard name which his English guest had pronounced was with the Count's company. And Richard of Woodville had just got through the arrangements of a first arrival and was taking a hasty meal, when the messenger returned, saying that Sir Philip de Morgan was with the Count and was lodged in the left gate tower, entering from the court. "'I will go to him at once, Ella,' he said, "'and before my return you had better bethink you of what course you will pursue, in case your kinsman should not be with the Count. I will leave you for the present under the charge of Ned Dyram here, who will see that no harm happens to you in this strange town. Oh, it is not strange to me, replied Ella Brun. We once stayed here for a month, noble sir, and as to bethinking me of what I shall do, I have bethought me already, but will not stay you to speak about it now. Thus saying, she suffered him to depart, without giving him any charge to inquire after her kinsman, being somewhat more than indifferent, to say the truth, as to whether Richard of Woodville found him or not. When the young gentleman had departed and the meal was concluded, Ned Dyram, though he had taken care to show no great pleasure at the task which his master had given him, to execute, besought his fair companion to walk forth with him into the town, and urged her still, notwithstanding the plea of weariness, which she offered for retiring to her own chamber. "'I wish to purchase some goods,' he said, "'and shall never make myself understood, fair Ella, unless I have you with me.' "'Oh, every one in this town speaks French,' replied Ella Brun, "'for since the country fell to one of the royal family of France, "'that tongue has become the fashion amongst the nobles, "'and the traders are obliged to learn it, to speak with them.' "'But I must not go out and leave you,' replied Ned Dyram, "'after the charge my young lord has laid upon me. "'And as he still pressed her to accompany him, "'Ella, who felt that she owed him some gratitude "'for having forwarded her scheme so far, at length consented.' and they issued forth together into the streets of Ghent. As soon as they were free from the presence of the other attendants of Richard of Woodville, the manner of her companion towards Ella became very different. There was a tenderness in his tones, and in his words, an expression of admiration in his countenance, which he had carefully avoided displaying before others, and the poor girl felt somewhat grieved and annoyed, although, as there was nothing coarse or familiar in his demeanour, she felt that she had no right to be displeased. The lowliest may love the highest, she thought, and in station he is better than I am. Why, then, should I feel angry? And yet I wish this had not been. It may mar all my plans. How can I check it? And if I do, may he not divine all the rest, and, in his anger, do what he can to thwart me? I will treat it lightly. Heaven pardon me if I dissemble. "'What are you thinking of so deeply, fair maiden?' asked Ned Dyram, marking the reverie into which she had fallen. "'You do not seem to listen to what I say.' "'As much as it is worth, Master Dyram,' replied Ella, in a gay tone. "'But I must check you. You are too rapid in your sweet speeches. "'Do you not know that he who would become a true servant to a lady "'must have long patience and go discreetly to work? "'Oh, I am not to be won more easily than my betters. "'Poor as I am!' I am as proud as any lady of high degree, and will have slow courtship and humble suit before I am won. You shall have all that you wish, fair Ella, answered Ned Dyram, if you will but smile upon my suit. Smile, exclaimed Ella, with the same light manner. Did ever man dream of such a thing so soon? Why, you may think yourself highly favoured if you get a smile within three months. The first moon is all sighing, the next is all beseeching the next hoping and fearing, and then, perchance, a smile may come to give hope encouragement. A kind word may follow at the end of the fourth month, and so on, but the lady who could be wholly won before three years is unworthy of regard. However, Master Dyer, she continued in a graver tone, you must make haste to purchase what you want, for I am over-weary to walk further over these rough stones." Just as she spoke, Brother Paul passed them, in company with a secular priest, and although he took no notice of his fellow travellers, walking on as if he did not see them, the quick eye of Ned Dyron perceived with a glance that the priest and the monk had stopped, and were gazing back, talking earnestly together. 
"'That dull shaveling loves us not, fair Ella,' said Ned Dyram. "'He is one of your haters of all men, I should think.' "'I have seen his face somewhere before,' answered Ella Brune, "'but I know not well where. "'Tis not a pleasant picture to look upon, certainly, "'but he may be a good man for all that. "'Come, Master Dyram, what is it you want to buy? "'Here are stalls enough around us now, "'and if you do not choose speedily, "'I must turn back to the inn "'and leave you to find your way through Ghent alone.' "'Then first, said Ned Dyram, "'I would buy a clasp to fasten the hood round your fair face.' "'What?' exclaimed Ella, in a tone of merry anger. "'Accept a present within a week of having seen you first. "'Nay, nay, servant of mine, "'that is a grace you must not expect for months to come. "'No, if that be all you want, I shall turn back.' "'And she did so accordingly. "'But Ned Dyram had accomplished as much of his object "'as he had hoped or expected, for that day at least. "'He had spoken of love with Ella Broom, "'and, although what a great seer of the human heart has said, that talking of love is not making it, may be true, yet it is undoubtedly a very great step to that pleasant consummation. But Ned Dyram had done more, he had overstepped the first great barrier, and Ella now knew that he loved her. He trusted to time and opportunity for the rest, and he was not one to doubt his skill in deriving the greatest advantage from both. The foolish and obtuse are often deceived by others, the shrewd and quick are often deceived by themselves. Without that best of all qualities of the mind, strong common sense, there is little to choose between the two. For if the dull man has in the world to contend with a thousand knaves, the quick one has in his own heart to contend with a thousand passions, and perhaps the domestic cheats are the most dangerous of all. There is not so great a fool on the earth as a clever man when he is one, and Ned Dyram was one of that class, so frequently to be found in all ages, whose abilities are somewhat serviceable to others, but are rarely, if ever, found serviceable to themselves. Ella had used but little art towards him, but that which all women use, or would use, under such circumstances. Her first great thought was to conceal the love she felt, and where, when it becomes necessary to do so, is there a woman who will not find a thousand disguises to hide it from all eyes? But to him especially she was anxious to suffer no feeling of her bosom to appear, for she had speedily discovered, by a sort of intuition rather than observation, or perhaps by a quickness in the perception of small traits which often seems like intuition, that he was keen and cunning beyond his seeming, and now she had a double motive for burying every secret deep in her own heart. She laid out no plan, indeed, for her future conduct towards him. She thought not what she would say, or what she would do, and if, in her after-course, she employed aught like wile against his wiles, it was done on the impulse of the moment, and not on any predetermined scheme. Ned Dyram had remarked his master's conduct well since Ella had been their companion. He had seen that Woodville had been sincere in the opinion he had expressed, that it would be better for her to remain in England, and the very calm indifference which he had displayed on finding her in the ship with himself had proved to him both that there had never been any love passages between them, ere he knew either, as he had imagined, when first he was sent to London, and thus there was no chance of the young gentleman's kindly sympathy for the fair girl he protected growing into a warmer feeling. He read the unaffected conduct of his master aright, but to that of Ella Brune he had become more blind, partly because he was deceived by his own passions, partly because, in this instance, he had a much deeper and less legible book to read, A Woman's Heart, and, though naturally of a clear-sighted and even suspicious mind, he saw not in the slightest degree the real impulses on which she acted. Contented, therefore, with the progress he had made, he purchased some articles of small value at one of the stalls which they passed, and returned to the inn with his fair companion, who at once sought her chamber, and retired to rest, without waiting for Richard of Woodville's return. Then sitting down in a dark corner of the hall, in which several of his companions were playing at tables, and two or three other guests listening to a tale in broad Flemish, delivered by the host, Dyron turned in his mind all that had passed between him and Ella, and with vanity to aid him, easily persuaded himself that his suit would find favour in her eyes. He saw, indeed, that the rash and licentious thoughts which he had at one time entertained in regard to her 
when he found her poor, solitary, and unprotected, at a hostel in the liberties of the city, were injurious to her. But as his character was one of those two ordinary and debased ones, which value all things by the difficulty of attainment, he felt the more eagerly inclined to seek her, and to take any means to make her his, because he found her less easy to be obtained than he had at first imagined. End of chapter 20Chapter twenty one of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Exile At one side of a small square or open space in the town of Ghent rose a large pile of very ancient architecture called the Gravenstein, for many centuries the residence of the Counts of Flanders. Covering a wide extent of ground with its walls and towers, the building ran back almost to the banks of the Lieve, over which a bridge was thrown, communicating with the castle on one side and the suburbs on the other. In front, towards the square, and projecting far beyond the rest of the pile, was a massive castellated gate of stone, flanked by high towers rising to a considerable height. The aspect of the whole was gloomy and stern, but the gay scene before the gates— the guards, the attendants, the pages in the bright-coloured and splendid costumes, particularly affected by the House of Burgundy, relieved the forbidding aspect of the dark portal, contrasting brilliantly, though strangely, with its sombre and prison-like air. At a small light wicket, in a sort of balustrade or screen of richly sculptured stone, which separated the palace from the rest of the square, stood two or three persons, some of them in arms, others dressed in the garb of peace, and Richard of Woodville, with his guide, approaching one who seemed to be the porter, inquired if Sir Philip de Morgan could be spoken with. "'Pass in,' was the brief reply, "'the door in the court on the left of the gate,' and walking on, they took their way under the deep arch and found in one of the towers a small low door of massive oak, studded with huge bosses of iron." No one was in attendance, and this door being partially open was pushed back by Richard of Woodville, who bade the guide wait below, while he mounted the narrow stairs, the foot of which was seen before him. At the first story another open door presented itself, displaying a little ante-room, with two or three servants seated round a table, playing a cross and pile, a game which by this time had descended from kings to lackeys. Entering at once, the young gentleman, using the French tongue, demanded to speak with Sir Philip de Morgan, but the servants continued their game with that sort of cold indifference which Englishmen of an inferior class have, in all ages, been accustomed to show towards foreigners. One of them replying, in very bad French and hardly lifting his head from the game, he can't be spoken with, he's busy, adding in English to his fellow, play on, Wilfrid. How now, knave? exclaimed Richard of Woodville in his own tongue. Methinks you are saucy. Rise this moment and inform your master that a gentleman from the King of England desires to speak with him. The man instantly started up, replying, I beg your pardon, sir. I did not know you. I thought it was some of those Flemish hogs come to speak about the vellum. Learn to be civil to all men, sir, replied Richard of Woodville, and that a serving man is as much below an honest trader as a trader is below his lord. "'Go and do as I have told you.' The lackey retired by a door opposite, leaving a smile upon the faces of his fellows at the lecture he had received, and after being absent no more than a minute, he reopened the door, saying, "'Follow me, noble sir. Sir Philip will see you.' Passing through another small chamber, in which a pale, thin man in a black robe with a shaven crown was sitting, busily copying some papers, Richard of Woodville was ushered into a larger room, poorly furnished. At a table in the midst was seated a corpulent, middle-aged personage, with a countenance which at first seemed dull and heavy. The nose, the cheeks, the lips were fat and protruding, and the thick, shaggy eyebrows hung so far over the eyes as almost to conceal them. The forehead, however, was large and fine, somewhat prominent just above the brow, and over the nose, and when the eye could be seen, though small and grey, there was a bright and piercing light in it, which frequently accompanies high intellect. He was dressed in the plainest manner, and in dark colours, with a furred gown over his shoulders, and a small black velvet cap upon his head. Nor would it have been easy for anyone unacquainted with his real character 
to divine that in that coarse and somewhat repulsive form was to be found one of the greatest diplomatists of his age. Sir Philip de Morgan rose as soon as Richard of Woodville entered, bowing his head with a courtly inclination, and desiring his visitor to be seated. As soon as the servant had closed the door, he began the conversation himself, saying, "'My knave tells me, sir, you come from the king. It might have been more prudent not to say so.' "'Why, good faith, Sir Philip,' replied Woodville, "'without saying so, there was but little chance of seeing you, "'for you have some saucy vermin here, "'who thought fit to pay but little attention to my first words. "'And, moreover, as I have letters from the king "'for the Count de Charolois, which must be publicly delivered, "'concealment was of little use, and could last but a short time.' "'That alters the case,' answered Sir Philip de Morgan. "'As to my knaves, they must be taught to use their eyes.' though a little insolence is not altogether objectionable. But you mentioned letters for the Count. I presume you have some for me. I have, answered Richard of Woodville, putting his hand into the gibessière, or pouch, which was slung over his right shoulder and under his left arm, by an embroidered band. This from the King, sir. And he placed Henry's letter in the envoy's hand. Sir Philip de Morgan took it, cut the silk with his dagger, and drew forth the two sheets which it contained. The first which he looked at was brief, and the second, which was folded and sealed, with two words written in the corner, he did not open but laid aside. So, Master Woodville, he said after this examination, I find you have come to win your golden spurs in Burgundy. What lies in me to help you I will do. Tomorrow I will make you known to the Count de Charolois. I was well acquainted with your good father and your lady mother too. She was the sister, if I recollect, of the good knight of Dunbury, a very noble gentleman. And then, turning from the subject, he proceeded with quiet and seemingly unimportant questions to gain all the knowledge that he could from Richard of Woodville regarding the court of England and the character, conduct, and popularity of the young king. But his visitor, as the reader may have seen in earlier parts of this true history, though frank and free in his own case, and where no deep interests were concerned, was cautious and on his guard in matters of greater moment. He was not sent thither to babble of the king's affairs, and though he truly represented his sovereign as highly popular with all classes, and deservedly so, Sir Philip de Morgan gained little farther information from him on any of the many points in regard to which the diplomatist would fain have penetrated the monarch's designs before he thought fit to communicate them. The high terms in which Henry had been pleased to speak of the gentleman who bore his letter, naturally induced the envoy to set down his silence to discretion, rather than to want of knowledge. And he observed, after his inquiries had been parried more than once, "'You are, I see, prudent and reserved in your intelligence, Master Woodville.' "'It is easy to be so, fair sir,' answered his visitor, "'when one has nothing to communicate. Doubtless the king has told you all, without leaving any part of his will for me to expound.' At least, if he did, he informed me not of it. And I have nothing more to relate. What, not one word of France? asked the knight with a smile. Not one, replied Woodville calmly. The envoy smiled again. Well, he said, then tomorrow at noon I will go with you to the Count, if you will be here. Doubtless we shall hear more of your errand from the letters you bear to that noble prince. I do not know, replied Woodville, rising. "'but at the same time I would ask you to send someone with me "'to find out the dwelling of one Sir John Grey, "'if he be now in Ghent.' "'Sir John Grey?' said de Morgan, musing, "'as if he had never heard the name before. "'I really cannot tell you where to find such a person. "'There is none of that name here. "'Is he a friend of your own?' "'No,' answered Richard of Woodville. "'I never saw him.' "'Then you have letters for him, I presume,' rejoined the other. "'What says the superscription?' Does it not give you more clearly his place of abode? The town contains many a street and lane. I have only been here these eight hours since several years, and he may well be in the place and I not know it. Woodville drew forth the king's letter and gazed at the writing on the back, while Sir Philip de Morgan, who had risen likewise, took a silent step round and glanced over his arm. Ha! The king's own writing, he said. Sir John Grey, I remember— there is, I believe, an old countryman of ours living near what is called the Sade Grand, in the name of Mortimer. He has been here some years, and if there is a man in Ghent who can tell you where to find this Sir John Grey, tis he. 
"'Nay, I think you may well trust the letter in his hands to deliver. "'Stay, I will send one of my knaves with you, "'who knows the language and the manners of this people well.' "'I thank you, noble sir,' replied his visitor. "'But I have a man waiting for me who will conduct me. "'But if you will but repeat the direction that you gave. "'Near the saint de I think you said.' "'Just so,' replied Sir Philip de Morgan dryly. "'But not quite so far.' It is a house called the House of Bayashut, but it is growing late. In less than an hour it will be dark. You had better delay your visit till tomorrow, when you will be more sure of admission, for he is of a moody and somewhat strange fantasy, and not always to be seen. I will try at all events tonight, replied Richard of Woodville. I can but go back tomorrow if I fail. Farewell, Sir Philip. I will be with you at noon. And after all the somewhat formal courtesies and leave-takings of the day, he retired from the chamber of the king's envoy, and sought the guide who had conducted him thither. The man was soon found, talking to one of the inferior attendants of the Count of Charolois, and calling him away, Richard of Woodville directed him to lead to the house which Sir Philip de Morgan had indicated. The guide replied, in a somewhat dissatisfied tone, that it was a long way off, but a word about his reward soon quickened his movements, and issuing through the gates of the city, they followed a lane through the suburbs on the northern side of the Leith. A number of fine houses were built at that time beyond the actual walls of Ghent, for the frequent commotions which took place in the town, and the little ceremony with which the citizens were accustomed to take the life of any one against whom popular wrath had been excited, rendered it expedient in the eyes of many of the nobles of Flanders to lodge beyond the dangerous fortifications, which were as often used to keep in an enemy as to keep one out. Many of these were modern buildings, but others were of a far more ancient date, and at length, as it was growing dusk, the young Englishman's guide stopped at the gate of one of the oldest houses they had yet seen, and struck two or three hard blows upon the large heavy door. For some time nothing but a hollow sound made an answer, and looking up, Richard of Woodville examined the mansion, which seemed going fast into a state of decay. It had once been one of the strong battlemented dwellings of some feudal lord, and heavy towers and numberless turrets seemed to show that the date of its first erection went back to a time when the city of Ghent, confined to its own walls, had left the houses which were built beyond them, surrounded only by the uncultivated fields and pastures, watered by the Chelles, the Lys, and the Lièvre. The walls still remained solid, though the sharp cutting of the round arches had mouldered away in the damp atmosphere, and the casement above, for externally there were none on the lower story, were, in many instances, destitute of even the small lozenges of glass which, in those days, were all that even princely mansions could boast. After waiting more than a reasonable time, the guide knocked loud again, and looking round for a bell, at length found a rope under the arch, which he pulled violently. While it was still in his hand, a stout Flemish wench appeared, and demanded what they wanted, that they made so much noise. Her words, indeed, were unintelligible to the young Englishman, but guessing their import, he directed the guide to inquire if an Englishman of the name of Mortimer lived there. A nod of the head which accompanied her reply showed him that it was in the affirmative, and he then, by the same intervention, told her to let her master know that a gentleman from England wished to see him. The girl laughed and shook her head, saying something which, when it came to be translated, proved to be that she knew he would not see any one of the kind, but though it was of no use, she would go and inquire, and away she consequently ran with good-humoured speed, showing, as she went, a pair of fat white legs, with no other covering than that which nature had furnished them. She returned in a minute with a look of surprise, and bade the strangers follow her, which they did, into the court. There, however, Woodville again directed his guide to wait, and under the pilotage of the Flemish maid, entered upon a sea of passages, till at length, catching him familiarly by the hand to guide him in the darkness that reigned within, she led him to a flight of stairs and opened a door at the top. Before him lay a small room, ornamented with richly carved oak, the lines and angles of which caught faintly the light proceeding from a lamp upon the table, and standing in the midst of the room, with a look of eager impatience, was a man, somewhat advanced in life, though younger than Woodville had expected to see. 
His hair, it is true, was white, and his beard, which he wore long, was nearly so likewise, but he was upright and seemingly firm in limb and muscle. His face had furrows on it, too, but they seemed more of care and thought than age, and his eye was clear, undimmed, and flashing. "'Well, sir, well,' he said in English, as soon as Richard of Woodville entered. "'What news? Why has she not come herself?' "'You are, I fear, under a mistake,' replied the young Englishman. "'I came to you for information, not to give any.' The other cast himself back into his seat and covered his eyes with his hands, as Woodville spoke. The next moment he withdrew his hands, and the whole expression of his countenance was altered. Nothing appeared but a look of dull and thoughtful reserve, with a slight touch of disappointment. As he spoke not, Richard of Woodville went on to say, "'Sir Philip de Morgan directed me, sir.' "'Aye, he has his eye ever upon me,' exclaimed the other, interrupting him. "'What does he seek? What is there now to blame?' "'Nothing that I am aware of,' answered Woodville. "'It is on my own business he directed me here, not on yours or his.' "'Indeed,' said the other, with a softened look. "'And what is there for your pleasure, sir?' "'He informed me,' replied his visitor, "'that if there be a man in Ghent, it is yourself, "'who can tell me where to find one Sir John Grey, "'an English knight, supposed to be resident here.' "'And may I ask your business with him?' inquired Mortimer coldly. "'Nay,' answered Woodville, "'that will be communicated to himself. "'I cannot see how it would stead you to know aught concerning it.' "'No?' "'replied Mortimer, but it might stead him. "'A good friend, sir, to a man in danger, "'may stand like a barbican, as it were, before a fortress, "'encountering the first attack of the enemy. "'I say not that I know where Sir John Grey is to be found, "'but I do say, and at once, that I would not tell if I did, "'till I had heard the motive of him who seeks him. "'He has been a wronged and persecuted man, sir, "'and it is fit that no indiscretion should lay him open to further injury.' Woodville fixed his eyes intently upon his companion's countenance, and after a moment's pause he said in an assured tone, "'I speak to Sir John Grey even now. Concealment is vain, sir, and needless, for I do but bring you a letter from the young King of England, which I promise to deliver with all speed, and if things be as I think, it will not prove so ungrateful to you as you may expect. Am I not right? For I must have your own admission ere I give the letter.' "'The letter?' repeated the other, and again a look of eagerness came over his countenance. "'You bear a letter, then? You are keen, young man,' he added. "'But yet you look honest.' "'I do assure you, sir,' replied Woodville, "'that I have no end or object on earth but to give the letter with which I am charged to Sir John Grey himself. "'I am anxious, moreover, to do it speedily, for so I was directed, "'and I have therefore come to-night without waiting for repose.' If you be he, as I do believe, you may tell me so in safety, and rest upon the honour of an English gentleman. Honour, said his companion, with a sad and bitter shake of the head, I have no cause to trust in honour. It has become but a mere name, the meaning of which has been lost long ago, and each man interprets it as he likes best. In former times, honour was a thing as immutable as the diamond, which naught could change to any other form. "'Twas truth, twas right, twas the pure gold of the high heart. "'But, alas, men have devised alloy, "'and the metal, be it as base as copper, "'passes current for the value that is stamped upon it by society. "'Honour is no longer independent of man's will. "'Tis that which people call it and no more. "'The liar, who, with a smooth face, "'wrongs his friend in the most tender point, "'is still a man of honour with the world.' The traitor who betrays his country or his king, so that it be for passion and not gold, is still a man of honour, and will cut your throat if you deny it. The calumniator who blasts another's reputation with a sneer is still a man of honour if he's brave. Honour's a name that changes colour like the Indian beast according to the light it is viewed in. Now it is courage, now it is rank, now it is riches, now it is fine raiment or a swaggering air. Once it was truth, young sir. "'And is ever so in reality,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'The rest are all counterfeits, which only pass with men who know no better. "'It is of this honour that I speak, sir. "'However, as you know me not, I cannot expect you to attribute to me "'qualities that are indeed now rare. "'Yet, holding myself bound by that very honour which we speak of, 
to deliver the letter that I bear to no one but him for whom it was destined. Unless you tell me you are indeed that person, I must carry it back with me. Stay, what is your name? demanded the other. That may give me light. My name is Richard of Woodville, answered his visitor. Ha! Richard of Woodville, cried the stranger with a look of joy, grasping his hand warmly. Give it me, give it me quick. I am Sir John Grey. How fares she? Where is she? Why did she not come? I know not of whom you speak, replied Woodville. This letter is from the king, and drawing it forth, he put it into his companion's hand. From the king? exclaimed Sir John Grey. From the king? A letter to me? And he held the packet to the lamp, and gazed on the superscription attentively. True, indeed, he said at length, cutting the silk. Our trusty and well-beloved, a style I have not heard for years, and bending his head over it to peruse the contents, which were somewhat long. Woodville gazed at his face while he read, and marked the light and shade of many varied emotions come across it. Now the eye strained eagerly at the first lines, and the brow knit. Now a proud smile curled the lip, and now the eyelid showed a tear. But presently, as he proceeded, all haughtiness passed away from his look, he raised his eyes to heaven as if in thankfulness, and at the end let fall the paper on the table, and clasped his hands together, exclaiming, "'Praise to thy name, most merciful! The dark hour has come to an end!' Then stretching forth his open arms to Richard of Woodville, he said, "'Let me take you to my heart, messenger of joy. You have brought me life!' "'I am overjoyed to be that messenger, Sir John,' replied Woodville, "'but, in truth, I was ignorant of what I carried.' I did but guess, indeed, from my knowledge of the king's great soul, that it would not be so eager that this should reach you soon, if the tidings it contained were evil. They are home to the exile, replied the knight, wealth to the beggar, grace and station to the disgraced and fallen, the reversal of all his father's bitter acts, the generous outpouring of a true royal heart. Noble, noble prince, God requite me with misery eternal, if I do not devote every moment that remains of this short life to do your signal service. And you too, my friend, he continued, taking his visitor's hand, so you are the man who, choosing by the heart alone, setting rank and wealth and name aside, looking but to loveliness and worth, sought the hand of a poor and portionless girl, the daughter of a prescribed and banished fugitive. Good faith, Sir John, replied the young gentleman, gazing upon him with a look of no small surprise and pleasure. I begin to see the light, but I have been so long in darkness that my eyes are dazzled. Can it be that I see my fair Mary's father, the father of Mary Markham, in Sir John Grey? But the knight's attention had been turned back to the letter, with that abrupt transition which the mind is subject to, when suddenly moved by joy so unexpected as almost to be rendered doubtful by its very intensity. I cannot believe it, he said, Yet, who should deceive me? It is royal, too, in every word. It is the king's own hand that wrote it, replied Richard of Woodville, and if there be aught that is high and generous therein, aught that speaks a soul above the ordinary crowd, aught that is marked as fitting for a king, who values royalty but for extended power to do good and redress wrong, set it down with full assurance as a proof that it is Henry's own. But you have not answered me as to that dear lady. "'She is my child, Richard,' said Sir John Grey, "'and if you are worthy, as I believe you, she shall be your wife. "'You chose her in lowliness and poverty. "'She shall be yours in wealth and honour. "'But tell me more about her. "'When did you see her? "'Why has she not come?' "'The last question I cannot answer,' replied Richard of Woodville, "'for though I heard her father had sent for her, "'I knew not who her father was, or where, but... "'So then she never told you?' asked the knight. Never, answered Woodville, nor my good uncle either, but I saw her some eight or nine days since in Westminster, well and happy. I have heard since, however, by a servant whom I sent up, that she and Sir Philip had returned in haste to Dunbury upon some sudden news. Aye, then, so they have missed the men I sent, replied Sir John Grey. I dispatched a servant, the only one I had, three weeks since, together with some merchants who were going to trade in London and who promised on their return, which was to be without delay, to bring her with them. Stay, exclaimed Woodville, had they not a freight of velvets and stuffs of gold? The same, answered the knight, what of them? 
"'They were taken by pirates in the mouth of the Thames,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'I heard the news in Winchester when I was purchasing housings for my horses. "'But be not alarmed for your dear child. She is safe. I saw her afterwards. "'And good Sir Philip seemed to marvel much why some persons whom he expected had not yet arrived. "'Had he told me more, I could have given him tidings of them. "'Put your mind at ease on her account, for she is still with Sir Philip.' "'But that poor fellow, the servant,' answered the knight sadly, "'my heart is ill at rest for him. "'Misfortune teaches us to value things more justly than prosperity. "'A true and faithful friend, whatever be his station, is a treasure indeed, "'not to be lost without a bitter pang. "'I must thank God that my dear child is safe, yet I cannot forget him.' "'They will put him to ransom with the rest,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'I heard they had carried the merchants and their vessel to some port in the north.' "'and doubtless you will soon hear of him. "'I did not learn that there was any violence committed, "'for though they are usually hard and cruel men, "'they are even more avaricious than bloodthirsty.' "'God send it!' exclaimed Sir John Gray. "'I wonder that your noble kinsman, "'when he heard that you were about to cross the sea, "'did not charge you with Mary's guidance hither. "'It would have been more safe.' "'But you forget,' replied Woodville, "'that I was ignorant of all concerning her, I thought she was an orphan till within the last ten days, or perhaps not so well placed as that. Besides, my uncle would not countenance our love, and indeed that was his reason, for I remember he said that he wished we had not been such fools as to be caught by one another's eyes, that it would have saved him much embarrassment. Sir John Gray smiled, saying, That is so much the man I left. He had even then outlived the memory of his own young days, when ladies' love was all his thought but arms, and looked upon everything but that lofty and more shadowy devotion to the fair, which was the soul of olden chivalry, as little better than youthful idleness. He kept you then, even to the last, without knowledge of her fate and history. He did well, too, for so I wished it, but I will now tell you all, and there is not indeed much to say. I raised my lance with the rest for my sovereign King Richard, was taken and pardoned, but swore no allegiance to one whom I could not but hold as an usurper. When occasion served again, I was not slack to do the same once more, and with my friends fought the lost battle of Shrewsbury. My life was saved by a poor faithful fellow of our army who gave his own, I fear, for mine, and flying more fortunately than others, I escaped to this land. Here I soon heard that I was proclaimed a traitor, my estate seized, my name attainted, and my child sought for to make her a ward of the crown, and to give her and the fortune which her mother inherited to some minion of the court. She was then a mere child, and by your uncle's kindly care was taken first to Wales, and then brought to his own house, where he has ever treated her as a daughter. I lingered on in this and other lands from year to year, and many an effort was made to entrap or drive me back into the net. The King of France was instigated to expel me from his dominions. The Duke of Burgundy was moved to follow his example, but would not so debase himself to any king on earth. But why should I tell all that I have suffered? Every art was used, and every means of persecution tried, till at length, taking refuge in this town of Ghent under a false name, I have known a short period of tranquillity. Then came the thought of my child upon me. It grew like a thirst till I could bear no more, and I sent for her. I knew not then that the late king was dead, or I might have waited to see the result. For often when this prince was but a child, I have had him on my knee, and I too taught him to handle the bow when he was seven years old. For till his father stretched a hand towards the crown, he was my friend. And Harry of Hereford and John Gray were sworn brothers. "'The more the friendship wants, the more the hate,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'So says an old song, noble knight. "'But now that enmity is over, I trust, for ever. "'The Earl of March, the only well-founded obstacle in the way of Henry's rights, "'acknowledges them fully.' "'And if he did not,' answered Sir John Grey, with a stern brow, "'I would never draw my sword for him. "'The Earl of March, I mean the old Earl, by tame acquiescence in the deeds of Henry of Bolingbroke, "'set aside his title. "'He held out no hand to help his falling kinsman, Richard, "'and if the crown was to be given away, "'it was the peers and commons of England that had right to give it, "'and they rightly gave it to the brave and wise "'rather than to the feeble and the timid. 
It was Richard Plantagenet was my king, and not the Earl of March. To the one I swore allegiance and owed much, to the other I had no duty and owed nothing. I did not wrangle which son of a king should succeed, but I upheld the monarch who was upon the throne. Neither did I ever, it my young friend, regard the Duke of Lancaster with private enmity, as you seem to think. He was ambitious, he usurped his cousin's throne, and I drew the sword against him because he did so. But I will acknowledge that, if there was one man in England fitted to fill that throne with dignity, he was the man. He, on the contrary, hated me, because his own conduct had changed a friend into an enemy. And so it is ever in this world. But who is it rings the bell so fiercely? Hark! Perhaps it is my child. And, opening the door, he turned his head eagerly to listen to the sounds that rose from below. Richard of Woodville also gave ear, for a word is sufficient to make hopes, however improbable, rise up like young plants in a spring shower, at least in our early days. But the next moment the steps of two persons sounded in the passage, and one of the servants, whom Woodville had seen in the antechamber of Sir Philip de Morgan, appeared, guided by the Flemish maid. "'My master greets you well, sir,' he said, addressing Sir John Grey, "'and has sent you, by the King's order, some of the money belonging to you, for your present need. And thus saying, he laid a heavy bag of what appeared to be coin upon the table. He bids me say, continued the man, that the rest of the money will arrive soon, and that you had better appear at the court of my lord count, as early as may be, that all the world may know you have the king's protection. Sir John Grey gazed at the bag of money with a mournful smile. How ready men are, he said, when fortune favours, how far and how long might I have sought this when I was in distress? And untying the bag, he took out a large piece of silver, saying to the servant, There, my friend, is largesse. Tell your master I will follow counsel. He has heard of this, Richard. You bore him letters, I suppose, he added, as the man quitted the room with thanks for his bounty. Well, tis no use to expect of men more than they judge their duty. Yet this knight was the instrument who willingly urged the Duke of Burgundy to drive me forth from Dijon. End of chapter 21「twenty two of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Count of Charolois, clothed in the most splendid array with which he had been able to provide himself, his tight fitting hose displaying to the highest advantage his graceful yet powerful limbs, with the coat of black silk, spotted with flowers of gold, cut wide but gathered into numerous pleats or folds round the collar and the waist, and confined by a rich girdle to the form, while the sleeves, fashioned to the shape of the arm and fastened at the wrist, showed the strong contour of the swelling muscles, Richard of Woodville stood before the door of the inn, as handsome and princely a man in his appearance as ever graced a royal court. Over his shoulders he wore a short mantle of embroidered cloth, trimmed with costly fur, the sleeves of which, according to the custom of the day, were slashed down the inner side so as to suffer the arm to be thrust out from them, while they, more for ornament than use, hung down to the bend of the knee. On his feet he wore the riding boots of the time, thrust down to the ankle, and, in accordance with a custom then new in the courts of France and Burgundy, but which ere long found its way to England, his heavy sword had been laid aside, and his only arm was a rich hilted dagger, suspended by a gold ring from the clasp of his girdle. His head was covered with a small bonnet or velvet cap, ornamented by a single long white feather, showing that he had not yet reached knightly rank, and round it curled in large masses his glossy dark brown hair. Likewise, arrayed with all the splendour that the young gentleman's purse had permitted him to procure, Six of his servants stood ready by their horses' sides to accompany him to the dwelling of the Count of Charolois, and a glittering train they formed, well fitted to do honour to old England, in the eyes of a foreign court. It was evident enough that they were all well pleased with themselves, but their self-satisfaction was of the cool and haughty kind so common to our countrymen, partaking more of pride than vanity. They looked down upon others more than they admired themselves, and, unlike the French or the Burgundians, seemed to care little what others thought of them, 
quite contented with the feeling that their garb became them, and that, should need be, they could give a stroke or bide a buffet with the best. The horse of Richard of Woodville, not the one which had borne him from the coast, but a finer and more powerful animal, was brought round, and turning for a moment to Ella Broom, who stood with a number of other gazers at the door of the inn, the young Englishman said, "'I will not be so careless and forgetful to-day, Ella, but will bring you back tidings of your kinsman, without farther fault.' Then, springing on his charger's back, he rode lightly away, while the poor girl gazed after him, with a deep sigh struggling at her heart, and suppressed with pain, as she thought of the many eyes around her. At the gate of the Gravenstein, orders had already been given to admit the young Englishman into the inner court, and, riding on, Richard of Woodville dismounted near the door which led to the apartments of Sir Philip de Morgan. A man who was waiting at the foot of the stairs ran up them as soon as he saw the train, and before Woodville could follow, the envoy of the King of England came down, followed by a page. He greeted his young countryman with even marked courtesy, suffering his eyes to rest with evident pleasure upon his goodly train, and then turning with a smile to Woodville, he inquired, "'Do men now in England gild the bits and chains of their horses?' "'It is a new custom, I believe,' replied the young gentleman. "'I gave little heed to it, but told the people to give me those things that would not discredit my race and country at the court of Burgundy.' "'Well, let us go hither,' replied Sir Philip, "'or at least to such part of it as is here in Ghent.' I have already advised the Count that you are coming, and he is willing to show you all favour. The envoy accordingly led the way across the wide court which separated the old gate, with its gloomy towers, from the stern and still more forbidding fortress of the ancient Counts of Flanders, and passing first through a narrow chamber in which were sitting some half-dozen armed guards, and then through a wide hall, where a greater number of gentlemen were assembled in their garb of peace, the two Englishmen approached a flight of steps at, at the farther end. There a middle-aged man, with a gold chain round his neck, advanced, and addressing Sir Philip de Morgan, inquired if the Count was aware of their visit. The diplomatist re replied that they were expected at that hour, and the other, pushing open the door at the top of the steps, called loudly to an attendant within, to usher the visitors to his lord's presence. After a few more ceremonies of the same kind, Woodville and his companion were introduced into the small cabinet in which the Count of Charolois was seated. He was not alone, for two personages having the appearance of men of some rank, but booted and spurred as if for a journey, were standing before him in the act of taking their leave, and Richard of Woodville had an opportunity of examining briefly the countenance of the prince, known afterwards as Philip the Good. He was then in the brightness of early youth, and seldom has there been seen a face more indebted to expression for the beauty which all men agreed to admire. Taken separately, perhaps none of the features were actually fine, except the eyes, but there was a look of generous kindness, a softness brightened by a quick and intelligent glance, a benignity rather heightened than diminished by certain firmness of character, in the mouth and jaw which was inexpressibly pleasing to the eye. There were lines of deep thought, too, about the brow, which contrasted strangely with the smooth, soft skin of youth, and with the rounded cheeks without a furrow or hollow, and the eyelids as unwrinkled and full as those of careless infancy. The Count had evidently been speaking on matters of grave moment, for there was a seriousness even in his smile. As, rising for an instant, while the others bowed and retired, he wished them a prosperous journey. He was above the middle height, but not very tall, and though in after years he became somewhat corpulent, he was now very slight in form and graceful in his movements, which all displayed, even at the early age of seventeen, that dignity never lost, even after the symmetry of youth was gone. As the two gentlemen who took their leave were quitting the room, the Count turned to Sir Philip de Morgan, bowing rather stiffly and noticing Woodville with a slight inclination of the head. "'This is, I suppose, the gentleman you mentioned, Sir Philip,' he said, "'who has brought me letters from my royal cousin of England?' "'The same, fair sir,' replied the envoy. "'Allow me to make known to you Master Richard of Woodville, "'allied to the noble family of Beecham, "'one of the first in our poor island.' "'He is welcome to Ghent,' replied the Count, 
but Woodville remarked that he did not demand the letters which he bore, and he was hesitating whether he should present the one addressed to him, when the prince inquired in an easy tone whether he had had a prosperous journey, following up the question with so many others of small importance that the young Englishman judged there was something assumed in his eager but insignificant interrogatory. He knew not, indeed, what was the motive, but his companion, too well accustomed to the ways of courts not to translate correctly a hint of the kind, whether he chose to apply it or not, took occasion, at the very first pause, to say, "'Having now had the honour of introducing this young gentleman, I will leave him with you, my Lord Count, as I have important letters to write on the subject of our conversation this morning.' "'Do so, Sir Knight,' replied the Prince." and he took a step towards the door, as if to honour his departing visitor. "'Now, Master Richard of Woodville,' he continued, as soon as the other was gone, "'let us speak of your journey hither. But first, if you please, let me see the letter which you bring, and which may, perhaps, render farther explanation unnecessary.' Richard of Woodville immediately presented the King's epistle to the Count of Charolois, who read the contents with attention, and then gazed at the bearer with an earnest glance. "'I have heard of you before, sir,' he said with a gracious smile, "'and am most willing to retain you on the part of Burgundy. "'Such a letter as this from my royal cousin "'could not be written in favour of one who did not merit high honour. "'And unhappily, in these days, "'there are but too many occasions of gaining renown in arms. "'May I ask what payment you require "'for the services of yourself and your men?' "'None, noble prince,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'I come but to seek honour. If my services be good, you or your father will recompense them as you think meet. In the meantime, all that I require is entertainment for myself and followers at the court of Burgundy, wherever it may be, and the discharge of my actual expenses in time of war, or when I am employed in any enterprise you may think fit to entrust to me. I see, sir, that you are of the olden chivalry, said the Count, giving him his hand. You are from this moment a retainer of our house. "'And I am glad,' he continued, "'that I have spoken with you alone, "'for good Sir Philip de Morgan loves none "'to bring letters from his king but himself. "'I may have cause to call upon you soon, "'even now, indeed, but of that hereafter. "'How many have you with you?' Ten stout archers,' answered the young Englishman, "'who will do their duty in whatever field "'they may be called to, and myself. "'That is my only force, but it may go far.' "'for we are well horsed and armed, "'and most of us have seen blood drawn in our own land. "'You said, my Lord Count, "'that even now an occasion might offer, "'at least so I understood you. "'Now I am somewhat impatient of fortune's tardiness, "'and would not miss her favours "'as soon as her hand is open.' "'The Count mused for a moment, "'and then looked up, laughing. "'Well,' he said, "'perhaps my mother may call me a rash boy "'in trusting to such new acquaintance, "'but yet I will confide in you.' "'to justify me. "'There may be an occasion very soon, "'and if there be, I will let you have your part. "'I, alas, must not go, "'but at all events have everything ready "'to set out at a moment's notice, "'and you may chance to ride far "'before many days be over. "'Now let us speak of other things.' "'And he proceeded to ask his visitor "'numerous questions regarding the English court, "'its habits, customs, "'and the characters of the principal nobles "'that distinguished it.' Richard of Woodville answered his inquiries more frankly than he had done those of Sir Philip de Morgan, and the Count seemed well pleased with all he heard. Gradually their conversation lost the stiffness of first acquaintance, and the young prince, throwing off the restraint of ceremony, gave way to the candid spirit of youth, spoke of his own father and of his dangerous position at the court of France, expressed his longing desire to take an active part in the busy deeds that were doing touched with some bitterness upon the conduct of the Dauphin towards his sister, and added with a flushed cheek, Would my father suffer it, I would force him, lance to lance, if not to cast away his painted paramour, at least to do justice to his neglected wife. She is more fair and bright than any French harlot, and it must be a studied purpose to insult her race that makes him treat her thus. Perhaps not, noble Count, replied Richard of Woodville, there is nothing so capricious on this earth as the pampered heart of greatness. Do we not daily see men of all ranks cast away from them things of real value, to please the moment with some empty trifle? And the spoilt children of fortune, I mean princes and kings, may well be supposed to do the same. God, when he puts a crown upon their heads, leaves them to enrich it with jewels, if they will. 
but alas, too often they content themselves with meaner things and think the crown enough. The prince smiled with a thoughtful look and gazed for a moment in Woodville's face ere he replied, "'You speak not the same language as Sir Philip de Morgan,' he said at length. "'His talk is ever of insult and injury to the House of Burgundy. "'He can find no excuse for the House of Valois.' "'He speaks as a politician, my Lord Count,' replied Woodville. "'Would that I might say, I speak as a friend, though a bold one. "'I know not what are his views and purposes, "'but when you mention aught to me, "'I must answer frankly, if I answer at all. "'And in this case I can easily believe that the Dauphin, "'in the wild heat of youth, perhaps nurtured in vice and licentiousness, "'and at all events taught early to think that his will must have no control,' may neglect a sweet lady for the trumpery leman, without meaning any insult to your noble race. Bad as such conduct is, it were needless to aggravate it by imaginary wrongs. The Count looked down in thought, and then, raising his head with a warm smile, he answered, You speak nobly, sir, and you may say you are my friend, for the man who would temper a prince's passion without any private motive is well worthy of the character here written and he laid his hand upon Henry's letter, which he had placed on the table. "'I trust, my Lord Count,' replied Woodville, "'that you will never have cause to say, in any case where my allegiance to my own sovereign is not concerned, that I do not espouse your real interests as warmly as I would oppose any passion, even of your own, which I thought contrary to them. I am not a courtier, fair sir, and may express myself somewhat rudely, but I will trust to your own discernment to judge in all instances of the motive rather than the manner. "'I shall remember more of what you have said than you perhaps imagine,' answered the young Count. "'You gave me a lesson, my noble friend, and henceforth I will call you by that name, in regard to those spoilt children of fortune, as you term them, princes, and I will not let a high station pamper me into deeds like those which I myself condemn. But there are many persons here, in the good town of Ghent, to whom I must make you known, as they will be your companions for the future. And before night, such arrangements shall be made for your lodging and accommodation as will permit of your taking up your abode in the old castle here. There is but one warning I will give you, he continued. Sir Philip de Morgan is a shrewd and clever man, very zealous in the cause of his king, but somewhat jealous of all other influence. My father esteems him highly, though he is not always ready to follow whither he would lead. You had better be his friend than his enemy, and yet, when there is anything to be done, communicate with me direct, and not through him. "'I will follow your advice, sir, as far as may be,' replied Woodville, "'but I do not think there is any great chance of Sir Philip de Morgan and myself interfering with each other. I am a soldier, he is a statesman. I will not meddle with his trade, and I think he is not likely to envy me mine. He was a good man at arms, I hear, in his early days.' "'but I fancy he will not easily enclose himself in plate again.' "'Good faith!' exclaimed the young Count, laughing. "'His cuirass would need be shaped like a bow, "'and have as much iron about it as the great bombard of Oudenard, "'which our good folks of Ghent call Mad Meg. "'No, no, I do not think that he will ever couch a lance again. "'But come, my friend, let us to the hall "'where we shall find some of the nobles of Burgundy and Flanders waiting for us.' "'Then we will ride to my mother's, where I will make you known to her fair ladies. "'I have no further business for the day, but yet I must not be absent from my post, "'as every hour I expect tidings which may require a sudden resolution.' "'The prince then led the way into the large hall through which Richard of Woodville "'had passed about half an hour before, and there was instantly surrounded by a number of gentlemen, "'to whom he introduced his new retainer. "'Many a noble name which the young Englishman had often heard of was mentioned Quoi, Van Hade, St. Paul's, Roy's, Lala, and Lean, and from all, as might be expected, under the circumstances in which he was introduced to them, he received a courteous reception. It must not be denied, however, that although chivalrous customs required a friendly welcome to every adventurous gentleman seeking service at a foreign court, human nature, the same in all ages, left room for jealousy of any one who might aspire to share the favour which each desired to monopolise. Thus, though every one was, as I have said, courteous in demeanour to Richard of Woodville, it was all cold and formal, and many a whispered observation on his appearance and manners, on the accent in which he spoke the language, 
and on the slight difference of his dress from that of the Burgundian court, marked a willingness to find fault wherever it was possible. For his part, he took little notice of these things, well knowing what he had to expect, and aware that friendship could not be gained at once. He treated all with perfect good humour and civility, in the hope that those who were worthy of any further consideration would learn in time to esteem him, and to cast away any needless jealousy. After passing about half an hour in the hall, the young Count selected some five or six of the gentlemen present to accompany him on his visit to his mother, who was lodged in the new palace, called the Cour des Princes, and as soon as his horses were brought round, he descended, with the young Englishman and the rest, into the court of the castle. He paused for a moment, where, ranged in a line by their horses' sides, he saw the stout yeoman who had accompanied Richard of Woodville thither. And as, with an eye not unskilful even then in judging the thews and sinews, he marked their light yet powerful limbs with an improving smile, he turned to his new friend, saying in a low voice, "'Serviceable stuff there, in the day of need, I doubt not.' "'I have every hope they will prove so, my good lord,' replied Woodville, and giving them a sign, each sprang at once into the saddle, except the one who had led forward his young master's horse, and held the stirrup while he mounted.' As the gay party rode along through the streets of Ghent, the inconstant peoples, so often in open rebellion against their sovereigns, shouted loud acclamations on the path of the young and graceful prince, who in turn bowed low his head, or nodded familiarly to those he knew in the crowd. The distance was but short, but the Count took the opportunity of passing through some of the principal streets of the town, to show the splendour of the greatest manufacturing city at that time in the world to the young Englishman, and frequently he turned and asked his opinion of this or that as they passed, or pointed out to him the magnificent shops and vast fabrics which lined their road on either side. There was certainly much to admire, and Richard of Woodville, not insensible of the high importance of the arts, praised with somewhat a better judgment than most of the haughty nobility of the day would have displayed, the indications of that high commercial prosperity which the courtiers affected to hold in contempt. He would not miss the opportunity, however, of learning something of the kinsman of Ella Brune, and after answering one of the observations of the prince, he added, "'But as I came from my hostel this morning, sir, I perceive that you have other arts carried to a notable height in the good city of Ghent, besides that of the weavers. I pass by many a fair stall of goldsmith's work, which seemed to me to display several pieces of fine and curious workmanship.' "'Oh, that we have amongst the best in the world,' replied the Count. "'Though, to say sooth, when we gave you a number of our weavers to teach you Englishmen that art, "'we borrowed from you in return much of our skill in working the precious metals. "'Many of our best goldsmiths, even now, are either Englishmen or the descendants of those who first came over. "'I had one right dexterous artificer, who used to dwell with my household, and who is still my servant.' but my mother's confessor suspected him of a leaning towards heresy, and extracted that he should be sent forth out of the castle. "'Twas but for a jest at our good father the Pope, but poor Brune made it worse by saying, when questioned, that as there are three popes, all living, the confessor might place it on the shoulders of him he liked. Many a grave man, I have remarked, will bear anything rather than a jest, and Father Claude, from that moment, would not be satisfied till Nicholas Broom was gone. "'Poor fellow! And what became of him?' asked Richard of Woodville. "'I have known some of his family in England.' "'Oh, he is in a shop at the corner of the market, close to the castle gate,' replied the prince, "'and drives a thriving trade, so that he has gained by the exchange. I hope both in pocket and in prudence. I have not heard any charge against him lately.' and I do believe it was but a silly jest, which none but an Englishman would have ventured. Richard of Woodville smiled, but made no reply, and in a few minutes after they reached the gates of the palace, from which he followed the Count of Charolois straight to the presence of Margaret of Bavaria, Duchess of Burgundy, whom they found in an inner chamber surrounded by a small party of young dames and elderly knights, devising, as the term was in those days, upon some motto which had been laid before them. Amongst faint traces of what had once been great beauty, the countenance of the princess displayed deep lines of thought and anxiety. She smiled kindly upon the young stranger, and seemed to him to examine his face with more attention than was ordinary, or perhaps altogether pleasant. 
She made no remark, however, but spoke of the Court of England with better information than her son had displayed, and, somewhat to the surprise of the young Englishman, evinced some knowledge of his own family and history, for although the Court of Burgundy at this time held the place which that of the Count of Foix had formerly filled, and was the centre of all the news, as we may say, of all the gossip in Europe, though its heralds and its minstrels made it their business day and night to collect all the tales, anecdotes, and rumours of every eminent person throughout the chivalrous world, Richard of Woodville was not aware of ever having done anything to merit such sort of notice. The conversation was soon turned to other subjects, and the Duchess was in the act of giving her son an account, in a jesting tone, of some visits which she had made that morning, to several of the religious institutions of the town, when a page entered hastily, bearing a packet in his hand. Approaching direct to the Count of Charolois, he presented it on his knee, saying, "'From my lord the Duke, the messenger sought you at the castle, sir, in haste, and then came hither.' The prince took it with an eager and anxious look, tore off the silk and seal without stopping to cut the cord that bound it, and then read the contents with a countenance which expressed rather preconceived apprehension, perhaps, than emotion caused by the intelligence which the dispatch contained. The Duchess of Burgundy remained seated, but gazed upon her son's face with a look more sad than alarmed, and it seemed to Richard of Woodville that, internally, she was meditating on the future course of that fair and noble youth, amidst all the many perils, cares, and griefs, which surrounded in those days the paths of princes, rather than even on the present dangers which might affect her husband. There is a tender timidity in the love of woman for her offspring, which is generated by none of the other relations of life. The husband, or the brother, or the father, is her stay and support. He is there to protect and to defend, and though she may tremble at his danger, or weep for his misfortune, there may be, and often is, some shade of selfish feeling in the dread and in the sorrow. Such is not the case with the child. It is for him she fears, not for herself. For him entirely, with emotions unmixed, with devotion unalloyed, to save any other dear one, she might readily sacrifice life, from duty, from enthusiasm, from love. But it would still be a sacrifice, in any other case than that of her child, to save him, it would be an impulse. The Duchess gazed upon the young Count's face, then, with calm but sad consideration, and perhaps her own memory supplied somewhat too abundantly the materials for fancy to raise up, without aid, a sad model of the future. She knew that honour, or goodness, or even courage, cannot bring security, that innocence cannot escape malice, that virtue cannot ensure peace, that wealth and power and a high name, are but as butts whereon to hang the targets at which the arrows of the world are aimed. And she feared for her son, seeing with prophetic eye the life of turmoil and contention and peril that lay before him. As soon as he had read the letter, the Count suffered his hand to drop by his side, and gazed upward for a moment or two in thought. Then, turning gracefully to his mother, he took her hand with a smile, from which was banished every trace or indication of the thoughts that he did not choose to communicate to those around, and saying, Dear Lady Mother, we must take counsel, and led her away through a door which those who were acquainted with the palace knew must conduct them to the private cabinet of the Duchess. The party which remained behind was soon separated into different groups, some of the young nobles who had accompanied the Count taken advantage of the absence of the persons to whom they owed most reverence, for the purpose of saying sweet, whispered things to the fair dames of the court, some gathering together to inquire of each other, and conjecture amongst themselves what might be the nature of the tidings received, and two or three others of either kinder or more pliant dispositions than the rest, seizing the opportunity of cultivating the friendship of the young Englishman. No great time was spent on these occupations, however, for before the Duchess and her son had been gone more than five minutes, the Count returned, and looking round the circle, said, "'Bad tidings scatter good company, my lords. I must ride this very night towards Lille. We will not strip our mother's court here of all her gallant knights and gentlemen, especially in this wise but somewhat turbulent city of Ghent. You, therefore, my lords of Croy, Joigny, St. George, Tyan, and Vergier, with what men are most ready of your trains, 
I beseech you to give me your fair company ere four o'clock. And you, Master Richard of Woodville, my good friend, if you be so minded, hasten your preparation and join me at the castle by that hour. You may have occasion, he continued in a low tone, taking the young Englishman by the arm, to win the golden spurs of which we have heard you were disappointed by no fault of your own at the Battle of Brabham Moor. We shall be back in Ghent before the week be out, so you can leave your baggage here if you so please. Away then, noble lords, away, for we have a long march before us, and perhaps a busy day to-morrow. All was in a moment the bustle and confusion of departure. The young count turned and went back to the cabinet of his mother, as soon as he had spoken. The ladies of the Duchess rose, and though some of them paused for an instant to speak a word in private to those who were about to leave them, retired one by one. The old knights and those who were to remain in Ghent walked out to see their friends and comrades mount, and in less than five minutes the hall was cleared, and the courtyard nearly vacant. End of chapter 22"'Chapter 23 of Agincourt, a romance by George Payne Rainsford James. "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'The Departure "'We must to horse without delay, Ned,' said Richard of Woodville as he entered the inn. "'Why, you have been to horse already, master of mine,' replied Ned Dyram in a somewhat sullen tone. "'And must mount again ere two hours be over,' rejoined Woodville. "'But where and how can I leave the baggage?' "'Aye, who can tell that?' said the other. "'See what it is to march loaded like a carrier's pack-horse "'with more things than you can carry. "'You are coming back soon, then, to Ghent?' "'Ere the week be out,' answered his lord. "'So the Count tells me.' "'Pray, sir, never mind what Counts tell you,' exclaimed Ned Dyram. "'Mind what your own senses tell you. "'If you know where you are going, "'you can judge as well as a king when you may be back.' "'But that I do not know.' "'replied Woodville, somewhat impatiently. "'No more words, Master Dyram, "'but gather everything together into one chamber, "'and I will speak to the host as to its security.' "'Little security for a traveller's baggage in a foreign hotel,' "'rejoined Ned Dyram, "'unless someone stays to take charge of it. "'Then, by my honour, you shall be the man to do so,' "'cried his master, thinking by leaving him behind "'when activity and enterprise were before him, "'to punish him sufficiently for his saucy tone. But Ned Dyram seemed not at all disappointed, and replied with an indifferent air, I am very willing to stay. I am one who does not love journeys I know not whither, and expeditions I know not for what. Well then, you remain, answered his master. Gather the things together, as I have said, and you shall be left like a trader's drudge to look after the goods. Where is Ella Brune? In her own chamber, I fancy, replied Ned Dyram. She has shut herself up there ever since you were gone, like a nun. "'Call her down hither to the eating-room,' was his lord's reply, and Ned Dyram hastened away. The fair girl did not make her young protector wait long, and ere he had finished his directions to his train to prepare all things for immediate departure, she was by his side. Taking her hand kindly, he led her into the common hall of the inn, and told her what he had discovered regarding her kinsman, adding that as he was about to set out in a few hours with the young Count de Charolois, he would at once accompany her to the house of Nicholas Brune, in order to ascertain if she could have shelter and protection there. "'I know not, my poor Ella,' he said, "'whether that dwelling may be one where you can safely and happily stop long, for this good man has been somewhat rash in his words, and is under suspicion of leaning to those heretical notions that are so rife. But I shall be back in a week or less, and then you can tell me all that you think of the matter.' You would not wish, I know, to remain with people who would seek to pervert you from the true Catholic faith. "'Are you sure to return in a week?' asked the poor girl, her cheek, which had turned somewhat pale before, resuming its warm hue. "'So the Count assures me,' answered Woodville, "'and I doubt it not, Ella, but at all events I will care for you, be assured, poor thing.' "'You tell me to put all the baggage in one room,' said Ned Dyram, thrusting in his head, and the men tell me that they are to have each his harness and you yours, two contrary orders, master of mine, which is to be obeyed. Your wit is strangely halting just now, answered the master. Put all but what I have ordered to be taken into the room, and see that it be arranged rightly and quickly too. Now, Ella, cast something over your head and come with me to your kinsman's shop. 
"'What wait you for, sir?' "'To know which suit you are pleased to have,' replied Ned Dyram, "'while Ella passed him to seek the wimple which she had cast off in the house. "'I have given orders on that score to others,' answered the master, "'and as the man retired he murmured to himself, "'I shall have to send that fellow back to the king. He does not please me.' With a rapid step, Richard of Woodville led the way, as soon as Ella joined him, to the wide open space which then, as since, was used as a market before the old castle of the Counts of Flanders, and as none of the shops or stalls bore their master's names inscribed, he entered the first they came to, and inquired which was the house of Nicholas Brune. "'His house,' replied the man to whom he had addressed himself in French, "'is at the other end of the town, but his shop is yonder.' and he pointed with his hand from the door to one of the projecting cases covered with a network of iron wire, under which the goldsmiths of Ghent at that period exposed some of their larger goods for sale. The last store but one, added the trader, and Woodville and his fair companion sped on towards the spot. At the unglazed window behind his booth stood a man of middle age, grey-headed, but with a fresh and cheerful countenance, who, as soon as he saw the two approach, demanded in the common terms of the day what they sought in his trade. The next instant, however, his eye rested upon Ella's face, which wore a faint smile, and he exclaimed in his native tongue, "'Masalta, if there be not my cousin Ella, how art thou, lass? Welcome to Ghent. What news of the good old man? My dame will be right glad to see you both again.' "'She will never see him more,' replied Ella Brune in a sad tone. "'But of that I will tell you hereafter, kinsman, "'for I must not stay this noble gentleman "'who has befriended me on the way. "'What I seek to know is, "'if you can give me shelter at your dwelling for a week "'till I can look around me. "'I will pay for my abiding, Nicholas,' she added, "'perhaps knowing that her cousin, dealing in gold, "'had somewhat too great a fondness for the pure metal. "'But Nicholas Brune was in a generous mood, and he replied, "'Shelter shalt thou have, fair Ella, and meat and drink, "'with right good will, for a week and a day, without cost or payment. "'If thou stayest with us longer, which God send, we will talk about purveyance. "'In the meantime I will thank this gentleman for his goodness to you. "'Why, by my tongs, I think I saw him riding this morning with my noble lord, the Count.' "'You did, most likely,' replied Richard of Woodville, "'for we passed by your door. "'But I have farther to ride to-night, Master Nicholas.' "'and now, having seen this fair maiden safe under your protection, "'I will leave her there. "'But you had better send up some of your lads with speed to my hostel "'for the coffer that we brought, as, perchance, "'Ned Dyron would not let you have it, Ella, when I am gone.' "'Ella Brune smiled, with an effort to keep up the light cheerfulness "'which she had lately assumed, and replied, "'I think, noble sir, that Master Dyron is not a carl "'to refuse me aught I ask him.' "'but yet if my kinsman can spare a boy, he had better go at once.' "'I will soon find one,' answered the stout goldsmith, "'and, turning to a furnace-room which lay behind his shop, "'he called one of his men forth, and bade him follow the gentleman back. "'The parting then came between Ella Brune and Richard of Woodville, "'and bitter was the moment to the poor minstrel girl. "'She had learned a world of new sensations since she first saw him.' that clinging attachment which made her long never to be absent from his side for a whole day, that tender regard which made her dread to see him depart, lest evil should befall him by the way, that love which is full of fears for the beloved that we never feel for ourselves. But no one could have told that there were any emotions in her bosom but respect and gratitude, unless the transitory look of deep grief that crossed her face as she bent down her head to kiss the hand he gave her, could have been seen. It was gone as soon as she raised her eyes again, and her countenance was bright and cheerful, when he said, Again my will, although I wend, I may not always dwell in here, for everything shall have an end, and friends are not a I fear. And skilled in all the law of old ballads almost as much as himself, she answered at once from that beautiful song of the days of the Black Prince. For friendship and for gift is good, for meat and drink, so great plenty that lord that wrought was on the rood he kept the comely company on sea or land where that ye may be he govern you withouteth grieve so good disport ye hand made me again my will i take my leave and after again kissing his hand she let him depart keeping down by a great effort the tears that struggled to rise up into her eyes 
but she would not for the world have suffered one weak emotion to appear before her kinsman, whose character she knew right well, and over whom she proposed at once to assume an influence which could only be gained by the display of a firm and superior mind. "'And who may that young lord be, pretty Ella?' asked Nicholas Brune. "'He seems to take great heed of you, dear kinswoman, and is evidently too high a bird to mate with one of our feather.' "'Mate with me?' answered Ella in a scornful tone. "'No, no, cousin mine. He will mate ere long with one of the sweetest ladies within the shores of merry England, who has been most kind to me, too.' He is a friend of the king, and when poor old Murdoch Brune, my grandsire, and your uncle, was killed by a fiend of a courtier trampling him under his horse's feet, that gentleman, who saw the deed, threw the monster back from his horse and afterwards represented my case to the king, who punished the manslayer and sent me fifty half-nobles. Nicholas Brune was affected in two very opposite ways by Ella's words. "'My uncle killed by a courtier!' he exclaimed at first with his eyes flashing fire. What was his name, maiden? What was his name? Sir Simeon of Royden, answered Ella Brune, and seeking a scrap of parchment and a reed pen, the goldsmith wrote down the name, as if to prevent it from escaping his memory. But the moment after, his mind reverted to the other part of Ella's speech. Fifty half-nobles, he exclaimed, taking a piece of gold out of a drawer and looking at it. That was a princely gift indeed, Ella, and you owe the young gentleman much gratitude for getting it for you. I owe him and his fair lady love more than I can ever repay for many an act beside, answered Ella Brune, but I am resolved, my good kinsman, that I will discharge part of the debt of gratitude, if not the whole. I have a plan in my head, cousin, I have a plan, which I know not whether I will tell you or not. Take counsel, always take counsel, answered the goldsmith. "'I want none, fair kinsman,' replied Ella. "'I need neither counsel nor help. "'My own wit shall be my counsellor, "'and as I am rich now, I can always get aid when I want it.' "'Rich!' said Nicholas. "'What, with fifty half-nobles, pretty maid? "'It is a heavy sum, truly, but soon spent.' "'Were that all,' rejoined Ella, "'I should not count myself very rich, "'but I have more than that, cousin, "'enough to dower me to as gay a citizen as any in Ghent. But here seem a number of gallants gathering round the gate of the Gravenstein. I will back into the far part of the shop, and we will talk more hereafter. While this conversation had been going on between Nicholas and Ella Brune, Richard of Woodville, followed by the goldsmith's man, had hurried back to the inn, and directed Ned Dyram to deliver over the coffer belonging to the minstrel girl, which had been brought, not without some inconvenience, on the back of one of the mules that carried his own baggage. The young gentleman did not remark that, in executing this order, Ned Dyram questioned the lad cunningly, and busy, to say sooth, in paying his score to the host, and making his final preparations for departure, he forgot for the time his fair companion of the way, quite satisfied that she was safe and comfortable under the roof of her kinsman. Sometime before the hour appointed, Woodville was in the court of the old castle, with his men armed and mounted, in very different guise from their peaceful habiliments of the morning. He contented himself with sending in a page to inform the Count that he was ready, and remained standing by his horse's side, while several of those who had been chosen by the young Burgundian prince as his companions entered through the old gate and paused to admire with open eyes the splendid array of the English band, each man armed in plate of the newest and most approved form, according to his degree, and each bearing, slung over his shoulder, the green quiver filled with the fatal English arrows which turned so often the tide of battle in the olden time. After having waited for about ten minutes, the page whom Woodville had sent came back, and conducted him into the castle, where, in a suite of rooms occupying the basement story of one of the towers, he found the young Count, armed and ready to mount. "'Here is your lodging after we return,' said the prince rapidly. "'I wished to show it to you, ere we set out. "'These four chambers and one above. "'Your horses must be quartered out. "'And now, my friend, let us to the saddle. "'The rest have come, I think.' "'And speeding through the passages to the courtyard, "'he welcomed gracefully the gentlemen assembled, "'sprang upon his horse's back and, followed by his train, "'rode out over the private bridge belonging to the castle.' "'bending his steps upon the road to the French frontier. "'The Count himself and the small body that accompanied him 
amounting in all to about a hundred men, were all armed after the heavy and cumbersome fashion of those days, and each of the several parties of which the troop was composed had with them one or two led horses or mules loaded with spare arms and clothing. Considering weight and encumbrances, they moved forward at a very rapid rate, certainly not less than seven miles an hour, and pausing nowhere but to give water to the horses, they had advanced nearly eight leagues on their way ere nightfall. A few minutes after, through the faint twilight which remained in the sky, Richard of Woodville perceived some spires and towers, rising at a short distance over the flat country before them and on his asking one of the gentlemen, with whom he had held a good deal of conversation during their journey, what town it was they were approaching, the reply was Courtray. Here the Count of Charolois stopped for about an hour, but while the horses and most of his attendants contrived to obtain some very tolerable food, the young prince neither ate nor drank, but with a mind evidently anxious and disturbed, walked up and down the hall, occasionally talking to Richard of Woodville, the only one who exercised the same abstinence, but never mentioning either the end or object of their journey. A little after eight o'clock the whole party were in the saddle once more, and judging from the direction which they took as they issued forth from the gates of Courtray, the gentleman who had been the young Englishman's principal companion on the road informed him that they must be going to Lille. In about two hours and a half more that city was seen by the light of the moon, and after causing the gates to be opened, the Count took his way through the streets, but did not direct his course to the chateau, usually inhabited by the Flemish Counts. Alighting at the principal hostelry of the place, he turned to the gentleman who followed, saying, "'Here we must wait for the first news that to-morrow may bring. Make yourself at ease, noble lords. I am tired, and will to bed.' Without farther explanation, he retired at once with his personal attendants, and his followers proceeded to amuse themselves as best they might. Richard of Woodville remained with his comrades of the road for about an hour, and during that time much of the rough asperity of fresh acquaintance was brushed away. He then followed the example of the young Count, in order to rise refreshed the next morning. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of Agincourt: A Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Those who were left behind. The morning after the departure of Richard of Woodville dawned clear and bright upon the city of Ghent, and the hour of seven found a small party assembled in a neat wooden house not many yards within the Brabant Gate, at the cheerful meal of breakfast. With dagger in hand and hearty good will, Nicholas Brune was hewing away at a huge capon, which, with a pickled boar's head, formed the staple of the meal, helping his good buxom dame and Ella Brune to what he considered choice pieces, and praising the fare with more exuberance than modesty, considering that he was the lord of the feast. Madame Brune, as we should call her in the present day, but known in Ghent by a more homely appellation which may be translated wife Broom, was a native of the good city, and by his marriage with her, Nicholas had not only obtained a considerable sum of money, but also various advantages, which placed him nearly, if not altogether, on a footing with the born citizens, so that, for his fair better half, he had great respect and devotion, as in duty bound. For Ella his reverence had been greatly increased by finding that she was endowed with a quality very engaging in his opinion, namely, wealth, for the sum which she possessed, though but a trifle in our eyes, was in those days no inconsiderable fortune, as I have already taken the liberty of hinting. I must not, however, do the worthy goldsmith injustice, and suffer the reader to believe that, had Ella appeared poor and friendless, as he had last seen her, Nicholas Brune would have shown her aught but kindness, for he was a good-hearted and right-minded man, but it is not attributing too much to the influence of the precious metals in which he worked, to admit that, certainly, he always took them into account in computing the degree of respect which he was bound to pay to others. He would not have done any dishonest or evil act to obtain a whole Peruvian mine, if such a thing had been within the sphere of his imagination 
but still the possession of such a mind would have greatly enhanced in the eyes of nicholas broom the qualities of any one who might chance to be its proprietor the only thing indeed which puzzled him in the present instance was how his old uncle could assume the garb of a wandering and not generally respected race when he had by him a sum which set him above all chance of want at first he fancied that the old man's love of music which was to him who did not know one note from another a separate marvel might be the motive the ruling passion strong in death but then he thought that good old murdoch might have made sweet melody just as well in his own house as in wandering from court to court and fair to fair but immediately after remembering the old man's peculiar religious notions with which he was well acquainted he concluded that zeal in which he could fully sympathize must have been the cause of conduct that seemed so strange this was an inducement he could understand for though on no other points was he of an enthusiastic and vehement character yet he was so in matters of faith and if he could have made up his mind to any sort of death it would have been that of a martyr but to say truth he could not bring himself to prefer any way of leaving the world and thought one as disagreeable as another thus he arrived at the conclusion that his uncle was quite right in using any means to conceal both his wealth and his religion however as i have said he viewed ella with a very placable countenance invited her to eat and drink and as his mind reverted to what she had said in regard to paying for her food and lodging he treated it with a mixture of jest and argument which showed her that he would receive something though not too much why my fair cousin he said when she recurred to the subject in this good town of ghent all is at so base a price that men live for nothing and are expected to sell their goods for nothing i can tell you now look at that capon a fatter one never carried its long legs about a stack of corn and yet it costs but six liards you will pay a sterling or maybe two for such a one in london and here you might get a priest as fat to sing a mass for the same money god help the mummers ella however replied that she would settle her share with his dame for so long as she stayed and was proceeding to let her good-humoured cousin into some of her views and intentions foreseeing that she might need his countenance and assistance when the outer door opened and after a knock at that of the room in which they sat ned dyram entered to inquire after his fair companion of the way ella knew not whether to be pleased or sorry to see him but surprised she certainly was for she had thought he was far away from ghent with his lord the cause of these contrary emotions was simply that she felt little pleasure in the man's society and less in the love that he professed towards her and yet having made up her mind to take advantage of the passion he experienced or affected to work out her own purposes she saw that his remaining in ghent might greatly facilitate her views but the game she had to play was a delicate one for she had resolved for no object whatsoever to give encouragement to his suit but rather to leave him to divine her wishes and promote them if he would than ask aught at his hands though carried on by that eager and enthusiastic spirit which lingers longer in the breast of woman than in that of man from which indeed everything in life tends to expel it his own wearing passions his habits of indulgence the hard lessons of experience and the checks of repeated disappointment yet she felt somewhat alarmed at the new course before her perhaps she was not quite sure though the end ever in view was high and noble self-devoted and generous that the means were right to have followed richard of woodville through the world to have watched over him as a guardian spirit to have sacrificed for his sake and for his happiness all anything peace security comfort and even her own fame i do not say her own honour for she would not have scrupled but she might ask herself at that moment whether it was right and just to sport with the love of another to use it for her purpose even to suffer it when she knew that it could never be returned and yet woman's eye is very keen and that selfishness which frequently bears such a large share in man's love was so apparent in her view in all dyram's actions 
that she could not but feel less compunction for suffering him to pamper himself with hopes than if he had been of a nobler and a higher nature whatever were the ideas that crossed her mind and kept her silent for a moment they rapidly passed away and when her cousin after gazing at the intruder for an instant asked who he was and what he wanted she answered for him in a gay tone affecting the coquettish airs then very common in a higher class oh he is a servant of mine nicholas bowed to the tip of my finger i do not intend ever to have him but if the poor creature is resolved to sigh at my feet i must in let him pray you give him welcome what news servant how is it that you have not followed your lord because replied ned Darham, i love best to stay with my lady nay answered ella Broom, call me not your lady you are my servant but i am yours not at all either as lady or servant you have not yet merited such grace in this light and jesting tone she continued to treat him and though perhaps such conduct might have repelled a more sensitive and delicate lover with ned Dyram it but added fuel to the fire each day he came to visit each day returned with stronger passion in his heart jest indeed which was far from natural to her character or to her feelings at the time ella could not always keep up though great and stern resolution is often the source of a certain bitter mirth at minor things but in every graver moment she spoke to Dyer of Richard of Woodville and of Mary Markham, for as yet she knew her by no other name. She did so studiously, and yet so calmly and easily, that not the slightest suspicion of the real feelings in her heart ever crossed the mind of her hearer. Of Mary she told him far more than he had hitherto gathered from his companions in Woodville's train, and dwelt long upon her beauty, her gentleness, her kindness following closely her object she even found means to hint one day a regret that she had not been permitted to follow the young englishman on his expedition what would i have given she said to have had your chance of going with him and yet you chose to remain behind indeed fair ella he exclaimed what made you so anxious to go nay answered the girl with a mysterious look do you expect me to tell you my secrets bold man i would give a chain of gold however to be able to follow your master about the world for just twelve months if it could be done without risking my own fair name oh for one of those fairy girdles that made the wearer invisible methinks you love him mistress ella replied ned Dyram, more from pique than suspicion but ella answered boldly and at once though he had touched the wound somewhat roughly yes i do love him well she answered and i have cause servant of mine but it is not for that i have a vow i have a purpose and though they must be executed i know not well how to do so i ought not to have left him even now i dare say he would have taken you if you had asked him replied the man and what would men have said demanded ella what would you have thought yourself what might your young lord have thought though he is not so foolish as yourself most likely you would all have done me wrong in your fancies no no if i go it must be secretly but there get you gone i will tell you no more nay tell on sweet ella exclaimed ned Dyram, and perhaps i may aid you get you gone i say replied ella Broom. i will tell you no more at least for the present you help me why were i to trust to you for help in such a matter as this should i not put myself entirely in your power but i would never misuse it ella answered ned Dyram. no no she exclaimed i will never put myself in any man's power unless i suffer him to put a ring upon my finger and then of course i am as much his slave as if he had a ring round my neck there leave me leave me you may come again to-morrow and see if i am in a better mood i feel cross to-day ned Dyram retired but he was destined to return before the day was over and to bring her tidings which however unpleasant in themselves rendered his coming welcome as he took his way back towards the inn just at the corner of the vendredi market-place he met a party of travellers and heard the english tongue but he took little heed for his thoughts were full of ella Broom, and he had passed half across the square when one of the horsemen rode after him and said his lord desired to speak with him ned Dyram looked up and at once remembered the man's face 
for reasons of his own, however, he suffered not the slightest trace of recognition to appear on his own countenance. As the horseman spoke in English, he replied in the same tongue, asking who was his master, and what he wanted. "'He is an English knight,' replied the servant, "'and what he wants he will tell you himself.' "'But I am not fond of trusting myself in English knights' hands,' answered Ned Dyram. "'They sometimes use one badly. "'So tell me his name, or I do not go.' "'His name is Sir Simeon of Royden,' replied the man. "'A very good name, isn't it?' "'Oh, yes, I will go to him,' replied Ned Dyram. "'He used to be about the court when I was a greater man than I am now.' And he walked straight up to the spot where Sir Simeon of Royden had halted his horse, and lowly doffed his bonnet as he approached. "'My knave tells me,' said the knight, "'that you are a servant of the king's. Is it so?' "'It was so once, sir.' "'replied Ned Dyram, and then added, looking round to the servant who had followed him. "'So, it was he who told you. I do not remember him.' "'Perhaps not,' answered the knight. "'But you came up with him once, when he was following a young woman in whom I take some interest. "'Do you know where she is now?' "'It may be so,' replied Ned Dyram. "'But I talk not of such things in the street, good sir.' "'Simeon of Royden paused and mused, gazing in the man's face the while. "'Whom do you serve now?' he demanded at length. "'Why, I am employed by no one at present,' said Ned Dyram, "'not exactly telling a falsehood, but implying one. "'Well, then, come to me to-night, some time after sunset,' rejoined Sir Simeon, "'and we will speak more. "'You know the convent of the Dominicans. "'I am to lodge there, for the prior is my cousin. "'Ask for Sir Simeon of Royden, or the English knight, "'and the porter will show you my lodging.' "'At the Dominicans!' cried Ned Dyram. "'Why, you are not going thither now. "'At least that is not the way.' "'Is it not?' exclaimed the knight. "'Why, this fellow agreed to guide me.' "'And he pointed to a man in the dress of a peasant who accompanied them. "'Then he is guiding you wrong,' replied Ned Dyram. "'Go straight up that street, follow the course of the river to the left, "'and when you have passed the second bridge, turn up to the right, cross the Lees, "'and you will see the Dominicans right before you. "'He was taking you to the Carmelites.' "'Well, don't fail to come,' rejoined Sir Simeon of Royden. "'And then he rode on, pouring no very measured abuse upon the head of his guide. "'The moment he was gone, Dyram hurried back to Ella Brun, "'and a long and eager conversation ensued between them "'of a very different tone and character from any which had taken place before. "'Ella was obliged to trust and to confide in him.' to tell her reasons for abhorring and shrinking from the sight of one whom her evil fortune seemed continually to bring across her path, and to consult with him on the means to be employed for the purpose of concealing her presence in Ghent from Royden's eyes, and of discovering what chance had brought him to the same city so soon after herself. Nothing, perhaps, could have given Dyron more satisfaction than this result. The new relations which it established between Ella and himself the opportunities which it promised of serving, assisting her, and laying her under obligations, the constant excuse which it afforded for seeing her, and consulting with her on subjects of deep interest to herself, were all points which afforded him much gratification. But that was not all. He fancied that he saw the means of obtaining a power over her, a command as well as an influence. Vague schemes presented themselves to his mind of entangling her in a chain that she could not break, of binding her to himself by ties that she could not shake off, and of using the haughty and vicious knight, whose character he easily estimated, from the information now given him by Ella, as a tool for the accomplishment of his own purposes. I have said that these schemes were vague, and perhaps they might never have taken any more definite a form, had not other events occurred which led him to carry them out almost against his own will. Man in the midst of circumstances is like one in a Delian labyrinth, where a thousand paths are ready to confound him, a thousand turnings to lead him to the same end, and that end disappointment, while but one of all the many ways can reach the issue of success. That night, soon after sunset, Dyram stood before the gate of the Dominican monastery, and ringing the bell, asked the porter for the lodging of Sir Simeon of Royden. It was evident to him that orders had been given for his admission, for without any inquiry he was immediately shown to a small chamber, where he found the knight alone. A curious contest of the wits then ensued, 
for the night was shrewd and had determined, if it were within the scope of possibility, to gain from Ned Dyram all the information he could afford, and Dyram, on the contrary, had resolved to give none but that which suited his purpose. Both were keen and cunning men, neither very scrupulous, each selfish in a high degree, though in a somewhat different line, and both eager and fiery in pursuit of their objects. The first question of the night to Ned Dyram was what had brought him to Ghent. "'I came hither,' he replied at once, "'with Master Richard of Woodville.' The knight's brow was covered by a sudden cloud, and he demanded in a sharp tone, "'Is he here now? Are you his servant, then?' "'He is not here now,' answered the man. "'He has gone on with the Count de Charolois, and did not think fit to take me with him any further.' "'Then you are out of employment?' asked the knight. "'For the present I am,' said Ned Dyram. "'But I shall soon find as much as I want. I am never at a loss, sir knight.' "'That is lucky for yourself,' replied Simeon of Royden and then abruptly added, "'Will you take service with me?' "'No,' answered Dyron bluntly. "'I will take service with no one any more. I was not meant for a varlet. I can do better things than be the serving man of any knight or noble.' "'What can you do?' demanded Royden, with a somewhat sarcastic smile. "'What can I not?' exclaimed Dyron. "'I can read better than a priest, write better than a clerk. I can speak languages that will make your ears tingle without understanding what you heard.' I can compound all essences and drugs, I can work in gold, silver, or iron, and I know some secrets that would well nigh raise the dead. Indeed, said the knight, then you must be a monk or a doctor of Oxford. Neither, replied the man, but I see you disbelieve me. Shall I give you a proof of what I can do? Yes, answered Simeon, I should like to see some spice of your skill. "'In what way shall it be?' asked Ned Dyram. "'If you will order up some charcoal with this little instrument and these pinchers, "'I will make you a chain to go round your wrist out of a gold noble. "'Or if there be a Greek book in the monastery, "'I will read you a page therefrom, and expound it, "'in the presence of whom you will, as a judge. "'For well I watch you yourself know nothing about it.' "'Nor wish to know,' replied the knight. "'But I will have neither of these experiments. "'The one will be too long, the other too tedious. "'You said that you had secrets that would well nigh raise the dead. "'I have heard of such things, and I should like to see them tried.' "'Would you not be afraid?' asked Ned Dyram. "'No. Why?' answered Sir Simeon of Royden. "'The dead cannot hurt me.' "'Assuredly.' said Ned Dyram, but yet when we call for those who are in their graves, we can never surely tell who may come. It is not always the spirit we wish that answers to our voice, and that man's heart must be singularly free, who, in the days of fiery youth, has done no deed towards the silent and the cold that might make him shrink to see them rise from their dull bed of earth and look him in the face again. I am not afraid, said Royden after a moment's thought. Do it if you can. Nay, I said I had secrets that would well nigh raise the dead, answered Ned Dyram. I neither told you that they would, nor that I was willing. Ha! It seems to me you are a boaster, my good friend, exclaimed the knight with a sneer. Can you do anything in this sort, or can you not? I am no boaster, proud knight, replied Ned Dyram in an angry tone, and I only say what I am able to perform. Tis you that make it more than I ever did say. "'But if you would know what I can do, I tell you I can raise the dead for my own eye, though not for yours. "'The last great secret I have not yet obtained, but I trust ere long to do so, "'and as you are incredulous, like all other ignorant men, I will give you proof this very night.' "'But how shall I know if I do not see the shapes myself?' demanded Sir Simeon of Royden. "'I will tell you what I behold,' rejoined the man, "'and you must judge for yourself.' Those whom I call up shall all have some reference to you. Have you a mirror there? Yes, replied the knight, and while he rose to search for one, Dyram strewed some small round balls upon the table, jet black in colour and apparently soft. The knight brought forward one of the small round polished mirrors of the day, which generally formed part of the travelling apparatus of both sexes in the higher class, and setting it upright, Dyron brought each of the little balls for a single instant to the flame of the lamp, and laid them down before the mirror. A thin white smoke of a faint but delicate odour instantly rose up and spread through the room, producing a feeling of languor in those who breathed the perfume, 
and giving a ghastly likeness to all things round, and kneeling down before the table, Ned Dyram gazed into the glass, pronouncing several words in a strange tongue, unintelligible to the knight. The moment after his eyes opened wide, and seemed almost starting from his head, and the knight exclaimed eagerly, "'What is it you see?' "'I see,' replied the man, "'a gentleman in a black robe seated at a table, "'and he looks very sad. "'He is young and handsome, too, "'with coal-black hair curling round his brow. "'Has he no mark by which I can distinguish him?' "'asked the knight. "'Yes,' answered Dyram, "'but it matters not for him, "'as I see he is amongst the living. "'It is the absent who generally come first, "'and then the dead. "'However, here's a scar upon his right cheek "'as if from an old wound.' "'Sir Henry Dacre,' murmured Royden. "'Try again, man, try again, and let it be the dead this time.' Dyron pronounced some more words, apparently in the same language, and then a smile came upon his countenance. "'A sweet and beautiful lady,' he said. "'How proudly she walks, as if earth were not good enough to bear her. "'Ha! How is that?' And as he spoke, his face assumed a look of terror. His lip quivered, his eyes stared, and the countenance of Sir Simeon of Royden turned deadly pale. "'What do you see?' demanded the knight in a voice scarcely audible. "'What do you see?' "'She walks by a stream,' cried Dyram in a terrible tone, "'and the sun is just below the sky. "'Someone meets her, and they talk. "'He seizes her by the throat. "'She struggles. "'He holds fast. "'He casts her into the river. "'Hark how she shrieks. "'She sinks. "'She rises. "'She shrieks again. "'Oh, God, someone help her. "'She is gone.' All was silent in the room for a minute, and Ned Dyram, wiping his brow as if recovering from some great excitement, gazed round him by the light of the lamp. Simeon of Royden had sunk into a seat, and his face was so ashy pale, the lids of his eyes so tightly closed, that for a moment his companion thought he had fainted. The instant after, however, he murmured, "'Ah, necromancer!' and then starting up exclaimed, "'What horrible vision is this?' "'Who is it thou hast seen?' "'Nay, I know not,' answered Ned Dyram. "'How can I tell? They spoke not. "'Twas but a sight. "'But one thing is certain, "'that either the man or the woman "'is closely allied to you in some way.' "'What was he like?' demanded the knight abruptly. "'It was so dark when he came "'that I could not see him well,' replied Dyram. "'He was a tall, fair man, but that was all I saw.' The lady was more clearly visible, for when she came there was a soft evening light in the sky. "'Why, fool, it has been dark these two hours,' cried the knight. "'Not in that glass,' answered the other. "'When she appeared first it was a calm sunset, and I saw her well. But it speedily grew dark, and then I could describe nothing but her form, first struggling with her murderer, and then with the deep waters.' "'Her murderer?' repeated Simeon of Royden. "'Her murderer, what was she like?' "'A vain and haughty beauty, I should say,' replied the man, "'with dark hair and seemingly dark eyes, "'a proud and curling lip, and—' "'Enough, enough,' answered Simeon of Royden, "'with resumed composure. "'I know her by your description and by the facts, "'but in the man you are mistaken. "'He was a dark man who did the deed, "'or suspicion belies him. "'Twas a fair man that I saw,' rejoined Dyram in a decided tone, of that at least I am sure, though the shadows were too deep to let me view his face distinctly. Shall I look again to see any more, Sir Knight? No, no, it is sufficient, cried Simeon of Royden somewhat sharply. I see you have not overstated what you can do. Hearken to me, I will give you employment in your own way, much or little as you like. I would fain hear more of this girl, Ella Brune, of where she is and what she is doing. I would fain find her, speak with her, but I am discomposed to-night. This lady that you saw but now was very dear to me. Her sad fate affects me deeply even now. See how I am shaken by these memories. And in truth his hand, which he stretched forth to lay the mirror flat upon the table, trembled so that he nearly let it fall. But of this girl, Ella Brune, he continued, have you known her long? Know you where she is now? "'Nay, I was but sent to bear her a letter from Richard of Woodville, "'and to counsel her from him, to go to York,' replied Dyram. "'Then, as to where she is, I cannot say exactly, not to a point, that is to say, "'but I can soon learn if I am well entreated and well paid.' 
"'That you shall be,' rejoined the knight. "'Come to me tomorrow early, and we will talk more. "'Tonight I am unfit. "'Here is some gold for you, for what you have done. "'Good night. Good night.'" End of chapter 24Chapter 25 of Agincourt, A Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Enterprise The young Count of Charolois stood in the courtyard of the inn about nine o'clock on the morning that followed his arrival in Lille, with a letter in his hand, and a countenance not altogether well pleased. There was a gentleman beside him, somewhat advanced in years, bearing knightly spurs upon his heels, and armed at all points but the head, the grey hair of which was partly covered with a small velvet cap, and to him the prince spoke eagerly, while the various persons who had attended him from Ghent stood at a respectful distance, waiting his commands as to their future proceedings. Richard of Woodville had not remarked the old knight with the band before, and turning to one of the young nobles with whom he had formed some acquaintance, he asked who he was. "'Why do you not know?' exclaimed his companion. "'That is Sir Walter, Lord of Rook, one of our most renowned leaders. "'He has just arrived from Douai, they say, "'but the Count seems angry with that letter the courier brought him from Paris. "'Things are going ill there, I doubt, and we shall soon have a levy of arms. "'That court is full of fetures and treachers, "'a crop of bad corn which wants Burgundian hands to thin it.' "'I trust that you will permit a poor Englishman to put in a sickle,' said Woodville, laughing, "'or at least to have the gleanings of the field.' "'Oh, willingly, willingly,' replied the young lord, with better wit than might have been expected. "'I cannot but think your good sovereigns in England have been but hesitating till other arms have begun the harvest, in order to take full gleanings of that poor land. But see, the Count is looking round to us.' "'Hearken, my lords,' said the Count, it is my father's will that I should remain in Lille, while this noble knight rides on an expedition of some peril to the side of Tournay. He says the Lord of Rook has men enough for what is wanted, and that some of you must abide with me here, but still I will permit any gentleman to go who may choose to do so, provided a certain number stay with me, so make your election. The young nobles of Burgundy were rarely unwilling to take the field, but in the present instance— there were two or three motives which operated to make them in general decide in favour of staying with the Count of Charolois. In the first place, they knew of no enterprise that could be achieved on the side of Tournay, which offered either glory or profit. There were a few bands of revolted peasantry and brigands in that quarter, whom the Count had threatened to suppress, but such a task was somewhat distasteful to them. In the second place, they were not insensible to the fact that by choosing to stay with the prince, they offered him an indirect compliment, which was especially desirable at a moment when he seemed angry at not being permitted to lead them himself. And in the third place, the Lord of Rook was inferior in rank to most of them, though superior in military reputation, and he was, moreover, known to be a somewhat strict disciplinarian, a quality by no means agreeable either to the French or Burgundian gentlemen. "'I came to serve under you, my lord the Count,' said the young Ingram de Croix, "'and if you do not go, and I am permitted to choose where you stay, I will remain.' The old lord of Rook gazed at him coldly, but made no observation, and the same feeling was found general, till the Count turned with a smile to Richard of Woodville, asking his choice. "'Why, my noble lord,' replied the young Englishman, if I could serve you here, I should be willing enough to stay, but as that is not the case, I had better serve you elsewhere, and wherever this good knight goes, doubtless there will be some honour to be gained under his pennon. Walter of Rook still remained silent, but he did not forget the willingness of the foreign gentleman, and one very young noble of Burgundy, whose fortune and fame were yet to make. Taking courage at Woodville's words, proposed to go also. "'I have but few men with me, my lord the Count,' he said, with the modesty which was affected, if not felt, by all young men in chivalrous times, and, as you know, I have but small experience, wishing to gain which I will, by your good leave, serve under the lord of Woodville here, who, I think you said, had been already in several stricken fields, and was a comrade of the noble King of England. King Henry calls him his friend, Monsieur Le Long, 
in his letter to me, replied the Count, and I know he has gained loss in several battles, though I have been told that he was disappointed of his spurs at Bramham Moor. He did not pronounce the word very accurately, because such was the trust placed in his discretion, that he was sent to the late king just before the fight, when no one else could be trusted. Again Richard of Woodville marvelled to find his whole history so well known, but the Count went on immediately to add to the young Englishman's troop ten of his own men-at-arms. "'You, Monsieur Le Long, brought seven, I think,' he said, "'so that will be some small reinforcement to your menet, my Lord of Rook.' And drawing that gentleman aside, the Prince whispered to him for some moments. "'Willingly, willingly, fair sir,' replied the old knight, to whatever it was, he said. "'God forbid I should stay any noble gentleman anxious to do doughty deeds. "'He shall have the cream of it, and it shall go hard if I give him not the means to win the spurs. "'Monsieur de Woodville, I set out in half an hour. "'I will but have some bread and a cup of wine, and then am ready for your good company.' "'But little preparation was needed, for all had been kept ready to set out at a moment's notice. "'Nevertheless, in the little arrangements which took place ere they departed,' They sprang up between Richard of Woodville and the Lord of Long, what may be called the intimacy of circumstances. The young Burgundian, though brave and well practised in the use of arms, was diffident, from inexperience, of more active and perilous scenes than the tilt-yard of his father's castle, or the jousting lists in the neighbouring town, and he was well satisfied to place himself under the immediate direction of one who, like Richard of Woodville, had fought in general engagements and served in regular armies. He had also some dread of the Lord of Rook, but by fusing his party into the English gentleman's band, he placed another between himself and the severe old soldier, so that he trusted to escape the harsh words which their commander was not unaccustomed to use. To Woodville, then, he applied for information regarding every particular of his conduct, how he was to place his men, where he was to ride himself, and a thousand other particulars, making his companion smile sometimes at the timidity, which he had personally never known, from having been accustomed, even in boyhood, to the troublous times and continual dangers which followed the usurpation of the throne by the first of the Lancastrian house. While they were conversing over these matters, one of the pages of the Count of Charolois joined them from the inn, and bade the English gentleman follow him to the prince. The Count was alone in a small bedroom upstairs, and the temporary vexation which his countenance had expressed some time before had now quite passed away. He met Richard with a laughing countenance, and holding out his hand to him, exclaimed, addressing him by the name he had given him ever since their first interview, "'God speed you, my friend. These rash nobles of ours have taken themselves in, and though stern old de Rook does not wish it mentioned that he is going on such an errand, I would have you know it, that you may take advantage of opportunity. I love you better for going with him than staying with me, as you may well judge, when I tell you that his object is to meet my father, and guard him from Paris to Lille, if the Duke can effect his escape from the French court. My father would not have me come, for he is likely to be pursued, it seems, and he says in his letter that should mischance befall him while I remain in Lille, there will still be a Duke of Burgundy to crush this swarm of Armagnac bees, even should they sting him to death. However, you must not tell de Rook that I have given you such tidings, for if he knew it, he would scold me like a Newport fishwoman, with as little reverence as he would a horse-boy. I will be careful, my good lord, replied Richard of Woodville, but if such be the case, had we better not have more men with us? Six or seven and twenty make but a small band against all the chivalry of France. Oh, he has got two hundred iron-handed fellows beyond the gates, replied the prince. But hark, there is his voice. Quick, quick, you must not stay. And hurrying down into the little square before the hostel, the young Englishman found the men drawn up, and the Lord of Rook with a page holding his horse, and his foot in the stirrup. Ah, you are long, sir said the old knight, swinging himself slowly up into the saddle. Nevertheless, Richard of Woodville was on horseback before him, for laying his hand upon his charger's shoulder, he vaulted at once, armed at all points as he was, into the seat, and in another instant was at the head of his men. "'The boy's trick,' said the old soldier with a smile. 
Never think, young gentleman, that you can make up for present delay by after activity. It is a dangerous fancy. I know it, my good lord, replied Richard of Woodville, but I had to speak with my lord the Count before I departed. Well, sir, well, answered the lord of Rook, when wheeling round his horse he gazed over the little band, marking especially the fine military appearance, sturdy limbs, and powerful horses of the English archers, with evident satisfaction. Ah, he said, good stuff, good stuff. Have they seen service? Most of them, replied Richard of Woodville. They shall see more, I trust, before I have done with them, rejoined the old knight. Come, let us go. March. And leading the way through the streets of Lille, a little in advance of the rest of the party, while Richard of Woodville and the young Lord of Long followed side by side at the head of their men, he soon reached the gates of the city without exchanging a word with any one by the way. "'Why, this is strange,' said the Lord of Lon to his companion, in a low voice, as they turned up towards the side of Douai, instead of taking the road to Tournay. "'This is not the march that the Count said was laid out for us. The old man knows his road, I suppose.' "'No fear of that,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'Our business, comrade, is to follow and to ask no questions. Perhaz there is better luck for us than we expected.' Commanders do not always tell their soldiers what they are leading them to. And turning his head as they came forth into the broad open road which extended to Peron, through the numerous strong towns at that time comprised in the Flemish possessions of the House of Burgundy, he gave orders in French and English for his men to form in a different order, nine abreast. Some little embarrassment was displayed in executing this manoeuvre, and he had to explain and direct several times before it was performed to his satisfaction. The Lord of Rook looked round and watched the whole proceeding, but made no observation, and after proceeding for about two miles farther on the way, Woodville again changed the order of his men, when the old commander suddenly demanded, "'What are you playing such tricks for?' "'For a good reason, sir,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'I have men under me who have never been accustomed to act together.' "'My own people, those of this young lord, and the men of arms of my lord the Count. "'I know not how soon you may call upon us for service, or what that service may be, "'and it is needful that they should have some practice, that they may be alert at their work. "'I have learnt that, in time of need, it does not do to lose even a minute in forming line.' "'Ah, you Englishmen,' replied the old lord, "'we're always better aware of that fact than we are.' There would never have been a Cressy if Frenchmen would have submitted to discipline. They will fight like devils, but each man has such an opinion of himself that he will fight in his own way, forgetting that one well-trained man who obeys orders promptly is better than a hundred who do nothing but what they like themselves. Ride up and talk with me, young men. I do not see why we should not be friends together, though those satin jackets at Lille did not choose to march with old Walter de Rock. After speaking with some bitterness of the turbulent spirit and insubordination which existed in all continental armies, the Lord of Rook led the conversation to the military condition of England, and inquired particularly into the method, not only of training the soldiers of that country, but of educating the youths throughout the land to the early use of arms, which he had heard was customary there. "'Ay, there is a difference between you and us,' he said, when Woodville had explained the facts to him. You are all soldiers, and your yeomen, as you call them, are as serviceable as your knights and gentlemen. With us, who would ever think of taking a boar from the plough to make a man at arms of him? No one dares to put a steel cap on his head, unless he has some gentle blood in his veins, though it be but half a drop, and then he is as conceited of it as if he were descended from Charlemagne. I have charged to give you, sir, the best occasions." he continued, still addressing Woodville, and I will not fail, for I see you know what you are about, and will do me no discredit. I beseech you, my good lord, to let me share them with him, said Monsieur de Long. I am as eager for renown as any man can be. You will share them, of course, as one of his band, replied the old soldier, and I doubt not, young gentleman, will do very well. I will refuse honour to no one who wins it. And thus conversing, they rode on as far as pont de marc where they found a large body of men-at-arms waiting for the old lord of Rue. Richard of Woodville remarked that they were most of them, 
middle-aged men with hard and weather-beaten countenances, who had evidently seen a good deal of service. But he observed also that, probably from the unwillingness of the Burgundian nobility to submit to anything like strict discipline, there seemed to be few persons of distinction in the corps, and not one knight but the old lord himself. Without any pause, the whole party marched on to Douai, the young Englishman losing no opportunity of exercising his men in such evolutions as the nature of the ground permitted, and many of the old soldiers of Duroup watching his proceedings in silence, but with an attentive and inquiring eye. At Douai they halted for an hour and a half, to feed their horses and to take some refreshment, and then marching on they did not draw a rein again till Combray appeared in sight. Here all the party expected to remain the night, for Combray, as the reader well knows, is a good day's march from Lille, especially for men covered with heavy armour, and for horses who had to carry not only the weight of their masters and their masters' harness, but still manifères, testières, and chanfrons of their own. The orders of the commander, however, showed them, before they entered the gates, that such repose was not to fall to their lot, for he directed them to seek no hostel, but to quarter themselves without dividing, in the market-place, and there to feed their beasts. "'Tis a fine evening,' he said, "'and you shall have plenty of food and wine, "'but we must march on for an hour or two at night, "'that we may be in time to-morrow. "'If we have more space than enough in the morning, "'why the destriers will be all the fresher.' "'No one ventured to make any reply, "'though the men-at-arms of the Count of Charolois "'felt somewhat weary with their unwanted exertion, and would fain have persuaded themselves that their beasts could go no farther that night. Their leader, or Wagner, who held the rank of a sergeant of the present day, and usually commanded twenty men, went so far as to hint his opinion on the subject to Richard of Woodville, but the young Englishman stopped him in an instant, replying coldly, "'If your horses break down, we must find you others. We have nothing to do but to obey.' The young Englishman took care, however, that the charges of his whole party should have everything that could refresh them, and he spared not his own purse to procure for them a different sort of food from that which was provided for the rest. The crumb of bread soaked in water was a favourite expedient with the English of that day, as it is now with the Germans, for restoring the vigour of a wearied horse, and he made bold to dip the bread in wine, which, on those beasts that would take it, seemed to produce a very great effect. After halting for two hours, the march was renewed, and wending slowly onward, they reached the small town, for it was then a town, of Gonneur, having accomplished a distance of nearly eighteen leagues. It was within half an hour of midnight when they arrived, and the good people of the place had to be roused from their beds to provide them with lodgings, but a party of two hundred men-at-arms was not in that day to be refused anything they might think fit to require, and in the different houses and stables of the town they were all at length comfortably housed. Richard of Woodville was not one of those men who require long sleep to refresh them after any ordinary fatigue, and though with the care and attention of an Arab he spent a full hour in inspecting the treatment of his horses before he lay down to rest, Yet, after a quiet repose of about four hours and a half, he awoke, and instantly sprang from the pallet which had been provided for him. He then immediately roused the young Lord of Long, who, with five or six others, slept in the same chamber. But the poor youth gazed wildly round him, at first seeming to have forgotten where he was, and it required a hint from his English friend that the old Lord of Rook was a man likely to be up early in the day, ere he could make up his mind to rise. Woodville and his companion had been in the stable about five minutes and were just setting the half-awakened horse-boys to their work, when a voice was heard at the door saying, "'This is well, this is as it should be,' and turning round they saw the figure of the old knight moving slowly away to the quarters of another party. In an hour more they were again upon the road, but their march was this day less fatiguing, and Woodville remarked that their veteran leader seemed to expect some intelligence from the country to which they were advancing for at each halting-place he caused inquiries to be made for messengers seeking him, and more than once stopped the peasantry on the road, questioning them strictly, though no one clearly seemed to understand his drift. He seemed, too, to be somewhat undecided as to his course, and talked of going on to Orville, or at least to Conchy, 
but he halted for the night however at tiloloa and quartered his men in that village and saint Nices. woodville and his party were lodged in the latter where also the old commander slept but about three in the morning the young englishman was roused by voices speaking followed by someone knocking at a neighbouring door and half raised upon his arm he was listening to ascertain if possible what was the cause of this interruption of their repose when the door of the room was opened as far as the body of one of the english yeomen who slept across it would permit hallo master woodville said the voice of lord of rook up and to horse your beasts are not broken down i trust they have had time to rest since six last night replied woodville and will be found as fresh as ever for they feed well like all true englishmen answered the old soldier join me below in a minute i have something to say to you dressing himself and giving hasty orders for the horses to be fed and led out the young englishman went down to the ground floor where everything was already in bustle and perhaps in some confusion the lord of rook was surrounded by several of his own officers and was giving them orders in the sharp tones of impatience and hurry ha sir englishman he exclaimed as he saw woodville how long will it take you to be in the saddle half an hour replied richard of woodville and these men want two hours cried the old leader well hark ye and leading woodville aside he whispered tis as well as it is there will be no jealousy get your horses out with all speed and you shall have the cream of the affair as i promised the young count you must know i am bound to meet our good duke at pont saint maxence he makes his escape from paris this morning and as he brings but four men with him i fear there may be those who will try to stop him his plan is to go out to hunt with the king in the forest of Halate, and there to be met by some one bringing him letters as if from flanders requiring his hasty return then he will decently bid the king adieu and ride away i was in hopes to have had time enough to be near at hand with my whole force to give him aid if they pursue or stay him though he tells me in the packet just received to meet him at pont saint maxence however it is well that some should proceed farther and if you can get the start of us you can take the occasion i will not miss it replied woodville but two things must be needful one a letter to the duke and another some one who knows the road and the forest what sort of letter demanded de rook sharply what is the letter for to call the duke back to flanders replied richard of woodville i will be the person to deliver it should need be ay that were as well answered the old knight though doubtless he has arranged already for some one to meet him yet no harm of two it shall be written as if others had been sent before i will call my clerk for of writing i know naught in the meanwhile i will see for a guide answered woodville and going forth he inquired amongst the attendants of the young lord of long and the men-at-arms of the count of charolois for some one who was acquainted with the forest of her late one of the latter had been there in former days and remembered something of the roads with which amount of information richard of woodville was forced to content himself trusting to meet with some peasant on the spot who might guide him better he then gave orders for bringing out the horses without farther delay and for charging each saddle with two feeds of corn and returning to the lord of rook he found him dictating a letter by the light of a lamp to a man with a shaven crown before it was finished for the style of the good knight was not fluent the jingle of arms and the tramp of horses feet were heard before the inn and looking round with a well-satisfied smile the old soldier exclaimed ha this is well this is the way to win los there that will do master peter fold and seal it then for the superscription as you know how some five minutes however were spent upon heating the wax tying up the packet and writing the address during which time richard of woodville looked on with no small impatience fearing that he might be forestalled by others in executing a task which promised some distinction at length all was complete and taking the letter eagerly he hurried out and sprang into the saddle the lord of rook added various cautions and directions walking by the young englishman's horse for some way through the village but at length he left him and putting his troop to a quicker pace woodville rode on towards pont saint maxence End of chapter 25
Chapter Twenty Six of Agincourt, A Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Achievement. The Forest of Halate, of which the Great Forest of Chantilly, as it is called, is in fact but an insignificant remnant, was in the days of Philip of Valois one of the most magnificent woods at that time in Europe giving its name to a whole district in the midst of which was situated the fine old palace and abbey of St. Christopher, or St. Christophle en Halate. The scene of many of the most important transactions in French history. I do not find that the palace was much used in the reign of Charles the Sixth, and it was very possibly going to decay, though the abbey attached to it still remained tenanted by its monks, and the forest still afforded the sport of the chase to the French monarchs and their court, being filled with wolves, stags, boars, and even bears, if we may believe the accounts of the time, which were preserved with more care from all but princely hands than even the subjects of the sovereign. The great variety of the ground, the hills, the dales, the fountains, the cliffs that the district presented, the rivers that intersected it, the deep glades and wild savannas of the forest itself, the villages, the towns, the chapels, the monasteries, which nestled themselves, as it were, into its bosom, the profound solitude of some parts, the busy cultivation of others, the desert-like desolation of certain spots, and the soft, calm monotony of seemingly interminable trees, which was to be found in different tracts, rendered the forest of Helate one of the most interesting and changeful scenes through which the wandering foot of man could rove. Whether he sought the city or the hermitage, whether the grave or the gay, whether the sun or the shade, here he might suit his taste, and the mutations of the sky in winter, in summer, in morning, in evening, in sunshine or in clouds, added new changes to each individual spot, and varied still farther a scene which in itself seemed endless in its variety. About three o'clock on the afternoon of a day in early May, with a cool wind stirring the air and some light vapours floating across the heaven, a gentleman, completely armed except the head, with a lance on his shoulder and a page carrying his casque behind him, rode slowly into one of the wide savannas, following a peasant with a staff in his hand, who seemed to be showing him the way. His horse bore evident signs of having been ridden far that day, without much time for the grooms to do their office in smoothing down his dark brown coat. But nevertheless, though somewhat rough and dusty, the stout beast seemed no way tired, and, to judge by his quick and glancing eye, his bending crest, and the eager rounding of his knee, as if eager to put forth his speed, one would have supposed that he had rested since his journey, and tasted his share of corn." "'Ay, there is a picker of the hunt,' said the gentleman, marking with a glance a man, clothed in green and brown, who stood holding a brace of tall dogs at the angle of one of the roads leading into the heart of the forest. "'You have led us right, good fellow. There is your guerdon.' The peasant took the money, and as it was somewhat more than had been promised, made a low, rude bow and stumped away, and the gentleman, turning to his page, beckoned him up. "'Think you, Will, that you have French enough?' he asked in English, when the boy was close to him, "'to tell them where we are, and what to do.' "'Oh, I will make them understand,' replied the page, with all the confidence of youth. "'I picked up a few words in Ghent, and a few more as we came along, and what tongue won't do, hand and head must.' "'Well, give me the cask," said his master, "'and you take my barret.' and receiving the chapelle de fer from the boy's hands, he placed it on his head, raising the visor till it rested against the crest, and rode slowly on towards the attendant of the chase, who, with all the sportsman's eagerness, was watching down the avenue attentively. "'Good morning, my friend,' said the gentleman in French. "'Good afternoon, sir,' answered the piquer, for the vulgar are always very careful to be exact in their time of day." He did not look round, however, and the stranger went on to inquire if the king were not hunting in the forest. The man now turned and eyed the questioner. His splendid arms showed that he was a gentleman, and he was alone, so that no treason could be intended. "'Yes, sir,' replied the piquer. "'I expect him this way every minute. Do you want to see him?' 
"'Why, not exactly,' said the stranger. "'Some of the people told me the good Duke of Burgundy was with him, "'and, as it is he with whom I want to speak, "'if their report be true, it may save me a ride to Paris.' "'The good Duke is with the King,' rejoined the man, "'but life I know not whether he will be so for long, "'for fortune alters favour, they say, "'and times have changed of late, "'though it is no business of mine, and so I say nothing. "'But the Duke was ever a friend to the Commons,' "'and to the citizens of Paris more than all. "'Have they had good sport to-day?' demanded Richard of Woodville, "'for doubtless the reader has already discovered one of the interlocutors in this dialogue. "'Tis somewhat late in the year, is it not, Picur? "'Aye, that it is for sundry kinds of game,' replied the man. "'But there are some not out, and others just coming in, "'and we are obliged to suit ourselves to the poor old king's health. "'He is free just now from his black sickness,' and would have had a glorious day of it, had not Achille, the subvenor, who is always wrong, and always knows better than any one else, mistaken which way the beast lay. But hark, they are blowing the death, the beast has been killed, and not passed this way, foul fall him. My dogs have not had breath to-day. Then they will not come hither, I suppose, said Richard of Woodville. Oh, yes, tis a thousand chances to one they will, answered the man. If they force another beast, they must quit that ground and cross the road to Sonley. And if they return with what they have got, they must take the Paris Avenue, so that in either case they will come here. While he spoke, there was a vast howling of dogs and blowing of horns at some distance, and Woodville, trusting to the piquer's sagacity for the direction the court would take, waited patiently till the sounds accompanying the curé were over, and then gazed down the avenue. In about ten minutes some horsemen began to appear in the road, and then a splendid party issued forth from one of the side alleys, followed by a confused crowd of men, horses, and dogs. They came forward at an easy pace, and Richard of Woodville inquired of his companion which was the Duke of Burgundy. "'What, do you not know him?' said the man in some surprise. "'Well, keep back, and I will tell you when they are near.' The young Englishman, without reply, reined back his horse for a step or two, so as to take up a position beyond the projecting corner of the wood, and while the piquer continued gazing down the avenue, still holding his dogs in the leash, Woodville turned a hasty glance behind him, to see if he could discover anything of his page. The boy was nearer than he thought, but, but was wisely coming round the back of the savannah, where the turf was soft and somewhat moist, so that his approach escaped both the eyes and ears of the royal attendant, till approaching his master's side, he said something which, though spoken in a low tone, made the man turn round. At the same moment, however, the first two horsemen passed out of the road into the open space, and immediately after the principal party appeared. At its head, a step before any of the rest, came a man seemingly past the middle age, with grey hair and a noble presence, but with cheeks channelled and withered, more by sickness and care than years. His eye was peculiarly clear and fine, and not a trace was to be seen therein of that fatal malady which devoured more than one half of his days. His aspect, indeed, was that of a person of high intellect, and though his shoulders were somewhat bowed, and his seat upon the horse not very firm, there were remains of the great beauty of form and dignity of carriage which had distinguished the unhappy Charles in earlier days. Close behind the king came a youth of eighteen or nineteen years of age, with a fine but somewhat fierce and haughty countenance, a cheek colourless and bare, and a bright but haggard eye, and near him rode a somewhat younger lad of a fresher and more healthy complexion, round whose lip there played ever and anon a gay and wanton smile. Almost on a line with these were three or four gentlemen, one far advanced in years and one very young, while the personage nearest the spot where Richard of Woodville sat seemed still in the lusty prime of manhood, stout but not fat, broad in the shoulders, strong in the limbs, though not much above the middle height. He was dressed in high boots and long striped hose of blue and red, with a close-fitting pourpoint of blue and a long mantle, with furred sleeves hanging down to his stirrups. On his head he bore a cap of fine cloth, shaped somewhat like an Indian turban, with a large and splendid ruby in the front, and a feather drooping over his left ear. 
His carriage was princely and frank, his eye clear and steadfast, and about his lip there was a firm and resolute expression, which well suited the countenance of one who had acquired the name of John the Bold. "'If that not be the Duke of Burgundy,' said Richard of Woodville to the piqueur in a low tone, as the party advanced, "'I am very much mistaken.' "'Yes, yes,' replied the man, nodding his head, "'that he is, God bless him, and that is the Duke of Aquitaine, the king's son, just before him, and there is the Duke of Bavaria on the other side.' The young Englishman did not wait to hear enumerated the names of all the personages of the royal train, but as soon as the king himself had passed, rode up at once to the Duke of Burgundy, who turned round and gazed at him with some surprise, while the young, pale Duke of Aquitaine, bent his brow, frowning upon him with an inquiring yet ill-satisfied look. "'My lord the duke,' said Woodville, tendering the letter he had received from de Ruc, "'I bear you this from Flanders.' The duke took it, and, without checking his horse, but merely throwing the bridle over his arm, opened the letter and looked at the contents. "'Ha!' he exclaimed as he read. "'Ha! I thank you, sir!' And making a sign for Richard and his page to follow, he spurred on, and passed the two young princes to the side of the king. "'This gentleman, sire,' he said, displaying the letter, "'brings me troublous tidings from my poor county of Flanders, "'which call for my immediate presence, "'and therefore, though I'm willing to leave you, royal sir, "'at a time when my enemies are strong in your capital and court, "'I must even take my leave in haste, "'but I will return with all convenient speed.' The king had drawn his bridle, and, turning round, gazed from the duke to Richard of Woodville, with a look of hesitation. But after a moment's pause he answered, with a cold and constrained air, "'Well, Duke of Burgundy, if it must be so, go. A fair journey to you, cousin.' And without farther ado, he gave a glance to his sons, and rode on. The Duke of Burgundy bowed low, and held in his horse while the royal party passed on, exchanging no very placable looks with the young Duke of Aquitaine, his son-in-law, and giving a sign to four or five gentlemen who were following in the rear, but immediately fell out of the train, and ranged themselves around him. "'Who are you, sir?' demanded the prince, turning to Woodville, while the king and his court proceeded slowly towards a distant part of the savannah, and, by the movements of different gentlemen round the Duke of Aquitaine, there seemed to be some hurried consultation going on. "'An English gentleman, my lord, attached to the Count, your son,' replied Woodville, without farther explanation. But seeing that a number of men completely armed, who followed the principal body of courtiers, had been beckoned up, he added, "'Methinks, fair sir, there is not much time to lose. Yonder is the way. I am not alone.' Without reply, the Duke gave one quick glance towards the royal party, set spurs to his horse, and rode quickly along the road to which Woodville pointed." He had hardly quitted the savannah and entered the long, broad avenue, however, when the sound of a horse's feet at the full gallop came behind, and a voice exclaimed, "'My lord, my lord the duke, the king has some words for your ear.' It was a single cavalier who approached, but the quick ear of Richard of Woodville caught the sound of other horse following, though the angle of the wood cut off the view of the royal train. "'Good faith,' answered the duke, turning his head towards the messenger, but without stopping, they must be kept for another moment. My business will have no delay. But even as he spoke, he caught sight of a number of men-at-arms following the first, and just entering the alley in a confused and scattered line. But you must, my lord, exclaimed the gentleman who had just come up. I have orders to use force. The duke and his attendants laid their hands upon their swords, but Woodville raised his lance high above his head and shook it in the air, shouting, "'Ho there, ho, ride on, my lord, ride on, I will stay with them.' "'Now gold spurs for a good lance,' cried the Duke of Burgundy, "'but I will not let you fight alone, my friend.' And wheeling his horse, he formed his little troop across the road. "'Ho there, ho,' shouted Woodville again, and instantly he heard a horn answering from the wood. "'The first man is mine, my lord,' he cried, setting his lance in the rest and drawing down his visor. "'Fall back upon our friends behind. You are unarmed.' And spurring on his charger at full speed, he passed the king's messenger, who was only habited in the garments of the chase, towards a man-at-arms who was coming at full speed some fifty yards in advance of the party sent to arrest the duke. His adversary instantly charged his lance likewise. No explanation was needed, 
and the two cavaliers met in full shock between the parties. The spear of the Frenchman struck right on Woodville's cuirass, and broke it into splinters, but the lance head of the young Englishman caught his opponent on the gorget, and without wavering in his seat he bore him back over the croup to the ground. Then wheeling rapidly he galloped back to the Duke's side, while at a brisk pace, but in perfect order, his band came up under the young Lord of Long, and the English archers, springing to the ground, put their arrows to the strings and drew the bows to the ear, waiting for the signal to let fly the unerring shaft. "'Hold, hold!' cried the Duke. "'Gallantly done, noble sir. "'You have saved me, but let us not shed blood unnecessarily.' "'And casting his eye over Woodville's troop, he added, "'We outnumber them far. "'They will never dare attack us.' "'As he spoke, the men-at-arms of France paused in their advance, "'and some of the foremost, dismounting from their horses, "'raised the overthrown cavalier from the ground, "'and were seen unlacing his casque. At the same time, the gentleman who had first followed the Duke of Burgundy began quietly retreating towards his friends, and though the Duke called to him aloud to stop, showed no disposition to comply. "'Shall I bring him back, noble Duke?' exclaimed the young Lord of Long, eager to win some renown. "'Yes, right after him, young sir,' said John the Bold. "'Remember, he is unarmed,' cried Richard of Woodville, seeing the youth couch his lance and fearing that he might forget, in his enthusiasm, the usages of war. "'You are of a right chivalrous spirit, sir,' said the Duke, turning to the young Englishman. "'Do you know, my lord of Riffiel, who is that gentleman whom he unhorsed just now?' "'The Count de Vaudemont, I think,' replied the nobleman to whom he spoke. "'I saw him at the head of the men-at-arms in the forest.' "'Oh, yes, it is he.' rejoined another. Did you not see the cross crosslets on his housings? A good knight and stout cavalier as ever couched a lance, observed the Duke of Burgundy. The young kestrel has caught the hawk, he continued, as the Lord of Long, riding up to him of whom he had been in pursuit, brought him back, apparently unwillingly, towards the Burgundian party. Ah, my good Lord of Vertu, exclaimed John the Bold, you have gone back with half your message, Fie, never look white, man. We will not hurt you, though we have strong hands amongst us, as you have just seen. Offer my humble duty to the king, and tell him that I should at once have obeyed his royal mandate to return, but that my affairs are very urgent, and that I knew not how long I might be detained to hear his royal will. And what am I to say to our lord? asked the Count de Vertu, for Monsieur de Voldemort, his son's bosom friend, overthrown by your people and well-nigh killed i fear my daughter ought to be his son's bosom friend replied the duke sharply but she is not it seems and as to monsieur de voldemont perhaps you had better tell the king that he was riding too fast and had a fall it will be more to his credit than if you say that he met a squire of burgundy in fair and even course and was unhorsed like a clumsy page and now my lord of vertu I give you the good time of day. You said something about force just now, but methinks you will forget it, and so will I. Thus saying, the Duke turned his horse and rode away down the avenue. The English archers sprang upon their steeds again, and Richard of Woodville, beckoning the young Lord of Long to halt, caused his whole troop to file off before him, and then with his companion brought up the extreme rear. A number of the French men-at-arms followed at a respectful distance, till the party entered the village of Florine, in the forest, but there, having satisfied themselves that there was no greater body of the men of Burgundy in the neighbourhood, which might have rendered the king's journey back to Paris somewhat dangerous, they halted and retired. The duke had turned round to watch their proceedings more than once, nor did he take any farther notice of Richard of Woodville till the French party were gone. When they were no longer in sight, however, he called him to his side and questioned him regarding himself. "'I do not remember you about my son, fair sir,' he said, "'and I am not one to forget men who act as you have done today. "'I have been in your territories, my lord duke, but a short time,' replied Richard of Woodville, "'as I came seeking occasions of honour to the most chivalrous court in Europe, "'and as I was furnished with letters from my sovereign to yourself and to your son, "'vouching graciously for my faith,' The Count was kindly pleased to give me a share in anything that was to be done today. 
happening to be in the saddle this morning somewhat before the rest of the Lord of Luke's troops, and my horses being somewhat fresher, the good old knight sent me on, thinking you might need aid before you reached the rendezvous you had given him. Aye, he judged right, replied the duke, and had I known as much when I wrote to him as I learned yesterday, I would have had him at the gates of Paris, for my escape at all has been a miracle. They only put off arresting me or stabbing me in my hotel till the king returned from his hunting, in order to guard against a rising of the citizens. Have you this letter from King Henry about you? My page has it in his wallet, noble duke, replied the young Englishman. Will you please to see it? John nodded his head, and calling up the boy, Richard of Woodville took the letter from him and placed it in the prince's hands. The duke opened and read it with a smile. Then, turning to Woodville, he said, "'You justify the praises of your king, "'and his request shall be attended to by me, "'as in duty bound. "'Men look to him, sir, with eyes of expectation, "'and have a foresight of great deeds to come. "'His friendship is dear to me, "'and every one he is pleased to send "'shall have honour at my hands, for his sake. "'Ah, there is Pont Saint-Maxence, and the bright was. "'The Rook is probably there by this time.' "'I doubt it not, my lord,' answered Richard of Woodville. "'He could not be far behind.' "'Who is that youth?' demanded the duke, "'who seems your second in the band.' "'One of your own vassals, noble sir,' replied the English gentleman, "'full of honour and zeal for your service, "'who will some day make an excellent soldier. "'He is the young Lord of Long. "'Ah!' said the duke in a sorrowful tone. "'I have bad news for him. "'His uncle Charles is a prisoner in Paris.' "'taken out of my very house before my eyes, "'and I doubt much they will do him to death. "'Break it to him calmly this evening, sir. "'But see, here are several of good old Duroc's party "'looking out for us. "'Methinks he would not have heard bad tidings of his duke "'without riding to rescue him.' "'Thus saying, he spurred on, "'meeting, ere he reached Pont Saint-Maxence, "'one or two small bodies of men-at-arms "'who saluted him as he passed, shouting, Burgundy, Burgundy, and fell in behind the band of Richard of Woodville. The single street of the small town was crowded with people, and before the doors of the two inns which the place then possessed were seen the company of the Lord of Rook, with the men dismounted, feeding their horses, but all armed and prepared to spring into the saddle at a moment's notice. The approach of the Duke was greeted by a loud shout of welcome, not alone from his own soldiers, but also from the people of the town. For in the northern and eastern provinces of France, as well as in the capital, John the Bold was the most popular prince of the time. De Rook immediately advanced on foot to hold his stirrup, but his lord grasped him by the hand and wrung it hard, saying, I am safe, you see, old friend, thanks to your care and this young gentleman's conduct. Ay, I thought he would do well, replied the old soldier, for he is up in the morning early. He has done well, said the duke, dismounting and turning to Woodville, who had sprung from his horse, he said, "'You rightly deserve some honour at my hands. Though we have no spurs ready, I will dub you now, and we will arm you afterwards at Lille. Kneel down.' Richard of Woodville bent his knee to the ground before the crowd that had gathered round, and drawing his sword, the Duke of Burgundy addressed to him, as usual, a short speech on the duties of chivalry, concluding with the words, "'Thus remember,' that this honour is not alone a reward for deeds past, but an encouragement to deeds in future. It is a bond as well as a distinction, by which you are held to right the wronged, to defend the oppressed, to govern yourself discreetly, to serve your sovereign lord, and to be the friend and protector of women, children, and the weak and powerless. Let your lance be the first in the fight, let your purse be open to the poor and needy, let your shield be the shelter of the widow and orphan, and let your sword be ever drawn in the cause of your king, your country, and your religion. In the name of God, St. Michael, and St. George, I dub you knight. Be loyal, true, and valiant. At each of these last words he struck him, a light stroke with the blade of his sword upon the neck, and the crowd around, well pleased with every piece of representation, uttered a loud acclamation as the young knight rose, and the duke took him in his arms and embraced him warmly. Old Duruc and the nobleman who had accompanied John the Bold from the forest grasped the young Englishman's hand one by one, and the Duke, turning to the Lord of Long, added with a gracious smile, I trust to do the same for you, young sir, ere long, 
In the meanwhile, that you may have occasion to win your chivalry, I name you one of my squires, and by God's grace you will not be long without something to do. The youth kissed his hand joyfully, and the duke retired to the inn. Richard of Woodville paused for a moment to distribute some handfuls of money amongst the crowd, who were crying, Largesse, around, and then followed the old Lord of Rook to give him information of all that had taken place in the forest of Halate, before they proceeded together to receive the farther orders of the Duke of Burgundy. End of chapter 26Chapter Twenty Seven of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A summary. All was bustle and activity throughout Flanders and Burgundy after the return of John the Bold from Paris. Night and day messengers were crossing the country from one town to another, and every castle in the land saw gatherings of men at arms and archers, while across the frontier from France came multitudes of the discontented vassals of Charles the Sixth, pouring in to offer either service or counsel to the great feudatory, who was now almost in open warfare, if not against his sovereign, at least against the faction into whose hands that sovereign, once more relapsed into imbecility, had fallen. If, however, the country in general was agitated, much more was the city of Lille, where the Duke prolonged his residence for some weeks. There, day after day, councils were held in the castle, and day after day, not only from every part of the Duke's vast territories, but also from neighbouring states, came crowds of his friends and allies. The people of Ghent, Bruges, and Ypres sent their deputies, the Duke of Brabant, the Bishop of Liège, and the Count of Cleves, appeared in person, and even the Constable of France, Walleran, Count of St. Paul, took his seat at the table of the Duke of Burgundy, and refused boldly to give up his staff to the envoys sent from Paris to demand it. The cloud of war was evidently gathering thick and black, and foreign princes looked eagerly on to see how and when the struggle would commence, but the eyes of both contending parties were turned anxiously to one of the neighbouring sovereigns who was destined to take a great part, as all foresaw, in the domestic feuds of France. To Henry of England both addressed themselves, and each strove hard not only to propitiate the monarch, but to gain the good will of the nation. All Englishmen, either in France or Burgundy, were courted and favoured by those high in place, and Richard of Woodville was now especially marked out for honour by both the Duke of Burgundy and the young Count of Charolois. The latter opened his frank and generous heart towards one, with whose whole demeanour he had been struck and pleased from the first, and that intimacy which grows up so rapidly in troublous times, easily ripened into friendship in the daily intercourse which took place between them. They were constant companions, and more than once, after nightfall, Richard was brought by the prince to his father's private chamber, where consultations were being held between them, not only on matters of war and military discipline, for which the young English knight had acquired a high reputation, on the report of the old Lord of Rook, but also on subjects connected with the policy of the English court, regarding which the Duke strove to gain some better information from the frank and sincere character of Woodville than he could obtain elsewhere. But, as we have shown, Richard of Woodville could be cautious as well as candid, and he replied guardedly to all open questions, that he knew naught of the views or intentions of his sovereign, but that he was well aware Henry of England held in high esteem and love his princely cousin of Burgundy, and would never be found wanting, when required, to show him acts of friendship. Father, he said, the Duke must apply to good Sir Philip de Morgan, a man well instructed, he believed, in all the King's purposes. Both the Count of Charolois and his father smiled at this answer, and turned a meaning look upon each other. "'You have shown me, Sir Richard,' said the Duke, "'that you really do not know the King's mind on such subjects. Sir Philip de Morgan was his father's most trusted envoy, but is his own envoy not the most trusted?' It is strange your monarch's conduct in some things. He has added to his agents at our poor court a noble and wise man whom his father hated. Because, my most redoubted lord, replied the young knight, he judges differently and is differently situated from his father. 
Henry the Fourth, snatched the crown, as all men know, from a weak and vicious king, but found that those who had once been his peers were not willing to be his subjects. Though a mighty, wise, and politic prince, his life was a struggle, in which he might win victories indeed, and subdue enemies in the field, but he raised up new traitors in his own heart, new enemies within himself. I mean, my lord, jealousies and animosities. Our present king comes to the throne by succession, and his father has left him a crown divested of half its thorns. His nurture has been different, too, never having suffered depression. He has nothing to retaliate. Never having struggled with foes, he has no fear of enmity. People say in my land that one man builds a house and another dwells in it. So it is with everyone who wins a throne. He has to raise and strengthen the fabric of his power, only to leave the perfect structure to another. The Duke leaned his head upon his hand and thought profoundly. Ambitious visions, often roused by the very name of Henry the Fourth, were reproved by the moral of his life, and though John the Bold might not part with them, he turned his thoughts to other channels and strove to learn from Richard of Woodville the character and disposition of the English sovereign, if not his intentions and designs. On those points the young knight was more open and unreserved. He painted the monarch as he really was, laughed when the prince spoke of his youthful wildness, and said, It was but a masking face, noble duke, put on for sport, and, like a mummer's wizard, laid aside the moment it suited him, to resume himself again. Those who judge the king from such traits as these will find themselves woefully deceived. And he went on to paint Henry's energies of mind in terms which, though the duke might attribute part of the praise to young enthusiasm, still left a very altered impression on the hearer's mind in regard to the real character of the English king. I have said that these interviews took place more than once, and also that they generally took place in private, for the duke did not wish to excite any jealousy in his Burgundian subjects. But, on more than one occasion, several of the foreign noblemen who had flocked to the court of Lille were present, and between the Count of St. Paul and Woodville some intimacy speedily sprung up. The Count, irritated by what he thought injustice, revolved many schemes of daring resistance to the court of France, and thought of raising men, and as the ally of Burgundy opposing in arms the, the Armagnac faction and the Dauphin, he thought of visiting England and treating on his own part with Henry V, and from the young English knight he strove to gain both information and assistance. There was in that distinguished nobleman many qualities which commanded esteem, and Woodville willingly gave him what advice he could, and yet he tried to dissuade him from being the first to raise the standard of revolt, pointing out that, although the state of mind of the King of France and the absence of all legal authority in those who ruled might justify a prince so nearly allied to the royal family as the Duke of Burgundy in struggling for a share of that power which he saw misused, especially as he was a sovereign prince, the feudatory for some of his territories to the crown of France, yet an inferior person could hardly take arms on his own account without incurring a charge of treason, which might fall heavily on his head if the duke found cause ultimately to abstain from war. The count listened to his reasons and seemed to ponder upon them, and though no one loves to be persuaded from the course to which passion prompts, he was sufficiently experienced to think well of one who would give such advice, however unpalatable at the moment. Thus passed nearly a month from the day on which the young Englishman quitted Ghent, and so changeful and uncertain were the events of the time that he would not venture to absent himself from the court of Burgundy even for an hour, lest he should miss the opportunity of winning advancement and renown. In that time, however, he had gained much. He was no longer a stranger— the ways and habits of the court were familiar to him. He was the companion of all, and the friend of many who, on his first appearance, had looked upon him with an evil eye, and many an occurrence trifling compared with the great interests that were moving round, but important to himself, had taken place in the young knight's history. The ceremony of being armed a knight was duly performed, the duke fulfilling his promise on the first occasion, and completing that which had been but begun at Pont Saint Maxence. Yet this very act, gratifying as it was to one eager of honour, was not without producing some anxiety in the mind of the young Englishman. 
such events were accompanied with much pageantry, and followed by considerable expense. Hitherto all his charges had been borne by himself, and he saw his stock of wealth decreasing far more rapidly than he had expected, though apartments had been assigned to him from the Gravenstein at Ghent. None had been furnished him in the castle of Lille, and no mention was made of reimbursing him for anything he had paid. One day, however, early in June, he was called to the presence of the Duke, and found him just coming from a conference with the deputies of the good towns of Flanders. The prince's face was gay and smiling, and as he passed along the gallery towards his private apartments, he exclaimed, turning towards some of his counsellors, "'Let no one say I have not good and generous subjects. Ha! Sir Richard,' he continued, as his eye fell upon the young Englishman, "'go to the chamber of my son. He has something to tell you.' Richard of Woodville hastened to obey, but the Count de Charolois was not in his apartment when he arrived, and some minutes elapsed before the young prince appeared. When he came at length, however, he was followed by three or four of his men bearing some large bags, apparently of money, which were laid down upon the table in the ante-room. "'Get you gone, boys,' said the Count, turning to his pages, "'and you, Godfrey, see that all be ready by the hour of noon.' "'Now, my friend,' he continued, as soon as the room was clear, "'I have news for you, and I trust pleasant news, too. First, I am for Ghent, and you may accompany me, if you will.' "'Right gladly, my lord the Count,' replied Richard of Woodville, "'for, to say truth, almost all my baggage is still there, "'and I have scarcely any clothing in which to appear decently at your father's court. "'I have other matters, too, that I would fain see to in Ghent.' "'Some fair lady now, I will warrant,' replied the Count, laughing. "'I have marked the ruby ring in your bassinet. "'But, Faith, we have more serious matters in hand than either fine clothes or fair ladies. "'I go to raise men, Sir Knight, and you have a commission to, to do so likewise. "'My father would fain have you swell your company to fifty archers, "'taught and disciplined by your own men. "'The more Englishmen you can get, the better, "'for it seems that you are famous for the bow in your land.' "'but our worthy citizens of Bruges are not unskilled either.' "'Good faith, my lord,' replied Richard of Woodville, "'I know not well how to obey the noble duke's behest, "'for my riches are but scanty, "'and tis as much as I can do to maintain my band as it is.' "'Ha! Are you there, my friend?' said the young prince with a smile. "'Well, you have borne long and patiently with our poverty, "'but the good towns have come to our assistance now, "'and we will acquit our debt.' "'One of these bags is for you, and you will find it contains wherewithal to pay you what you have spent, "'to reward your archers according to the rate of England, which is, I believe, six sterlings a day, "'for the month past, to pay them for three months to come, and to raise your band, as I have said, to fifty men. "'You will find therein one thousand fleur-de-lis of gold, or as we call them, franc à pied, "'each of which is worth about forty of your sterlings.' "'Then there is much more than is needful, my good lord,' replied the young knight. "'One half of that sum would suffice.' "'Exactly,' replied the Count. "'But no one serves well the house of Burgundy without guerdon, my good friend. "'My father knighted you because you had done well in arms, "'both in England and in his presence. "'But knighthood is too high and sacred a thing "'to be made a reward for any personal benefit rendered to a prince.' My father would think that he degraded that high order if he conferred it even for saving him from death or captivity, as you were enabled to do. For that good deed, therefore, he gives you the rest, and I do trust that ere long you will have the means of winning more. Richard of Woodville expressed his thanks, though, with the ordinary chivalrous affectation of the day, he denied all merit in what he had done, and made as little of it as possible. There was one difficulty in regard to increasing his band, however, which he had to explain to the young Count, and which arose from the promise he had given his own sovereign, of holding himself ready to join him at the first summons. But that was speedily obviated, it being agreed that in case of, of his services being demanded by King Henry, he should be at liberty to retire with, with the yeoman who then accompanied him, and that the rest of the troop about to be raised should, in that case, be placed under the command of any officer the duke might appoint. As was then customary, a clerk was called in, and an indenture drawn up, specifying the terms on which the young knight was to serve in the Burgundian force, the number of the men-at-arms and archers which he was to bring into the field, 
the pay they were to receive, the arms and horses with which they were to appear, and even the Burgundian cloaks, or hooks, which they were to wear. A copy was taken and signed by each party, and fortunate it was for Richard of Woodville that the young Count suggested this precaution. The usual clauses regarding prisoners were added, reserving the persons of kings and princes of the blood from those whom the young knight might put to ransom as his lawful captives, but the Count specifically renounced his right to the third of the winnings of the war, which was not unusually reserved to the great leader with whom any knight or squire took service. All these points being settled, Richard of Woodville hurried back to the inn, called the Shield of Burgundy, where he and his men were lodged, and prepared to accompany the Count to Ghent. When he returned to the castle, with his men mounted and armed, he found the courtyard full of knights, nobles, and soldiery, all ready to set out at the appointed hour, and for a time he fancied that the young prince might be going to Ghent with a larger force than the good citizens, jealous of their privileges, would be very willing to receive. But, as soon as the trumpet sounded and the whole force marched out over the drawbridge into the streets of Lille, the seven or eight hundred men of which the party consisted separated into different bands, and each took its own road. One pursued its way towards Amiens, another towards Tournay, another towards Cassel, another towards Bethune, another towards Douai, and the Count and his train, reduced to about a hundred men, rode on in the direction of Ghent, which city they reached about four o'clock upon the following day. Except the Lord of Croy, between whom and the young Englishman a good deal of intimacy had arisen, the Count de Charolois was accompanied by no other gentleman of knightly rank but Richard of Woodville, and as that high military station placed him who filled it on a rank with princes, those two gentlemen were the young Count's principal companions on the road to Ghent, and received from him a fuller intimation of his father's designs and purposes than had been communicated to them before they quitted Lille. All seemed smiling on the fortunes of Richard of Woodville. The path to wealth and renown was open before him, and he might be pardoned for giving way to all the bright visions and glowing expectations of youth. End of chapter 27《28 of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Friend Estranged. Trumpet and timbrel were sounding in the streets of Ghent. The people, in holiday costume, were thronging bridge and market place. The procession of the trades was once more afoot, with banners displayed. The clergy were hurrying here and there with cross and staff, and all the ensigns of the Romish church. It was a high holiday, for the young Count had given notice, immediately on his arrival, that he would be ready in an hour before Compline, which may be considered about six o'clock in the evening, to receive the honourable corps of the good town, in order to return them thanks, in the name of his father, for the liberal aid they had granted him in a time of need and flushed with loyalty to their prince, well, I wot, a somewhat unusual occurrence, and with a full sense of their own meritorious sacrifices, each man pressed eagerly to be one of the deputies who were to wait upon the count, and if that might not be, to go at least as far as the palace gates with those who were to be admitted. All the nobles who had accompanied the count from Lille were present in the great hall of the Cour des Princes, where the reception was to take place, except, indeed, Richard of Woodville. He, soon after he had arrived, had begged the Count's excuse for absenting himself from his train, and hurrying to the inn where he had left Ned Dyrum, with his horses and baggage, he dismounted from his charger and cast off his armour. To his inquiries for his servant, the host replied that he had not been there since the morning, and, indeed, seldom appeared there all day. But Woodville seemed to pay little attention to this answer, and, merely washing the dust from his face and neck, set out at a hurried pace on foot. He thought that he knew the way to the place which he intended to visit well, though he had only followed it once, 
and passing on, he was soon out of the stream of people that was still flowing on towards the palace. But he found himself mistaken in regard to his powers of memory. Long, tortuous streets, totally deserted for the time, lay around him. Tall houses, principally built of wood, rose on every side, throwing fantastic shadows across the broad sunshine afforded by the sinking sun. And when he at length stopped a workman to ask his way, the man spoke nothing but Flemish, and all that Woodville had acquired of that tongue was insufficient to make the artisan comprehend what was meant. Leaving him, the young knight walked on, guided by what he remembered of the direction in which the house of Sir John Grey lay, for it is hardly needful to tell the reader that thither his steps were bent, when suddenly a cavalcade of some five or six horsemen appeared, coming at a slow pace up the street, and the tall, graceful figure of a man somewhat past the middle age, but evidently of distinguished rank, was seen at their head. The garb was changed, the whole look and demeanour was different. But, even before he could see the features, Richard of Woodville recognised the very man he was seeking, and, hurrying on to meet him, he advanced to his horse's side. Sir John Grey gazed on him coldly, however, as if he had never seen him before, and Woodville felt somewhat surprised and mortified, not well knowing whether the old knight's memory were really so much shorter than his own, or whether fortune, with Mary's father, had possessed the power it has over so many, to change the aspect of the things around, and blot out the love and gratitude of former days, as things unworthy of remembrance. "'Do you not know me, Sir John Grey?' he asked. "'If so, let me recall to your good remembrance, Richard of Woodville, who brought you tidings from the king, and also some news of your sweet daughter.' "'I know you well, sir,' replied the knight. "'Would I knew less. I hear you have acquired honour and renown in arms. God give you grace to merit more. I must ride on, I fear.' His manner was cold and distant, his brow grave and stern. But Woodville was not one to bear such a change altogether calmly, though, for his sweet Mary's sake. He laid a strong constraint upon himself. "'I know not, Sir John Grey,' he said, "'what has produced so strange a change in one whom I had thought steadfast and firm. Whether calmer thought and higher fortunes than those in which I first found you may have engendered loftier views, or reawakened slumbering ambition, so that you regret some words you spoke in the first liberal joy of renewed prosperity, but—' "'Cease, sir, cease!' exclaimed the old knight. "'I should indeed regret those words, could they be binding in a case like this.' "'Steadfast and firm I am, and you will find me so, but not lofty of views, or reawakened ambition has made the change, but better knowledge of a man I trusted on a fair seeming. But these things are not to be discussed here in the open street before servants and horse-boys. You know your own heart, you know your own actions, and if they do not make you shrink from discussing what may be between you and me—' "'Shrink?' cried Richard of Woodville vehemently. Why should I shrink? Shrink from discussing aught that I have done? No, by my knighthood, not before all the world, varlets or horseboys, princes or peers. I care not who hears my every action blazoned to the day. But I do, sir, replied Sir John Grey, for the sake of those dear to us both, for your good uncle's sake, and for my child's. You are compassionate, Sir John, said Woodville bitterly, but then he added, Yet no, you are deceived, I know not how or by whom, but there is some error that is very clear. This I must crave leave to say, that I am fearless of the judgment of mortal man on aught that I have done. Sins have we all to God, but I defy the world to say that I have failed in honour to one man on earth. According to that worldly code of honour we once spoke of, perhaps not, replied Sir John Grey. "'According to what fastidious code you will,' said the young knight, "'I stand here willing, Sir John Grey, to have each word or deed sifted, like wheat before a cottage door. "'I know not your charge, or who it is that brings it, but I will disprove it, whatever it be, "'when it is clearly stated, and will cram his falsehood down his throat, whenever I know his name who makes it.' "'Ha, sir!' "'Is it of me you speak?' demanded the knight somewhat sharply. "'No, Sir John,' replied Woodville. 
You are to be the judge, for you, he added with a sorrowful smile, hold the high prize. But it is of him who has foully calumniated me to you. For that someone has done, so I can clearly see, and I would know the charge and the accuser, here, now, on this spot, for I am not one to rest under suspicion, even for an hour. You speak boldly, Sir Richard of Woodville, answered Sir John Grey, and doubtless think that you are right, though I may not, for I am one who have long lived in solitude, pondering men's deeds, and weighing them in a nicer balance than the world is wont to use. However, as I said before, this is no place to discuss such things. But, as it is right and just that each man should have occasion to defend himself, I will meet you where you will, and when, to tell you what men lay to your charge. If you can then deny it and disprove it, well, I will not speak more here. See, someone seeks your attention. Whatever it is that any man on earth accuses me of, replied the young knight, without attending to Sir John Grey's last words, I am ready ever to meet boldly, for my heart is free. As you will not give me this relief, I ask even now, it cannot be too soon. I will either go with you at once to your own house. No, that must not be, cried the other hastily. Or else, continued Woodville, I will meet you two hours hence in the hostel called the Garland, on the market-place. What would you, knave? he added, turning suddenly upon someone who had more than once pulled his sleeve from behind, and beholding Ned Dyram. I would speak with you instantly, Sir Knight, replied Dyram, on a matter of life and death. Shall it be so, sir? Richard of Woodville continued, looking again to Sir John Grey, who repeated thoughtfully, In two hours. Sir, will you listen to me? exclaimed Dyram in great agitation. Indeed you must. There is not a moment to lose. I tell you it will bear no delay. If you would save her life, you must come at once. Her life? cried Woodville in great surprise. Whose life? Of whom do you speak, man? Of whom? Of Ella Brood, to be sure, replied Dyram. If you stay talking longer, you leave her to death. Sir John Grey, with a bitter smile, shook his bridle, and striking his heel against his horse's flank, rode on. End of chapter 28「Twenty nine of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Betrayer. The writer must retread his steps for a while to show the events which had taken place in the city of Ghent since Ned Dyram and Sir Simeon of Royden were last seen upon the stage. Whether the reader may think fit to do so or not must depend upon himself. All that the author can promise is that he will be brief and merely sketch the conduct of the personages left behind till he brings them up with the rest. The arrival of Sir Simeon of Royden in Ghent spread the same terror through the heart of poor Ella Brune that the appearance of a hawk produces in one of the feathered songsters of the bush or clouds. Had Richard of Woodville been there, she would have felt no apprehension, for to him she had accustomed herself to look for protection and support, and with that relying confidence, that trust in his power, his wisdom, and his goodness, which perhaps ought never to be placed in a man, and which is never so placed but by a heart where love is present. Had she been even in London, her terror would have been less, for even in those days, although they were dark and barbarous, although tumult and riot, civil strife and contention, injustice and wrong, would, as we all know, take place in every different country, the peculiar character of the English people, the homely sense of justice and of right, which has been their chief characteristic in all ages, was sufficiently strong to render this island comparatively a land of security. Though there might be persons to oppress and injure, yet there were generally found some kind hearts and generous spirits to support and protect, and, in short, there were more defences for those who needed defence than in any state in Europe. Very different, however, was the case in Ghent, especially for a stranger, and Ella Brune well knew that it was so. She was aware that deeds could be done there, boldly and openly, which in England would require cunning concealment and artful device. 
even for a chance of success, and the consequence was that she kept herself immured within the walls of her cousin's dwelling, never venturing forth even to breathe the air, but at night, and striving to make her companionship during the day prove as pleasant as possible to the worthy dame of Nicholas Brune. To her and to him she communicated the cause of her apprehensions, and it is but justice to the good folks to say that they entered warmly into her feelings, and did all that they could to mitigate her alarm and give her encouragement. But Ella Brune, in answer to all assurances of safety, constantly replied that she should never feel secure till Richard of Woodville had returned, and as it was already beyond the period at which he had promised to be back, she looked for his appearance every day. From such subjects sprang many a discussion between her and her good cousin as to her future conduct. "'Why, you know, my pretty Ella,' he would say, "'you could not go wandering after this gay young gentleman all over the world. Mischief would come of it, be you sure. Men are not to be trusted, nor pretty maidens either. We have all our weak moments, and if no harm happened to you, your fair fame would suffer. Men would call you his leman.' Ay, that is what I fear, answered Ella Brune, and that only, for though most men are not to be trusted, he is. But at all events, she continued, willing gently to remove all objections to the plan she was determined to pursue, he might carry me safely with him to Burgundy, or to Liège, as he brought me here. Nicholas Brune shook his head, and Ella said no more at that time but gradually she put forward the notion of obviating all difficulties and objections by assuming some disguise, and on that her good cousin pondered, thinking it a more feasible plan than any other, yet seeing many difficulties. "'As what could you go?' he said. "'If at all, it must be in male guise, and though you would make a pretty boy enough, I doubt me they would find you out there, Ella.' "'Why not as a novice of the Black Friars?' demanded Madame Brune, who entered into the maiden's schemes more warmly and enthusiastically than her prudent husband. Then she would have robes longer than her own to cover her little hands and feet, and a hood to shade her head. There is no punishment either for taking the gown of a novice. "'Then, as this man Dyron must be in the secret,' said Ella Brune, "'he could give me help and protection in case of need.' Ha! Uh, are you there? cried Nicholas, laughing. But Ella shook her head, no way abashed, replying, You are mistaken, cousin of mine, but perhaps you have so much respect for those holy men, the monks, that you would object to a profane girl like me, taking their garb upon her. Out upon them, the lazy drones, cried Nicholas Brune. You may make what sport of them you like for that. I would put them all to hard labour on the dikes if I had my will and he burst forth into the long vituperation of all the monastic orders, in terms somewhat too gross for modern ears, not even sparing the holy Roman Catholic Church, but ending with another wise shake of the head, and an expression of his firm belief that the scheme would not do. Nevertheless, Ella Brune and his good dame were now perfectly agreed upon the subject, and worked together zealously, preparing all that was needful for Ella's disguise, while Ned Dyron brought them daily information on the proceedings of Sir Simeon of Royden, and made them smile to hear how he had deceived the knight into the belief that Ella was far away from Ghent. "'But if he should discover the truth,' said Ella Brune, really anxious that no one should suffer on her account, "'may he not revenge himself on you, if you give him the opportunity, by going every day and working in gold and silver under his eyes?' I beseech you, Master Dyron, run no risk on my account. I would rather endure insult or injury myself than that you should incur danger. Ned Dyron's heart beat quick, though Ella said no more to him than she would have said to anyone in the same circumstances. But he shook his head with a triumphant air, replying, He dare not wag his finger against me. He added no more, but turned to the subject of Ella's disguise, having before this been made acquainted with her project, and being, moreover, eager to second it. For the prospect of having to leave her behind in Ghent, if his young master should be called upon some more distant expedition, had often crossed his mind, producing very unpleasant sensations. 
Day after day, however, he visited Simeon of Royden, and generally found him alone. Plenty of work was provided for him, and the payment was prompt and large. Now it was an ornamented bridle that he had to produce, encrusted all over with fanciful work of silver, now a testier or a poitral arabesqued with lines of gold. Sometimes he compounded perfumes or essences, sometimes he illuminated a book of canticles, which the knight intended to present to the monastery. One morning, however, going somewhat earlier than was his wont, he met the monk, Brother Paul, coming down the stairs from the knight's apartments. The Cenobite gave him a grim smile, but merely added his benedicite, and passed on. Ned Dyron paused and mused before he entered. More than once he had asked himself what it was that detained Sir Simeon of Royden so long in Ghent. The court was absent, there was little to see, and less to gain, and the visit of Father Paul gave him fresh matter for reflection. But Ned Dyron was one who, judging by slight indications, always prepared himself against probable results, and he now divined that the discovery of the truth in regard to Ella might not be far off. He found no change in Simeon of Royden when he entered, and the morning passed away as usual. But on the following day the knight received him with a smile so mixed in its expression that Dyron felt the hilt of his analyst, and returned him his look with one as doubtful. "'Shut the door, Master Dyron,' said Sir Simeon of Royden. The man obeyed without the least hesitation, and the knight proceeded. "'Think you, fellow, that it is wise and worthy to cheat and to deceive?' "'On proper occasions, and with proper men,' replied Ned Dyram calmly. "'Ah, you do,' cried the knight, with his brow bent. "'Then let me tell you that you will deceive me no more.' "'That depends upon circumstances and opportunity,' answered Ned Dyram, with the same imperturbable effrontery as before. I dare say you will not give me the means, if you can help it. What if I take from you the opportunity of cheating any one again? exclaimed Sir Simeon of Royden. What if, as you well deserve, I call up my men and bid them dispose of you, as they know how? You will not do that, replied Dyron, without a shade of emotion. Why should I not? demanded the knight fiercely. What should stop me? Out of these walls no secrets are likely to pass. Why should I not, I say? Because, said Dyram in a cool conversation tone, there is a certain bridge in this city over the river Leith, where you may have seen as you pass along a foolish figure cast in bronze of two men, one going to cut off the other's head, apparently. They represent a son who offered to execute his father, when, as old legends say, but I do not believe them, the sword flew to splinters in the parricide's hand. However, that has not much to do with the matter, as I see you perceive. But the fact is, that bridge is called the Bridge of the Decapitation. Not, as many men fancy, on account of those two statues, but because it is there the citizens of this good town have a pious custom of putting to death knights and nobles who have had the misfortune to become murderers. Now you must not suppose me so slow-witted a man as to come to visit Sir Simeon of Royden under such peculiar circumstances, without letting those persons know where I am, who may inquire after me if I do not reappear. I am always ready for such cases, noble knight, and, to say truth, care little when I go out of the world, so that I have a companion by the way. And that, in this instance at least, I have secured. Tis therefore, I say, you will abandon such vain thoughts." Sir Simeon of Royden gazed at him for a moment with the expression of a fiend, but suddenly his countenance changed and he fell into deep thought. What strifes there are in that eternal battlefield, the human heart! What strifes have there not been therein since the first fell passion entered into man's breast with the words of the serpent tempter, aye, with the words of the tempter, for man had fallen before he ate! But perhaps there is none more frequent than the struggle between passion and policy in the bosom of the vehement and wily, none more terrible either, for whichever gains the ascendancy ruins the country round. There was something in Dyram's demeanour that suited well with the character of him to whom he spoke. Opposed to him, it first excited wrath, but yet a voice whispered that such a man might be made most useful to his purposes, if he could but be one. 
and as the knight's anger abated, the question became, how could he be gained? In regard to Ella Brune, Royden was aware of much that had taken place, but not of all. Otherwise his course would have been soon decided. By this time he had learned that Ella had journeyed from England in the train of Richard of Woodville. He knew that Dyram had stayed behind, not dismissed by his master as the man had insinuated, but left in charge of his baggage. And Simeon of Royden suspected, judging of others by himself, that he had been left in charge of Ella also by her paramour. But of Dyram's love for her he had no hint, though there might have arisen in his mind a vague surmise that such attachment did exist, from the fact which brother Paul had discovered and communicated that Dyram visited her once at least each day. That surmise, however, was enough to guide him some way, and after pausing and pondering till silence became unpleasant, he said, "'Perhaps, my good friend, you may be mistaken in what you fancy. No fears of the results you speak of would stay me, were I so minded. Those who have good friends dread no foes.' "'That is what I say, sir,' replied Ned Dyram in the same tone. "'I have no apprehensions, because I know there are those who will take care of me or avenge me.' "'You need have none,' answered Sir Simeon of Royden, "'but not for that cause. "'There are other regards that would restrain me. "'You have deceived me, it is true, "'but you can deceive me no more, "'and now that I know your motives and your conduct, "'I think that our ends may not be quite so different as you imagine, "'and as I too imagined at first. "'Indeed,' said Ned Dyron with a sarcastic smile, "'I know not what your ends are, "'or what you think you know.' Knowledge is a strange thing, noble knight, and those who fancy they know much often know little. True, learned master, answered Simeon of Royden, but you shall hear what I know. I wish not to conceal it. Your lord brought this fair girl to Ghent, then, being called to serve the Duke of Burgundy, left his sweet leman. He paused upon the word, and saw his companion's visage glow. But Dyram said nothing, and the knight went on. Left his sweet leman, with his other baggage, under your careful guard. She lives now in the house of one Nicholas Brune, and you see her daily. You love her, and fancying that I seek her paramours, would fain hide from me where she is. That you see is vain, and I will show you, too, that what you suppose of me is false. I care not for the girl, though perchance I may have thought in former days to trifle with her for an hour. But I will tell you more, Jyram. I love not your lord, and I believe that you have no great kindness for him either. Is that not so? All wrong together, Puissant Knight, replied Ned Dyram with a laugh. She is no leman of Richard of Woodville. So Richard, by the mass, for I have heard to-day he has been made a knight. Nay, more, he cares no further for her than as a boy, who has saved a bird from hawk or raven, loves to nourish and fondle it. "'That may be,' answered Sir Simeon, who had now regained all his coolness. "'You know more than myself of his doings. "'But of one thing we are both certain. "'She loves him, and it would need but his humour to make her his. "'Of that I have had proof enough before I crossed the sea.' "'Ned Dyram winced, but he replied boldly, "'Because she looked coldly upon you.' "'Nay, not so.' said the knight, but on account of signs and tokens not to be mistaken. However, if, as you think, he loves her not, my scheme falls to the ground. And what was that, if I may dare to ask? demanded Ned Dyram. I heed not who knows it, replied Royden at once. I seek revenge, and thought to accomplish it by taking this girl from him. As to what is to follow, I care not. I never seek to see her more would wed her to a hind or any one. But if you judge rightly, and he loves her not, I am frustrated in this, and must seek other means. There was a pause of several minutes, and both thought, or seemed to think, deeply. With Dyram it was really so, though the more shrewd and wise of the two, he had suffered the words of Royden to fall upon the dangerous weaknesses of his bosom, like a spark into some inflammable mass. And doubt, suspicion, jealousy— were all in a blaze within. Yet he had sufficient power over himself to hide his feelings skilfully, and sought neither admitting nor denying aught farther 
to lead on the knight to speak of his purposes more plainly. But Simeon of Royden saw there was a struggle, and that was sufficient for his purpose without discovering clearly what it was. He did speak more plainly then, and by many an artful suggestion and many a promise, sought to lure Dyrum on to aid in separating Ella Brun from him who could protect her, concealing carefully that it was on her his thirst of revenge longed to sate itself, though Richard of Woodville was not forgotten either, and before they parted he thought that he had nearly won him to his wishes. The man did indeed hesitate, but the sparks of better feeling, which I have before said he possessed, burned up ere their conversation ended, and a doubt which, even in the midst of passion, will rise up in the minds of the cunning and deceitful, that there may ever be a knavish person in others, made him desire to see his way more clearly. All that the knight could gain was a promise that he would consider of his hints, and Dyram left him with the resolution to draw from Ella Broom by any means a knowledge of her true feelings towards his master, and to watch every movement of Simeon of Royden with a care that should let not the veriest trifle escape. In the first object he was frustrated as before, for the cold despair of Ella's love, its utter unselfishness, its high and lofty nature, was a veil to her heart which the eyes of one so full of human passion as himself could by no art penetrate. But in his second he was more successful, with the cunning of a serpent, with the perseverance of a ferret, he examined, he watched, he pursued his purpose. He had already wound himself into the confidence of several of the knight's servants, and he now took every means to gain some hold upon them, which was not indeed difficult from the character of the men whom Royden had chosen. Neither did he altogether cease his visits to their master, but for many days kept him negotiating as to the price of his services, and although he could not exactly divine the end that the other proposed for himself, he learned enough to show him that Royden was sincere, when he assured him that no love for Ella influenced him in seeking to remove her from the protection of Richard of Woodville. Then he admitted that he loved her himself, in order to see what the knight would propose, and was not a little surprised to find how eagerly Royden grasped at the fact, as a means to his own ends. "'Then she may be yours at a word,' exclaimed Royden, grasping his hand, as if he had been an equal. "'But aid me boldly and skilfully in what I seek, and she shall be placed entirely in your hands, at your mercy, to do with as you will. "'Then, if you use not your advantage like a wise and resolute man, it is your own fault.' "'Dyron mused. The prospect tempted him. The strong passions of his nature rose up and urged him on.' He could not resist them, but still, cunning and cautious, he resolved to make his own position sure, and he replied, I must first know your motive, noble knight. Men are not so eager without some object. What is it? Revenge, replied Sir Simeon of Royden vehemently, and he said truly, but then he added more calmly the next moment, I am still unconvinced by what you have said in regard to the feelings of your master. Though he may seek a higher lady as his wife, and, indeed, I know he does, yet he loves this girl, and will seek her paramours as soon as he has made sufficient way for her, for I persist not in saying that she is his leman. I have been acquainted with him, longer than you have, since his boyhood, and he cannot hide himself from me as from others. At all events, that is my affair. I seek revenge, I tell you, and if I think I shall inflict a heavy blow on him by making this girl your paramour, and am mistaken, the error will fall on myself. You will gain your ends, and I gain not mine. My paramour, said Ned Dyram thoughtfully. Ay, or your wife, if you will, replied the knight, but perchance she will not, till forced, readily consent to be your wife. You understand me. I will give you every surety you may demand. "'that she shall remain wholly in your power. "'The course you follow afterwards must be of your own choosing.' "'The great tempter himself could not have chosen better words to work his purpose. "'It seemed, as if by instinct, that the one base man addressed himself "'to all that was weak in the other's nature, 
and there is a kind of divination between men of similar characters which leads them to foresee with almost unerring certainty the effect of particular inducements upon their fellows gradually dyram yielded more and more resolving firmly all the while to do nothing to aid in nothing without ensuring that his own objects also were attained but in the execution of such schemes there are always small oversights passion so frequently interferes with prudence the stream grows so much stronger as we are hurried on that it is scarcely possible to stop when we would and when once the knave or the fool puts power in the hands of another his own course is as much beyond his direction as that of a charioteer who will guide wild horses with pack-thread how strange it is perhaps the most wonderful of all moral phenomena that any man should trust another in the commission of a bad action the question between sir simeon of roydon and his lowlier companion speedily reduced itself to how ella Brun was to be separated from those who could afford her protection but the knight soon pointed out a means instructed as he was by another who kept himself in the dark these people he said with whom she resides are known to be the followers of a new sect of heretics which has sprung up in a distant part of germany and is similar to our own lollards only their apostle is named huss instead of wycliffe the girl herself is more than suspected of favouring these false doctrines such things are matters of no moment in your eyes or mine but the zealous priesthood fearful for their shaken power are resolute to put such blasphemous notions down and if you can but discover when these bruins go to one of their assemblies which are kept profoundly secret we can ensure that they shall be arrested the girl then left alone shall be placed at your disposal if she will fly with you from ghent for fear of being implicated well if not on your bringing me the information you shall have a sufficient sum of money to hire unscrupulous friends and carry her whithersoever you will but if she should accompany them to their assembly said ned dyram at once how shall i ensure that she is not thrown into prison tortured perhaps burnt at the stake no no that will never do all those ifs can be met right easily answered simeon of roydon ere you give any information you can exact a promise from brother paul a promise from brother paul exclaimed dyram with a mocking laugh what trust the promise of a monk you are jesting sir knight was there ever promise so sacred sworn at the altar on the body of our lord that they have not found excuse for breaking or means of evading do you judge me a fool sir simeon of roydon not so rejoined the knight the danger did not strike me but i see it now it must be obviated or i cannot expect you to go along with me yet let me consider methinks it were easily guarded against perchance she may not go but if she do you can go with the party take what number of men with you you like and in the confusion that must ensue rescue your fair maiden the gates at this time of night are not shut till ten horses may be ready and there is a castle some five leagues off on the road to bruges which i saw and cheapened three days since as a place of residence during my exile it is vacant now you can bear her thither to-morrow you can speak with father paul yourself and make your own terms as to leading him to the place of their meeting if you discover it no replied ned dyram no i will not go with him i will be at their meeting with men i can trust so can i be sure that i shall be near at hand to guard her i will have it under his hand too that i am authorised by him to go or perchance they may burn me likewise you are too suspicious my good friend cried the knight with a laugh that rang not quite so merrily as it might have done a monk a monk answered dyram one can never doubt a monk too much i will gain the intelligence wanted sir knight but i leave you to prepare this brother paul to grant me all the security i ask or he hears not a word from me and so good night you shall have news of me soon and thus saying he left him simeon of roydon bent down his head and thought for several minutes but at length he exclaimed biting his lip he will shear down my revenge to a half and yet perhaps that may be as bitter as death to be the minion of a varlet twill be a fiercer though a slower fire 
than that of faggot and stake. End of chapter 29Chapter 30 of Agincourt, a romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hussites In a large old house, built almost entirely of wood, and situated in one of the suburbs of Ghent, far removed from all the noise and bustle of the more frequented parts of that busy town, there was a large old hall, in former years employed as a place of meeting by the linen weavers, but which, at the time I speak of, had been long disused for that purpose. When the trade becoming more flourishing, its followers had built themselves a more splendid structure in the heart of the city. In this hall were assembled, at a late hour of the day, about fifty personages of both sexes, and apparently of various grades and professions. Some were dressed in rather gay habiliments, some in and sober costume, but fine and costly withal, and some in the garb of the common artisans. The greater number, however, seemed of a wealthy class, and all appeared to know each other, and the rich citizen spoke in brotherly fellowship to the poor mechanic. The well-dressed burgher's wife nodded with friendly looks to the daughter of her husband's workman. There was one part of the hall, indeed, in which, for a moment, there was a momentary bustle caused by a beautiful girl in a morning garb, of somewhat foreign fashion, expressing apparently a wish to quit the hall but it was soon quieted and a minute or two after a tall elderly man with white hair stood up at the end of a long table having some books laid upon it while the rest of the assembly sat on benches round at some little distance leaving a vacant space in the midst after pausing for a minute or two till all was silent the old man began to speak addressing his companions in a fine mellow tone and with a mild, persuasive air. "'My brethren,' he said in the Flemish tongue, "'although I be an ignorant man and not meet to deal with such high matters, "'you have permitted me to expound to you the opinions of wiser men than myself, "'and especially of the venerable John Huss, "'upon things that nearly touch the salvation of all. "'And on former occasions I have shown you cause to see that very many corruptions and abominations have, by the wickedness of men, been brought into the Church of Christ. Amongst other points on which we have all agreed, there are these principal ones, that the word of God, first preached by the lowly and the humble to the poor and ignorant, should be laid open to all men, and committed to their own keeping, not being made to be put under a bed or hidden in a bushel, but to be a light shining in darkness, and leading every one in the way of salvation, that the Bible is no more the book of the priests than the book of the people, but it is the property of all for the security of their souls. Secondly, we have agreed that there is but one mediator with God the Father, Jesus Christ our Lord, and that to worship or invoke or kneel down to even good and holy men departed, whom we are wont to call saints, is a grace idolatry as well as the worship of statues, figures, or cross-pieces of wood and stone, there being nothing that can save us but faith in our Redeemer, and no intercession available but His. For surely it is a folly to suppose that men, who are sinners like ourselves, have power to help or save others when they have need of the one atonement for their own salvation. Thirdly, we have held that in the Mass there is no sacrifice, Christ having entered in once for all and that to suppose that any man, by the imposition of a bishop's hands, receives power to change mere bread and wine into the substance of our Lord's body and blood, is a fond and foolish imagination devised by wicked priests for their own purposes. These were the points touched upon when last we met, and now, before we proceed farther, let us pray for grace to help us in our examination. Thus saying, he knelt down at the end of the table, and all the rest but one followed his example, "'turning and bending the knee by the benches around. "'The Hussite teacher raised his eyes and hands to heaven, "'and then in a loud tone uttered a somewhat long prayer, "'followed by the voices of his little congregation. "'It was by this time growing somewhat dusk, "'for the sun must have been halfway below the horizon, "'and the windows of the hall were narrow and far up, "'but nevertheless when the kneelers raised themselves again, "'at the conclusion of the prayer,' 
and turn round towards the teacher, the eyes were all fixed on one spot at the end of the table, and a universal cry burst from every lip. With some it seemed to be the sound of terror, with others that of rage and surprise, and well indeed might they feel astonished, for there, exactly opposite the old man who had led them in prayer, stood a figure frightful to behold, covered with long black shaggy hair, with two large horns upon its head, a pair of wings on its shoulders, swarthy and ribbed like those of a bat, and with a face apparently of a negro. Hardly had they time to recover from their surprise and to ask themselves what was the meaning of the apparition they beheld, when the doors of the hall burst open and a mixed multitude rushed in, consisting of monks and priests and the whole train of varlets and serving men, which, in that day, were attached to monasteries, chapters, and other religious institutions in great towns. Staves and swords were plenty amongst them, and with loud shouts of, Ah, the heretics! Ah, the blasphemers! Ah, the worshippers of Satan! They rushed on the unhappy Hussites, overpowering them by numbers. No resistance was made. In consternation and alarm, the unhappy seekers of a purer faith rushed towards the doors, and even the windows, in the hope of making their escape. But the attempt was vain. One after another they were caught by their furious enemies, while cries of triumph and savage satisfaction rose up from different parts of the hall, as captive after captive was seized and pinioned. "'We have caught you in the fat,' cried one. "'You shall blaspheme no more,' shouted another. "'I saw the arch-enemy in the midst of them,' added a third. "'They were in the act of worshipping the devil,' said Brother Paul. "'To the stake with them, to the stake with them,' roared a barefooted friar. "'You see what you have done?' said Ella Brune to her cousin, who stood near with his arms tied. "'This was very wrong of you, Nicholas.' "'It was,' answered Nicholas Brune in a sorrowful tone. "'But they can do no harm to you, for I and others can testify that you came, unknowing whither, and would have left us if we had allowed you.' "'Will they believe your testimony?' asked Ella, in a tone of deep despondency. Before he could answer, Brother Paul approached, and gazing at the fair, unhappy girl, with a malicious smile, he said, "'Ah, ah, fair maiden, I knew your hypocrisy would be detected at length. I did not forget having seen you with the heretics at Liège.' Even as he spoke, however, there was a bustle at the door, and, to the surprise of all the hall contained, a number of men completely armed appeared, having at their head a gentleman in the ordinary riding dress of the day, with the knightly spurs over his boots and two long feathers in his cap. "'Stand there,' he said in a loud voice, turning to the men who followed, and let no one forth. Then striding through the hall with a multitude of priests and monks scattering before him, he advanced, gazing from right to left, till he reached the spot where Ella Brune was standing. A low murmur of joy burst from the poor girl's lips as Richard of Woodville approached, and she would fain have held out her hands towards him, but that her delicate wrists were tied with a hard cord. Richard of Woodville gazed from her to Father Paul, who stood beside her with a stern brow, and then in a low but menacing voice exclaimed, "'Untie that cord, foul monk!' "'I will not,' answered Father Paul sullenly. "'Who are you that you should interrupt the course of justice "'and rescue a blasphemous heretic from the stake?' "'Thou liest, knave,' answered Richard of Woodville. "'She is a better Catholic than thou art, "'with all thy hypocritical grimaces.' "'And unsheathing his dagger, he cut the cord from Ella's wrist "'and set her free. "'Ah, he draws his knife upon us,' cried Father Paul. "'Upon him! Cleave him down! There are no brave men here!' A rush was instantly made towards Richard of Woodville, and one man, with a grease arm, thrust himself right in his way, but laughing loud the young knight bared his long heavy sword and waved it over his head, grasping Ella by the hand and exclaiming in English, "'On, my men, on, open away there!' All but the most resolute of his opponents scattered from his path, and his stout followers forced their way forward into the hall, showing some reverence for the priests and monks, it is true but striking the varlets and serving-men sundry heavy blows with the pommels of their swords, not easily to be forgotten. A scene of indescribable confusion ensued. 
The darkness of the hall was becoming every moment more profound. A number of the Hussites made their escape, and untied others, while still through the midst of the crowd Richard of Woodville slowly advanced towards the door, and knocking the guisarme out of the hand of one of the men who seemed most strongly bent on opposing his passage, he brought the point of his sword to his throat, exclaiming, "'Back or die!' The sturdy violet laid his hand upon his dagger, but at the same moment one of the English archers who had reached his side struck him on the jaws with his steel glove, and knocked him reeling back amongst the crowd. Quickening his pace, Richard of Woodville hurried on, still holding Ella by the hand, and soon reached the top of the narrow stairs. There, pausing at the door, he counted the number of his men who had closed in behind him to see that none were left, and then hastened down with his fair charge into the street, several other fugitive Hussites passing him as they fled, with all the speed of terror. As soon as they had reached the open road, the young Englishman turned to his followers, and ordered three of them to remain a step or two behind, to ensure that they were not taken by surprise, and to give notice if they were pursued. But the party of fanatic priests within were busy enough in the wild riotous scene presented by the hall, now in almost total darkness, and often mistook one man for another in endeavouring to secure the prisoners that still remained in their hands. Thus Woodville and his companions were suffered to proceed on their way unfollowed, through numerous long and narrow streets till they reached the inn where they had first alighted on their arrival in Ghent. Quick, cried Richard of Woodville to one of his attendants, saddle four horses and the mule, and you with Peter and Alfred be ready to set out. You must leave Ghent with all speed, my poor Ella, he continued, leading her into the inn. I cannot go with you myself, but you shall hear from me soon, and the men will take care of you. I must go first to my cousin's house, said Ella eagerly. T'will not take long to run thither and return. There are many things that I must take with me. You can pass round there as you go, replied Woodville. Less time will be lost, and there is none to spare. Here, host, he cried. Host, I say. But the host was not to be found, and one of the chamberlains, running up as the young knight and his followers stood under the arch, demanded, "'What's your will, sir?' "'At what time are the city gates closed?' asked Richard of Woodville. "'I have to levy men at Bruges for the service of the Duke, and must send some of my people on to-night.' "'They do not shut until ten, sir, in this time of peace,' replied the chamberlain. "'So you have more than an hour, but even after that an order from the syndic will open them.' "'That will do.' "'replied Richard of Woodville. "'They must set out at once.' "'The moment after the horses were brought round "'with the mule which Ella Brun had ridden from Newport, "'and placing her carefully thereon, "'the young knight gave some orders to his men in a low tone, "'added some money for their expenses, "'and with a kindly adieu to Ella saw them depart. "'He then directed two of his archers "'to superintend the immediate removal of his baggage "'to the apartments which had been assigned him, in the Gravenstein, to see to the care of the horses, and to rejoin him without loss of time. After which, followed by the rest of his attendants, he took his way back to the old castle of the Counts of Flanders, and sought the chamber in the basement of one of the towers, which had been pointed out for his own by the Count of Charolois. At the door stood a stout man-at-arms, whom Woodville had placed there that night, after his meeting with Sir John Grey for it may be necessary to mention here what we did not pause to notice before, that the young knight had returned with Dyrum to the Gravenstein to seek for his men as soon as he heard of the danger which menaced poor Ella Broom. Opening the door of the chamber, Richard of Woodville went in and found Dyrum seated at the table with his head leaning on his arms. He moved but slightly when his master entered, and Woodville, casting himself into a seat opposite, gazed at him for a moment with a stern and angry brow. "'Look up, sir,' he said at length. "'In your terror and haste to remedy the evil you have caused, you have spoken too much, not to speak more. You once boasted of telling truth. Tell it now, as the only means of escaping punishment.' "'Is she saved?' asked Ned Dyrum, raising his head, and gazing in his young master's face with a look of eager anxiety. "'Is she saved? I care for naught else.' "'Yes, she is saved,' 
replied Richard of Woodville, but with peril to her and peril to me. I found her with her hands tied, and what may be the result no one yet can tell. And so you love her, he continued, gazing upon him thoughtfully, a glorious means indeed to prove your love. I have been deceived, said Dyram. The villain cheated me. He promised that she should be mine, and when I told him of the day and hour when the assembly was to take place, thinking that I kept the power in my own hands, so long as I did not mention where they were to meet, they laughed me to scorn and and told me they wanted to know no more. They? exclaimed Richard of Woodville. They? Whom do you mean? Brother Paul, replied Dyram, hesitating. Brother Paul and... Well, it matters not. If you learn not from me, you will learn from others, so I will say it first myself. Brother Paul and Simeon of Royden. Simeon of Royden? exclaimed the young knight, starting up, and lifting his hand as if to strike him. "'Have you been villain and traitor enough to betray this poor girl "'into the hands of that base and pitiful knave? "'By the Lord that lives, I have a mind to have you scourged "'through the streets of Ghent as a warning to all treacherous varlets.' "'Dyron bent his brows upon him with a bold scowl, "'answering in a low, muttering tone, "'You dare not!' "'The words had scarcely quitted his lips when, with a blow on the side of the head, "'Richard of Woodville dashed him to the ground. "'The man started up and drew his dagger half out of the sheath, "'but his master, who had recovered from his anger "'the instant the blow was given, "'so far at least as to be sorry that, that it had been struck at all, "'looked at him with a smile of cold contempt, "'and raising his voice exclaimed, "'Without there!' "'The archer instantly appeared at the door, "'and pointing to Dyram, the young knight said, "'Take away that knave, and put him forth from the castle and from the band. "'He is not one of my own people, and unfit to be with them. "'He is a base and dishonest traitor who betrays his trust. "'Away with him!' "'Dyram glared upon him for a moment without moving, "'then thrust his dagger back into the sheath, "'raised his hand with the right finger extended, "'and shook it at Richard of Woodville, "'with his teeth hard set together, "'and a significant frown upon his brow.' Then, turning to the door, he passed the archer, saying in a menacing tone, "'Touch me not!' and quitted the room. End of chapter 30「Chapter 31 of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Result Perhaps I have been too harsh, thought Richard of Woodville, when the man Dyron was gone, and he sat alone in his chamber. Surely that knave's conscience must be punishment enough. What must it be to think that we have betrayed a friend, violated a trust, injured one who has confided in us? Can hell itself afford an infliction more terrible than such a memory? Methinks it were torment enough for the worst of men to render remembrance eternal. And he was right. Surely he was right. In this world we weave the fabric of our punishment with our sins. As the young knight proceeded to reflect, however, his mind turned from Dyram to Sir Simeon of Royden, and suddenly a light broke in upon him. It must be so, he cried. Tis this man has poisoned the mind of Sir John Grey against me, but that will be easily remedied. The next instant he suddenly recollected the half-made appointment with Mary's father, which in all the bustle and excitement of the scenes he had lately gone through had escaped his memory till that moment, and he started up, exclaiming, "'This is unfortunate indeed. There may yet be time. I will go.' But as he turned towards the door, the clock of the castle struck. Nearly an hour had elapsed since the appointed period, for the stealthy foot of time ever runs fastest when we could wish his stay." Nevertheless, Richard of Woodville went forth, received the password of the guard, and hurried to the inn to inquire whether or not the old knight had come during his absence. He was in some hope that such might not be the case, for Mary's father had ridden away abruptly without saying whether he accepted the appointment or not. But when Woodville reached the hostel, he found, to his mortification, that Sir John Grey had not only been there, but had waited some time for his return— and had gone away, the host informed him, with a gloomy brow. 
sad and despondent with all the bright hopes which had accompanied him to Ghent darkened, he strode back to the Gravenstein and passed through the court to his apartments, remarking that there seemed a number of persons waiting and a good deal of confusion, unusual at so late an hour. But his thoughts were busy with his own situation, and he walked on in the darkness to his chamber without inquiry. There, leaning his head upon his hand beneath the light of the lamp, he gave himself up to bitter reflections, thinking how sad it is that a man's happiness, his name, fame, purposes, abilities, virtues, should be so completely in the power of circumstances, the stones with which fate builds up the prison walls of many a lofty spirit. While he was thus meditating, there was a knock at his chamber door, and bidding the applicant come in, the next moment he saw the young Lord of Lon enter. The youth's countenance betokened haste and agitation, and closing the door carefully, he said, "'The Count has just whispered to me to come and warn you, good night, not to quit your apartments till he comes to you.' "'How so?' asked Woodville, partly divining the cause of this injunction. "'Do you mean, my young friend, that I am a prisoner?' "'Oh, no,' answered the other. "'Tis for your own safety. "'There are enemies of yours in the castle, "'and perhaps if they were to see you, "'they might seize you even here. "'You know not the daring of these men of Ghent, "'and how, when passion moves them, "'they set at naught all authority. "'They would arrest you in the very presence of the prince "'if they thought fit, "'and they are even now pouring their complaints "'into the Count's ear. "'Luckily, however, they know not "'that you are in the Gravenstein.' and with a show of loyal obedience, of which they have very little in their hearts, they are affecting to ask permission, as you are one of his knights, to have you sought for in the town to-morrow, and apprehended for something rather rash that you have done this evening. I have done nothing rash, my friend, replied Woodville gravely, but only what I would do again to-morrow if the case required it. Only, in fact, what my knightly oath required— I have but rescued a defenceless woman from wrong and oppression. I can justify myself easily to the Count or any other gentleman of honour. Well, wait till he comes, answered the young nobleman, for though you might be able to set yourself right at last, yet you would ill brook imprisonment, I wot. And perhaps even the Count might not be able to save you from these people's hands if you were found just now. They are a furious and unruly set, and the priests have got syndics and magistrates of all kinds on their sides. I have heard tales of their doings, replied Richard of Woodville, but I cannot bring myself to fear them. However, I will, of course, obey the Count's commands, and wait here till he is pleased to send for me. I will bear you company, replied the young Lord of Long, for I love not the presence of these foul citizens, and heaven knows how long they may stay with their orations, as lengthy and as flat as one of their own pieces of cloth. To say the truth, Richard of Woodville would have preferred to be alone, but he did not choose to mortify the good-humoured young lord by suffering him to perceive that his presence was a restraint, and sometimes in grave conversation, sometimes in light, they passed nearly an hour, till at length numerous sounds from the courtyard gave notice that the deputation of the good citizens was taking its departure. For half an hour more they waited, in the expectation of soon receiving some messenger from the Count de Charolois, but none appeared, and at length Richard of Woodville besought his companion to seek some intelligence. The young nobleman readily undertook the task and opened the door to go out, but on the very threshold was met by the Count himself, followed by the Lord of Croy. The expression of the prince's countenance was grave and troubled, and seating himself he made a sign to the rest to do so likewise, and then, looking at Woodville with an anxious and careful smile, he said, "'This is an awkward business, my friend.' "'If told truly, it is a very simple one, my lord the Count,' replied the knight. "'It may be simple, yet have very dangerous results,' said the young prince gravely. "'These men of Ghent are not to be meddled with lightly,' and though their insolence must some day be checked, and shall, yet this is not the time to do it. It seems, by their account, that you brought a pretty lighter loved maiden with you hither from England, and that she, having been found with a number of other heretics, worshipping, they assert, the devil himself, who was seen in proper form amongst them, 
Woodville smiled. You delivered her with the strong hand from the people sent to seize the whole party. What makes you laugh, Sir Richard? Because, my good lord, replied the young knight, you here in Flanders do not seem to understand monks and priests so well as we do in England. They have made a fair story of it, which is almost all false. I am as good a Catholic as any of them, though I have not had my head shaved. I believe all that the church tells me, for I doubt not that the church knows best, but I can't help seeing that she has got a great number of knaves amongst her ministers. But what is the truth of the story, Sir Knight, said the Lord of Croy? I told the Count that I was sure they had made a mountain of a molehill. Thanks, my good lord, answered Woodville. The truth is simply this. The poor girl is a good and sincere Catholic and has been bitterly tried, for many of her relations are what we call lollards, a sort of heretics like your Hussites, and she has steadfastly resisted all their false notions. She was persecuted and ill-treated in England by a base and unworthy man, a knight, heaven save the mark, one Sir Simeon of Royden, now banished from the English court for his ill-treatment of her. She, having relations in this land, amongst others Nicholas Brune, your goldsmith, sir, quitted London to join them. I found her in the same ship which brought me over, and in Christian charity and common courtesy gave her protection on the way. She is no light to love, my lord, but a good and honest maiden, and I will be the last to sully her purity by word or deed. As soon as I reached Ghent and found out where her cousin dwelt, I placed her safely under his roof and thought of her no more, accompanying you to Lille. A servant, however, whom I had left with my baggage and some spare horses here in Ghent, a clever knave but a great rogue, was smitten, it seems, by her beauty on the way, and went often to see her. On my return, while I was speaking with Sir John Gray in the street, this man came up importunately and told me, if I did not save her, she was lost. Hurrying along with him to gather my men together, I found that a certain monk or friar named Brother Paul had combined with others of whom I have since discovered this Simeon of Royden was one to seize upon the poor girl with the whole party of her friends as a heretic meeting in the old linen weaver's hall on their promise to give her up to him this scoundrel servant of mine dirham had betrayed to the cunning monks at what hour the assembly was to be held but when he asked for the securities they had promised that she should be placed in his hands they laughed him to scorn he is a persevering knave, however, and by one means or another gained a knowledge of all their proceedings and intentions, and found that they had dressed up one of their varlets as the arch-enemy, covering him with the skin of a black cow, and setting the horns upon his head. The mummer was to be placed under the table in the hall, as doubtless he was, for I saw something of the figure when I went in, and as soon as it grew dusk he was to rise up amongst the heretics, giving a sign for the others to rush in. Knowing the girl to be a Catholic, as I have said, and free from all taint of this heresy, then why went she thither? demanded the Count de Charolois. She told me afterwards, my lord, replied the young Englishman, that her cousin Nicholas and his wife had deceived her, and anxious to convert or pervert her to their own notions, had taken her to this place without letting her know whither she was going. She says they will acknowledge it themselves, if they are questioned, and also that she strove to go away when she found out where she was, but was prevented by them. However, knowing her to be a good Catholic, and certain that the whole matter was contrived out of some malice towards her, I had no hesitation in hastening to her deliverance. I used no farther violence than was needful to set her free, took no part in delivering the others of whose religious notions I knew nothing. And the greater part of them escaped, it seems, said the Lord of Croy. With that I have nothing to do, replied Richard of Woodville. I contented myself with cutting the cords that they had tied round the poor girl's wrists and making my way with her out of the hall, leaving the monks and their mene to settle the matter with the others as they thought fit. And where is the maiden now, my friend? asked the Count de Charolois. "'I instantly sent her out of the town with three of my men,' replied Richard of Woodville. "'I thought it the surest course.' "'The Count looked at the Lord of Croy, as if for him to speak, 
and the young English knight, somewhat hastily concluding that they entertained doubts of his word, exclaimed, after a moment's pause, "'I trust that you do not disbelieve me, sir. You cannot suppose that an English gentleman of no ill repute would tell you a falsehood in a matter such as this.' "'No, no, my friend, no, no,' replied the Count. "'I do not doubt you for a moment. I only look to our good comrade here to speak what is very unpleasant for me to say.' Indeed, I do not know how to explain it to you, for you will naturally think that my father's power ought to be sufficient to protect one of his own knights against his own people. The truth is, Sir Richard, said the Lord of Croy, that the citizens of Ghent are an unruly race, and if they once get you in their hands, they may treat you ill. If my lord the Count were to resist them, there is no knowing what they might do. I would not answer for it in such a case that we should not see them in arms before the castle gate ere noon to-morrow. That shall never be on my account, noble prince, re replied the knight, turning to the count, but under these circumstances it were wise in me to quit the town of Ghent. That is exactly what I wish to say, answered the prince, but in truth it seems most ungrateful of me to propose such a thing to you, my friend. Undoubtedly, if you are not pleased to go, I will defend you here to the best of my power, and my father would soon give us aid, in case of necessity. But I need not tell you that to have Ghent again in revolt, just on the eve of a new war with the Armanacs in France, might be ruinous to all his schemes, and fatal to his policy. Moreover, if they were to accuse him of countenancing heresy here, it would do him a bitter injury, for the people in Paris have just pronounced that the sermon preached by one of his doctors, Jean Petit, is heretical. Well, answered Richard of Woodville, I can go to Bruges, my lord, where you said I should find good archers, and can be carrying on my levies there. The Count shook his head, saying, That will be no place of safety. These good folks of Ghent, and those of Bruges, so often at deadliest enmity, are now sworn friends and the bourgeois will give you up without a thought. No, what I have to propose is this, that you should go an hour or two before daylight to my cousin Valorant de St. Paul, who is now raising troops on the Meuse. I shall have to pass thither also, for my father sends me into Burgundy, and I cannot go through France. If you will wait for me between Chimay and Dinan, I will join you within ten days, and we will go on to the west, and raise what man we can at Besançon. So be it, my noble lord, replied Richard of Woodville, but where shall I find the Count? You will find him at Chimay, replied the young prince. He has a castle two leagues thence, on the road to Dinan. From me you shall hear before I come. I will meet you somewhere in the Ardennes. Make all your preparations quickly, and in the meanwhile I will write letters to my uncles of Brabant and Liège, that you may have favour and protection as you pass. Richard of Woodville thanked him for his kindness in due terms, and as soon as the young Count with the Lords of Croy and Long had left him, called his servants and gave orders to prepare once more for their immediate departure. Fortunately, it so happened that he had ordered all his baggage to be brought from the inn, so that no great time was lost, and in about an hour all was ready to set out. The letters to the young Count, however, had not arrived, and Richard of Woodville waited, pondering somewhat anxiously upon the only difficulty which presented itself to his mind, namely, how he was to recall the men whom he had sent with Ella Brun upon the side of Bruges, without depriving her of aid and protection at the moment when she most needed it. It was true, he thought, she had no actual claim upon him. It was true that he had done more for her already than might have been expected at his hands, without any motive but that of compassion. But yet he felt that it would be cruel, most cruel, to leave her in an hour of peril, undefended and alone. We take a withering stick and plant it in the ground, says Stern, and then we water it because we have planted it. And Richard of Woodville was one who felt that the kindness he had shown did give her a title to expect more. At first he thought of bidding the men rejoin him and bring her with them, but then the glance which Sir John Grey had cast upon him as her name was mentioned came back to his mind, and he said, No, that must not be. For her sake and my own she must go no farther with me. Men might well think, if she did, 
that there were other ties between us than there are. I will bid them take her to England, or place her anywhere in safety, and then come. To Sir John Grey I must write, and to my sweet Mary also. I may well trust her, I hope, to plead my cause, and repel the charges which this base villain has brought. Yet it is most unfortunate that this event should have occurred at such a moment." He was still thinking deeply over these matters when the door opened and the young Count of Charolois appeared alone. "'Here are the letters, my friend,' he said. "'I have ordered some of my people to go with you for a mile or two beyond the gates, in order to secure you a safe passage. Is there aught I can do for you while you are absent?' "'One thing, my noble lord,' replied the young knight, a sudden thought striking him. "'If you will kindly undertake to be my advocate,' with one whose good opinion is to me a matter of no light moment. You must know that Sir John Grey, so long an exile in your father's dominions, but now empowered by King Henry to treat, in conjunction with Sir Philip de Morgan, at the court of Burgundy, has one daughter, plighted to me by long love, by her own promises, and by her father's also. But some scoundrel, the same I do verily believe, who has made all this mischief, I mean Sir Simeon of Royden, has brought charges against me to that good knight, which have altered his countenance towards me. Called suddenly away, I have no means of explanation, and I leave my name blighted in his opinion. The accusation, I believe, refers to this poor girl, Ella Brune, but you may tell Sir John, and I pledge you my knightly word, you will tell him true, that there is naught between her and me but kindness rendered on my part to a woman in distress, and gratitude on hers to one who has protected her. I will not fail, replied the young prince, giving him his hand, nor will I lose any time before I explain all as far as I know it. Thus saying, he walked out with Woodville into the court, where the horses stood prepared, and in a few minutes the young wanderer was once more upon his way. End of chapter 31